Ready to master the art of capital? Welcome to the Capital HQ Masterclass and unlock your potential in the world of business and finance. Providing you with the knowledge and tools you need to excel in today's competitive landscape. This event is powered by Wholesale Investor and Capital HQ. Thank you for joining us. Hi, and welcome to day one of Capital HQ Masterclass, our investor stream. For a long time, we've been working with high net worth, family office, angel investors, and also VCs. We are very fortunate to be surrounded by some of the most brilliant minds across Australia, Singapore, the UK, and even in some in the US. And what we always want to do is we want to give you access to their insights, access to their information, access to their investment thesis. This, however, is slightly different. This is for the investor looking to take the next step. So whether you're a founder that's just sold your business and looking to start to get into angel investing, whether you're an angel investor that's now thinking about running syndicates or potentially looking at building your own VC fund, or if you're currently working in a VC and you're looking at taking that next step in your career, we want to provide you with access to the information and people that can help you make that next step. We want to provide you with the step-by-step -step actionable insights that you can take advantage of today. Over the next two days, we're going to be providing you with access to a range of speakers. There's a complete agenda sitting inside the crisp room, which you can actually have a look at. And by the way, as a small point, we're going to be rebranding crisp the capital HQ, right? But you'll be able to get access to all the agenda that sits inside of it. And don't worry if there's a session that you're going to miss, we're going to be making it completely free and available for the next 30 days for you to access. So Welcome to day one of the investor stream of Capital HQ Masterclass. Enjoy the sessions. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Stein. I'm the CFO of Altec Batteries List Limited. We're listed on the ASX. Our code is ATC. Today, I'll be talking to you about one of Altec's uh, projects, which is the Serenergy Sodium Chloride Salt Battery for Grid Storage Solutions. So to start off with, I just want to talk about how a lithium ion battery works. So inside of that, you've got a cathode and an anode section, and then running between the cathode and the anode is a liquid electrolyte, as well as a plastic separator sheet. And what happens with that liquid electrolyte and plastic separator is a process that is called thermal runaway. And that's when the temperature gets so hot and the battery catches on fire and explodes. And we're seeing lithium ion batteries catching on fire and exploding because of this. So what the industry is attempting to do is to move to what's called a solid state technology. Now that's replacing the liquid electrolyte and the plastic separator sheet with a solid ceramic electrolyte and that stops the fires and the explosions from happening. With lithium ion batteries, they're restricted in their temperature range. So they generally operate best between 15 degrees and 35 degrees. Outside of that, they lose their capacity. So lithium ion batteries are not used for very, very hot or very, very cold climates. Lithium ion batteries also have a limited lifespan because of the degradation issues of lithium. Just like your mobile phone that holds a lot of charge when you first get it, but fades away in time with use, that's the same with a lithium ion battery. Lithium ion batteries also rely on a lot of cobalt. Now, 70% of the world's cobalt is sourced from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which we know has child labor and ethical issues in sourcing that material. And lithium ion batteries use a lot of graphite 90% of the world's graphite supply is coming from China, which poses a ge geopolitical uh, and supply chain risk over that material. And China has recently come out and said that they will be restricting exports of sales of graphite going forward. Lithium ion batteries and EVs actually use two and a half times the amount of copper than a internal combustion engine. So there's a lot of copper being needed for the electrification revolution. And there's a lot of experts saying that there's not enough copper 
coming online to support all the world's needs. So what I will put to you, is there an alternative? Is there a battery technology that is completely fire and explosion proof that has a large temperature range that can operate for more than 15 years and doesn't use any lithium, any cobalt, any graphite, any copper, and any manganese? Well, this is Altec Batteries Serenergy Sodium Chloride Grid Storage Battery. And the battery was developed by Altec's joint venture partner, which is Fraunhofer. Fraunhofer are uh, a German or the German government owned research and development institute, very credible organization. And they've spent eight years developing this battery, which uses common table salt or sodium chloride technology. Sodium is actually the next most reactive element on the table of elements to lithium. It's in abundance, it's widely available, and it's a very cheap raw material. So the Serenity battery by Altec is not exposed to rising lithium prices. And what we're doing is we're commercializing a battery that will support the world's transition from renew from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. What's happening around the world is that the wind and the solar power is being produced so much so that the grids can't handle it though at this stage and there's a lot of waste. In fact, Germany's wasting 2 billion euros per annum in wasted green energy that the grid can't support. So the world is looking at having battery storage as a solution to this problem. And that's where the Serenity battery comes in. So we, we're commercializing very, very large sea container size batteries that will go onto the grid, take the surplus energy from solar and wind that is produced, for example, during the day, storing it into the battery and then returning it to the grid at nighttime when the energy isn't being produced, but it is required. It's exactly the same concept to a residential house that may have solar panels on its roof and wants a battery to store the energy in. The way the world's renewable energy is going at the utility grid scale uh, movement is to have these massive batteries put onto the grids. This is a very lucrative niche industry. It's growing at 28% compound annual growth rate. And as I mentioned, it's the future of the renewable energy transition. Tesla has come out and said that they see the future of their business, the battery industry side of things being just as relevant and as big to Tesla as the electrical, as the electrical vehicle industry. So what our tech is doing now, it is commercializing a 120 megawatt hour plant it's going to be done on Altex land that we already own in Saxony in Germany. And that is what the plant is envisaged to look like, 120 megawatt hour capacity. It will be all renewable power driven. This is the first stage in the strategy. Altex longer term vision is to have gigawatt hour capacity plants around the world. We have the worldwide rights of manufacturing, distribution and licensing. So in time, the goal is to take this product around the world. So that's the Altec Batteries for Energy story, and I welcome you to be part of the journey. Altec Batteries, stock code ATC on the ASX. My name is David Smith and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ceres Tag. We're a multi-species animal health intelligence company. We're most known for being the world's first direct-to-satellite livestock monitoring platform. We're currently operating in 36 countries. We have a global distribution network, an open platform that enables us to scale very quickly. We have a very strong innovation pipeline. We only have one class of share, no debt, and we're a publicly listed company. People use our platform for a range of reasons, but including the scope three emissions and a very strong climate um, background. 
What's driving our business is the regulatory changes that are happening for sustainability around the world and the need for reporting. These include things like deforest-free supply chains and the corporate needs to have that evidence for ESG reporting. In addition to this, we're seeing a demographic change in our industry where the average age was around 65 in the livestock industry. Now, they're either dying or leaving the industry uh, and the new generation coming through are highly educated, they're digital native, they want to make the world a better place and they don't have as much access to labour. So automation is absolutely key for what they do. We see a lot of other drivers as well, such as the use of land for a growing population. There's not as much available. And also diseases and biosecurity is a major concern for the world too. The, one of the unique value propositions for our platform is a, an algorithm called pasture feed intake which measures the amount of grass that the animals consume, so in dry matter intake. And from this, we can predict the amount of methane emissions, which is highly critical for sustainability purposes. The calculation of the amount that they're eating combined with the outputs, whether it be milk production or weight gain, provides us with a feed conversion efficiency, which is a heritable trait for animals and provides the phenotype for genetic selection. This enables us to optimize our stocking rates and increase the production and profitability of the operation. So everybody will be doing this and they'll need to do it with the Ceres tag. The satellite traceability is absolutely key as it enables us to operate anywhere on the planet in a plug and play way without the need for any infrastructure. The sensors are small and light, low cost, and the way in which we share that data in an open platform means that people can use that data to interpret for a range of different uh, solutions. How the technology works is the tag will arrive at the property, you charge it up in the sun, you activate it, and you put it on the animal. From there, the, the ear tag will, smart ear tag will send via a low earth orbit satellite to our back end software platform, where we then move that data to the customer's choice of software and we charge for that as well. Collaboration has been our absolute key to rapid growth. In only three years, we're operating in 36 countries. In fact, we've got distributors on every continent. That means we've got boots on the ground interacting with our customers on a daily basis. Partnerships are also been key in finance, supply chain management, animal health, vegetation, insurance, and of course, sustainability and conservation. In fact, we're arguably the world's fastest growing wildlife monitoring platform too. The revenue streams that we have is from the sale of the sensors and then the monetization of that data. Every sensor is sold with a SaaS data model. So we charge on a per animal per month basis. And we also have aggregate data. We have over 8 million data points that we're already anonymizing and selling in packages of data. Of course, our innovation pipeline is second to none, not only in the livestock space in through things like virtual fencing and remote sickness detection, but also we have a pet platform of which we already have some international partnerships in play. It's not just the data, but the use cases of the data is also innovation through using the, the enteric emissions uh, and also the data for soil carbon evidence for carbon credits, uh, the reduction of stock theft, deforest free and genetic evaluation. In the competitive light landscape, we're the only ones with the satellite connectivity, the pasture feed intake capability, the interoperability of the data pla open data platform, and of course the omni-channel. So we sell e-commerce as well as our extensive global distribution network. Looking at comparators, because we don't really have a head-to-head -head competitor, you can see that the variation in, in the money that people have acquired the companies are uh, similar to us, varying from 40 million right up to 3.7 billion US dollars. We're seeking $8.5 million to scale our manufacturing, reduce the costs, 
build the margins, and also to improve our backend data platform uh, because we're expecting or anticipating significant amount of data as our sales continue to increase as we're currently having month on month uh, increase in sales you know, of record sales. Thank you very much. Development HQ. My name's Simon Peters. Uh, I've got 30 years of development experience, developed a number of properties, over $300 million in value. This is a quick overview of some of the assets that we've actually developed in two countries, Australia and New Zealand, just to give you an idea. A lot of residential subdivisions, uh, medium rise townhouses, mostly residential and some commercial. So the big idea that we have in seconds. There's a big problem in Australia right now. There's a rising demand for affordable housing. House prices are going up and the income of households aren't. In short, there's a huge amount of uh, property being built over here uh, in the four bedroom, sort of three to four bedroom space. Not a lot suitable for any other uh, type or demographic. These are mainly for families. <clears throat> Single person household uh, demographics are growing dramatically in this country. Um, and there's nowhere near enough property being built in that space. So the Queensland demographic where we're currently focused, 60% of the income is at under $1,000 a week for each household. And that's a significantly low number considering the price of housing and rental. Um, so why not just build affordable housing? That's actually what we're doing. After years of being in this space, uh, I've decided and we have decided as a business that this is an area we really can make a difference in. So co-living is one of the ways or one of the forms of this type of development, uh, mainly to make it affordable, and it's also a, a really growing space internationally. And so what is it? Um, and who's it for? It's basically for nearly everybody. It's primarily designed for one or two people per room. Uh, there's a lot of women in this country over 55 uh, that are now single. They've had their families. They don't actually have enough money to buy a property and they don't have enough money to pay rent. They're usually nurses or um, service workers, what have you. So it also encompasses the essential work space around shopping centers, retail workers, as I said, nurses, educators, uh, police. There's so many areas that are underserved uh, and also young professionals. There are some large players globally in the space already. You can see here, um, Australia is very young in terms of our, uh, our um, penetration into this market, but it's very much a growing space. So the challenges really are economic health, regulatory policy, um, and affordability. So our solution is these co-living apartments and uh, housing. It's, it's a, um, it's a, it generally makes it affordable due to the fact that people are actually sharing uh, service spaces like kitchens and what have you. But in general, people have their own actual bedroom that's safe and secure, and it's designed for one or two people. We also have, want to make sure that when we offer a triple bottom line, which is social, economic, and environmentally designed properties, that we actually have that audited by an international company. This organization, One Planet Living Framework, encompasses these items, including uh, zero carbon, uh, the global culture and community, and what benefits are we adding back in terms of how we design, what we design, uh, and for what cohort must be measurable. Uh, this is our first project, currently has an approval, We're preparing for construction commencement within six months uh, with a value at 72 rooming accommodation, which is effectively shared accommodation in six buildings in Logan Home, uh, Queensland, that's Southeast Queensland. So we're offering at the moment, uh, in short, a, uh, a first mortgage, 12.5% interest, this is to take out the current mortgage while we prepare for construction. And then once the construction's underway, we'll refinance that mortgage and put it into a construction loan from a traditional lender. It's, a, it's an example of one of the projects that we're doing, this one here. We have four or five of these projects with similar scenarios. Uh, and you'll see here uh, three other projects that we're currently underway with. Stage two, which is the Toowoomba project here on the left, is in for DA, we should expect that in two months' time, and we'll be constructing that this year, 
similar scenario, similar offer, whilst we prepare for construction. Uh, and the other two projects, again, uh, in similar locations in Logan. That's our pipeline. These are some of our partners that we work with. We obviously do our best to make sure we have very, very high quality team behind us. Uh, right, you know, right, Levitt Bucknell, Norton Rose, Fulbright Lawyers, Gensler Architects are the largest architectural firm on the planet, six and a half thousand staff in, in 52 cities. They designed the first project. They're not our only designers. We have others here. Bolo are modular home builders. We also have all our projects designed for modular home and construction. So we can build them traditionally for modular and in Australia, modular is fast becoming uh, an absolutely serious space. And we believe it's the future of all this type of development. And in fact, through to the extra development going forward. So the next steps really is have a look at our deal room. We are, we're online on Wholesale Investor. Um, book a call to discuss it. I'm happy to, to chat to anybody personally uh, and do a, an individual presentation, go into more depth and detail. And, um, and talk to us about investing. Thank you for your time. G'day, my name's Brian Dunster and I'm one of the founders of, uh, of GrowBud Price Limited. Uh, we've been working for the last three years in developing a solid state solar powered product to help people grow healthier, higher yielding plants. Um, with genuine tried and tested results we've been doing over this period, our reusable products make growing plants easier and more effective than ever before. And they've got the added benefit of reducing the use of pesticides. Our ambition is to be the provider of the most affordable and accessible plant growth enhancement technology on the market today. The problem, the obvious problem, growing plants is difficult, whether you're a professional operator, a hobby farmer, or a home gardener. It's not easy to grow strong, healthy plants. And anything that can assist in achieving this is actively pursued by people. Virtually every person growing plants would like them to grow faster and produce more yield with no extra effort or ongoing cost. Food insecurity is a global problem and when people have, do not have physical and economical access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. We're hoping we can help that. The solution, introducing our GrowBud products. We, uh, we have the Grow Stick and the Grow Elf, which is our consumer focus, and our Grow Bed now, which is our, con our, our commercial focus, which is exciting. They're easy to use, they're renewable, they help reduce carbon miles, they encourage people to grow fruit at home, they reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, support local community, encourage social connection, biodegradable, and we hope are going to greatly assist the farmers in their yield and benefit. The product itself is very easy to use. The, uh, the consumer versions, the Grow Elf and the Grow Stick, you simply place in either a pot, planter bed, or garden bed, and within four to six inches of the plant, uh, the bigger version will do about two meters squared, and you simply place the uh, solar panel towards the sun or in, indoors, obviously, towards LED lights in this uh, video as such. Um, and the, the results we get are amazing. They, they increase the uh, yield. They're able to provide a small amount of electricity to the root system, which allows the roots to absorb more nutrients. Uh, local nursery, uh, a very simple test. We gave them a grow stick. They provided uh, two lettuce plants identical. Um, uh, same watering, same soil, same nutrients, and this is the difference. They were just blown away. We've been testing for the last three years. As I said, we've tested a multitude of variety of plants from tomatoes to mint and everything in between. Ongoing testing will continue. Uh, everything we've tested has increased its growth and yield. First results of the grow bed, which is the most exciting part we've got now, have completed with outstanding results. We've been doing our testing in the Philippines with our partner lab, and they've been uh, engaged some uh, local farmers to do the testing. The significant increase we observed in the eggplants that we did the test on was 150% in actual plant and over 171% in actual crop weight. Um, importantly, insect damage was significantly reduced, resulting in little or no pesticides to be used. Organic farmers are now all over this. Showing the results uh, uh, here, the, it's the largest fruit farmers have ever seen. Um, the harvest has been a lot quicker than ever before with the uh, with the grow bed uh, plants. The two control plants are uh, identified in the top left and bottom right of both photos. Um, so as you can see, the yield is just massive. 
importantly, the uh, control plants lost about 30 to 50 percent of their of their plant from insect infestation, where there was no insect infestation in the grow bed plants. Our current status: we have an innovation plant patent granted, uh, international patent is pending and lodged. Uh, we've completed three production runs of our products, basically zero competitors, very strong sales traction already. Um, importantly, our commercial trials have just been completed with the farmers. Uh, first to market, uh, a couple of trademarks done. We've got currently eight weeks uh, lead time support, and we can manufacture 30,000 units per product per month currently. The market, the, uh, the importantly, the consumer market is about 100 plus million. We know that. Um, and sorry, 100 plus billion. And uh, we're targeting that with our consumer products, but we're focusing on our con commercial product. Um, we've got three versions, which is a 2050 and 100 probe systems. Uh, we intend to focus on the smaller protected crop market, the hobby farmers allotments, uh, which is a massive market globally. To give an example, there's 5 million small farms in the Philippines. Over 2 million of these have uh, growing specifically vegetables. Uh, and it's these small farm allotments that we're going to be targeting. Um, the estimated worldwide greenhouse um, uh, area of market is 496,000 hectares, which is just crazy. Uh, so the numbers are massive. It'd be unrealistic for us to place a SAM on the on the greenhouse polytunnel market at this stage in our in our growth. Uh, the mark or the the ask that we're asking for is uh, is approximately 24 percent of the equity of the of the company for a million dollars Australian. That is. Thank you for your time. We are, uh, have a table at the uh, at the emergence in Sydney in uh, in next month in February. Please come along and and have a chat. And look forward to seeing you. Hello, I'm Ray Mountford. I'm the CEO of Foresta, New Zealand. Um, we have a project down here in New Zealand that we think will interest anybody that's uh, interested in investing in the space of uh, renewables, sustainability, um, and decarbonisation. Um, what we've done is we've taken New Zealand's large pine resource, which has been sustainably managed um, for over 90 years, um, and we have added value, further value to that pine resource. Uh, prior to, to now, trees currently today are just logged and 66% of the um, what's logged is just exported um, as a bulk commodity by boat um, offshore. This is uh, costing significant money in um, freight, not adding much value to the forest and forest owners not getting a great return. And it's created an opportunity for us in manufacturing to actually create more of a return for the forest owner, but also generate a great return for ourselves. Uh, we're making three products, and what we've done is we've brought three processes together. Um, and what those processes do is, is we it's very similar to pulp and paper, but we've changed the technology around so that it's no longer destructive, it's no longer uh, creating pollution, and it gives us products that are, are more relevant to today. Um, so we take the resins and the terpenes out of the wood. Resins, it looks like amber because it, it is just unfossilized amber. And, that, and it's used in a lot of your adhesives manufacturers and products such as um, Loctite, maybe your soft drinks and so forth, um, um, road paint, those sort of things. Terpenes as your flavors and fragrances. They make over 5,000 different products come from that. Even things like vanilla essence in the, in, your, uh, in the supermarket, if it's not from a vanilla plant, it's probably from pine tree. And then we come to the, the torrified black pellets at the back. And those, uh, those form the most of our volume, but about 50% of our sales when compared to the chemicals at the front. And that, that combination of revenue generation is actually the key thing about this business. It means that in our manufacturing process, we get all of those savings, but we generate a, of um, combining these three, three processes um, at the cost of doing one. And that, so black tarified pellets are straight coal replacement. And that, and so this is a little diagram, if you say, from the tree grown to its cycle, harvested, and then gets replanted. And then uh, we take, we also use the pine stump, which is another um, innovative uh, part of the process, which is chemical rich, and uh, and that is a feed source. So we we increase the yield from the forest. We then maximise the actual um, productive 
uh, yield of chemicals, which include the uh, torrified pellets as a coral replacement. And then, so that that's the opportunity. Um, some of the products I've talked about already, paint coatings, energy generation, chewing gum, pretty nice. And that this is our sales. We have uh, it's a $10 billion industry existing fine chemicals. They're utilized all over the world and are a high value, high niche commodity as a wood pellets, more a low value, but still a commodity. And of course, becoming more and more important as we transition into a green, renewable, um, sustainable economy. And, uh, you know, of course, the replacing direct replacement with coal. And uh, in saying with that, uh, we've had a really good uptake from the marketplace with um, New Zealand's largest coal distributor um, taking um, uh, all of our first production um, as a as a 10 year off that contract, Yasahara Chemicals and Waters on the chemical side. Um, we have we have 1.7 million hectares of pine in New Zealand, um, well managed, and of those, 66% are exported for low value. That's our supply, very accessible, um, and right next to our proposed site. So value proposition is this opportunity to replace coal, 95% reduction when we burn this instead of coal in, in carbon emissions. We'll first move a patented manufacturing process. We've got a site, we've got um, offtake supply agreements, all engineering and reports, all of the uh, various suppliers lined up with contracts. Potential revenues in excess for this first plant of investment that we're release, releasing this next month, 290 million per annum in return on investment around 31%. Um, We'd love to hear from you if you're interested in investing in a limited partnership with us. Uh, we can, we've can we got open as from small to large. Thank you. I'm Alan Trounson, CEO of Carotherix. Carotherix is developing a breakthrough cancer therapy for solid tumours with a primary focus on ovarian cancer. An investment in Carotherix advances this life-saving technology and benefits from licensing and acquisition or a possible listing providing shareholder returns in two to four years. We're raising a minimum of 10 to $20 million, giving us three years to complete an FDA IND filing and a phase one and two A clinical trials for our lead product. Passing these milestones is expected to generate considerable returns. Deals for comparable assets have recently completed for more than 400 million or more. Our vision is to manufacture multiple immunotherapies, attacking cancers where chemotherapy and other treatments have failed. Our pipeline includes treatments for tumors, including ovarian, lung, prostate, pancreatic, and other cancers. Our lead product targets ovarian cancer, a lethal and costly disease. It kills approximately 65% of women diagnosed. It's often caused late, reducing the chance that surgery and chemotherapy will send the cancer into remission and not reappear again. The market for ovarian cancer is large. In the US, the price of the first year of treatment for ovarian cancer is on average $100,000, with a total annual spend across the country of $3.5 billion. Ovarian cancer will also qualify for orphan status from the regulators. On top of this lead indication, the combined market size for our pipeline is over six times greater than ovarian cancer alone. These are results of what has got very excited. This is an animal study for our lead product, CDH401, where each mouse has had cancer modified with a luminescent tag. On the left, you can see the pictures of the cancer going away with CDH401, which is also shown at the bottom line of the chart on the right. I'm a stem cell guy. I pioneered in vitro fertilization in the 1980s that have been used successfully for over a million couples worldwide. I led a $3 billion fund in the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and I founded the Australian Stem Cell Center. I started Cartherix in 2015, and this was by far the most revolutionary technology I've seen in the last 30 years. There's the right technology, right time, right team, a chance to change cancer therapy. We live for these opportunities and our platform is now delivering the results. 
So briefly, how does it work? Cartherics uses stem cells to create immune cells that attack tumors. We genetically insert a receptor called a CAR onto our stem cells and then alter the stem cells to become natural killer cells. A CAR targets a specific antigen on the membranes of the tumor cells, programming the natural killer to attack and kill the cancer. Today, the CAR T immunocell approach has FDA approval for blood cancers. However, no one is advancing this therapy for ovarian cancer or other solid tumors, which is where CARTHERIX comes in. By starting with stem cells, we solve many of the problems that haunt existing CAR Ts, making our therapy more clinically and commercially valuable. Existing CAR T treatments face limited availability, high costs, complex manufacturing, and there are patient side effects. They are autologous. They take the immune cells from the patient, modify them, and put them back. Our process is allogeneic. We manufacture cells outside the patient. Our stem cell sources material is unlimited, meaning we can scale up manufacturing with bigger and bigger bioreactors. The cells are screened to prevent serious side effects. Our process means less time and lower costs. A cartherix treatment is a fraction of the cost of, of, of existing therapies. Cartherix has licensed two products to date. Investors in this round will benefit from the milestone license payments at no additional cost. This raise advances the ovarian cancer therapy and the pipeline, one by one advancing products towards license or acquisition. We're solely focused on the development of new treatments for solid cancers, providing another tool in the fight against cancer. One last slide to recap our plans for this capital raise. We're raising 10 to $20 million. Our target to an IND for CDH401 is one year, completing phase one and 2A clinical trials in 2026. Then do a deal to generate liquidity for shareholders and yield a significant return. Cartherix represents a great opportunity to get in early on a new cancer therapy, saving lives and yielding great returns. Thanks for taking the time to learn about Cartherix and hope to hear from you soon. Hello, my name is Stephen Crozier, CEO at Reenergize. We're developing a pumped hydro-like energy storage solution called High Density Hydro, which is low cost and globally scalable. Our aim is to facilitate massive growth in zero carbon renewable energy and to create firm and stable power grids from renewables. We all know the world is increasingly seeing the damaging effects of climate change. We know that there is a solution in the form of renewable energy, and we know that the problem with renewable energy is that of intermittency. We also know that the only solution to intermittency is long duration energy storage. Reenergize call our long duration energy storage solution high density hydro. It is based on traditional pumped hydro energy storage, which is commercially proven over decades. However, traditional pumped hydro suffers from lack of sites, environmental challenges, evaporation and water abstraction. But most importantly, the time to consent and construct projects, which is measured in decades. This means it is not a solution for the climate emergency. Reenergizes high density hydro uses a high density fluid, increasing the energy density in a closed loop system. This enables deployment on hills rather than mountains, which means there are tens of thousands of more sites. Suddenly, we have a scalable pumped hydro-like solution that addresses all of the constraints of traditional pumped hydro. Reenergize delivers best-in-class economics, a solution that is fast to deploy, fast to consent, and can be implemented globally. Projects are grid scale with 10 to 100 megawatts of power and durations of 4 to 16 hours. A solution to remove gigatons of CO2 over decade long timescales. Reenergized projects can be installed on small hills found nearly everywhere. This is what a typical site might look like, not massive projects in protected mountainous areas. Exponential growth in energy storage demand driven by adoption of renewables is predicted. 
Different commentators give different estimates, but all state the market is going to become huge and grow rapidly. Predictions include global annual market increasing tenfold by 2030 and that the market may be worth $4 trillion by 2040. In every country we look, we find tens of thousands of site opportunities. There are more than enough sites to meet the needs of the energy transition several times over. Reenergize are receiving inquiries from across the world. We have two memorandums of understanding and one letter of intent signed in the UK, Chile and Australia. And our project pri pipeline stands at £500 million. Reenergize benefits from over £11 million of non-dilutive capital via grants, the largest of which is an eight and a quarter million pound contract. Using methodologies developed by the consultancies Jacobs and academics from Imperial College, we can see that high density hydro is highly competitive with all other energy storage solutions and a strong competitive position with no known competitors developing similar technology, a growing patent portfolio and know-how to provide IP defensibility clear competitive advantage of a high density hydro versus other technologies for long duration energy storage. The technology is being scaled up and de-risked. We benefit from an existing global supply chain. The company has an expert team of 25 and extensive testing facilities. Reenergize was founded by three serial entrepreneurs. We are growing our senior management team and rapidly increasing diversity. Our team includes five PhDs, a chartered accountant, two MBAs and many master's degrees. Where does our money come from and how are we using it? The vast majority of our funds, three quarters, come from grants and contracts. We have a strong cash position and are seeking three million pounds of investment today from a cohort of pre-series A investors. 720,000 has already closed. Don't delay speak to us now. We plan to use funds to complete our demonstration project to extend the R&D towards a fully commercial solution to strengthen our IP portfolio, creating a diverse IP moat across all critical subsystems and to further develop commercial traction. We believe returns for early investors could easily exceed 20 times your investment. Thank you for your time and please get in touch if you're interested in an investment discussion. Thank you. Hello, I'm Stephen Crocher, CEO of Reenergize, and we're developing a long duration energy storage solution called High Density Hydro. Reenergize's mission is to solve the problem of net zero power grids, matching renewable energy's low cost intermittent supply with variable demand. Our thanks go out to our existing supporters who have enabled us to make the progress which has resulted in inquiries from across the world. Now we'd like to invite you to invest so we can further engage with potential customers to capitalize on these commercial opportunities. Let's hear from Lizzie Gold, who is currently in Chile on behalf of Reenergize. Across the world, we're experiencing the damaging effects of climate change, which has led to a huge surge in renewable energy. Here in Chile, that surge in renewable energy has led to a huge demand for long duration energy storage. Energy storage is one of the largest challenges and therefore a huge opportunity facing society as we seek to undergo the critical energy transition. Next, we're here from Dr. Tamas Patani, our Chief Technology Officer at Reenergize in Montreal, Canada, about our own response to the challenge. High Density Hydro uses our in-house developed secret sauce, a non-toxic high density fluid, which is two and a half times denser than water. Like conventional pumped hydro storage, our fluid is exchanged between an upper and lower storage tank. Low cost, clean renewable energy pumps the fluid up waiting to be released as demand and energy prices rise. And at that point, the fluid flows down the pipe and through our turbines, designed specifically for the high density fluid, regenerating electricity to supply power to consumers. 
Replacing water with a high density fluid allows a significant reduction in the required vertical elevation for the same performance. Our location suits small hills, not mountains, opening up a vast number of potential new sites. Despite providing long-term energy security, traditional pumped hydro at current rates of deployment cannot scale to meet the needs of the energy transition. Eligible sites are too few and in the wrong places, and it can take more than 10 years to plan, develop, and construct. Reenergize addresses these challenges with the target to maintain the same round-trip efficiency of 80%. At Reenergize in London, Sophie Orm, our commercial director, will tell us about our current opportunities. To support the energy transition, analysts forecast that more than 30% of new power capacity will need to come from energy storage. We believe this makes a great fit for HD Hydro, which will compete with batteries but will last longer with 40% lower levelised costs and with the potential for fewer end-of-life liabilities. Energy storage is a huge $4 trillion global opportunity. Our business model is to partner and license our technology to enable rapid rollout and scale. We've signed a letter of intent with an Australian developer to build out a program of modular HD hydro to replace a coal power station in Queensland. We've signed a memorandum of understanding with Coal Boon, a Chile-based energy utility. The Chilean government has committed $2 billion of support for energy storage rollout from 2024. And in the UK, we've signed another MOU with Mercia Power Response, who we'll hear from now. We see enormous potential for Re-Energizer's high-density hydro as a low-carbon replacement for things like gas-powered assets. As an engineer, what I really like about this solution is that they use existing technologies in a really clever way to ensure a greater possibility of success. And before we finish, let's hear from Graham Cook, CFO, about growth and the financial support secured so far. Reenergize has continued to drive company growth since its founding in 2019. Reenergize raised circa 3.4 million pounds in private investment and is currently working on projects supported by nine and a quarter million pounds of public funding. We now have 24 employees and continue to accelerate hiring of both engineering and commercial talent. Should we prove successful, even a 3% share of the projected market size of $4 trillion would be worth $120 billion. Our technical progress has been consistently delivering against the plan. A recent milestone has been a completion of the detailed design of the 500 kilowatt HD turbine which has now entered manufacturing. And the Lotus demonstration project is more than halfway complete, with all long lead time orders placed. We have a great team, an innovative solution and a huge potential market. Our aim is to provide a clean, scalable solution and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Please invest today. Thank you. Hi there, I'm McKenna, and after successfully building out trading teams at leading financial institutions, I was fortunate enough to found Odom Group. I'm here to take you through our journey and our growth plans. And the first thing people think when they hear the word crypto is giant companies failing, complex terminology and an opaque structure. Odom is a purely technology driven trading company which seeks to profit from short-term mispricings in the market, whether the market rises or whether it falls. We have survived significant market turbulence where far larger companies have not. And we're generating superior returns for our clients in the meantime. We're here to do things differently, and that means doing things properly. But let me put that in perspective. 
Odom Research decided to be audited from day one without legal requirement, as well as getting regulated in the UK without any requirement either. This is because integrity, accountability and transparency are our core values. We know that this hasn't always been the case with crypto giants, and that's precisely why we're here to go against the grain. A couple of years ago, we raised $3 million in an oversubscribed equity round at a $12.25 million valuation. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither were our revenue streams. It took 18 months of intense research and development and incredible work ethic from the team to bring our algorithms to a state of maturity and revenue generation. On the back of this huge success with our client portfolio, we are now seeking capital to grow our revenue streams whilst further enhancing our product edge. Odom's revenue drivers in the short term are simple. Firstly, we generate trading returns with our own capital where we've achieved over 40% annualized returns since July. The second is managing client money. Since August, our clients have increased their allocations in Odom from 40K to over a million in a matter of weeks. We started with one client and now we have four. And I think the charts demonstrate why. We've achieved annualized returns of over 41% since the summer with low volatility. Our 2024 vision and path to Series A is simple. Grow our capital base, firstly via an equity round of $3 million, and secondly, via a client AUM up to $25 million without taking on significant cost. With our returns and fees, we project over $4 million in revenues over 2024. Our clients have already told us that they have appetite for eight to $20 million and we have received interest from several more. We believe our strategies scale because we can scale across many coins and exchanges that we don't currently touch and still be well under half a percent of the markets we trade. At Odom, we're proud to call ourselves Crypto Winter Survivors. And anyone that's been in this space for a while will know that that is no easy feat. We've navigated away from heavy losses despite facing counterparty risk to some of the largest companies in crypto. For example, we pulled money out of FTX in good time. We have also avoided any exposure to the lunar collapse. All the while, we even underwent a management team restructure and a failed merger attempt. Resilience and learning from mistakes is in the blood of Odom's team and the company at large. We have shown time and again that we can turn challenges into opportunities to grow and develop because we're here to stay. Opportunity to participate in the revenue generation of automated trading companies because usually the doors close very early to outside investment as they scale. An investment in Odom's seed round provides precisely that opportunity, as well as an opportunity to be at the forefront of trading technology and innovation whilst earning healthy returns along the way, in the right way. I thank you very much for listening and I look forward to speaking with you soon. Hello, I'm Florent Gross, the CEO of Payothea. We are an Irish company with a site in France near Basel, and we have acquired a drug from Novartis that was developed under collaboration with Curin. It's a novel S1P receptor drug called Bocavimod, which has been tested already in 400 subjects by Novartis. We have now initiated a global phase three dosing and enrolling patients. The drug is administrated as a single dose daily over one year, 
And the, and the disease we are targeting is acute myeloid lymphoma or AML. And the therapy is really given as a maintenance therapy post stem cell transplantation. The primary endpoint of the clinical trial is relapse-free survival, which will open a registration process of the drug in Europe, US, and Japan. The commercial potential of Mokravimod is simply huge, well over a billion. And by 2025, when we will deliver the RFS primary endpoints, we can unlock about the NPV value of 10 billion. In addition to the faith free clinical study, we have tested also whether this drug could uh, have any benefit in county models. And the data we obtained from different academic centers were very good. Uh, we see a significant reduction of CRS and increase of cancer killing and increase of survival in mice. And for this reason, we have submitted a CTA in Germany to initiate an exploratory trial in large B-cell lymphoma patients and the first patient dosing should happen this year. We are in a Series B financing, hoping to close by June or July. You are welcome to learn about the company and contact me. Me is a dynamic company making waves in the realm of avatar technology and innovation. About 3D Me, established in 2015, 3D Me Limited is a private UK-based enterprise that has been pioneering the way forward in the virtual try-on technology landscape for online garment purchases. For a startup, what sets 3D Me apart is its structure, including a wholly owned subsidiary in Bangkok, Thailand, dedicated to software development. This strategic move leveraged the diverse engineering and artistic talent pool and innovative capabilities present in the Asian regional market while keeping everything in-house. With offices strategically positioned in both London and Bangkok, 3DME maximizes its global presence. The London office serves as the headquarters, facilitating commercial planning, marketing and sales strategy while the Bangkok office is the hub for innovation and development of our core technology, TDM avatars. 3DME has a vibrant and growing team of 15 professionals. This talented team drives the company's mission, collaborating seamlessly across borders to deliver innovative solutions and top-tier services. True Representation At 3DME, our core technology, TDM avatars, serve as your digital twin. Imagine owning an online representation of yourself that is accurate in measurement and detailed in features down to the last pixel. Initially 3DME has decided to focus on the online retail market sector. What sets TDM avatars apart is their application in revolutionizing the shopping experience, particularly for clothing. With these avatars, you can dress yourself virtually in various garments before making a purchase. TDM avatars empower you to evaluate clothing virtually for fit and suitability. Gone are the days of uncertainty regarding online purchases. This technology ensures that what you see virtually aligns perfectly with reality. Each detail in a TDM avatar is meticulously created to ensure accuracy. TDM avatars redefine the online shopping landscape, offering a personalized, immersive and reliable way to experience fashion and make informed choices. The problem. 3DME development of TDM avatars addresses a large problem in the fashion industry and for online retailers which is the issue of a high return rate. The impact of returns on the economy, environment and sustainability is staggering. Did you know that 93% of returned clothing is due to incorrect sizing or fit? In the UK, the value of clothing and footwear returns is projected to soar by 5.8% to reach £4.4 billion by 2026, up from £4.2 billion. This growing trend of returns culture highlights the substantial economic implications to retailers' bottom lines. 
However, it's not just an economic issue. Returns in the fashion industry carry an alarming environmental cost. Did you know that returns generate five times more carbon dioxide emissions than the initial purchase? With reverse logistics, returns are costly for retailers and thus are likely to end up in landfills or be incinerated rather than checked, cleaned, and restocked. In response to growing demand for sustainability, diverse legislation is on the horizon for the fashion sector. As the fashion industry faces this imminent wave of sustainability legislation, it is essential for businesses to proactively adopt eco-friendly practices, embrace transparency, and innovate towards a more sustainable future. The returns predicament in the fashion industry isn't just an economic burden. It's a substantial environmental and sustainable challenge. It's imperative for us to find innovative solutions to minimize returns, ensuring both economic, environmental and sustainability responsibility. The solution. So what is the solution to the issue of fashion retailers' returns? TDM avatars are not just ordinary avatars, they're exact digital twins, boasting 1-2% to accurate measurements of the customer. From skin tone and hairstyle to body shape, these avatars mirror the customer's exact image, enabling precise size recommendations for a perfect fit. Beyond static images, TDM avatars incorporate animation and associated garment dynamics and animation. This allows for lifelike visualizations of how clothing interacts with the body, providing an immersive and accurate representation of the clothes' fit and movement. By offering accurate visualization and precise size recommendations, TDM avatars significantly mitigate fashion returns. Studies suggest that virtual try-on can reduce return rates by at least 20% simultaneously increasing sales by 4 to 10 percent. Moreover, by curbing returns, TDM avatars play a crucial role in reducing associated environmental costs. The decrease in return shipments translates to lower greenhouse gas emissions and a decreased need for landfills, aligning seamlessly with sustainability concerns and forthcoming legislation. Coming up is a demo video of our virtual try-on technology, TDM avatars, and our capabilities. TDM introduces our core technology, TDM avatars. Step 1. Users will take a quick video of them slowly rotating 360 degrees for 10 seconds, pausing slightly every 90 degrees. For the most accurate results, they should wear form-fitting clothing and stand in front of a clear background. Step 2. The video is to be uploaded onto our system. Step 3. The user's measurement will be available in just seconds. Step 4. During this time the user's avatar will be automatically generated from the video provided in their exact image. Step 5. With the user's personalized avatar, they can bring their style to life. Try on virtual garments and see the perfect color and style in their image. Users can choose different items, in their correct size changing the color based on what they believe suits them best. With our animation presets and real-time cloth simulation, the users can easily visualize how the garments would look on them in various ranges of motion, such as idle, sitting, and catwalk. They are also able to save the image and share on their chosen social media platforms. View their wish list. And also their cart. Our system is compatible for both female and male avatars. Step 6. Once users have selected their items, they can go to their shopping cart and purchase them directly, having the correct sizing automatically derived to match their measurements. Step 7. Finally, there is the option of taking the personalized avatar of themselves into the metaverse, allowing for an immersive shopping experience. Funding 
For this funding round 3DME is seeking £800,000 of funding for 20% equity in order to complete TDM avatar technology with a minimal viable product, MVP, and scale to meet client demand. So far £320,000 has been pledged. This funding round will end on the 30th of April 2024. We are providing investors the option and right to invest an equal amount. They invested in this round within one year of the investment date at the same terms. 3DME is fully EIS compliant. Contact us at info at 3DME.com or visit our website to learn more at www.3dme.com and follow us at at 3dme across our social media platforms for more updates on TDM avatars. Hi, my name is Burish. I'm the founder and CEO of Scooch. After leading a human wellness technology company for eight years, Rio joined our family. We felt that he instantly became one of our babies, and we also realized we're not alone. Millions and millions of households around the world consider their pets as their family. And 12 developed countries actually have more households with pets than kids, which is crazy to think about. The majority of the new pet parents are actually young generation. I quickly realized Pets cannot tell you how they feel, so taking care of them is mostly guesswork, which causes most preventable conditions to be unnoticed for years before they become serious and costly. And many pet parents out there are heavily reliant on the old school pet healthcare market, which is reactive, old school and costly, and a black box experience, which is not built for today's generations of time poor tech savvy pet parents out there. That's why, I decided to utilize my experience in wellness and personalization technology to create Scooch, an all-in-one pet health subscription with a mission to take guesswork out of pet care. It has been a phenomenal ride so far. We have established strong traction with positive unit economics. Last year alone, we grew by 8x, achieving 1 million pounds in annualized revenue, 10xing our subscriber growth, with positive unit economics. We managed to assemble a world-class founding team, received FCA approval for our upcoming pet insurance product, won the best pet tech of 2023, and been selected among the top 100 new startups in the UK for 2024. Now let's talk about how Scooch works. It's an online platform. You come and complete a virtual checkup to identify any potential conditions, and the Scooch web app gives you a, a quick snapshot of the health and well-being of your dog. And if it identifies any health concerns, it will tell you to have a deeper look into that problem domain and give you more insights. We utilize this data together with, uh, with, with our propriety uh, health score, um, utilizing LLMs and generative AI to give you personalized insights uh, and recommendations. Our AI assistant is named after my dog, Rio, uh, helps you triage uh, and address any concerns or issues you uh, have with the health and well-being of your dog, learns from the conversations you have uh, with the assessments you complete and gets better and better in time. We also provide access to 24-7 video veterinary service through our subscription so that you never feel alone. In addition to our AI-enabled digital features, we also provide two fundamental ranges of propriety treatments so that we can actually uh, tackle burning issues pet parents are uh, suffering from. These are essential healthcare products that are recommended for all dogs for preventive uh, care. But we also have targeted treatments that are uh, specifically uh, formulated uh, by us for targeting the biggest pain points uh, in pet healthcare. These are best-in-class products and they come with best-in-class margins. We have 87% gross margin on majority of our best-selling products, which enable our business to become very profitable. They are human-grade, natural and plant-based, which is uh, 
basically giving us marketing superiority over the competition, but dogs love it and our pet parents also love it because it solves their issues. We're building a digital pet health co-pilot to eliminate the guesswork in pet, pet care you know, from puppyhood to elderly. In the next phase, we will be introducing a pet insurance product and also introduce larger integration with uh, medical history documents, DNA testing kits, and smart collar devices around uh, that enable a collection of ambient data from your pet's health behavior. So we can actually uh, offer a digital health passport for our customers in the future. As I mentioned, we already received our FCA approval to launch our insurance product. We are going to utilize our health data and AI to reward preventative care. And we have amazing plans uh, for our insurance product, uh, which is coming soon. In essence, Scooch enables the customer to diagnose, treat and prevent any painful pet health issues from the comfort of their home. And we know that we will be able to help millions and millions of uh, pet parents out there. We're predominantly a subscription based business. We have two main subscription products at the moment with new tiers of membership coming very soon. Our starter plan gives you access to Scooch Health, which is a digital only experience that gives you the health um, a profile and AI enabled features and 24 seven video veterinary. And our premium package gives access to both our uh, Scooch Health product, but also Scooch treatments that deal with any burning pet health issues uh, that the pet parents are suffering from. So you have also a physical product delivered to your door. This is an amazing recession proof market already huge and booming. It's accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic and it's a great place. UK is a great place to start a business in this space because it's the third largest market in the world with majority of households having already a pet. So it's dear to millions of people out there. And it's a great place to scale the business internationally in the future as well. Pet tech in particular, which is something we're more excited about, is the fast growing subcategory within the larger pet space. And this makes it a very compelling and big opportunity market. And in this amazing market, there are lots of businesses, lots of interesting things happening because people basically love their pets and spend a lot of money for them. But Scooch is creating something truly unique, a new category, the new front door for modern pet healthcare, which is holistic, seamless, digitized, data-driven, and fully integrated, which is different to anything out there. We have an amazing team of technology, product, and growth uh, operators. I started my career 24 years uh, ago at Unilever, scaling big consumer brands like Lipton, uh, building the fastest growing tea business in the world, achieving global awards for my marketing work, and then building a new generation agency, working with the likes of Unilever, Pepsi, scaling many other consumer brands and uh, building a award-winning organization, and then later merge it with one of the biggest conglomerates in the space, Hawass Worldwide, and then stumbled, my, uh, uh, stumbled up myself into technology world. Uh, building uh, very high-end compute devices uh, and some other uh, businesses. But most uh, recently and most relevantly, uh, I built a AI-powered personalized wellness technology company, Fitwell, for the last eight years of my career before Scooch. We scaled it into a couple of million registered members around the world, and it was selected best of App Store and Play Store many times globally. Misha, our chief product officer, joined us from Fresher where he was head of product. He also worked at amazing companies like Revolut, Reich and Veely where he had product leadership experience, but also he has a data science background. Rafa, our CTO, is a full stack developer with 26 years experience, a former founder, worked in Silicon Valley uh, at very reputable companies. And most recently he was head of engineering at Motorway, a unicorn company. Mia, our growth marketing manager, also a former founder, has experience working with direct-to-consumer startups in the past. We have two very talented full-stack developers. Uh, we are a very small team, 
but we are very agile and achieved so much with so little. We're building a fundamentally strong business. Lifetime value is very important for us and we have been driving for our lifetime value as we improve our product experience and it's already visible with our results. We are seeing strong data that cohorts of our customers are spending up to thousands pounds, thousand pounds already on the platform, 50xing lifetime value to cost of acquisition balance, which is a very amazing early signal to see. And following the launch of our AI enabled app, we have seen our lifetime value to double in the last six months, which is very exciting to see. Our investors include Founders Factory, which has been very helpful, but also 50 founders and uh, CEOs of very established tech companies in the UK and European ecosystem. We're raising a 1.3 million round, half of which is already committed, and this is EIS eligible for UK investors. We're going to use the funds to launch insurance product, grow our team, accelerate user acquisition and prepare for international expansion. We would love if you become an investor. It's a huge and growing market. We have a proven team. We have been executing like a boss with profitable unit economics, and we have been already recognized among one of the leaders in our category. And we've had some amazing investors so far who have uh, helped the business strategically as well. I hope you like Scooch. Please reach out if you have any questions, and we would love to see you as a valued investor. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ansu Supo, and I am the founder and CEO of Azatron. Today, it is a very tough time to be the CEO of a company. The market conditions are not only tough, but it also is dynamic and fluid. New competition is emerging all the time, while social media can make or break a company. Many CEOs understand that to survive, they must implement AI and data analytics across both the cyber and physical environments. The IT departments do not fully understand this new AI world nor do the existing suppliers. They turn to consultants and software development companies to assist them. However, these projects take very long and are also very expensive. They also do not provide the desired outcomes as consultants also do not have the required skills and capabilities required in this new digital world. These consultants also take a fragmented view of implementing IoT, data analytics, AI, and and automation in isolation from each another, missing the big picture. The solution to this dilemma is to create a toolbox with various tools to enable organizations to rapidly adopt AI-driven solutions and automation across their physical and cyber operations. The toolbox must support open standards, hybrid cloud deployments, providing seamless integration between IoT and edge devices, internal IT and OT systems, and a centralized AI-driven data analytics platform that collects data from across the silos in an organization. Building this toolbox is not easy, as the organization will need a diverse set of skills, capabilities, and have a deep understanding of new technologies while also having an appreciation for the complexities of large organizations, processes, and systems. Well, Azotron is extremely unique in what it brings to the market. Our consulting division interacts with large enterprises, and this enables Azotron to ensure our solutions are relevant to what is required in industry. Our experience in building large complex solutions coupled with our decades of experience in data analytics, combined with the research and development we have done in the IoT and AI fields, have enabled Azotron to build an AI enablement toolbox that makes it very simple 
for organizations of all sizes to implement AI-driven processes and operations within their businesses. We have a B2B approach for large enterprises and a B2B to B or C model for customers who want to use our technology to deliver AI and automation solutions to their customers. The AI toolkit consists of the IoTAS platform that enables Azertron to deploy AI-driven IoT devices to automate physical operations and environments. Our AI data analytics as a service solution called ADIS enables Azertron to provide data analytics as a service to customers. The IoTAS and the ADIS platforms you use the Azertron Deep Learning Platform to deliver AI-driven solutions to businesses. Azertron has already deployed and developed thousands of APIs interface and interfaces into OSS and DSS systems, as well as external sources such as social media platforms, news feeds, and other external data sources. An example of one of the quick deployments using the toolkit was Centec. Centec requested Azertron to build an AI-driven smart state poll. Our team built a the fully functional poll within two weeks using the Azertron toolkit. This would have been impossible to do without this toolkit. The poll was demonstrated at the Africa Comp, and we have had several additional customers globally interested in the poll. These global customers include the Dubai Municipality, Salam from Saudi Arabia, the Iswatini government, the South African Defense Force for border management and control, and various commercial farms for farm security. Another use case is MTN. MTN is the largest telco in Africa. One of the divisions had to cut their operational budget by 30% and were forced to relook at their current operations. Azotron had previously presented our AI toolkit to MTN and we were asked to come back in and showcase how AI can help MTN reduce its OPEX. Within three months, we identified where AI can assist as well as provided a solution to MTN that halved the current OPEX for the chosen use case. The speed at which Azertron did this, combined with the low cost point, really impressed the customer where now more work is being identified for Azertron to do. There are many such cases as Centec and MTN. Here are some of the other examples outlined in this slide. Uh, our customer base and partner base is growing rapidly. And this is reflective both in our pipeline for our business as well as the growth of our market. Azotron has many competitors. However, none of them have combined digital technologies into a de uh, deployable toolkit like Azotron has done. We find that our competitors compete with us only in certain different parts of our toolkit and not the entire toolkit. Hyperscalers also have been talking to us about partnerships to take our our solutions and toolkits into their customers. Azotron is a multi-award winning company that is recognized globally as an innovative technology startup that has been accepted into the UK government's prestigious global entrepreneurship program, as well as being identified as one of the top 20 technology startups by the telecommunications industry. Azotron has a small, a strong team of executives to ensure business success, resilience, and growth. All of the members of our exco have worked with each another in the past and have built a fantastic working relationship as an exco to meet the growing demands of Azotron. Through their leadership, we have developed a very creative and innovative culture within Azotron. The business has been bootstrapped up to this point by myself. Azotron has generated in excess of $12 million of revenue to date. We have a very strong pipeline, which is already exceeding our own financial projections. 
The increase in demand for our services, coupled with the fact that we are now expanding globally, is necessitating the need for the business to raise external capital. Our projected revenues were based on our current growth in revenues while factoring, factoring in our global expansion program, uh, plans. This year, our current opportunities are exceeding even our own projections, and this is now placing huge demands on our capacity to deliver. We are raising $3.2 million in this funding round with a minimum buy-in of $32,000. Uh, $32, Based on the discussions we have been having, it is very likely that the business will be bought out by a hyperscaler software vendor or telco. Already AWS has invested $250,000 into the development of our solutions. Microsoft and Microsoft, Google, Oracle are already talking to us about funding the migration of our solutions into their cloud stacks so that we can take our solutions to their customers as well. Splunk has identified Azotron as one of its few partners to further develop solutions on their Edge Hub solution. A telco in South Africa is funding some of our R&D projects with a view to buy us out in the future. So these are just some of the examples already that we're experiencing of interest in the buyout of Azotron. Here are some of the events that we took part in last year. These events have unlocked huge opportunities and potential for new business for us. Thank you for your time today. My name is Ansa Sufo. Let's build the future together. Hello, my name is Barry Sharples and I'm the Executive Chairman of Microgen. I'm Steve Ray, I'm Chief Scientific Officer here at Microgen. And as a way of background, Microgen has developed a platform technology using stem cells of various types to produce secretory factors, molecules which are made naturally by the stem cells, which have the potential to treat the major root causes of degenerative diseases and also age-related dysfunction. So this work has occupied most of my research career for the last 35 years. And over that time, we've managed to translate some of this approach actually to produce bespoke treatments for a variety of leading athletes, including boxers, American football stars, ice hockey players, soccer players, and indeed the very wealthy. And that's how me and Steve met. And uh, I had a degenerative condition which I was treated for. And uh, when I asked Steve who he was treating, and he explained it was uh, wealthy individuals and uh, top sports people, I, did, I naturally asked, what about everybody else? And he explained to me uh, what was needed. And I said, if this works for me, I'd really like to help you um, get this out to, to more people. And so we established Microgen. It did work for me, incidentally. And uh, we established my, Microgen in 2015 to democratise a bespoke treatment into an off-the-shelf product that could address the root causes of diseases for as many people as possible. And we'd now like to play just a very short video, which hopefully will summarise the science behind this process. Multipotent stem cells have the unique ability to differentiate into specialised cells, and they also produce bioactive substances which are collectively known as a secretome. A secretome includes paracrine factors such as microRNA, exosomes, microvesicles, cytokines, anti-inflammatory factors, and growth factors. The secretome is believed to be responsible for much of what has to date been attributed to whole stem cells in terms of repair and regeneration. Challenges with current stem cell therapies include difficulties with allogenic manufacturing and upscaling. 
the need for expensive tissue matching to avoid graft versus host disease, the limited doubling potential and the limited lifespan and regenerative capacity of adult stem cells. Microgen has made great strides in overcoming these challenges. Our proprietary manufacturing process allows the mass production of a new class of Secretome-based therapeutic, Secretomix. MRG1061 is a novel investigational Secretomix being developed by Microgen. It is cell-free, thus reducing the risk of graft versus host disease and the need for expensive tissue matching. Within the body, the secretomics modulates a multitude of signaling pathways to ultimately improve regeneration of tissues and cells. Secretomics-induced regeneration and repair is multifactorial and results in increased cellular proliferation, growth of certain blood vessels, and reduction of inflammation. MRG1061 is a novel, first-in-class, allogeneic and scalable regenerative product that has shown positive results in preclinical studies. Such benefits may translate into other diseases that share a similar pathology, presenting an attractive pipeline of opportunities. So on establishing the company, we built a team of key opinion leading scientists and uh, successful business executives and life science executives who have translated research through to uh, the clinic uh, on many occasions and have founded companies to sale and to IPO and also uh, handled multi-billion dollar transactions in the life science industry. Our in-house research programmes are also complemented by various research collaborations with university laboratories and hospitals, not only here in the UK, but also in the US and Canada. And this includes a variety of medical conditions where the root causes can be helped by this approach. We've worked on muscle degenerative disease, neurodegenerative diseases, which is my own specialist area, as well as digestive tract issues. And this includes diseases which affect children. And we're very fortunate to work with Toronto Sick Children's Hospital in Canada on two very advanced research programmes for specific children's diseases. And we'd now like to play a second video, which would actually summarise some of this work that we collaborate with in Canada. Breathing is essential to life. As with every breath, the body is replenished and cleansed, a process made possible by the lungs. Every year, in the US and Canada alone, almost 2,000 babies are born with lungs that are too small for them to breathe properly. Tragically, half of these babies die and the other half has severe difficulty breathing. These babies suffer from a condition called congenital diaphragmatic hernia, or CDH, as they are born with a hole in the diaphragm the muscle that separates the chest from the belly. So the organs that are supposed to live in the belly, such as the intestines, slip up through the hole into the chest and squash the lungs to a point that they don't have enough room to grow. Even when we do surgery to close the hole in the diaphragm and return the bowels into the belly, the lungs remain way too small. We all agree that a therapy for these tiny lungs is desperately needed. Once the baby is born, it's too late to make the lungs grow. The good thing is that nowadays, we can recognize these babies with CDH before birth with a simple ultrasound scan. So we all agree that the ideal timing to intervene on these lungs is when the baby is still in the mom's womb. However, many research groups have tried, but none of the treatments tested so far has been successful. I'm very excited to tell you that we think we have found the solution in the amniotic fluid. For years, we've been studying stem cells from the amniotic fluid and we have now demonstrated that they release small droplets called exosomes that can make these tiny lungs grow bigger. Exosomes are like postmen who carry messages from a cell to another. They're released by old cells, but those coming from the amniotic fluid are special as they can regenerate organs like the lungs of a baby. 
In fact, they carry a message made of genetic material, the so-called microRNAs, molecules that tell the recipient lung cells to restart growing. When in our studies we gave exosomes to tiny lungs, we observed that they restarted growing and functioning like normal. When we colored the exosomes to see where they were going, we found them inside the lung cells and saw that they released their cargo. This caused the lungs to make more and more of the molecules that help us breathe like surfactant. And we saw that the treated lungs were more mature as they had more specialized cells. I'm very excited because this is the first fetal therapy using exosomes. Our study opens avenues to test the use of these exosomes for other congenital anomalies. This means increasing the chances for millions of babies to survive and live a normal life. As you can see, this is proper impact investing. If we get this right, with your help, we could make a real difference. The directors, personal contacts, and also medical professionals have invested to date. And we now want to accelerate our work and uh, get closer to commercialization. And for the first time, we're excited to open up this investment opportunity uh, to you uh, on the wholesale investor platform and we've got a full data room established where you can uh, access information on the company and if you'd like to email me with any questions or queries I'd be very very um, uh, happy to help. Thank you. Hi there, I'm John and I'm glad to be speaking with you today about our childcare real estate fund. We're part of a niche sector in an area that not a lot of people know about or understand. And that's why we have a lucrative window of opportunity to get fantastic returns for our investors. We are targeting a 20 to 23% IRR for your investment per project over a seven year fund term. So for the next five minutes, I'll share with you the opportunity and talk a little bit about our team and strategy and show why this investment could work for you. And just a little bit about myself and the partners to explain what qualifies me to speak to you today. I'm the co-founder of the startup property development company, Devio. In the past two years, our startup acquired five childcare sites around Australia with a projected end value of 38 million. We wanted to share this opportunity with other like-minded investors through a fund. So we partnered up with Richard Toe from Childcare Developer, a seasoned operator with 18 years experience in childcare and property development, with completed project worth of over 300 million. Our unique edge is that we have personal experience in both aspects of this setup. Along with the property development, I'm an approved provider for childcare services and Richard also has decades of experience in childcare operations. So we can bring these two fields together. Our team has navigated this sector successfully over multiple cycles. So you can have the confidence that our projects will be marketable and profitable every single time. Okay, so why childcare then? Why are we getting excited about it? Well, I'm fortunate enough to have kids on my own and be in the life stage where childcare is part of my everyday world. For Australians, childcare as a service is as essential as they come. Kids benefit from the social aspects and education and parents benefit because it allows them to work and to contribute outside the family home. Luckily for us, the Australian government subsidizes childcare fees up to 90% cover in many cases. So for families, it's a literal no brainer. Kids go to childcare, it's a fact of life. And arguably the biggest beneficiary of all is the Australian government. The official models show that the recent $1.7 billion increase to government childcare subsidies will boost the economy by $1.5 billion a year. That's a pretty nice return on investment. 
Australian governments have a colossal problem that they need to avoid. That is, the potential loss of revenue to the economy, as well as the potential negative social impacts that may follow. So we want to be part of the solution. And this is a massive opportunity now in Australia. And on the other end, childcare businesses are highly profitable. We know the centres we build, the business owners will generate somewhere around $1 million in profits per centre, if not more. Once enrolled, childcare fees are locked in, whether you attend or not. So it's a super reliable income for the operator, and they want to keep this growing. Demand from families is increasing, and demand by operators is increasing. On top of that, the data shows that childcare services are vastly undersupplied around the country. Up to 9 million Australians, over a third of the nation, live in areas of childcare undersupply. It is a highly regulated industry, little understood, and this is where our tremendous opportunity lies. So simple economics, demand is high, supply is low, and government support is increasing. It's not going away anytime soon. We can show you how to profit on this imbalance through property development. Your investment into our fund will help deliver the real estate needed for the childcare operators. Childcare centers are purpose-built facilities. We know which areas are undersupplied and where operators want to build their businesses. Our core strategy will be to purchase potential sites, build and then sell complete onto a commercial landlord. And commercial landlords love childcare tenancies. Long leases of 20 to 30 years are typical and all outgoings are paid by the tenant. Just let that sink in for a moment. 20 plus year leases. That's a very secure source of income for the landlord and this rent increases year on year. So if you're thinking about diversifying your portfolio, please contact us. We'd love to align our values with yours and for you to join our fund. Our development fund is a fantastic way to allocate some of your portfolio towards an opportunistic play with great returns. The childcare industry is one of the most robust sectors that we've seen. Do you currently have any exposure to Australian commercial real estate? This could be the opportunity for you. So if you'd like to know more, let me give you access to our data room. And our data room is going to have all the information from our bios, our thesis and feasibilities, and more on what our private offering is. And then from there, we can follow up with you if you have any more questions. Again, my name is John. I hope to hear from you soon. And thanks for your time. Hi, I'm Mark, CEO of CQ Business Management Software. We offer a comprehensive solution for medium to large sized businesses focusing on the construction and service based industries. In today's landscape, businesses with over 50 employees face a critical challenge, fragmented business management. They juggle with multiple software solutions, leading not only to inefficiencies, but also to tangible issues like project overruns, diminished job profitability and communication breakdowns. This fragmentation escalates operational costs due to numerous software subscriptions and obstructs the flow of integrated business data, crucial for informed decision making. While some companies attempt to develop bespoke systems to address these issues, these solutions often fail to meet the comprehensive needs of managing a large scale business effectively. Businesses often find themselves entangled in a web of software solutions, using four or more for tasks like estimation, project management, HR, communication, time tracking, and lead management. Introducing to you CQ, the all-in-one business management software poised to revolutionize operations for medium to large businesses. By unifying everything into one seamless platform, CQ not only streamlines operations, but also amplifies their efficiency. This integration is the key to our powerful business analytics, offering unprecedented insights by drawing on comprehensive interconnected data. Tailored to meet the dynamic needs of large businesses, CQ leverages this unity to empower smarter, data-driven decision-making, setting a new standard in operational excellence. CQ offers a powerful 
powerful features designed to meet every need of medium to large businesses. Key features include advanced project management, comprehensive lead management, integrated time tracking and timesheets, customizable business analytics, among others, each meticulously designed to enhance efficiency, improve decision making and drive growth. CQ is positioned to tap into a vast market opportunity, initially focusing on the UK and US markets, which together host over 253,000 businesses with 50 plus employees. This represents a significant target market ripe for our integrated business management solution. With business operations growing increasingly complex and the demand for data driven decision making soaring, CQ potential extends globally. CQ's business model is built for scalability and profitability, leveraging a monthly subscription model that caters to our SaaS solutions. Our pricing is set at £50 for the main account and £15 for each additional user, aiming for an average monthly revenue of £1,000 per company. This structure is designed based on an in-depth analysis of our target market's need and spending capacity. Our strategy prioritizes delivering exceptional long-term value, cultivating enduring customer relationships and maximizing lifetime value, positioning CQ for sustained growth and profitability. So comprehensive all-in-one platform. Our platform stands out by offering a comprehensive all-in-one solution, integrating all essential business management tools into a single seamless suite. Advanced data analytics. We deliver unique advanced data analytics, transforming complex data into actionable insights, empowering businesses to make informed decisions. Customizable solutions. Our software is highly customizable, designed to meet the specific needs of medium to large businesses, ensuring a perfect fit for every client. Evolution through feedback. We pride ourselves on continuously evolving our platform based on direct client feedback, ensuring our solution always meets the changing needs of businesses. CQ faces three primary challenges, market penetration and customer acquisition. To overcome this, we're assembling a dedicated digital marketing team focused on leveraging compelling storytelling to highlight our unique value proposition. Scalability and infrastructure. Our solution utilizes cloud-based technology, ensuring scalability with elastic server capacity to support growth seamlessly. Continuous product development and innovation. Innovation is at our core. We employ agile methodologies to continually evolve our system, integrating user feedback to enhance and refine our offerings. These strategies position us to effectively address these challenges, driving growth and ensuring long-term success. Our marketing and sales strategy employs a dynamic, multi-channel approach to maximize reach and impact. We're investing in sales development representatives. Our SDRs will engage in direct outreach, leveraging emails, phone calls and LinkedIn for personalized relationship building. Digital marketing team. We're assembling a digital marketing team dedicated to crafting comprehensive growth funnels. This team will focus on optimizing conversions and strengthening customer relationships through targeted content and engagement strategies. At the heart of our sales process, is a deep understanding of our prospective clients' unique challenges. We tailor our approach with personal demos, informative videos, and clear demonstrations of how CQ directly addresses their pain points, ensuring a solution that's not just effective, but also highly relevant. So leading our team is myself, Mark, with over a decade of experience in web design and development, complemented by a deep understanding of internet marketing. Partnering with me is Richard, who brings over 25 years of invaluable experience from the construction and trade industry. Together, our combined expertise forms the perfect foundation to develop CQ. Additionally, we are supported by a dedicated team in the Philippines, enhancing our development capabilities and ensuring global insights and perspectives. As we look at our forecast and roadmap to success, Our graph here outlines a clear and ambitious trajectory for CQ over the next five years. At year one, our primary focus is on establishing a strong market presence in the UK and US, targeting an initial acquisition of 60 users. 
This year is about laying the foundation with an emphasis on product refinement and building our user base. By year five, our goal is to solidify CQ's position as a leader in the business management software industry with a user base of 769. Our roadmap includes diversifying our product offerings and exploring new markets to ensure sustained growth. Each step of this journey is designed with precision, ensuring that we not only meet but exceed our targets, driving towards a future where CQ becomes synonymous with excellence in business management solutions. We are currently opening an opportunity for investment, seeking £350,000 in exchange for 10% equity in CQ business management software. This capital will be strategically allocated to accelerate our market penetration, enhance product development and expand our team to support our ambitious growth plans. We invite investors who share our vision for revolutionising business management to join us on this journey. We would like to specifically use the money for two SDRs at a cost of £70,000 with a target of four sales each per month. A LinkedIn marketing manager for £60,000 with a target of five sales per month. We need two custom success people at £52,000, two senior teams at £120,000 and six developers at £72,000. In conclusion, CQ Business Management Software represents a unique and timely opportunity to revolutionise the business management software industry. Our comprehensive all-in-one platform addresses critical market needs, offering a scalable solution to the fragmented management systems currently plaguing medium to large businesses. With a clear path to rapid growth and a strategic plan for deployment of funds, we are poised to capture significant market share and deliver robust returns to our investors. We invite you to join us in shaping the future of business management and be part of a venture with the potential for substantial impact and strong financial returns. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Punter. I'm the CEO and founder of iSalvage Limited. I'd like to take a bit of your time today to talk about the uh, proposition, the business so far and our plans for the future. So what is iSalvage? iSalvage was founded to handle the disposal of uh, salvage ethically, efficiently and with a low carbon footprint. So we're talking motor vehicle salvage here, motorcycles, uh, scooters, cars, trucks, vans, you name it. So what, how do we do that? Basically, what it means is that we have a very strong leadership team who are well experienced in this space. We have our technology platform in built in house, which was uh, brought to market this year. And we have our trusted agents across the UK and Northern Ireland who are what we call registered ATFs. They are uh, approved treatment facilities who dispose the vehicles ethically uh, from us as they're dispersed. So a bit about the company, started trading in officially in February 2024. We have an established customer base. We have contracts now that are live and signed. We have work providers coming on board. We have revenue uh, from 1st Feb and we are invoicing currently. So let's look a bit more about how we came about. So in 2023, we set about working with Amber Heights Consulting Limited as a little micro business for iSalvage to investigate the current state of the body of the market and what we could do to disrupt it. And we set about organizing a manual process of dealing with one small provider uh, customer to see what we could do. In that time, we generated sales of around 1.45 million and it was quite clear to us that the market was easily penetrable and there was a lot of change that we could bring from our technology experience and our direction and our, our vision to win. In 2024, saw the launch of iSalvage after its commercial um, uh, kind of setup with the latest technology for the iSalvage Limited platform and also all the associated connectivity we deliver around that. So what are the problems in the marketplace for UK motor salvage? There's no, no choice, basically. Uh, the market has become literally um, blocked by one main provider who, via acquisition and uh, consolidation, have 
become a problem to the marketplace. They provide a solution which has been around for a number of years and change needs to happen. What we see is vehicles going there and they've been dealt with in a model that allows them to make profit regardless of the returns, the money the, the customer gets back, the insurer gets back, regardless of what it's sold for. So there's not really a competitive proposition to use that platform. And complacency, you know, some supply chain we've seen over the last 10 years are supply chain managers and insurers and access managers who have gone along with deals because the big shiny numbers are shown at them. And realistically, it's created a position where everything has come down to um, consolidation. Now they're left with negative news and negative returns. So some vehicles are costing money to be disposed of, which to me is insane. The insurers are spending money with a salvage disposer to dispose of vehicles which are worth money. I can't figure that out. With our proposition, you do not lose money. There's a return or a break-even situation with every vehicle that we supply. So what are our key objectives? Well, we're using Six Sigma. You know, we're a supply uh, service industry and we come from a strong sales background, which I'll touch on in a moment or two. But we use uh, Six Sigma, so we've defined and measured the marketplace. We've analyzed what's happening and we've improved it and bringing control for our customers today with the iSalvage platform, which brings better returns, better money for end users, a better ethical supply chain, more robust, more agile and more scalable. What are our services in this space? So we want to expand as we go along, but this is what we're going to start with. Our technical platform we touched on is iSalvage. iSalvage is a web-based portal which allows interaction with all key stakeholders, whether that be a client, a uh, agent, or our internal team, or even an, an end customer of our customer, an insured or a policy holder. We can dispose of vehicles uh, digitally. We can use V5. Uh, logbook uh, interaction to transfer ownership we check for the uh, finance we check for plate transfers and make sure everything is done correctly before it is ethically disposed all completely cloud-based and live today in operation that looks into linking into all the web auction with our api so we've got feeds in and out of the system that allows us to interact with all the key providers but we also inside have our own ibid platform which is used for fleet customers and people who vehicles are not total loss, where they can't get parts or supply and they look to um, reduce the hire of a vehicle or the term it's in for repair by becoming a total loss because the cost associated with loss of hire means that the cost of the overall claim is higher, really pivotal for our fleet customers and some of our key insurers. And the final proposition is, is the portal.cloud and portal.cloud hooks into all of our agents and all of our providers to offer green parts, green upcycle parts from vehicles that we've already sold into our network as category B or break for bits. Uh, and we're putting that back into supply chain into our links in the insurance industry and repair, which we've been very strong in. And that allows us to compensate for parts that cannot be found in the UK due to supply chain issues, such in conflicts in the Middle East and, and Ukraine and Russia. So we're enabling a faster return on the sale we're enabling a quicker return to customer with the vehicle and we're reducing and mitigating any loss by the insurer what are our marketing strategies well we need to establish uh, our position in the marketplace with key releases to market uh, we are currently uh, well noted from a lot of people see what's going off and, and want to talk to we've got key insurer conversations of people coming to us saying you're doing something a little bit different let's have a conversation see what we can do but we need to grow that proposition we want to attend more events we want to be given sponsorship to to raise our name and profile so people know who we are to become that market leader and we need to continue and focus on involvement industry bodies i myself sit on quite a few steering committees and large industry organizations and you can read more about that in our bio if you go to our section there's links to linkedin that explains exactly where we kind of touch the proposition um, let's then look at the ongoing structure uh, of marketing support so we want to be dropping uh, podcasts and blogs and social media emphasizing that we do things a little bit differently because we go out to market and we look at the proposition from the customer's perspective and look at our application how it works for them and how we can improve our application we're very sort of open to change to make things better so what's the target market in the UK, we currently see around uh, 40 million 
pounds of revenue with the active managers, 80 million pounds with the fleet and claims advisors, and 275 million with the insurers. Now our model operates a little bit different from our competitor because our competitor doesn't actually own the vehicle, they just charge a fee to facilitate the sale. We actually buy the vehicle for a short time and then we sell it onto our agents at an agreed cost on a rate structure basis outside of the bid situation. Uh, what that means is that obviously we're looking at uh, speeding the, the supply chain up for acquisition of the vehicle and helping them through our digital process to, to close the vehicle down much, much more quickly. This does not include the uh, uh, proposition for green parts. That's something we want to develop further down the line, but we see a real strong proposition there to take the double sell. We're selling a vehicle uh, to be broken for bits and they're also selling the bits on the behalf of that vehicle for our, for our agents to allow them to connect into the insurer marketplace. Bit about our core team. Well, our core team is myself, David Punter, I'm the chief exec, and Mick Walker, who is our chief commercial officer. So we have a uh, extensive background in body repair and salvage. Uh, between us, we have around 75 years of experience, which makes me feel very old, but I'm not. Uh, we, uh, in a previous life, worked for Glasses Information Service or Glasses Guide. And we operated something very similar to this called eSalvage, which worked for two insurance companies and disposed of about 35,000 vehicles a year. So we know this is scalable. We know it works. But all we're really looking at now is bringing some really core cool digital applications into the way we find that buyer for that vehicle. Links are in the bios there uh, on the um, presentation, but you can also go to the um, downloadable information and on our share deck as well that's there. So how are we going to do it? Basically, our vision is to become the change in the market which is required to enable equitable transactional business to take place, to reduce waste, mitigate loss, and empower supply chain for repair via digital transformation. Big sentence. What we're really doing is bringing people together. The current situation excludes the marketplace. It puts a, an interrupter in there to take a profit margin for a service that doesn't really bring that massive benefit to all users it's just a connector and a blocker what we're doing is we're looking for the right vehicle for the right uh, buyer uh, via the right seller and then again with the parts we're connecting to people to take the parts off the vehicle we're joining up all the dots in the situation to bring a really strong outcome this is scalable equitable and ethical and that's it, I salvage. It's as straightforward as this. Like I say, we transact at the minute. We'd like to speak to people who are interested in working with us uh, who could bring something to, to the market, perhaps with a, a kind of similar vision. Uh, we are growing and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks for your time today. Goodbye. Welcome to Capital HQ where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. All right, welcome guys. Um, it's a pleasure to have you guys on Capital HQ. Um, and you know, with the, the purpose of today's call is really to dive deeper into a report that you guys were both put together, the VDO uh, and Focal uh, Venture Fundraising Landscape Q3 2023. So um, yeah, if, you, if Adam, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name's Adam and I'm part of the Growth Advisory Team at VDO. Um, we are specialist earlier stage advisors helping companies raise both debt and equity, uh, post seed up to early uh, Series B. Um, and yeah, uh, we're a mix of uh, both advisors and former investors in our team. So we believe that uh, uniquely in the market, we've got um, a really strong investor lens when we look at opportunities. So the companies we talk to and work with 
um, are best prepared to hopefully increase their chances chances of a successful race. Fantastic. Uh, maybe Jack? Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually couldn't agree more on the, on the BDA side. They've been fantastic partners um, to both us, but also a number of companies that have gone through Focal. Um, so I'm, I'm one quarter of an organization called Focal. Um, we're essentially a, a central data exchange for early stage fundraising. So we were formed about three and a half years ago by two uh, quite senior members of the VC ecosystem that decided the process of, of raising funding was completely broken and very opaque, very relationship driven, um, predominantly favored that of the well networked or very community led individual and then founders. And um, so we started tackling that problem. We have a binaural demo day, which is, is certainly probably Europe's largest and we're kind of bridging on now, hopefully with global expectations and ambitions. Um, we see about four and a half thousand um, early stage companies every single year. And we systematically invest um, into two, three companies that go through each demo day by SPVs. So we've co-invested the likes of NTBC, um, Lightspeed, uh, Alderton, et cetera, and have facilitated, um, I think, of last day about seven and a half thousand introductions between both VCs and both also founders. Fantastic. And I think uh, hopefully today uh, we can get rid of some of this opaqueness um, with this uh, report. And for anyone who's uh, for, for anyone who's watching in the description is a link to that report um, and the questions that will be asked today and answered and the discussions will all revolve around that, that, that report as well as expand on it. So I think first things first, um, maybe one of you can answer this to start with. Considering the, the trends highlighted in the report, um, how is the dynamics between investors and startups evolving? Uh, and a, as a follow up to that, what key strategies should startups adopt to navigate this evolving landscape? Okay. So if you want to take that one, Adam. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I think like um, leaning on uh, what Jack um, said before is we also firmly believe that there should be more transparency in the ecosystem and um, companies should be able to, if they have, if they're well prepared and well researched, to be able to go out to investors with a good proposition and be able to get a meeting. Um, and by that, I think it works both ways that when founders reach out to VCs, they should get a response with um, clear reasons why the investor wants to or does not want to take up a meeting. But also founders really need to do their due diligence that they are going out to relevant VCs. Um, sometimes when we speak to companies and they say, oh, I've been out to a few investors and I'm not really getting much traction. And we look at a company doing 10 um, K of MRR and they've reached out to investors that clearly say on their website, they only invest in businesses that are doing 2 million EBITDA mm. upwards. Um, so they're not going to get a response because investors will just look at that and say, you, you, you haven't researched this properly. Um, you've got no credibility. I'm not going to respond to you. Um, but more widely, I think um, it's becoming more important for founders to give themselves more credibility by not only knowing their business really well, but also knowing the whole landscape of businesses that they um, compete against mm -hmm. and how the market that they're operating in has changed. Because not only does that give more credibility to the founders and especially in early stage, I think it comes, it might come later in one of your questions, but it definitely comes through in the report. Founders are the most important thing for early stage investors. So um, knowing your company and your market really well shows investors why you are the standout pick in your market for them to invest in because what you have to realize is very few investors, if any, can have two competing assets in the same portfolio. So what you're convincing them of is this is a really good market and you should invest in it. But also we are the best asset in that market for you to invest in. And the reason we know that is because our KPIs are better, our management team is stronger, our traction is quicker, et cetera, et cetera. So knowledge and being prepared, I think you'll find that me saying being prepared might be a really thing to bring out. And that's like yeah, absolutely. And I um, I couldn't agree more on, on the investor points. Um, uh, often VCs, uh, forgive me if, if any VCs are actually tuning in, but are often quite fickle individuals. Um, so as a startup, it's it's paramount really to like the first impressions matter because it's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to say. And often from an investor outreach point of view, there's only kind of one bullet in the revolver um, from a chance point of view. Um, 
from exposure to, to VCs. Um, so, so first impressions matter and, and they last. Um, so it's, it's kind of pivotal to make sure that you present yourself as a founder in the best possible light. Um, whether that be to take formal advice from a, an outreach point of view or to structure a financial model if you're a late stage company that reflects the VC's growth expectations, so all those things uh, come into play. Okay, fantastic. And I guess um, you know, moving on to the next part of the, the the report in terms of venture landscape and dynamics, investor dynamics. So it's it's reported that forty two percent of investors require investments to qualify for VCT or EIS funding. Um, Apart from the tax incentives, why do you think this is and how does it shape investment strategies? So that's first part. And how should startups navigate this landscape if perhaps they don't qualify for it or what steps should they take to make sure they qualify for it? So I think that the um, the, the first thing to mention is that the reason that question is in the report is to set the theme for the rest of the report so people know where the answers or the type of investors that are answering these questions um, and I think what you'll find is um, with EIS and VCT investors, the background really to that is if you kind of think without being too stereotypical, UK personalities versus US personalities, US personalities are, uh, sorry, UK personalities are more risk averse naturally. Mm. The background of a lot of um, the VC ecosystem in the UK, because because it hasn't been going for as long as in the US, is more kind of private equity type mindset with a bit more risk. So those um, EIS and VCT um, aids allow the funds to take more risk and then therefore allow them to say, you know, we can invest in companies that are more loss making um, for for a bit longer than than our counterparts in private equity. Um, and, And that's really helpful for earlier stage companies. And I think um, it does make it more difficult for companies that don't qualify to raise money in the UK. But I think if you if you consider why that is, most companies that VCs will want to invest in are high growth, early stage UK based companies. And the reason for that is despite what we're doing now and having a virtual phone call, VCs do want to know that if something goes wrong or they need to, they can just get in a car, get on a train and go and speak to the management team in person and try and help them because VCs, although people do give them a bad name, do want to be supportive because ultimately everyone has the same goal to get a nice return for management and the VCs. Um, So I think what is important is when you are looking for your first round of investment or you're coming through to the fifth or sixth year without going into the details of the ice and bct rules is to really understand and grasp those rules to know how to keep your company eis and bct qualifying because it does just open a lot more doors and give you a lot more options for funding right and absolutely yeah sorry jack did you have something to add yeah, yeah, I think like just like a takeaway tip, really. Um, it, there's obviously a thing called EIS Advanced Assurance. So if founders are thinking about going out to raise through the EIS scheme, which, as Adam rightly said, is, is massively beneficial from a UK investor point of view. And I think like having proper legal advice that you can actually rely upon to go out with that assurance is, is sometimes very advantageous. So we work or have worked quite closely in the past with a law firm called Philip Herr, which um, is a specialist EIS law firm. And so for any founders out there, I think um, thinking about that sort of strategy, it's, it's important to, to get proper legal advice. And I think those guys are, are really good at what they do. Yeah. Okay. Th- th- those are some good tips. Um, in regards to, uh, Adam, what you've mentioned in terms of the um, risk, more risk aversion mindset, have you seen a trend where it's getting more risk averse or less risk averse? And obviously the last two years probably hasn't seen more risk averse, but in general, the UK landscape, is that, what's your opinion on that? Um, so it, it depends how, how you look at risk. I think the, what has the, the biggest change in the landscape has been how long investors um, allow or will ex- tolerate cash consumptiveness in a business. Um, they want to see a pathway to profitability sooner rather than later. Yep. Um, I think if you look at those like Series C, Series D raises, they're the ones that have really fallen off um, because 
most VCs now think that the companies that struggled the most and the, the, the bigger companies that were really the big failures through and out of COVID um, were those ones that were still loss-making, having had hundreds of millions of investment. So I think Series A investors especially are now turning around and we've, I think we've, we've asked the investors these questions that where previously Series A investors would say, look, if you're not profitable in two years, that's fine. But as long as you start to get profitable within two years, we really start need to see that. Now it's a lot more like 17, 18 months. Um, we don't want to see heavy loss making throughout. And effectively what that's saying is we want to see um, a structurally profitable business model that the longevity of the company isn't just dependent on spending more money on marketing, winning more customers. It's, yeah. are, do you have pros- profitable customers? Are you running a strong company? So that if some other crazy uh, macroeconomic event happens, that it's more savable, that we can keep the company going through that period. Um, the company won't need massive investment um, to support, the investors won't have to support their portfolio with massive investment um, just to keep those companies running. Right. And I think, you know, based on that, on the follow-up of that, uh, either one of you can take this on, but it, it's noted in the report that most Series A investors expect a company to become profitable within 12, uh, 12 to 24 months post-investment. From a from a, an investor's perspective, how realistic is this expectation? And from a, from a founder's perspective, from a startup's perspective, um, what steps should they take to, to meet these profitability, profitability timelines? Uh, I can say that one bit of a tongue twister. Um, so uh, yes, I, obviously now that startups are, are being launched, um, I think with Lena and raising environment in mind, obviously DD periods for investors um, are taking a lot longer and they're kind of mitigating. Um, those are now perceived quite risky or riskier investments than, than previously. Um, teams, which is obviously a huge proportion of overhead, but other overheads I think are being kept smaller for longer which means that profitability can be achieved at a quicker rate. Um, I think obviously there's, there's an offset with, with growth here, with VCs revising down their growth expectations to account for, for better inverted, um, uh, inverted commerce profitability. But there's also a great focus on, I think, organic customer acquisition channels, customer retention, and especially from a consumer perspective. And so all in all, I think having to be that they're having to be much more strategic about growth and, and not just targeting everything and, and everyone um, you know, like they were, or possibly more so anyway, um, one, two, three years ago. Right. And maybe follow up, and this is a, a, yeah, what impact does a higher focus on profitability maybe have on the rate of innovation then within this UK ecosystem? I'm not too sure if you want to take that one. Adam. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't mind. I, I think that the, um, I think it just goes back to what Jack says that it, it drives more focus from management teams. Um, if you're not trialing loads of different um, routes to market, loads of different products at the same time, um, and you have a focus to say, right, we're going to launch this, and then we'll launch this module, and then we'll launch this module, but bear, like keeping in mind that you're not just going to go out and try and win ten customers straight away um, with whatever you've got. And then you've got to maybe rebuild the tech because those 10 customers, it doesn't work for those 10 customers and you've churned 80% of that. Um, hopefully, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, um, it's no, like, and then in the report, um, the average minimum founder equity stake expected by investors at different funding stages was, was mentioned. Um, the numbers evade me, but I'm sure you guys <laughs> know them. Um, how does this expectation influence founder decisions and especially considering uh, company growth and how much they're supposed to give away? Um, yeah, I can say that one. I, I think it's it's a dark arts really. Um, and it obviously involves quite a lot of negotiation. Yeah. Um, it's about realistically a, a baseline, ha- finding a happy medium for, for both of, of the parties mentioned. Um, yeah, I think it's a famous saying, I'm not too sure, sure who said it, but no amount of friendliness can change the fact that every single cap table lines up to to 100%. Um, I think if you put yourself in, in the investor's shoes, um, I think investors obviously look for founders to be incentivized round on round, right? And that's probably most important for them beyond obviously their equity stake. So 
so if you're a Series A company with two founders, for instance, effectively owning 30 to 40% of the business, um, an incoming investor will look for a share option pulls a part of that as well, which is often probably vested um, across multiple years of the cliff. And best and are crucial to VCs to make sure that founders are sufficiently incentivized. Um, I think founders often forget that, that equity is an unbelievably expensive form of financing. So maybe we can come on to a bit of like strategies and, and how to kind of balance and, and meet demands and supply. Um, but yeah, I, I think from a from a strategy point of view, in terms of, of how to balance that equity retention piece and investor demand. And there's now short-term and long-term debt options, which are often hybrid mixed with with equity, so venture debts, which is often like an eight to twelve percent fixed interest rate. Mm. Often, most popular of Series A companies, and um, we, we see quite quite often. Um, I, I think some VCs are very ownership sensitive, some aren't. Um, I think the latter are very common at the very early stage. So, for instance, you have a an LP VC driven fund here in London called Kakoa, um, which is led by an amazing female entrepreneur and, and investor called Carmen. And it's a micro VC, so that's $17 million. She, and these are her words, famously, doesn't give a damn about equity stake, really. Um, I think if you consider what pressure she's under from above, LPs, especially the more institutional players, are putting pressure on GPs because um, often they want to see consistent ownership within their particular funds into companies. Um, I think this obviously... In that particular case, not often a huge amount you can do to control that as a founder. And it's about finding a situation that works, works for both parties, like I said. And I think that derives from a level of transparency. Um, you know, so for instance, before signing your term sheet, I think discuss um, things that are going to be thrown into the equity, the equity conversation. So like a share option scheme, for instance, your potential investor, make sure that that's negotiated fairly. Um, I think as a founder as well, make sure that you don't fall off done or fall victim to, to the, off the, the share option shuffle, which is essentially putting the option pool in the pre-money valuation, which is diluting the existing shareholders and, and yourself mm. as a result of that. Um, and, and basically just don't undersell yourself, like the opportunity cost of an incentivized workforce from a share option plan point of view. Um, at the expense of diluting shares is is one that investors understand and, and you should be appropriately positioned for that to, to really motivate a, a workforce of yours, really. Correct. Then the only other thing that I'd add to that is um, that equity stake uh, point is a really good sense check for founders uh, in terms of their valuation and how much they're raising. Um, because, again, it goes back to founder credibility that if you're going to an investor and saying, I want to raise... X at an X valuation and the investor looks at it and they might say, look, I'm only getting single digit equity here. I'm not even going to carry on the conversation. Yeah. Um, so having a think about the, that 15 to 25% or whichever stage of, of investor you're talking to as to do you think that's a reasonable amount of equity that they will want, not just that I'm willing to give away, that would incentivize them to want to carry on the conversations. And if it isn't, Am I looking to raise too much or is my valuation too high? Yeah, makes complete sense. And before we move on to the next next part of the sector trends and sustainability, I'd like for both of you to maybe give one piece of advice to founders currently um, raising capital. Um, yeah, just the one biggest piece of advice and perhaps the current climate. Not too sure if you want to go first, Adam. Yeah, I don't mind. I think that um, look, the, the fundraising process as it is, um, is effectively a full-time job for founders. And the difficulty in that for founders is that um, they are usually operating in a high-growth business and they are a central cog yep. to that business continuing to grow. So if they take on another full-time job, the business is very unlikely to grow at the pace that it was growing at and the wheels might even fall off. So if you... Um, end up going into a VC process and the business is growing and two months into discussing um, an opportunity with the VC and they might be about to put, put funds in and they ask for your most recent figures, um, they'll look at them and say, wait a second, you're not growing at your 10, 15% MRR, you're growing up 2% MRR. Um, what, what's going on? If the founders say, well, it's because I'm doing this fundraising process, the VCs don't care. So, it's about really understanding that it is a second full-time job. Um, advisors, of course, I'm biased, 
do help to do that. Um, but it, even if it means bringing some fractional support, whether it's a fractional CFO, um, an NED, yeah. anything that can help you through that process, and you really have to understand that how much, how time consumptive it is to already to fans that are, already have really short bandwidth. Yeah. Absolutely, I think echoing what Adam said as well. I mean, if you're not going to go down the third party route, I think it makes sense for a lot of companies, especially at the late stage A and B in particular, where ultimately um, you have more stuff going on as a founder, quite simply. Um, it's just to stay in the saddle, like ultimately the, the higher quality startups are, are still getting funded and there is a spike capital out there, be it quite a lot of it is dry powder currently. It's a volume game. So ultimately, um, you know, 90% plus of the replies that you're going to have from VCs, whether you have a com- conversation with them or not, is, is going to be a no, unfortunately, just to set the baseline. Um, but they're in the business to say, no, that's quite literally their full-time job. Um, but it's, it's a, it takes a very relentless individual, one that I wouldn't really ever want to aspire to, just given the massive effects that it has on running your business, but also on your mental health, I would say. Um, but yeah, like I said, it comes down to the, the higher quality startups that are still getting funded. And it's just a matter of, of when and who from. Yeah. I think one of the biggest tips I've 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 heard in my two years with wholesale investors, always a founder should always be in capital raising mode, as in they should never not be. So even if they've completed their round, they should still have this mindset because it's a lot easier to keep going than to restart for the next funding round. Keep those contacts. Even if you're not raising, go go t- once or twice a week to meet investors and just keep them in the loop. Um, I think that was one of the biggest pieces of advice I, I heard. And I've reproduced that a couple of times um, to certain founders. And so some of them have taken that up and I can see that obviously their first fundraise is, is always so long, but the ones that keep going and it's, I've worked with them for the second fundraise now, it seems like it's a lot easier to keep that going. Um, so I think that, that for me was one of the biggest tips I, yeah. I've taken and given to, to certain founders. Yeah, yeah I agree. Like, like, so go ahead on. Then I was going to say that it, like, it is a very good strategy and I definitely agree that I think that if you are doing that, you, the numbers that you share with those VCs that you want to do further rounds should be numbers that you believe are definitely achievable. Because yeah. if you send out numbers which are shooting for the moon numbers, the VCs will always come back to those numbers. And if for some reason you haven't hit them, it's going to be very difficult for those VCs to turn around and not say, well, you said you were going to be doing X of ARR and you're only doing X. So can you come back to us when you get there? And maybe things have changed. Maybe you just were too aggressive with the numbers you showed them. So it's always good to show the numbers that you think are attractive to them, but also numbers that you can at least meet, but even better surpass. Yeah, absolutely. I think instead of, you know, just don't like putting numbers on this, but instead of spending 100% of your time over three months doing a capital raise, it's spending 25% every month for 12 months. And that still allows the business to continue thriving. Um, so yeah, no, that was a good piece of advice. But look, let's move on to sector trends and sustainability. Um, so obviously the re- report discusses the heightened focus on sustainability and investments. Um, obviously it'd be great for you guys to maybe talk a bit about what sustainability is in this context. And after that, how is this emphasis changing the types of startups that are receiving funding? I don't, mind, I don't mind starting. Yeah. So I think um, look, if, if we're going to boil it all down to what investors do, investors are looking to invest in businesses that are going to get them at least a probably a, a three to five times return in the UK. Uh, that's like at a series A stage. And that, the way they get the return is by the business growing to yeah. a point that, the, that when it's sold, there is enough of a market that the business will attract a good offer that, that that means that everyone gets the return that they've been aiming for. So if you're looking at the way that the market sentiment has moved, which businesses are going to be those businesses that are worth the most in three to five years, as well as being growing strong businesses, is also the businesses that um, have a social and economic conscience. Yeah. So there are, even if you take away the things that, that I'm not sitting here and saying, look, you need to have 
solar panels on your building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But even having like a strong maternity or paternity policy, um, things like all those social aspects, do you care about your employees? And it's not even what are you doing today? It's mapping out what are you doing today and where do you want to be? Yeah. And what steps are you taking to get there? Um, because I think that, I mean, in, uh, th- there's a lot of organizations which are supporting this from like a free point of view. Um, ESG VC is a really strong organization um, doing a lot of good um, content in the space. And all the investors that I've had, uh, any of their talks or webinars have said, all they want to see is a plan. And they can work with you on the plan. They don't expect you to come in with a fully formed ESG policy. They want to know that you do care. Mm. Um, and it, and it, it's part of of your your, your business, um, your whole business plan. You haven't just put it in because it's something extra that might help you get investment. It has to be core to what you're doing. Not, not just chucking in AI and ESG. <laughs> just, just exactly. <laughs> and, and, and just kind of following up on that as well, it's been trickled down from LP, I think, pressures on GPs as well. Um, so there's now a ESG focus really in place um, from, from a top-level perspective that GPs have to implement within their particular investments. And obviously, it's up to the GP to decide how far along to the right they want to go with that particular theme. So that's why you get a huge amount of funding obviously been putting to but into sustainability and climate, like World Fund, for instance, is one of the largest um, in the world, actually. But certainly Europe, Aid Ventures, obviously most most recently raising uh, her latest fund to, to invest in impact. Yep. Um, so that there is an increasing importance, um, I think, uh, you know, right from the very top, not just a, a base level. Yeah, I think it's, for me, it'd be great to understand, you know, whether investors are more looking at companies that have an ESG centric approach or whether they're investing into impact companies, right? So impact companies on perhaps a uh, climate tech space or just w- w- what have you guys seen in that space? Is it more so focused on general ESG or, you know, is it, are the focused investors just focused on impact or is it everyone that's more and more focused on impact? So I don't mind starting on that. I think um, it's really important to note that there are obviously like um, specialist funds that invest in yeah. either climate or impact, et cetera. But the more sector agnostic funds, um, what what they their, their fundraising strategy is still to get the level of returns that they need. Yeah. And a business that isn't growing at the rate of um, – MRR increase or a, a annual increase that they need or doesn't have the right gross profit or any other KPIs that they need to see to make the investment just because they might be solving the climate crisis doesn't mean that it's an investable company. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's really important. Just having an ESG friendly uh, business isn't going to get you investment. It needs to go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. I think just onto that as well. I mean, there's a big toss up really in, in climate tech now in, in regards to a hardware or software enabled approach really to tackling problems. And uh, there's a school of thought really on one side that says that um, you know, reaching net zero goals really by the time frame that's just set out from a regulation point of view, it's just not possible about implementing more hardware related um, solutions. Um, so that's a big, big topic of contention. Um, I, I, I would say really in, in this particular market as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really important to actually visualize and contextualize whether you're physically imparting some benefit really into, into the environment from, from what your product does. I mean, if I, if I see another law respect, another carbon accounting credits off that platform, I, I think I might um, exit out of this game as soon as humanly possible. Uh, it's very saturated really in particular subsectors such as, as that particular subsector, um, so I think having a truly differentiated approach really to tackling what is the world's uh, certain certainly societies. Um one one of the biggest problems right now is is pivotal, but it needs to be truly unique. Um and I think a point of differentiation in that particular sector is more important than than anyone in, in, in my personal view. Yeah. I, I would I would I would agree with you on that one. <laughs> Um, but, um, in regards to, you know, we, we, you spoke about ESG, but from an investor's perspective, you mentioned LPs to GPs down, right? How are investors incorporating ESG into their investment decisions? Um, 
Right. Um, and how should startups adapt their strategy so that they're both incorporating ESG while remaining, let's say, uh, on a growth path that maybe wasn't there prior to the ESG criteria being thought out? I, I can say that one first. I just from um, maybe Adam can, can follow suit in regards to the lower level. Um, so, yeah, I think especially from a more institutional place, so the endowment funds, the um, like the, the European investment firm, which is a government institution, they have a mandate really to comply with the regulators who um, the regulator vision is, 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 is important to LPs because they obviously donate and invest the most amount of money. Um, so, uh, like, for instance, when you're raising a fund, you have to have an ESG policy really in place to be attractive to, to those particular individuals now, and that is an ESG policy on ultimately how you run your own business um, everything from like, the day-to-day operations of, of exactly how you would run a business equivalent essentially, but also um, how to look and view ESG policies within particular businesses. So um, for instance, it's very rare that you find VCs investing in gambling propositions in um, maybe even if it's vaping, for instance, in, in smoking related products, et cetera. And um, anything that could be detrimental really to, to the health of, of a consumer or a business um, is, is really kind of seen in the eyes of a regulator, but also now an institutional investor, a, a big no-no. Um, maybe, maybe I think can speak to, to the lower level of, of end, end user in business. Yeah, I, I think that the, a lot of um, investors, when they're looking at businesses, are looking at kind of like red flag reporting ESG. Mm. Um, so I think that if you carry that out on your own business first before going for a raise and thinking about where an investor might have an issue. So, for example, if you're going out and saying we're solving um, the carbon or let's say you're in a circular economy business and you're recycling um, something and that's for the good of the environment, but the machines that you're using are very power consumptive and yeah. you're not using solar power, um, then an investor is going to turn around and say, well, it's not really net net benefit, so it doesn't really help. So that's a big red flag to an investor. An investor is not going to turn around and say, oh, yeah, I'll definitely invest in this because it's solving an issue and the business is growing. Because on the other hand, you're taking away from one hand to give with the other hand. So it's it, it's just doing that kind of like red flag reporting in your mind. It's the same with um, your deck, your financials and everything. It's just an extra thing that you now need to think about that is core to raising funds. Yeah. And I, th- I think, you know, following on on this, the, there's obviously the, the report suggests a, a shift in sector preferences among investors. Um, how how do you think this will impact perhaps innovation in less uh, popular sectors, such as I think it, in the report, the telecommunications is, is very low in terms of um, funds deployed into, right? So what type of impact will that have on on less popular sectors? I can say this one first. I, I think we're, we're actually um, quite keen on, dare I say, like the unsexy overlooked industries um, that are typically very underfunded and um, from a VC point of view. So the supply of capital um, is, is just not there and has not been there historically and, and they're very much yeah. an untapped resource. So like prime example of this is maybe like shipping or logistics where there's only been a couple or, or three unicorns as opposed to the likes of Finsec where there's been a huge amount more. Um, so I, I, I would say that I think building a, a business in a very unsexy sector is actually quite a sexy thing right now, dare I say it. Um, and there are specialist species that really can can resonate that, that more more well with you, essentially. Um, and it's just about finding and doing your research or, or basically speaking to a third party, um, such as BDO, which can help you map out and invest the outreach strategy in order to, to make that happen. Um, ultimately, it's about finding especially to benefit your own valuation in terms that you land on it's about finding multiple horses in the race but meeting them all at the same point in terms of the finish line um so creating fear of missing out on, on your round is, is another topic that we might come on to but um it's, it's pivotal really um in that regard yeah. yeah i think just to add to that it's just what's hot today might not be hot tomorrow um so it, uh, just to echo what jack said if you you are doing something which really solves a problem and you've got customers that are buying it, investors will invest. Um, it doesn't, like you have, obviously, you have to be using the best technology that's available to you um, and doing the best R&D that you can do. But if you think about 
two years ago when all anyone ever wanted to invest in was Web3 and crypto. Those companies are find it difficult to raise now because investors are just like, well, that didn't work. I'm not investing in that anymore. Even if you've got a really good company, if you've used that technology at your core and without it, your business doesn't work, um, you, you, you're kind of a bit stuck. So really growing something which solves a problem that you need to solve as long as the the, the TAM or the total addressable market of that market is big enough and you are solving that problem, um, as Jack said, you, you'll get investors to invest. Great. Um, now let's move on to economic climate and global trends. Um, so um, how is the current economic climate influencing investor risk appetites uh, as per the report? Um, and in what ways can startups adapt their pitches to appeal to these changing risk profiles? I know we touched upon it earlier a bit, but if we could go a bit more detail. That, that'd be great. Um, I'm not too sure if you want to cut this one out. I think Adam said it was a bit too vague. I probably might agree to be honest. I think we might have a bit of detail yeah. prior to, to that. I think that it, like, if you just want to ask about, um, I think it was the second question on inflation and currency, because then we can just talk about yeah. valuation. And then... Cool. Just making a note to remove that. Um, cool. So um, yeah, moving on. How do you guys foresee the impact of global economic trends such as inflation and currency fluctuations or venture capital investment decisions? Um, and to add to that, what measures should startups take to mitigate these macroeconomic risks? So the, the main the main thing that we've seen um, through inflation is valuation and it's like there, there's lots of charts and graphs that people and data that people have brought out um, to explain that like as, um, interest rates go up, valuations go down, um, because the LPs have other places to put their money. And so the risk appetite of investors mean that they're not going to do your 20, 30 times revenue multiples. Um, and if you think about, does anyone on this call or anyone really expect value, uh, um, interest rates to go back down to 0%? Probably not. So those founders that are sitting there and saying, oh, I'm going to wait till valuations come back, it just it, it's just not worth waiting for. If you need the money to grow your business, you go out and try and get the best valuation you can get now um, because there's more chance your business will grow with funding uh, than without funding. And if you have to give away a bit more of your business to make that happen, um, then it's worth it. So I think that the, the, the biggest change is how it's affected valuations. Yeah, so yeah, I think in late stage business as well, I think I mentioned this before, but shorter term lending options, which can obviously help with um, you know, an equity sensitivity point of view, if you don't want to give too much of your business away at uh, what you would see as an unfair valuation to, I think the likes of you know, a few players in the space of Cap Chase, um, you know, Uncapped, et cetera, they, they essentially give a, a, a very attractive, uh, I would say, product. Um, and it's it's obviously no personal guarantees, et cetera, so it doesn't have the scary headline views as, as previous loans I mean, available to early stage companies do. Yeah. Um, but it's obviously not, it's at the cost of obviously not growing your business as fast as you would with, you know, a fully fledged PC round, which would obviously have um, a lot more capital available to, to that particular business. Of course, there's positives and negatives in every different uh, avenues anyway. So that, that makes sense. Um, look, in terms of moving ahead, we'll look at techno technology, innovation and future future trends. So considering the, the rapid evolution of the venture landscape, um, how might the role of traditional VC change in the next five years? Um, obviously, we've seen a lot more funds appear and emerge in the last five years. Um, is this a trend that we're going to continue seeing or what are you guys seeing? Yeah, I, I, I can say this one. Um, so like I said, I think there's a whole lot more of optionality available really to founders than they used to be historically. Like I said, obviously the short-term debt options being one of them, which is has played a pivotal part really in, in series A and B companies growth at least somewhat. And there are a number of different kind of propositions really, really out there. Um, I think obviously within this particular, as you say, there are say a downturn of markets um, anything that can mitigate the investor's risk from an instrument point of view, especially is, is quite attractive to them. So it's not necessarily an emerging fund model, but it's been around for a while and very much used um, a lot, especially the earlier stage companies now is an ASA or a safe equipment really in the US. 
um, they're being really used to accelerate processes and to get around or to, to get around the way of uh, an early stage. Um, often those, uh, should we say, like risk profiles are rewarded with a discount rate. So we 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 see a lot of ASAs which give essentially uh, the investor the right to invest at a valuation set at a later point in time, but with a cap on it. Um, we, we see a lot of those a lot of those models emerging and uh, very very popular. Uh, I would say. Um, I, I think it's, it's always going to be quite a, a opaque industry um, and building up it's not very well innovated industry to, to, to be quite honest from a funding perspective. Yeah. Um, VCs like what they know and, and often that's unfortunately it's the detriment of, of founders. Yeah. But um, maybe j- just to keep on that, if, if possible, how do you maybe see the role of perhaps AI um, blockchain coming to, I don't know if this is a word, but de opaque, <laughs> um, th- this industry, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, VC has been a pretty pivotal amount of change really with the impact of especially data analytics and, and AI. Um, it's changed the landscape a lot from a sourcing perspective, especially in huge amount of resources and money is being spent on, on sourcing. Um, currently, I think from a top-down perspective, those methods are very, very advanced. So, like big thought leaders in this space are like perhaps Andre from, from Early Bird. Um, I know episode one really huge fan of, of this as well. Um, and, and they often play and pick on the characteristic which is most important to them. So, Adam rightly said that the only way to de-risk an investment at uh, the earlier stage is belief in the founder, and obviously, belief in the founder derives from perhaps previous experiences. And, you know, maybe if you're a behavioral investor, maybe it's um, from, from you know, the uh, good childhood, et cetera, that they've been raised from. But from a data point of view, it's, it's often um, where they've worked in the past and at what position, with what, what, what level of, of autonomy, essentially, at the end of the day. Um, and that, that's, that's given way to, to models that can source extremely promising talents. I mean, it's, for instance, Mishral AI is, is a big kind of AI company it's on everyone's lips at the moment. So they raised... I think it's $120 million, a ridiculously expensive $270 million valuation. Um, and, and those four individuals were previous engineers and products uh, directors at Google. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's pivotally changed. I, I think the way VCs, VCs source companies, um, first and foremost. Cool. Um, and, you know, you talked about how investors put a lot of emphasis on the team, right? On the management team. Are you seeing more of a shift towards the management team in terms of in, uh, when in, as an investment criteria, or has it always been this way? Is it growing? Is it decreasing? Um, especially maybe let's consider the, this current climate crisis, uh, this current crisis, economic crisis and the climate we're in. I, I could say this one will lead anywhere. Yeah, sure. I think it's just, massively massively dependent on stage right um i i think shift has always been oh well, the focus has always been on management teams at, at pre seed and seed because ultimately there's not a huge amount of data that a vc can base their decision off an investment decision off um so i think that always has been always will be the case i think obviously when you're breaching growth rounds series a b and c it's, it's a different story um uh, obviously the people leading the business is still first and, and paramount and the most important factor to consider, but a huge element of traction comes into Series A investors' investment decisions to growth profile the business. Um, and obviously, like the uh, as you say, market potential, like Adam said, some businesses are just not suited to a venture backable um, proposition and often the, the size is just, just not there. Um, I think from a team perspective, like I referred to before, it's mostly about the drive, grit, determination, relentlessness of, of those individuals, um, about their ability to resonate well with VCs because ultimately it increases their chances of raising further down the line um, and obviously increases the, the chance of return from a VC perspective. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think every single VC approaches the conversation, at least based on the founders that they're only put on data or this uh, to do one thing and that's essentially to, to build that business um in its entirety i think i'll just add that that oddly the the importance of the 
the management team has maybe slightly decreased because the importance of the business model has increased. Mm-hmm. So whilst it is still probably the key key factor in where earliest why earlier stage investors invest, there is at least one very famous example, which I'm not going to mention for fear of getting into trouble, of a business that raised money just off the back of a serial founder. Um, and that was pre-COVID. And I don't think that, that business would have re- become a unicorn as quickly as it did um, had it started raising now. Um, because I think that that business model would have been scrutinized a bit more. And if you look at that business model now, um, it doesn't have, it didn't when it first got invested in the most appealing investment KPIs. Um, so I think that like, whilst it is extremely important, it has always been extremely important that like scale of the importance of your business model versus the importance of the founder has tips slightly towards the business model. Um, but as Jack says, without a strong management team, the investors wants to back and believe in, um, you're not going to get invested. Right. So look, perhaps if you guys can maybe, if you guys have a, a piece of advice for early stage founders who might not have the, the right background or the right experience that maybe certain investors are looking for, but have a great product and believe in themselves, what should they do to make sure that they are kind of on the same level as other experienced founders, maybe repeat founders. Uh, what's actions should they take? I'm, I'm more than happy to say this one. So I've actually, I'm really in book at the moment, um, which actually dispels the myth for most, um, like the most successful founders really come from repeat backgrounds. So I think VCs have the determined idea that a good deal can come from anywhere, uh, essentially. And so they don't necessarily have to be a repeat founder or a um, you know a Harvard PhD or um, you know an Oxbridge candidate um, to to really gain investments. Um, I, I think to make themselves more appealing is to put themselves on on the same playing field as those. So there's a number of initiatives out there, including Focal, obviously that can can help surface those individuals. Um, and we, we've our alumni have gone on to raise a huge amount of money, which haven't come from a traditional, should we say, um, you know, BC investable background. Um, and there are a lot of funds out there, including Ada, for instance, which is an inclusive venture capital fund that invests in in people not with not with the run of the mill background investment banking, and um, you know, found the startup money at fifteen and, and funded it, etc. Um, so I think putting yourself on, on the same level for initiatives and doing your research in, into to funds to really understand actually what they want and, and what they look for, um, I, I, I think is, is, is pivotal. Um, I'm not too sure Adam can add to anything on, on that front. No, I, I just think that, um, that I wouldn't worry about not having a traditional investable background because if you do have a business and you've proven that it's growing and you've proven that it, the actual business is investable. Um, it's about having confidence in yourself that there is a reason that that business has got there. And whether it's you or your co-founder, um, you are doing something right, which makes you investable. Um, and I think like sitting there before you go out for a raise and thinking, where are the gaps in my management team? Yeah. Do we have a gap from a financial point of view? Should we consider bringing in a fractional CFO before we do the raise rather than getting to the raise and investor saying, yeah, I like it, but your finance function is not investable. Yeah. Are there things you can fix before going for a raise? Yeah, absolutely. And there's actually nothing wrong with that, like showing a bit of humility, but there really isn't by spotting the gaps in your team that you're not particularly good at. Um, but there's absolutely no shame um, from an investor point of view in, in showing that there just needs to be a level of transparency. Um, and, and often an investor will be able to separate that of, of what you do know with that of what you need support on. And obviously that of what you do know and are very good at, you should make your um, superpower when you invest in conversations to, to make it play to the strengths. Yeah. Yeah. I think if an investor can see that humility and that they can work with you to plug those gaps, they're automatically getting a value increase Yeah, um, as soon as they invest, which is a massive benefit to them, but also to you um, as founders. Great. Um, look, in terms of, timing we have a time for a couple more questions um i think we're, i'll merge a couple of them um let's take on this technology side so 
what role do you see technology playing in streamlining the VC funding process, right? Because uh, based on the report, I think it's like 34% of, of investments take about five or six meetings, if some more, some less, right? But that's that. And how do you think the increasing use of data analytics and AI and VC will change the way investments are sourced and evaluated? So if we break that down, the evaluation, uh, the the um, the sourcing, the evaluation, and then the due diligence. How do you think technology comes into that and streamlines that whole process? Just from a, a GP perspective or from a founder perspective, sorry? From, from a from a GP perspective. Okay, cool. Uh, Adam, do you want to go first or yeah, they may too? Yeah, I think that there, there'll always be in VC a need for a number of meetings because, because the investor is backing the founders, they're backing the management team. Um, so that's always going to be important. And the investor, to get comfortable with that, will want to ask questions on areas that they're not happy with. And they'll always have to um, prepare their investment committee report, um, their IC paper. Um, and that will need to be thorough enough that gains the uh, IC's backing to make the investment. So I don't think that's going away. I think where things could be made more efficient is a bit maybe a bit through due diligence um in just like things like um data data room um, compilation tools all these things which just means that you can be more prepared a bit faster do i think that there's going to be versions of ai which can help you put a deck together um, within the next five six years i would be surprised if there isn't if if you could take my team's knowledge and build that into an ai platform so that by the time we're reviewing a deck 80 percent of it's already done yeah i think that's eminently possible i'm not a techie and it's like what i say to most ctos when i say are oh, you sure you can just fix this it'll be a quick fix and you can see the look on their face going yeah it's not, not going to be that quick but do i think that those things are eminently possible yes do i think that you can you'll eventually be able to feed some assumptions and your management accounts into a an AI model and it will come out with a financial model that's almost fit to go to VCs. Probably, yeah, I think all those things are are, are, are eminently possible and, and it will save time in preparation. Um, but that human contact with VCs is always going to remain important. So the number of meetings, um, I, I don't think that will change, but the ability to get the data out and um, to respond to VCs' questions should be spe- be able to be sped up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think from a founder perspective, there's a multitude of, of tools really out there. I mean, I we've mentioned Focal. Uh, sorry, it's a bit of a shameless plug, but obviously we're, we're a tech-enabled platform that can help on the sourcing investors side, but also from a VC point of view, sourcing founders side. Um, uh, we're not probably the first to do it and probably definitely won't be the last. So there's definitely um, other platforms that founders um, and also VCs can use to, to source. Um, from from a tracking point of view, I think if you're not going through a third party like Adam, uh, the ORM from a founder point of view, uh, from a tech from a tech angle is is pivotal important. So to make sure that you circle round on conversations, to make sure that you um, are massively on it in terms of chasing, in terms of getting materials back over to the particular VC that they've requested. Um, I think from a funding perspective, is is particularly an interesting space as well. There's now availability of platforms that can structure investments extremely easily. So um, we we use Odin, which has been around for maybe three and a half, uh, four years, who essentially from a VC point of view can help structure syndications um, and can even now help structure a fund if you're you're raising a fund as an emerging GP that can also help um, a founder. They can basically just go online, enter a few details from a company, legal point of view, upload their certificate of incorporation and start to fundraise where they can distribute a link where people can commit, transfer funds, et cetera. Um, so that kind of closing part is, is very much streamlined, I think, um, already with, with the help of those individuals. Um, Seed Legals have obviously been around for an extremely long time, which can help in the documentation front to save you um, going for you know a fully-fledged law firm, even though perhaps probably in part, especially if you want to get the, the best possible deal, is is probably advisable to at least use, use a mix of both. Um, from a, I think I mentioned this before, but VCs are quite fickle human beings. Um, so, so never underestimate like that or really having a, or putting your best friend forward. So there's now like pitch deck software, which, which founders can use to help 
Um, that story really resonates well that uses AI. I think Canva, for instance, even has an AI tool. We see, we see a lot of that through, through that particular platform. Yeah. Um, and then the kind of sourcing and AI and data analytics side, I think we, we might have mentioned that before in terms of, of, of how VC funds are really honing down and what is critically important to them. And, and most of the time that is, is either about talent at the earlier stage or data availability at late stage. And what I mean by that is Series A and B funds are basically just pulling data in from public sources, such as Companies House, for instance, um, which will fit their particular thesis. Um, so I've completed a fund round, funding round before, their credit rating has changed, um, the number of shareholders has, has increased. Um, so yeah, those, those large language models in particular, particularly clever, I, th- I think now, um, uh, yeah. really servicing great companies and VCs are putting a huge amount of money into, into investing in those. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things I've done recently is uh, specifically for B2B SaaS, cause that's a lot of the companies we see at Wholesale Investor. What I did is, you know, the, the new chat GPT module where you can add your, you can create your own uh, GPT. I uploaded the best B2B SaaS uh, pitch decks um, based on different VCs. And I've added uh, the top VCs, their investment criteria into B2B SaaS into it. And just to test it, I uploaded the, um, our own wholesale investors because we're B2B SaaS into it. I'm like, can you help with the pitch deck based on all of these criteria? And it spurned something out, which was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, I, know, so I, I, I know that Prezi does that as well. It's, yeah. Um, really impressive so you do that with you know if you're a fintech company maybe that's that's an easy not an easy trick but it's something that could take you somewhere a bit elevated in terms of the vc in terms of the pitch deck game is probably just make your own gpt with uh, the best decks in your industry and then just go from there um absolutely i i think adam's right there there's always going to be a human element which is needed both of course on, on the vc sourcing side but also the, the founder outreach side um i really think that'll ever be fully, fully automated yeah, I think it comes back to the original point, like the, the point we were making earlier, the that the team, especially in early stage, is still the most crucial, right? So I don't think you can remove those face-to-face meetings or just those meetings in general. Um, look, we have maybe one time for one more question. Um, in your opinion, uh, both of you, what is the most underappreciated sector in the VC space currently and, and why? Um, and we'll do one more question at the end, which is, or maybe you can incorporate them. What's the one piece of advice, the biggest piece of advice, I know we went on one earlier, but that you would give to founders thinking of st- starting to raise now? Do you want to go first, Adam? Uh, I'll take the second bit. Um, I, 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 <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's... <laughs> no, I, don't, I, I don't mind combining them. So like the, the first bit is that, I, I mentioned it before, is... Um, if you look at the report and you, you look at the companies that are raising, you look at like people will say ESG, people will say fintech, people will say climate tech. But as Jack said previously, it's not what's hot now. And um, mm. so if you feel like you've got a solution to a problem um, and you can build um, a commercially viable business to tackle that problem and gain investment, then go and do it. If the market's big enough, you're strong enough founders, and you know you can you know there's a problem with a solution, um go for it. Don't, don't worry about what's hot now. I think um the there's two angles, which is I think why we have worked closely with Focal that um is just really important for founders to know and is one, be prepared, as prepared as you can, because First impressions count. So if your deck is as tight as it can be, you know your numbers as well as you can, and the model is as tight as it can be, um, then that's really important. And going out to the right investors with the right message is really important. And getting those warm introductions, as, as much as we want to democratize and remove and, and increase the transparency as much as possible, um, there'll always be that element that VCs see so many opportunities that when they see a friendly name in their inbox, they might be more likely um, to answer that email. But that that doesn't stop you from growing from someone who doesn't have that black book to going out and building their network. Um, A lot of people say, go out, be confident, start writing on LinkedIn, build your network that way. 
ask people how you can help them and then they'll want to help you. Um, so for example, like with what, what Jack's doing with, with Focal, what the whole Focal team are doing by saying to investors, we're going to bring you deal flow. Investors are coming and saying, well, we'll be, we'll, we'll be more transparent. Then. If you're giving something to us, we'll give something to you. So it's just about being helpful. I think the whole early stage funding ecosystem is all about helping each other. Um, mm. And you'll find that if you help people and people help you, it is as, as much as people might give it a bad name from that point of view. Um, I think that it is, it is a very helpful environment. I wouldn't really have anything else to add there, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's all good. I, I think we kind of addressed the question in terms of them and the appreciation of sectors as well prior to, to that too. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you both for your time today. Uh, for any uh, for any everyone watching this, again, in this description is uh, a link to the report uh, and we'll also be including some other information uh, which you'll be able to find in the description. But Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks thank for having you. us. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows awaits you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Well, look, thank, thank you so much for, for you know, taking your time today. Um, from my masterclass session, I've really been focused on a little bit on the blockchain one-on-one side. And the idea here is to really focusing a little bit on the really kind of basic fundamental on why people are interested in this new buzzword called blockchain, how that well, um, relates to cryptocurrency, which is probably more commonly known. Um, you know, things like Bitcoins, NFTs, these buzzwords, the, the FTX and, and, and so forth. So it's really to guide the, use, um, the viewers from the kind of the most basic fundamental uh, technology to some of the key events uh, that happen and ultimately to what was some of the best practices to invest in into this ecosystem. So as a very quick agenda uh, for, for the call, and you'll see that we'll focus on six different modules, starting with introduction to blockchain, followed by some of the use cases, the market size regulations, digital asset custody and why that's relevant to all the above, as well as a little bit more about hex trust. So where do we begin, right? I mean, we heard this term Web3 quite, quite often, but it's, what exactly does it mean? So if you look at kind of the evolution of Web, World Wide Web in general, starting with the Web1, which obviously it was just Web at that point in time, you really can think about the, the really the late, late 90s, um, you know, you have the, the Ebays and, and, and so forth, and it's really beginning the, uh, of the digital era with a kind of one-way interaction. Right. What does that mean? It means that you go to the website and you kind of consume the content. Right. Um, and so that moved to the whole Web2 space, which really can be defined by really the, the 20, uh, the 2000s um, on kind of some of the more uh, well-known uh, applications like Facebook, Instagram, G uh, Google and, and so forth. And that really it means that you start to interact with the website. Okay, so their social media is probably one of the biggest example of Web2. You have the web and mobile games. Uh, you have the kind of the various application process. Um, and the whole, I think the main difference here is that imagine Facebook and social media. You're really kind of, you know, providing your data, but that data is being monetized and really consumed by the, uh, the companies such as the ones that you listed here, um, where the user, where the, uh, we as the owner of the data, really cannot do anything about that. 
And that kind of moves to Web3 today. Really, it, what that means is you, as the individual that you know have the data about yourself with the birthdays and, and, and so forth locations, you own the data and you have the opportunity to actually monetize from such data. And that leads to kind of some of the uh, other concepts such as the metaverse, in which you know you, you know you can potentially own your own digital property rights, um, decentralized finance, uh, in which case there's you know potentially no intermediaries becomes a peer peer approach. The whole purpose is here is that you own the data uh, as you know it's, since it's your own data. So then, what is a blockchain? Okay, well, blockchain is it's it's kind of a highest turn. It's it's simply a ledger. Okay, think about your accounting ledger. Think about your bank account. It's credit and debit, and and you know what the blockchain is is basically a giant ledger that's on a you know a public transparent location somewhere in you know in the cloud, and that it records transactions, and that each ledger is made out of blocks, and each blocks are being recorded, uh, and you know a next one will be created, and if you think about this process in, in forever, this becomes a blockchain, okay, and the purpose of this is that okay chains are you know um, irreversible, it's immutable, and that each block kind of strengthens the verification of the previous block. Uh, it's meant to be decentralized because no individual group has control of this whole blockchain thing. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it's transparent. Every single one of us, you know, if we just go Google and go and, and click on one of the blockchain explorer, you will be able to see every single block since the very genesis, which means the very first block. So the whole idea is that it's about transparency. And kind of the, some of the, you know, the, the purpose of that is, okay, it's a ledger, yes, but it's also pseudonymous, right? It, you know, it doesn't record your, your, your name, your, your ID number and so forth. Anyone really with a wallet can access this blockchain. Um, and the data is meant to be immutable, right? Again, you cannot change the past. Um, it's you know it's quite safe in the sense that it's nearly impossible to hack a you know a large blockchain such as Bitcoin. Um, it's very easy to access, really, if you just need to have a, a wallet address, which I'm sure I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about at a later slide. Um, anyone can have an easy and then free access to the blockchain, um, which again is kind of the main purpose of this technology. So you can talk about the blockchain, and without talking, mention a little bit about. Bitcoin, the one that, that we keep hearing about. Well, Bitcoin, really published in 2008 by um, somebody by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, created a pseudonymous creator of the uh, of Bitcoin white paper, and it's really talking about the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, right? The whole idea is that, you know, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, um, you know, they can do it uh, on over the blockchain, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. And actually, you know, Block, uh, Bitcoin just celebrated its 15th year uh, anniversary, uh, and you know the whole rhetoric about about uh, this particular asset as an institutional asset class is growing stronger by the day. Again, I'll highlight a little bit more about this in the later slides. Use cases. Okay, so we we on the, on chapter one we highlight a little bit on technology, on the fundamental technology on uh, that is known as blockchain. Cryptocurrency is really just one application of blockchain. Okay, so what what exactly are are they? So the goal is trying to decentralize financial instruments. A lot of times you hear you know this concept on storage of value. They try to you know the digital gold, or this concept of you know uh, stable coin, um, you know tokenized assets and so forth. The whole idea here is that basically, you know, cryptocurrency is a, it's a type of digital asset that really is intended to serve the same purpose as some of the traditional, you know, US dollar, um, other type of uh, fiat currencies while being secured by the cryptographic technology underpinned by blockchain. So a stable coin would be a, you know, an ex expression of a cryptocurrency. So what, what is that? It basically is a way for people and users to hold the value of a certain token, um, given that, you know, we know that sometimes the volatility of other cryptocurrency could be, could be quite high. So the whole point of stablecoin is that it's stable and it's generally pegged to a currency and most widely known, uh, uh, be used with US dollar. 
So the whole idea of the stable coin is that it's intended to be around traded at one US dollar at all time. And so in order to do that, there's various ways to do it. You know, you had to peg to, you know, the, the um, you know, in this case, US dollar. Obviously, it needs to be backed by real world assets. In this case, US dollar in a bank account somewhere. Um, you know, it's low, relatively low risk, uh, easier to access. And the whole idea is that it's completely transparent. Again, thinking about the previous example on blockchain assets, it's transparent, it's easy to transfer. Generally speaking, depending on blockchain, it probably costs a fraction of some of the remittances uh, players that would charge in, in the real world. And the whole idea is here is that you can now use something that's stable and use that as a funding currency to say other currencies like Bitcoin, maybe uh, NFT, and et cetera, et cetera. So speaking of NFTs, what is that? I mean, it was probably one of the uh, biggest buzzwords last summer. Um, NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, okay? Whereas in the previous example, the stable coin, Bitcoin, is actually an expression of fungible. So what is the difference between fungible and non-fungible? So think about this dollar bill that you have in, in, in your wallet or whichever currency that, that you have, right? If you owe somebody that $1 bill, you can give that to anybody and it's considered $1. For a non-fungible tokens, Right. Think about this example, but whereas on this dollar bill, you put a signature on it and date it. Right. That becomes unique. Probably the only dollar bill in the world where your signature and your date, you know, is on this specific part of the dollar bill. Right. It's one and only in the entire world. Into which case, then, let's say that if you were to lend it to somebody else and you want it back, you can only obviously take that one unique uh, asset back. Right. So the whole idea is that it's unique. Another way to look at this is think about artwork, right? There's only one Mona Lisa, the one and only, the real one. Um, and so it's the idea is that, you know, it's not fungible in the sense that this, you know, it's purely authentic, it's unique, uh, it's also transferable. And again, you know, um, it can be, you know, you trade on the blockchain in a very transparent manner. And there are, you know, various use cases of NFTs, real world ownerships, digital art, gaming, music are just some, some examples. Tokenization, what does that mean? It really means make anything digital. So you're tokenizing something. So the two things that the example I mentioned earlier, stable coin and um, NFTs are really also the expression of tokenization. In the first stable coin, you're literally making US, you're tokenizing US dollar, right? Then that becomes a token called a stable coin that represents dollar for dollar um, of the underlying assets. In a case of a piece of art, you're tokenizing this Mona Lisa, right? You're making Mona Lisa become a token and that token represents a unique um, uh, artwork that is this actual uh, painting and that token can now be freely traded um, and, and transfer on the blockchain. So the sky's the limit here. The whole idea is that it eliminates traditional barrier uh, such as you know going through um, you know the underwriting process, the kind of the uh, the various service providers, and ultimately increase increase liquidity and ready access to this particular token. Okay, chapter three, mar market size. Okay, the reality is you know the, the current market size, and you'll see on the right hand top right hand side of the screen, you'll see it says US dollar one point three four. I mean, the, you know this this number changes quite often. Okay. At the peak of the crypto market cap, is you're looking at about $3 trillion. Um, you know, during the, the bear market that we observed, you know, over the past year and a half, you know, it dipped uh, to below one, but given kind of recent market rally as of today, we're about 1.5, right? But crypto market is really just the, you know, a, a small represent uh, representation of this overall market size, okay? Um, what we're very interested in, it's not just about cryptocurrency, which again, is just one application. It's think about tokenizing traditional assets, right? So if you think about the traditional world as, as measured by stocks and bonds and FX and, and commodities, we're now talking about hundreds of trillions in potential market size that could be um, digitized, right? So the idea is that, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of different projections. Um, you know, this one says, you know, US dollar 10 trillion by, by 2030. Uh, the reality is, if you look at you know a you know standard VC kind of type of graph, it's very upward to the right, and it goes straight up, right, representing that the growth potential in this space is very immense. 
Um, so one of the, some of the opportunities, and these are just really just a, a couple headlines as of late, is the whole rhetoric on institutional adoption. Okay. We know that there's been, you know, negative connotation with, you know, say Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies and and relating to various nefarious activities and, and, and so forth, right? So there's really that, that educational process that we think that, you know, it's important to, to share, right? That yes, uh, an instrument uh, could be, have good use cases, but used wrongly, it could obviously have, you know, um, bad use cases as well. But I think for the purpose here is that, again, with Bitcoin as the kind of the barometer uh, entering, you know, 15 years in, in, in you know, in, in the industry, um, look at some of the headlines. Coinbase enters Singapore in partnership with Standard Charter, Deutsche Bank to hold crypto for institutional clients, BlackRock, uh, you know, filing for their uh, crypto, uh, Bitcoin um, ETF, um, you know, a sovereign like El Salvador adopts Bitcoin's currency. I mean, you know, these are kind of household names from, you know, the corporate world as well as, you know, on the government sovereign side of things. And I think the whole purpose here is that we are entering a phase where institutions, enterprises are becoming more and more familiar um, and more comfortable with this new technology. And there's a reason for that. And we'll certainly get into some of that um, uh, later. Regulations. Okay. So speaking about institutional adoptions, you cannot talk about the work of regulations because at the end of the day, you know, some of the most traditional, you know, Fortune 500 companies, asset managers, you know, one of their biggest concern is obviously to make sure that um, the product is safe and secure for their investors, right? And so without kind of proper guar guardrails, and that's when you kind of have seen some of the uh, the negative publicities with, you know, misuses and, and various things that, that you might read on, on you know, on, on paper. So wh where exactly are we with respect to a global uh, regulatory landscape with respect to crypto assets, right? So... Looking at the screen on, on, on the right hand side, right, it's a, it's a high level kind of overview on, on where things are uh, with respect to, to crypto assets. Now, there are kind of differences uh, in terms of the, the regulatory kind of, um, of uh, attitude. So, for example, you have all the way with, say, for example, China that bans cryptocurrency. They're very pro blockchain technologies, but they outright banned cryptocurrency a few years back, right? That's on, on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, yeah, I'd say Hong Kong, for example, um, you know, really starting to fostering uh, cryptocurrency as an asset class. In fact, issuing, uh, providing the issuance uh, framework such that uh, potentially retail investors can actually trade on regulated exchanges that are obviously going through the gauntlet of being licensed uh, in order to provide this service. Singapore's payment services has been around since 2021. Uh, one of the earlier kind of um, uh, uh, countries and, and, and governments to really foster blockchain technology uh, and some of the use cases that it might bring to you know to the real world. Dubai, for example, you know under the the new newly established um, regulatory uh, authority called VARA for sure has been very friendly with respect to attracting Web three uh, enterprises to the Middle East. In Europe, um, you know one of the um, there's a, a markets and crypto asset regulation called Mika uh, that really went into effect this year and, and will go through various levels of enforcement in, a, in the coming years. This is an EU-wide framework, right? So now literally the single uh, largest uh, block of economy uh, will have a uniform uh, rules around dedicated uh, crypto asset regulation, right? Again, you know, all signs that points to a more regulated and more transparent um, um, uh, industry with more guardrails to protect uh, in, uh, investors. This is part of the reason why uh, institutionals are coming into uh, this ecosystem. Okay, so I want to share a little bit about uh, as a very quick study, right? Because I'm sure you know we talk, we hear about FTX quite a bit, and Bank of Freed, and 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 so forth. So what kind of happened, right? Just keep keep in mind that FTX itself, for for those who may not be aware. Uh, FTX is a crypto exchange. In fact, it was formerly the second largest crypto exchange by volume at a point in time. Um, in a matter of seven days, after a kind of a known uh, a leaked uh, balance sheet on a popular um, uh, me uh, uh, crypto focused media, uh, essentially in seven days, the, this darling basically collapsed into bankruptcy, and this this 
cryptocurrency actually, again, was uh, at the previous valuation was valued at $28 billion with some of the most notable uh, investors uh, on the planet. Okay, so kind of what happened? Well, I'll start with one of the quotes from John Ray III, who is actually the new uh, FTS CEO kind of overseeing, overseeing the bankruptcy process. And, and I quote, um, never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here, unquote. Just a very quick background, John Ray, is that he actually oversaw the Enron bankruptcy. At that point in time, the largest bankruptcy in US history at that point in time. Okay, so he knows a little bit about uh, poor governance. And I think this, this, uh, this quote kind of sums it up, right? It's really the mismanagement of funds. There's a lack of regulatory oversight. There's a lack of liquidity and, and kind of over concentration of, of control uh, beyond many, many things. So the idea here is that, you know, the, the, the FTX issue to me is really not a crypto issue, right? Because this is really talking about lack of control. And I actually do believe that, you know, with regulations providing a little bit more oversights and more kind of control and, and more um, uh, guardrail for entities operating in this space, this then builds trust for the industry players and therefore will be able to enable more and more new entrants into this space. So chapter five, I want to talk a little bit about digital asset custody and why that matters and relevant to all the uh, previous uh, previous uh, discussions, right? Remember, recall that, you know, in the earlier stages, you know, blockchain or, you know, we'll use just Bitcoin as a, as a you know, as an example. How do you access it? We mentioned that it's free. We mentioned that it's easy to, to access, okay? Because like the question is, okay, well, like now that I won't have access to Bitcoin, we know that you can, not touch Bitcoin. So, well, how do you, where do you put your Bitcoin, right? You can't put it in your bank account. It doesn't work that way, right? Because the technology is fundamentally different. So there's really three main ways to put your digital asset or really to safe keep it at a, at a, a more precise matter, right? The very first way is what we call self-custody. It means that you are responsible for safekeeping your private keys. And we'll, I'll talk about the concept of private key Shortly, but it means that you, as an individual or an investor, you're responsible for safekeeping of your own digital assets. You can think about this analogy as kind of like keeping your cash, you know, physical cash under your pillow. Okay. The second part is, you know, there are kind of intermediaries. Exchange is just one example. Like for example, think about exchanges uh, where you want to buy and sell certain assets, right? So the idea here is that, okay, well, I'm going to put my Bitcoin on these, you know, intermediaries. So then it helps me ready to buy and sell, provide liquidity to, to my investment, right? So that's, that's another way. Basically, you're leaving the private key ownership to these intermediaries, okay? Thirdly is, you know, you have a licensed custodian, right? So recall that in the traditional world, you have so, you know, the custodian bank will be the likes of BNY Mellon, State Street, JP Morgan, Northern Trust, et cetera. Um, the purpose of this custodians, uh, like tech trust, is that typically, generally speaking, they are regulated. And at a high level, they are legally liable for any lost assets um, under certain, obviously, certain, um, you know, eligible conditions. Uh, and the whole point about being licensed is that, you know, they are complying with, you know, various jurisdictions, uh, regulatory frameworks such that, you know, the, the end consumer are more uh, confident that these type of players are, you know, playing by the rules, okay? So generally speaking, you know, there are different ways to, to these are the main three main ways, okay? And so custody, right, was really one of the biggest reason, in my opinion, that, you know, that's leading to kind of institutional adoption and more and more uh, new entrants into this space, okay? So, Let's talk a little bit about the history about custody in general. Okay. Custody 1.0 is really, okay, well, private keys, you know, we have this, you know, password um, that I, I, I need to, to have in order to, to have access to, to, you know, my wallet that holds, you know, my, my, my Bitcoin. Fantastic. What I'm going to do is I'm just literally going to print it out on a piece of paper and I'm literally, so that's my password, print on a piece of paper and I might put that in a safe. And if I need to access my wallet, I open my safe, I take a look at this piece of paper, 
I type in the actual, you know, the hex decimals in that on my piece of paper, and now I have access to my wallet. Okay. Very rudimentary, right? That's what we call paper wallets. Um, and needless to say, it's probably not safe, right? If you think about the immutable nature of blockchain, it means that God forbid you lose, you know, you totally forgot you lost a piece of paper, you forgot about it. You will not get your assets back. There is no fail safe uh, in the blockchain land, which is, you know, uh, one of the main features uh, of blockchain. Okay. So we know that's probably not scalable, right? You know, we know that some of the biggest asset managers, the, you know, the big investment bank, the asset managers, they're probably not going to, you know, invest billions of dollars into the space, especially client assets into something that is probably quite vulnerable. Okay. So then we move to, to custody 2.0 era, which is the institutional grade framework. Okay. So this is a really kind of, you know, the time when Hex Trust really came about back in 2018 is that, okay, well, we're going to do things the right way. We're going to offer a fully licensed digital custody solution tailoring to institutions and some of the largest uh, players in the industry so that, you know, when they do believe in, you know, the idea of cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and all things digital assets and so forth, that they know that their digital asset is safe. They don't have to worry about losing their assets. They don't have to worry about this thing called private key because, you know, they know that there is, you know, control in place uh, that offers segregation of duty and so forth. So then they can deposit, they keep, and withdraw a digital asset. Right? That's really the three main thing of, um, on custody through 2.0. And this is quite important because this, this whole technology, just like, you know, blockchain, is completely greenfield. Okay. There's no kind of existing, uh, you know, legacy infrastructure um, that can do this, right? So, you know, this entire industry is brand new. That means that we build everything from scratch to make sure that there is a, a known solution, um, knowing that, you know, believing the longevity of this asset class. Um, so, again, everything is uh, building from specialized technology, uh, you know, leveraging best practices that we learn from the traditional world. Now we're actually entering the, the whole era of, of custody 3.0, right? So to me, this is, you know, the, the, the era that we are in, in this 3.0 landscape. What does that mean? Well, the whole purpose of getting into the space, you know, it's not just about buying and selling. Yes, the trading firms love it. You know, when, when prices go up and, and you make money, everyone's happy, right? But buying and selling a digital asset is really just one small kind of, um, one small factor for leveraging this uh, this asset class, right? What a lot of the idea here is that people want to participate in this, you know, decentralized economy, access on chain solutions, um, you know, connectivity to different protocols for online lending, for example, um, maybe a whole you know NFT that represents underlying art, uh, underlying intellectual property to certain music rights, uh, GameFi where you can play on chain games. Right and and maybe earn some you know in game assets that you can you know potentially pass you know send to your friend maybe you can sell that for for some um, some amount right the sky's the limit here so the whole purpose is uh, is custody three point is that okay we still have the deposit safekeeping withdrawal functions right that's a given but how do we securely make sure that you are able to connect with the rest of the ecosystem. That's what making this um, industry so exciting. And we can do it the secure way. And really, this is kind of what um, the era of custody 3.0 that we are in today. Very high level, um, you know, I, I kind of alluded to it, traditional finance and custody and, and digital asset custody and, and the main difference. Again, the, the, the short answer here is that there is digital asset custody did not exist 10 years back, 15 years back, right? It's just, it's a completely new asset class. So, you will not, you know, so there's no kind of existing framework prior to that time. And therefore everything kind of has to build from scratch. And given that, you know, uh, blockchain technology, it's a technology, um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the uh, technical side of things uh, really needs to be done and built um, from scratch. So I, I alluded to a little bit about this concept of private key and public key. Okay. This is pretty uh, kind of a, you know, if you want to come to digital asset uh, space, I think this is something that I think all of us, you know, need to be aware. The whole idea here is that private key, as it kind of sounds, is that it should only be known to the owner. It's private, right? Okay? Whereas on the other side of public key, it's public, 
you know, it's okay to be shared widely, it, you know, and, and that's kind of how you, um, you know, uh, be able to kind of you know, receive some assets to, to, you know, to, to your wallet. Okay. What exactly is it though? Like what is the key here? Well, to be, you know, it's really just a very large number randomly generated. Okay. So if you look at on the bottom left side of your string, example of a private key, it's something like E9873, D, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So the whole idea, remember my early example on self-custody is chances are you may not memorize this, or if you do it, you know, memorize it today, you may forget about it tomorrow. But just again, if you forget about it, you cannot access your assets. So that's why, you know, protecting this really long string of random number is so important um, that might as well leave it to the expert in a digital asset custodian such that the custodian would be responsible for the generation, the safetyness, the usage of it, and the backup of said private key. Okay. So I think a great example of, of this is, you know, the one that people always use is think about your private key as the password, whereas the public key is your email address, right? You need your password in order to log into your email. But your email address really can be freely given to anybody, right? With the, the, without, without, you know, uh, any kind of uh, repercussion, right? That I need your email address to email to you. You need your email, you know, other people's email address to, to send email from. So that's, that's totally fine. And in order to access your email, you need this private key. Um, and again, the whole purpose is to make sure that this private key is safe in a secure manner. Okay. We talk a little bit about wallets in, in the space. Well, wallets, you can think about wallets kind of like account at, at a very high level, right? Everyone needs a wallet to be able to access um, cryptocurrencies under the by blockchain technology, right? So think about, um, you know, my account, um, um, you know, a wallet, so then I can, you know, buy or I can receive or I can send uh, Bitcoin, okay? So, we have two different types of wallet at a high level. One is hot, one is cold. What is the difference? The, the reality is at, at some point in the future, a wallet is just a wallet. You wouldn't even need to know the difference. Um, and this just shows how much kind of um, technology, um, you, know, had, you know, we've been innovating in this space. Hot at a high level, it means that the wallet itself is connected to internet. So let's, let's think about that for a second. I have my account that's connected to internet right? Just like your computer right now is probably connected to internet. Um, what that also means is that if you're connected to the internet, that means that you are subject to cybersecurity risk. Right? So if you're on the net, because it's public, chances are there's you know potential intrusions. And the whole idea with your account is that, okay, that introduces one attack factor that anyone within the world with an internet potentially, potentially could try to attack and get access to your wallet. Whereas on the right-hand side, the cold wallet is called cold wallets are kept offline. So you can think about this analogy as, okay, I have my laptop, there's no modem in it. Uh, there's literally no kind of part that, that connects to internet, not even plugged to your LAN adapter. So if I put it in my room, there's no possible technological way where intruders from you know, outside of my room can access my laptop and the data on it because there's literally no device uh, that can connect to the internet, right? So you can think about the difference between online and, and offline. And needless to say, generally speaking, OLC equal cold wallet is kind of known, currently known as the gold standard in terms of safekeeping of your assets. So about head trust. So I want to share a little bit about, about who we are and, and what we do. So Hex Trust, as I alluded to earlier, you know, we're one of the leaders in, in digital asset custodian. Uh, and the whole idea here is that back in 2018, we, you know, had been in the in industry and we believe that, you know what, digital asset with this um, technology kind of features and support could be the next big thing. Uh, and that as uh, digital assets or anything that's tokenized, be a Bitcoin, tokenized securities, tokenized, you know, central bank digital cash, and et cetera, et cetera, will be the default form um, of, you know, financial instruments in the future. However, at that point in time, you know, what's missing is the whole idea of custody. So think about some of the terms we had in the past is, okay, how do we make sure that this private key is safe? 
if BlackRock wants to come into the space um, with potentially billions and billions of dollars, how do they make sure that this this private key is safe and secure, such that you know if it's misplaced or it's compromised, etc., um, you know billions of dollars are at, on, on you know on, on the line. So we decided to build um, a hex trust um, as the kind of the infrastructure of the future, and we started by doing that you know via custody. Um, and ever since 2018, we've grown our staff to about 140 people globally, with offices in Hong Kong, Dubai, Singapore, Milan, and, and um, Vietnam. Um, you know, leading by you know a group of you know ex practitioners, uh, won several awards in terms of forefront innovations, such as being the first licensed custodian to support NFT. Um, what we've done, um, you know, the way that we go to market is to provide you know regulated services for institution, uh, institutional clients. So that we hold the trust company license in Hong Kong, um, you know, we were the first licensed custodian to hold their um, uh, to hold a, a digital asset custodian license uh, in Dubai under VARA, and we, you know, needless to say, under regulatory framework, we are complying with the strictest KYC ML requirements, uh, so that you know we can provide you know core infrastructure, institutional grade technologies to institutionals around the globe. A little bit more about about licensing and certification because we do believe that you know this this industry is going towards regulation and that in order to provide trust into this ecosystem for such that new interests will come in, we have to make sure that we adhere to the highest level of standard. So Hong Kong uh, registration front, registration Italy, regular in Dubai. And additionally, you know we have we hold the stock one type one, stock two type one, type two licenses audited by Deloitte. Um, as well as a few various sort of certification uh, to make sure that we are, um, you know, doing what we say we are. Um, with that, uh, I'll I'll pause here for um, any comments and questions that uh, you may have. Brilliant! Thank you very much for that, Calvin. That's a very very good insight into. The world of blockchain, um, kind of some clarifications on the on the current crypto market, uh, and then also a deep dive into custodian, um, the, the role of cust custody in this market. Um, I, I think a lot of people might not be aware of the extent of how well established it is, especially considering you know Hex Trust's role in it. So, look, I have a couple of questions which I've divided kind of into more around the blockchain and then more about Hex Trust further down the line. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to maybe talk about uh, sustainability in blockchain. Um, so given the increasing importance of ecological sustainability in business and significant reduction in energy consumption by newer blockchain technologies, such as proof of stake, how do you envision blockchain, blockchain contributing to sustainable business practices um, and environmental conservation in the future? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, hundred percent. That you know, when when Bitcoin first came out, the whole concept of proof of work, obviously, you know, was was a talk about, uh, you know, costing quite a bit of electricity, and and that led to the whole new technology on proof of stake, and that whole Ethereum move from proof of work, um, you know, costing energy to to proof of stake, uh, you know, um, you know, saving ninety nine percent of the energy cost. Now, I think that the point here with respect to sustainability is that. The same underlying technology that is blockchain can be leveraged to in, um, to basically enhance this sector. For example, carbon credit, right? It's, it's a common thing about about kind of offsetting, you know, carbon emissions and so forth. Um, you can actually also tokenize that, right? Going back to my my early comment about you can tokenize just about anything. So what that means is that okay, if you can tokenize carbon credit and make that readily available to investors and, and trade that. Right, that's actually one expression of how you can potentially decrease the emission um, from from carbon. Right. So again, I think these are are uh, you know just one use case. Um, you know the whole ESG concept obviously it's very very widely talked about, but the G in in ESG in in terms of you know governance. Yeah. Right. I, I think blockchain technology is the perfect example of that because it's transparent. It's literally on the blockchain. It's immutable. You can't change that. Uh, so think about governance, you know, voting, for example, uh, leading to a certain outcome. I mean, these provides ultimate transparency on the blockchain. 
Fantastic. Thanks for giving those insights. Um, and now moving on maybe to more blockchain and enterprise. Um, so with the growing adoption, obviously, of blockchain by enterprises for improved security, transparency, and decentralization, which you touched upon, how do you see blockchain technology transforming traditional business operations? And perhaps what industries do you predict will be the most impacted by this change? Yeah. So on, on the technology front, again, we're, we're so early. Right. So yeah. the, the industry that benefited from Washington so far has been the financial services sector. Right. So we talked a little bit about Bitcoin as a potential asset class because you buy and sell stablecoin, et cetera. I mean, that's really the financial sector as a friend for first use case. Now, where I do think at some point in, in the future where it would be, you know, um, super beneficial and, and disruptive is supply chain. Yeah. Because if you think about supply chain, blockchain, then except that there's a little one word difference. If you think about supply chain, it's literally going through a certain process and procedure. You have to make sure reconciliation, you have to make sure things are done properly in the right control. Um, but a lot of that right now is still done manually. Probably not even digitizing. I'm talking about manually, right? If you even think about letter of credit, trade finance, and things like that people are literally looking at a piece of paper and writing things and double checking, okay? Imagine blockchain technology is used. This is the entire purpose that there's a chain of command through history. It's verified through a consensus. So we know it's accurate, right? You don't even have to worry about reconciliation and that you don't even have to worry about auditing and, and manual inputs because that's you know prone to fat fingered error, et cetera. This technology can streamline the entire operational process. So when I talk about blockchain technology, a lot of times because people think about um, the dollar that, that that's attached to some of the you know, cryptocurrencies, to me, implementing a blockchain technology is not about generating revenue. It's to minimize cost, in my opinion, right? That cost efficiency is to me what makes blockchain technology disruptive. Yeah, I totally see that with the supply chain. I think it's it's. I've 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 been a lot. I've been very interested in supply chain for a long time, and I think just for example, I read a use case where, um, for example, at the ports uh, of entry, ports of entry into the country, that could have massive ramifications for governments, but also uh, private enterprises in the sense of it could reduce, for example, storage uh, significantly. Uh, because of that tracing of where it's coming from. So I don't know too much about it, but I've read that and it's, it seemed really, really interesting. Um, look, in terms of moving ahead, uh, there's two more questions on the blockchain. The first one is global trends. And then after one, I'd like to hear your future predictions about around it. But so given new regulatory frameworks, as you've mentioned in the EU, and also developments happening uh, in Singapore, um, the UAE, um, and a lot of other markets, what key global trends are you observing in blockchain adoption? Yeah, I mean, I would say absolutely on the regulatory side, it's absolutely the one of the, the key driver. And I think, you know, if you, I mentioned a little bit about FTX and, and kind of what an unfortunate event that that was, but if you look at the silver lining of the collapse of FTX, it's that it really brought regula regulation forward by at least a few years. Mm. Okay. So looking at the various jurisdictions, right? I mentioned a little bit about Asia Pacific, Hong Kong, Singapore, Middle East, you know, Dubai, uh, Europe with uh, Mika and et cetera. Uh, and US, which is, you know, has a little bit of regulatory, you know, uh, unclarity there. I think that whether it's clear or unclear, whether it's friendly or not friendly, the constant is that there is regulation. Like regulation is coming uh, in various parts of, of the world. And I think that's important because you know, traditional assets are regulated. Stocks and bonds are regulated. What that also means is that it legitimizes this digital asset as a form of, you know, a legitimate financial instrument. So that at, at some point in the future, there is no difference between, you know, buying a Bitcoin versus buying a stock. It's just a financial instrument, Yeah. right? Obviously the technology is, is a little bit different. Right. So I think we are absolutely going towards that direction in terms of legitimacy of this asset class. Great. And I think this leads well to the next question in terms of looking ahead, where do you see the blockchain um, slash and crypto industry in the next five years? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm super bullish. Uh, it's biased opinion, but I, I am. And, and why is that? Because 
in my in my five years in the professional in, in this industry, five years ago when I was speaking to some of the largest financial institutions, they pretty much brushed me off. Okay. Maybe three years ago, it was okay. This is interesting. Let's chat. So it was really very education. Maybe two years ago, it kind of started to lead to some some um, you know tangible conversations. Uh, some some you know institutions you know went with POCs and and you kind of start to see institutional adoption. Now at this point in time, I'm pretty confident that major financial institutions around the world are you know have some type of digital asset strategy. Mm. Now you know the the kind of the progression might may differ, but obviously the the kind of the poster child right now is BlackRock's ETF uh, application to uh, for for you know spot uh, Bitcoin as uh, as an example. So in five years time. In my opinion, is that this industry will continue to grow and, and flourish, uh, and that you know education will play a big part, right? As people more and more understanding of what is a private key, right? If I want to, you know, be in this industry, okay, well, um, you know, how to use, make sure that I don't lose my assets? How do I, um, you know, get a wallet? I mean, these are still questions very new to a lot of new entrants, and it could be scary because it's new, but. As more and more education provided to this industry, as the application become more and more user friendly, yeah, right. Um, as people become more familiar with this concept, uh, it's just it's a new concept, just underpinned by different technology. I think I really do believe in five years time, um, you know, this industry will be a complete next level, and that people might have less differentiation about digital assets versus some of the other traditional assets. Right. Hopefully that, that that's where we get to. I think I think you're right in terms of education. It's really important um, that educating the market and educating the the people using it will be will be a massive um, and maybe a bit more stability. I think that will come with regulation though. So um, hopefully we get there. Um, well, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, now in terms of hex trust, a bit more, right? So with everything you've said, it sounds like you know the, the blockchain industry in general, the crypto industry has seen a lot of volatility, right? How do you stay agile in this rapidly evolving um, market? Even for me personally, or, I mean, or I, Hex Trust so, in general? Why not both from a, from a <laughs> you both. perspective and then from a Hex Trust perspective? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I think in, in, in general, right? What is myself or Hex Trust? I mean, the beauty of the, this industry is that it doesn't stop, right? It's twenty four seven. Okay, so so you know, from a personal perspective, needless to say, you know, it's it's difficult at times because all of our clients, partners, they're all over the world, right? So time zone difference it matters to me. It doesn't matter to crypto. It just keeps going. For me, at some point, I need to sleep, right? And this goes to to our partners. But you know, if you really believe in something that you're building, if you really believe in industry that's growing. To me, it's obviously well worth it, right? So that's that's how it, it, I motivate myself, and and it really in that from that perspective, you really need to constantly educate yourself because there's always something new, and that's exciting, right? There's something new that you don't see in the textbook that you were taught growing up, right? We will eventually be the ones writing the textbook for the next generation, right? So that that's how it it, it motivates me. On the Hextra side, again. We built the fundamental, which is custody. That's how we started the business because as I alluded to it, it really kind of builds a very fundamental, the you know, the building pillar um, of digital assets. So from our perspective, we're just going to continue to build on top of that, mm. right? We're going to enhance our our offering. So, you know, we, we um, mentioned a little bit about this whole custody 2.0 to custody 3.0 switch. Maybe one day will be this thing called custody 4.0, right? At, at some time in the future. But the idea right now is that we pretty much solve the concept of institutional grade custody, right? We build the technology, we build the guardrail, we build the various uh, you know workflows to make sure that okay it fits the requirement of a large institution. So that's one from a product perspective. Secondly, is again, it's focusing on connecting with the best thing that this industry has to offer, the central evidence, everything, right? So we we build that. And the important thing here is that on the technology front, we have to be agile. Uh, we talk, you know, we, from our perspective, we most recently partnered up with uh, MetaMask Institutional that we that we announced. MetaMask Institutional is this, you know, wallet uh, uh, connectivity that can essentially connect to, I, I think, like over nineteen thousand different applications on on um, within the blockchain world. So now it gives our users the ability to have secure access to some of the coolest projects out there, right? And that's important. 
Um, on the other side, from a regulatory front, again, it's within our DNA since 2018 to be regulated compliant uh, with the prevailing uh, uh, you know, local juris uh, jurisdictions. So needless to say, we will continue to work with regulators, continue to educate them, continue to see, you know, share what we see uh, and apply best practices uh, from industry participants. That's like, great. Um, I think, you know, touching upon what you've just talked about, from from a hex trust perspective, I know you mentioned partners, but who is the ideal client for hex trust, and how do you build? That's first question, and then second one is uh, how do you maintain trust in such a dynamic and volatile field? Yeah, absolutely. On, on your first point on our ideal uh, target audience, so hex trust we don't serve as retail clients, so essentially institutional clients. Um, and I would say, you know, accredited investor, professional investors um, are our uh, our target audience. So to kind of break that a little bit further, we service really anybody uh, from the traditional financial service world. So the banks, the insurance companies, the, the traditional, you know, the Fortune 500 companies. Um, you know, we have luxury brands on, on our cap table, um, all the way to what we call the Web3 natives. So these could be crypto exchanges. This could be the you know the blockchain foundations that's launching uh, blockchains. This could be the different projects that's building on top of you know, uh, you know on top of various blockchains like the the lending platform etc. This could be the asset managers. This could be the family offices um, that are already investing and deploying capital into this space. Uh, in fact, we will you know we started talking to various um, governments and and kind of regulatory bodies. Uh, to to help them understand what they can do uh, with respect to to blockchain. Okay, so so that's that's really point point number one. Point number two in terms of sustaining trust. Well, there's a trust in our name, right? With Hex Trust, it's not without reason. Okay, in fact, it, it's, a, it's it's a dual play on 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 the word trust, right? It's one first of all is because we have a trust company license in Hong Kong. Okay, so actually in in Hong Kong, you cannot have the word trust in your uh, company profile without being a trust, right? That's obviously to protect consumer, not, not be uh, thinking that you're working with a potential, uh, uh, you know, licensed body when, when they're just not, right? So that's, that's really kind of how, how our name came about. But obviously it's a pun to the, the, the word trust because at the end of the day, we are a custodian. We own the password, the private key to your digital asset because that's what we're, you know, paid to do as a professional. So you, institutions do entrust us with billions of dollars in assets under custody. That's a huge trust. Yeah. So in order to gain, you know, and maintain this highest level of satisfaction, we do a few things. One is, you know, again, is to be regularly compliant in jurisdictions that offer such, um, you know, a framework, right? So, so to be regulated by the regulators, you know, is no easy feat. It's a lot of education. It's a lot of, um, you know, application process, interviews and so forth, uh, which, you know, perhaps maybe the unregulated entities do not uh, want to go through, but we're willing to go through that because we have the right policy and procedure in place, right? Second of all is, okay, I tell you that I have these policy and procedure in place. Okay, should I just take your word for it? Well, no, don't trust us because we are, you know, we went through a SOC 1 SOC 2 uh, certification and we have all of the financials, so we do engage with reputable uh, service provider to say, okay, audit us, right? Because we are telling, you that we are doing these things yeah and so we have the certifications to, to kind of prove that we will always continue down this path thirdly is again you know to me you know as overseeing you know the client's activities at hex trust client servicing is of the utmost importance to me yeah right we always have the best interest of the clients at, at hand this obviously goes beyond just custody this is about really providing top-notch services and really providing this uh, high level of professionalism and providing the best client servicing in the industry. And that obviously would build trust over time. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, look, I have a uh, two, three more questions and then we're, we'll wrap it up. Um, are there any new markets sectors Hex Trust are exploring currently? And um, can you maybe discuss, if you can, some key partnerships that have been crucial for, for your growth? Yeah, sure. So I think for from our perspective, you know, we do have an open in terms of partnership. We have a very open, you know, ecosystem, right? But we we believe that we have to partner with people, yeah, um, to kind of make it to to the next level. I would say earlier on in our journey, we were you know partnered with IBM. Okay, you know, we leveraged the IBM hardware security module 
uh, with respect to our um, encryption and, and safekeeping of our, our private key. Uh, so in fact, I think we were probably the first digital asset custodian uh, to work with IBM on, on, on that front, right? So that was kind of early on a journey. Um, moving forward to, to you know, our more recent uh, um, kind of uh, uh, journey, uh, we, you know, we work with Animoca brands very closely. Animoca brands, for those that may not know, outside the Web3 world, it's one of the largest um, investors in the metaverse uh, industry, uh, always promoting digital property rights, uh, and they've been a very strong partner of ours. Um, so that, that that's really been great. I mentioned a little bit on MetaMask Institutional, and this is quite important. And again, this is a little bit more on the on the traditional side of things. Uh, sorry, on, on the more crypto native side of things. This partnership really enables secure access to so many different applications in, in the DeFi world, right? So I think that's also super helpful to our clientele. Okay, great. Oh. Yeah, go for it, sorry. Sorry, I forgot the second question. The second uh, question. Beyond the partnership. Uh, after the partnership, it's are there new markets sector sectors that you guys are exploring? Yeah, so from a kind of a product perspective, right? I mentioned a lot about custody, right? Again, again, that's that means safekeeping is 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 you know it's check the box and we 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 we've got that and we have the uh, ready uh, proven solution. But again, we know that that's not what our clients want at this point. Only what uh, what our clients want at this point. So we do have a couple other um, you know uh, segments that that products that we offer the first one is the markets arm mm -hmm. so we do have a separately um, you know markets arm that provides liquidity so think about you know we do have an OTC desk that provides you know trade execution uh, including fiat on an offering so all things liquidity getting into crypto getting out of crypto right we do have traders uh, you know um, ready to, to help our clients on that on that perspective the other pillar is all things um, you know, reward generation, right? Because at the end of the day, you want some type of, um, you know, call it interest, call it rewards, call it, yeah. you know, however you want to do it, is that there's some type of gain to be had by, you know, coming to the industry. So what I mean by that is, okay, we can offer staking. Again, it's a very, you know, crypto concept, but, you know, we can offer staking services to, to our client, as well as structured solutions, uh, financing solutions that, you know, can provide uh, additional uh, compensation to, to our clients. And actually, we are launching an asset management arm. So why this is also relevant is providing an institutional grade uh, framework for fund management. Uh, so then our institutional clients globally would have an access to a particular uh, you know, investment strategy that obviously would have a crypto component to it. Definitely sounds really exciting, all of this, Calvin. Um, look, and final question I ask everyone in a slightly different way, but if you had to give um, one piece of advice to an individual who wants to get into this space, what what would be your one piece of advice? Yeah, I mean, look, it's 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 interesting because remember in the bull market about two years ago, I probably had so much, so many of these CDs on, on my desk that I can I can read because everybody wanted to come in. In the past bull market, got a lot less. Right. So what that means is you know, when I receive CV these days, I really want to show what, why you're interested in this space. A lot of interviews I've done, you know, people just, candidates would tell me, oh, because, you know, crypto is cool, it has a lot of growth potential. Okay, I believe you, I agree with that, but tell me what type of research you've done. Why is it, do you believe in growth potential, mm. right? And, and this could be, you know, uh, obtained from, you know, easily Google, you can Google something very, uh, you know, very easy these days. So you really have to show us why is it that you're interested beyond just kind of headline like, oh, because Bitcoin is at $44,000. So I, I love crypto, <laughs> right? You have to talk about why is the technology amazing? What is, why is NFT, you know, can potentially disrupt digital property rights? Uh, why is to tokenization could be the next big thing? Um, so you really have to do your homework in advance. Do, read some paper, read news article, and be able to explain why this industry is amazing. Fantastic. Well, I want to say uh, thank you for your time today, Calvin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Welcome to Capital HQ 
where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Hello, my name is Barry Sharples. I'm the executive chairman of Microgen, a small UK biotech company. And I've been asked today to talk about uh, my past and also the building of the Microgen team. And Microgen, first of all, just to let you know, our goal is to prom promote longevity and to prolong the period of quality active life. And we do that through the what we've built in terms of a technology uh, that is our secretomics platform technology. And we manipulate human stem cells to produce novel multifactorial products that have got over 2,000 components uh, from uh, over 450 microRNA, uh, extracellular vesicles, including um, exosomes and uh, peptides and proteins, uh, multifactorial, a, a soup of, of components that have the potential to address multiple uh, degenerative conditions. And we do this because uh, what we've, uh, what our chief scientist discovered uh, almost 30 years ago now is it's not the stem cells themselves that are re responsible for repair and regeneration. It's the actual secretions that the stem cells secrete. And it, it, as you can see there, we, we won Innovation of the Year, or Secretomics Platform did, um, when we came out of stealth mode earlier. Um, part of the, our larger presentation talks about the likelihood of giving you a return for it on your investment. And we talk about improving the chances of success. Um, and the first part of that is translating an established bespoke treatment that's used by hundreds of elite athletes and wealthy individuals. And um, democratizing that into something that can be used for millions of people. And uh, we'll, we'll get on to uh, that. But I, I want to concentrate for now on uh, having the right team. And that's the right team to execute uh, the, the plan. Our commercial experts have led IPOs and company sales. They've also handled multi-billion dollar budgets and multi-billion dollar transactions in the life sciences industry. And working for some of the companies here, some of the world's largest um, uh, drug companies. Steve Ray is the inventor of the technology <clears throat> and um, Steve was on faculty at Oxford Brookes University for 26 years. And um, he's the chap who's already translated that research that he did in his initial discoveries to treat hundreds of uh, elite athletes, um, including myself, actually, but I'm not an elite athlete. Um, I met Steve I, when I was uh, 20. I had a... a serious accident where I had a major oper operation on my knee and I've had three subsequent ones. And in 2012, I uh, I was on crutches, waiting for a knee replacement. And my doctors in Harley Street introduced me to Steve, who who changed my life, to be honest. It, it, that, that's all I can, that's, that's uh, how I can put it. He took me to Switzerland, took some cells out of my back, did some clever stuff uh, uh, with the cells, 
with uh, creating secretions, injected it into my arm. And within a month, the arthritic burn that I had on my knee uh, stopped. And uh, it wasn't uh, long after I started to uh, climb mountains around Europe, writing a book uh, for cancer research on a leg that I couldn't previously walk on. And, and actually behind me is a reminder from 1990, my friends uh, bought me a walking stick. Uh, I'll never forget that. And 20 years ago, I was told to stop running. And now I, uh, I, I can I can run on a leg that I could hardly walk on uh, 10 years ago. I know it's anecdotal, but now Steve has treated over 500 elite athletes, uh, Super Bowl players, ice hockey players, um, uh, premiership footballers, boxers, golfers. So... Um, uh, it's worked out uh, really, really well for me and him because what I did, I, I'd had previous businesses and uh, that I've founded and take them to sale. And uh, also I've done uh, founded two companies and built them to IPO. And I uh, I said to Steve when I met him, when he told me what, what he was doing, I, I said, it's all right for wealthy individuals what about the rest of the world? How can this uh, uh, this his work benefit those people? And he explained to me what needed to be done, and I told him I'd fund it and uh, help him do it and bring the right people in. And I believe I believe I brought the right people in to support him. And we look at uh, Adam, for example, who's our managing director from uh, uh, Novartis uh, and uh, Sanofi. He's a medical doctor. He's translated many drugs through from research into um, uh, mass-produced uh, clinical uh, products. Peter is our non-exec director. Who Peter has a uh, his family built business. He built over four hundred stores, stores which ultimately sold to Boots. Peter went on to chair Boots Healing Aid Care, and a great sounding board uh, for for everyone on the. Uh, in the company. Joe Kelly, business development director who spent, he's had a, she's had an outstanding career with AstraZeneca and uh, Joe has led multi-billion transactions. Uh, I think the biggest one she did was about $15 billion, um, which was transformational for uh, AZ. And she's done a number of, uh, of, of large transactions, let's say. Kerry, uh, Kerry um, is a English, solicitor and US lawyer, and as a former chairman of the Institute of Risk Management, he, he handles uh, risk for the company and also handles HR. Jim, as commercial de director, uh, he is a founding director of Clinigen, and Jim was responsible for Umira at Abbott and handled a $3 billion a year budget. And uh, Jim has, has led many uh, R&D uh, teams uh, throughout his career. So as you can see, quite a veritable uh, uh, group of, of experienced individuals. One thing we've got missing off that, as you've probably noticed, is a, a CFO. I handle all the finances along with our accountants to produce the monthly management uh, accounts and uh, do all the company uh, secretarial stuff. Uh, prior to IPO and, and during the process that we're going through with uh, Abel Shaw's um, is, uh, in 2024 to do a beauty parade, duty parade with the banks as a free IPO uh, uh, Series A uh, uh, exercise, we will be appointing a, a, a senior uh, financial officer. In terms of our scientists, we've got key opinion leading scientists as founders of the business. And uh, we have got numbers of professors, CBs, OBs. I've got a fellow and, and president of the Royal uh, College of Physicians and a group of uh, individuals that have developed many medicines uh, in, in careers and, and are working for these companies and uh, I'm going to come on and talk about each individual one. Uh, ben did his PhD specialising in the area that we 
uh, working and then heads up our operations. And he got his PhD under Professor uh, Keaton Patel, one of the uh, founders of the company, who, um, as it says, the, the head of uh, regenerative medicine and uh, molecular and cellular medicine at, at Reading. And he is a world authority on muscle uh, degeneration. Rob, who heads up power development and who is handling the uh, relationships with our clinical manufacturers, he also uh, did his thesis specialising in our area under Keaton at Reading. And Paolo, Paolo is a renowned uh, paediatric surgeon. He is the reader and head of stem cell and regenerative medicine at UCL. And he's leading the translation or the transition of, of, of what we're doing through to the clinic. Uh, Paolo, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll talk about Paolo a little bit more in a second. So those are uh, our founding scientists. And in terms of our clinical team, uh, Professor Alan Boyd, uh, Alan was the uh, he was the I have to pause this. Um, he was the president, 2018 president of the um, uh, Faculty of uh, Pharmaceutical Medicine at the Royal College of uh, Physicians, and he's, he's now a fellow at the... Alan has got a vast, vast experience uh, in translational medicine, and he's got, he, he runs Boyd's Consultancy, which works in the UK, Ireland, and the USA. And uh, he, he's just a, a wealth of knowledge. Kate is our advisory board chair, and um, great when we actually saw uh, the MHRA for the first scientific advice meeting that we had. Kate was one of the team, along with Alan and Paolo and, and, and Steve, uh, to, to represent Microgen. There were five people there from uh, MHRA, and three of them, the, the, the actual uh, experts in the field that we were discussing at the time, had all worked for Kate. So it, it really it, it helps with credibility with uh, with any company when you've got um, these type of people in, involved in in your business. And I mean, Kate, she was awarded the the highest honor uh, from the Royal Co uh, College, which is the James uh, Spence Medal in two thousand sixteen. Got some examples actually of, of what. Um, what our scientists had done previously. Uh, Steve was the inventor of the technology. Paolo, which uh, which I mentioned as, as one of the founders as well. You may have seen Paolo on the news only uh, the, the last couple of weeks. He, he led the team of Great Ormond Street in separating the uh, conjoined twins from Ireland. Um, uh, Ex-Harvard um, Medical School as well is, is Paolo. In terms of examples of, of our scientists' work previously, I apologise for the graphic uh, detail on here, but it just does show you the dramatic impact that stem cell secretions can have on um, on, on various uh, disease states. The the terrible one in the middle is is a, is a diabetic foot uh, with uh, old necrosis, and. Um, what you'll see there is within the space, if you can read the dates, it's, it's about four months. It's still looking rather angry, but uh, you can see the repair that's, that's been taking place there. And that foot fully recovered, and, uh, whereas uh, otherwise it, uh, it would have probably been amputated. Um, lesser foot below, but no less uh, inconvenient for the 80-year-old. 80 80 year uh, ulcers on the legs uh, for more than six years. Again, four months later, you can see the, uh, the effect of uh, on that particular foot. And uh, bottom left is actually a rugby player who is one of the directors of the company. Uh, I mentioned Carey earlier. That's four layers deep, that cut that they have on, on, on the field. And you will see that uh, only 70 odd hours later, uh, he didn't have it stitched. He did what all rugby players do, and he went to the pub, uh, holding his uh, holding his eye, and uh, uh, that uh, that 
not only repaired, but it got him interested in the company. And uh, obviously, he's, he's now a director of the business. Polo, uh, again, you'd have read about it in The Lancet uh, a couple of times. It's, it's been in, and it was news at the ten at the time when he he, he replaced a child's uh, uh, trachea with um, with a uh, caravas uh, uh, trachea, which he decellarized, took the cells from the patient, so took the cells from, from the, the the boy, seeded it onto the um, uh, uh, the decellarized one, and then uh, put it back into the patient. And that young lad is a, is a, is is grown now into a young man, and uh, and it was life saving uh, surgery. But just these are some of the previous work, just to show the extent and, and the the level of the uh, capabilities of our scientists. Um, there we have it. Our uh, our commercial offices are at Aldley Park at AstraZeneca's old site. Our uh, laboratories are at Thames Valley Science Park. You can email me at the email address uh, there or equally pick up the phone and, and, and give me a call. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Barry. Very <laughs> definitely extremely strong team. Um, and I think, you know, it's not every day that we come across a journey um, that's as fascinating as yours. You, you didn't really touch on what you've done previously, but you've built uh, two very successful companies and exited them, but in very, very different industries. Um, and you've managed to come into this space and, you know, uh, hire talents uh, such as uh, Athen Papadopoulos um, from Novartis and Sanofi, uh, Steve Ray, um, as well as Joan Kelly, former AstraZeneca VP. So, my question, my first question to you is when you first decided to venture into uh, regenerative medicine with Microgen, despite not coming from the industry, what was your starting point? Did you have a where do I even begin moment? And how did you navigate this new and complex terrain? I suppose the first thing really is the fact that we're starting, starting a few rungs up the ladder in terms of translating something that's already uh, established. And people can relate to that. And because it's so innovative, any scientist or anybody involved in the pharma industry has got to be inquisitive. Uh, in terms of me, where, where do I start? Um, actually, I don't think medicine is very much different from the technology businesses that I've been involved in and I've been involved in different uh, industries. Uh, techies, for example, have the same sort of mentality as scientists. They've got the same personalities, and that helps the the management and, and support of, uh, of your team. Um, does that answer your question? It, it does. It's it's just it's very intriguing the the way this you know your your mind works in the sense of it's the same. And I'm just going to build it, right? It's uh, it, it's it's definitely very intriguing. So, uh, you know, I have a couple more questions with it, which I think we'll deep dive more into this. Yeah. Um, which first? Oh, yeah. yeah, go for it. Sorry, I was going to say. Well, I, I think every business needs funding. Every business needs managing. Um, every business needs sales. You know, it, they're all the. It's all they are all the same. And um, what I lack in scientific knowledge is what you need to bring in in terms of expertise to help you with that. You can't know it, it doesn't matter what business you're involved in, you can't know everything. You've got to have the right team and uh, you've got to have people better than you are. I know it's a, an old adage, but uh, I've learned that over the years. Uh, to, to, I've suffered over the years by uh, at times not having the right people in the right place. and. Um, that's uh, that's something that's really helped me with mm. that. Great. I think I think this leads me to my first question. It's when you entered this space, how, where did you start to identify these these talent, mm. these scientific talents, these business development talents that have that network in the biotech uh, in the biotech space, the um, big pharma yeah. or pharma space. Do you know, what, one of the things that I found when I, when I started uh, this is how. It might sound a bit soft, but how nice the industry is. I know everybody wants to do good. You know, 
if we start saving and uh, improving people's lives, the money will come. You know, that, that's, that, that's, that's a given. Um, the, and what you've got is a real collaborative nature uh, to, to the industry. And people know each other. Mm. You know, and, uh, it's quite easy to network in, in, in this industry because there's always somebody knows somebody. And, um, and they also also uh, cross international borders. You know, we've got the likes of Paolo that was at, um, at uh, Harvard Medical School. He, he worked with uh, Agostino Piero, uh, eminent professor uh, at Sick Kids Children's Hospital in, in uh, Toronto that we deal with. They're the number one children's hospital. And, um, you know, two people that have worked together previously. I, I, we've got another um, uh, doctor who's looking at some lung conditions with us at, uh, at Sickett's uh, Hospital as well, who, again, work with Powerball. So that those two sort of um, good examples of, of uh, I suppose, also it was the same with, uh, with Jim. I, I met Jim at a conference. Um, we got uh, we got chatting about uh, his own difficulties with his own knee. And... Uh, uh, very soon after, I was sat down at a, at a dinner at AstraZeneca with uh, with Joe Kelly, and Joe actually knew Jim. They'd worked together, so it, it's it's funny how these things happen. It, but it's I, I think it's quite easy in such a collaborative environment, especially when you've got something as as um, as appealing to uh, what we believe uh, microgen's got. Mm, absolutely. And and talking about the, this appeal, um, how how do you cultivate this culture of uh, this vision, perhaps uh, amongst amongst your team, amongst the, the the directors, but amongst the rest of the team as well, in terms of um, moving forward and perhaps coming on board? You know how how yeah how do you cultivate that? Yeah, um, you're doing something that's quite compelling. Uh, that is. That's got to be number one, you know. It, 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 it's 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 seeing. I suppose my own story was was a big help, you know. Yeah. It, I know it's anecdotal as far as uh, uh, important in the industry, but life changing for me, absolutely life changing. I mean, you're talking about that, you know. We, we've Steve's got patients that were career ending injuries, you know. These are world class uh, 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 athletes playing in the Super Bowl with career ending injuries and mm. getting back on the field and, and playing again it's uh, it, that is life changing and um uh, with with you, with your team i suppose if you if you set it out with a company with an idea for a a, a molecule a, a, a small molecule drug um you go through the same procedure of discovery and, and taking it through the, all the clinical trials and um you, you never know, and we'll never know, to be, to be fair, whether we get the success um, uh, with millions of patients. You know, that will only come in a matter of time. But I think we've got more confidence than, than someone with a small molecule of drug has because there is history of yeah. making uh, uh, stem cell secretomes uh, effective and um, regenerative for uh, uh, for patients already. So it, it's not as if they are trying something new, but not something new that um, maybe maybe they, they, they feel that the risk is less. Maybe. Right. Um, okay. But in, ter in terms of the scientists, scientists like going down rabbit holes and uh, sometimes you've got to stop them. Um, but other times you've got to give them free reign because that's how they discover things. So it's trying to get that balance right with, um, it's a bit, like I said, if you compare to te technology, um, I've dealt with, uh, I've had hundreds of uh, mobile uh, programmers. And uh, if you leave them to develop a product, feature after feature after feature after feature, you just keep getting added. And you think, well, hold on, we don't need that. You know, just let's stick to this and we've got a good uh, good product. So, so I suppose that's the same with scientists. They they, they will continually look and continually uh, uh, think about uh, 
how many things we could achieve. Um, but that will come with time for us. You know, mm. what we want to do is get in the clinic, get to improve and save lives, and then just keep adding on uh, with uh, with the different therapeutics that we produce. So, uh, Barry, so considering, you know, your past to drawing on the insights and your expertise that you've had with the Hesketh Group and and to Argo, where, you know, you've grown it to, to hundreds of people in, in the company, um, how, you know, as Microgen continues to grow, how do you plan to scale that team effectively while ensuring the quality and specialized focused, um, specialized focus required for your work? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the good thing is I've been had hundreds of people in offices around the world in New York, Washington, Mumbai, Delhi, London, Manchester, Sydney. Um, what we're doing at uh, Microgen doesn't require a presence like that in other um, in other countries and doesn't require the hundreds of people that uh, that we've had to manage previously. Um, because the nice thing about this industry is, I mentioned earlier about collaboration, the big pharma companies and the big life science companies have got tremendous uh, distribution uh, channels. And um, it's doing partnership deals with them to license your products for that distribution. So they do all that heavy lifting uh, that's that's needed. And we, we'll, we'll avoid that. You know, as, as Microgen, I, I've always thought, if you have 50 people, you can, you've can you got a good personal relationship with, uh, with all of your team. Once you get beyond that, it starts to get uh, uh, more difficult. And I don't think we'll need more than 50 people. You know, we, we've, we've done the modelling and um, we, we think uh, 35, 40 people in, in time will be sufficient unless we um, we start our own manufacturing facilities. Um, but again, the industry is just full of, of uh, well, pharma companies that can, can uh, produce for you, as well as the contract manufacturing organisations. So we can be quite lean and yet... Um, a bit like some of these um, new internet companies where uh, they're turning over billions and there's uh, there's a handful of them uh, uh, in the office. Uh, yep. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I think and I'm enjoying this journey far better than previous journeys. Um, Why is that? I wouldn't say because of that, but that's a contributing factor. Uh, I think... Uh, I think the main thing has got to be the fact of what the industry is. And uh, in business, a lot of the time, you get people that just want to cut your throat. Mm. Uh, you don't get – I've, I've found it really, really refreshing, this industry. Everybody wants to do good. I mean, crikey, if, if I had known now uh, – sorry, if I had known at the beginning what I know now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this, to be honest. I wouldn't. I'm glad I didn't know. I'm glad I didn't know what, how much work has needed to be done to get us here um, because it would have put me off. Uh, and, um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't know um, because to be involved in something that it's easy to say can be world-changing, you know, You've only, you know, one of our presentations, we talk about the report that was done by um, uh, Harvard, Harvard, Oxford, and I think it was UCL. They're you know, talking about delay growing all by one year globally uh, as a positive effect of 38 trillion. I mean, those are just, just crazy numbers, fantastic, fantastic effects. And when you when you dig deep under those types of reports, it's because people are working longer, so they're earning, they're contributing to society, paying taxes and the spending. They're not uh, falling ill as early as they would otherwise do, so they're not putting the pressure on the health services. Just a fantastic, it is a fantastic industry. It's it's definitely something to get you up out of bed in the morning. 
I mean, what look at the, we're dealing with the world's number one children's hospital and the world's number three children's hospital. Sick kids in Toronto and uh, Great Ormond Street in in uh, in London. And whilst we're doing aging, a lot of the underlying causes of aging uh, are uh, one of the presentations that we show is. is uh, uh, shows the necrosis on a, on a diabetic foot. Well, that necrosis is, is um, similar pathology to uh, uh, a disease called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is the biggest killer of preterm babies. Well, if we can have effect, a positive effect on, on, on a disease that is an unmet clinical need, that's the biggest killer of preterm babies, I mean, what better to get up in the morning uh, and, uh, and sit at your desk if, if you if you feel that you can have a positive effect on uh, on, on children's lives, there's nothing more important than children for for any any parents. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't think of anything more more motivating. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I want to come back to something you said earlier in regards to personal relationships. How important do you think those are in in building and growing a successful company? Um, personal relationships. Um, being able to have those personal relationships with your team, your employees. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that it comes in two different uh, forms. That because there's personal relationships in terms of collaborative uh, uh, relationships. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I mentioned Paolo and uh, yeah. Um, in terms of your team members, um, I think. There's got to be a respect between the two of you uh, in in a company. They've got to have respect for you in terms of where your skill sets lie, and you've got to have respect for them in 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 their uh, area of expertise as well. And um, that that creates a positive environment. Uh, you know, far from it for me to question scientists on the real nitty-gritty science of, of, of what we're doing. Um, yeah. yeah, in terms of personal relationships, I think mean, if you can all be friends when you're doing something as well, it, that, that does help, um, yeah. but sometimes not necessary either. You know, you, you can have you can have respect for people because people people have got different personalities, and some personalities uh, don't uh, don't go together as well as they uh, uh, they could. But that's human nature. Um, it is. I, I, I think get the right people in the right positions and give them the uh, the space to uh, uh, to utilize their expertise and. I think it was, uh, I think it was one of the books that Facebook did, or about Facebook, and, and uh, about making sure that the people that you work with do what they enjoy, because yeah. otherwise you're knocking a square peg into a round hole, and uh, that's not a recipe for long term. Uh, yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, I guess. Yeah, moving ahead, uh, Barry, could you give me your thoughts on, on this statement? Um, be the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> that's uh, you recognize me, did you? Then uh, that's I, I often sit around the table with uh, with the people that are involved in the company. I do look around and I pinch myself, <laughs> I do think, oh, um. Yeah, I am the dumbest person in the room here, um, uh, especially when it comes to scientific uh, matters. Uh, you've got to be. Uh, well, what have you got to be? Um, obviously, I've got expertise in in, uh, in in what I do. A wealth uh, of it, <laughs> if yeah. I may say. Yeah, but you you need the good people around you. You need better people than than, than you and and. There's, there's, you can try and do too much yourself. And I've done that previously, thinking that um, you know I'm going to do the best 
there's only me who can do this, you know, and, and you you don't delegate. And people do do things differently than you do. And a lot, of, a lot of the time, though, they actually do it better than you, you know, because if that's certainly if that's their area of expertise and uh, that's when you've got to let go and, um, and, and utilize the skill set of, um, of the people around you. Was that learned? Did you learn that somehow? Or as um, a, yeah, what definitely. I, mean, I learned was, did you? Without like, question, without question, yeah. I am hands on. You know, and, and uh, I recognise that is one of my. Um, uh, it's given me challenges over the years. Yeah, you know, where I, I, I sort of I do like to pick up the banner and run from the front and and, and show charge, um, and at times you can you can want to do things that should be in someone else's someone else's hands. So that's, that becomes the art of delegation as, as you become more, let's say, mature in business. Um, Do you, would you say that that's the biggest, the biggest key of a leader? That's a good question. I never give up. Hmm. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lead, the, the determination that you've got to have is got to be second to none. Mm. Um, you get knocked down and you get up again. And as the song goes, you get knocked down and you get up again, over and over again. Um, and, um, yeah, when you when you believe in something, I'll give you an example. I mean, crikey, when, when we, 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 we had a very successful uh, – uh, company doing the first, with the world's first apps, mobile phone applications, and uh, we did the first live uh, sporting event uh, on a mobile device. And in the city of London, when I first uh, we, we sat down and, and explained that we were doing the cricket from uh, against uh, England uh, from Australia live event on a mobile phone. And every single institution and analyst, this was 2004, said to said to us, who would want to watch video on a mobile device? Can you believe that? Every single one of them said that. So TikTok can thank you. Oh, <laughs> in 2000, we, uh, I, I was with, um, in, in Miami with um, the mobile networks. Uh, it's a mobile messaging conference talking to the networks over there about um, text messaging and how we built these platforms to do cross-network billing and uh, uh, how uh, text messaging was going to explode over there. And again, even these were the networks. These weren't just financial people. And uh, we said, why do you not think it's going to happen over here? And they said, we'll tell you why. Because we've all got pages. Can you, that, that was the stock answer. We've all got pages. So, um, yeah, and it was only 2005, I believe, when the sale of mobile phones outstripped pages in America. Um, so there's a, there's a timing. There's a yeah. timing. And... and if you're too early, you can be at the bleeding edge, of the, you know, the cutting edge. There's the cutting edge and the bleeding edge. And um, maybe when I started at this, we were at the bleeding edge. And it's only now that uh, there's thousands of papers from, from uh, labs around the world uh, uh, confirming that, uh, that w the work we've been doing in terms of uh, stem cells secretome being responsible for regeneration repair as opposed to the stem cell itself. Um, I've always liked being at the cutting edge though. And that, that's that's the you know the companies that I've built over uh, over the last uh, 35 years. Um, and this this is no different. This is very, very much at the cutting edge of medicine. And uh, 
I, I've I've always said it's it's the future of medicine. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, just uh, one one simple question. I don't know if the the answer is going to be as simple. How do you get people to jump on board your vision and your mission? It might seem natural to you, but people you've gotten on board are remarkable. And yeah, you may feel like the dumbest person in the room, uh, mm -hmm. especially with those names. But how? <laughs> Well, the, you've got to give them the belief, first of all. You've got to give them the belief that, you know, what you're doing and what you plan to do. You know, when I, when I first started, I, I obviously, you've got to start with adding one person to the team and another and another and another. And um, uh, the story's got to be right. It's got to be believable. Uh, and, and I think as you build the team, more and more credibility gets added to it and gets more and more credibility to your story. Uh, yeah, to, to your story becomes more credible. You know, the the the, the advisors and, and, you know, our... Um, uh, what's he called? Uh, Robert's our QP. Uh, Robert Smith is, is our QP quality, uh, a qualified person for the drug manufacturer. Got uh, Robert involved quite early, in it, and I I only found out later. It was a complete surprise to me that he was the um, QP for the government's uh, stem cell catapults down at uh, down at Stevenage, and he wrote the uh, QP book. I can't say I. Uh, uh, there was no skill involved from my perspective though. That was that was pure luck. But again, the fact that of getting involved in the business and being our QP gave credibility in talking to other people that, that knew him because he was well known. As is uh, uh, Alan, uh, Professor Alan Boyd, uh, who's our uh, interim uh, medical director. Alan uh, was a past president of the Royal uh, uh, I keep I keep wanting to call it academy, but it's not academy. It's the the the, the, um, the Royal Institute of um, he was a past president and he's a fellow. It's everybody. Well, I say everybody knows him. Most people know him, and and I suppose as you as you add these people all the time, it just again it just adds credibility. Yeah. Uh, so story's got to be right at first. Build your credibility. There's, I couldn't have turned around and recruited them all in one uh, fell swoop. I think. How'd you uh, hire the first person then? Um, well, again, uh, Steve was uh, Steve and uh, uh, Paolo and uh, Keaton came as a as a bundle because it was Steve's um, it was Steve's work. It was it was me saying to Steve, Steve, I'd really like to help you to get this out to, to more people. Um, and um, he'd worked with Paolo, he'd worked with uh, Keaton. So those three straight away uh, provided scientific credibility. Mm. And um, the fact that Steve's work uh, the, the the effect that Steve was having on on uh, leading sports people and me and. Uh, Actually, from the investment perspective, that's that's a good, actually it's a good uh, good question because my friends uh, the, right at the very beginning, I, I know individuals. I brought some of my best friends in. Always difficult in a business, um, but what I said to them was, "You can't invest more than me, and you can't invest more than you can afford to lose." Because you know, if, if this doesn't work, I want me to be the biggest loser out, out of uh, the two of us. So I've got my very best friends uh, invested uh, early doors, and um, and then the, the 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 as we as we started to talk with higher net worth individuals that every everyone knew, quite a lot of them knew me historically. Uh, not only from the fact that I've made money for them in the past uh, with with uh, uh, with other businesses that we that, that invested in, or had worked work with uh, different people. Um, the other 
thing that added credibility to the, to the story rather than the team was a lot of those people had seen me wearing a leg brace, you know, mm. and um, over the years and had known of uh, the difficulties that I, I'd had and had seen the the the, uh, the effect that that the that Steve's treatment had, had on me. Yeah. So again, I, I suppose yeah, that, that the first person you've got a good scientific team. You've got me that's um, that's can add the the commercial credibility. You know, I've been founded companies and uh, uh, and sold companies. I had difficulties in this. In, I, I've had difficulties as well in business. Many difficulties and, and challenges that uh, we face. Um, I made my first million when I was twenty eight, and I lost it at twenty nine. Uh, in the crash at the end of the 80s. Um, so that teaches you a, a lesson or two. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting journey, but it just gets more and more interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, look, as we wrap up our discussion, uh, discussion today, I just have two more questions. Could you share what has been the most gratifying aspect of your journey with Microgen so far and how this venture compares to your two past ventures? You mean three past? We've got three two IPOs and company sale in, in, in the last uh, 20 years. Um <clears throat> In terms of how it compares, we're talking about different. This industry is fantastic. I just, I, I just love the industry, as I mentioned earlier, because of the, 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 the attitude of everybody that's working in it, and uh, that, that's I, that had the most profound effect on on me. And I didn't even realise that when I came into uh, into the business. Uh, it was just nice to have people that want to do good. Okay. Uh, I forgot the first part of your question. Um, can you... Gratifying aspect of your journey. What's the most gratifying aspect of your journey? Yeah. I suppose that's... that's that's That is is, uh, is quite gratifying. And, and um, I mentioned earlier about the, the saving babies' lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I've got yeah. two grandkids now. I mean, you know, I've got my own children, but I've got uh, grandkids, and there's just nothing more important in, in life. Uh, yeah. It is, uh, you know, what better to get out of bed in the morning to, 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 to do. So, you know, if we can, working at the other end, you know, we're, we're doing neurodegenerative diseases, um, uh, the, the, the research there, and... Uh, you know, one of my uh, real targets personally is Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, what, you know, I, I've got, I've had, as so many of us, has had a, has uh, been touched by that. Um, you know, because it doesn't just affect that one person; it, it, it's um, it affects all the friends and family around that person. In fact, it, it affects that person less than than everybody else. Yeah. Um, so. If we can have an effect, a positive effect on new neurodegenerative diseases, um, it's a great legacy. You know, I, I, I can, uh, you know, in time when I sort of uh, hang up my boots, uh, I can say, you know, I had a, I had an hand in that. Yeah, fantastic, inspirational. Um, look, finally, um, after all of this uh leadership innovation talk uh could you offer one piece of advice to individuals out there who are wanting to start something well, i've just been asked to speak at um at one of the universities to the on the, the run an entrepreneurial course which i'm going to do in, in uh, december um being a CEO of a business can be the loneliest job in the world. It's, uh, it's, you know, it can be tough. It can be tough because you can hear what everybody else has got to say. You can get everybody's opinions. But at the end of the day, you've got to make that final decision. 
And um, when you make it, there will be probably the major uh, uh, proportion of people will agree with what uh, the decision you've made. But the people that have given any counter arguments won't agree with what, you, what you've uh, said. Um, so um, you've got to be prepared for that. And you've... You've got to go into this if you're prepared to never give up. Yeah. Never give up. It, it, it's um, if you go about things not thinking, I must do this and I must do that in the business. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> rather than that, um, rather than saying, uh, I, I should do this and I should do that in the business. No, you must do this and you must do that. And and you've got to do it as opposed to you, you, you should. Just that never giving up, that perseverance. That Yeah, it's you've got to have perseverance. It, 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 if you're going to... When you set out in business, I always thought, oh, yeah, right, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sell up and I'll retire when I'm 25 and live on a beach. I mean, that, that's... That's worked out well. <laughs> That's forty years ago. That's forty years ago, and uh, you, 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 I never, I, I'm never going to hang up my boots. I'm never yeah. going to give up, uh, and because it, it's part of the makeup, really. Uh, from, from my engineering days, I, I qualified as an engineer, and I can't look at anything now without thinking how it's made. That's still after forty years. I look at whether it's a chair and 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 uh, uh, whether it's a, a, a some new fangled dangled uh, device that uh, that you might see advertised. Um, I always think, oh, no, that's made. Or do I, I, you know, what's the most expeditious method of manufacturing that? You know, how can you, how can that be improved upon? How can the functionality be improved upon? Um, and that's just a. a my inquisitive mind and, and uh, my, my business mind. So uh, I'll never turn that off. Well, look, Barry, it's been an absolute pleasure. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. So yeah, welcome, uh, welcome Daniel, um, and welcome to anyone tuning in uh, for Capital HQ. It's a, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, I think it, what would be great is for you to introduce yourself. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. My, my name is Daniel Hume. I, uh, I guess I have over twenty five years of experience in AI uh, research. I started the company fifteen years ago. Uh, that has been building AI and small companies. Uh, we were acquired two years ago by WPP, the biggest media marketing company in the world, where I'm uh, the chief AI officer. So I'm the CEO of Satalia still, so uh, essentially WPP's deep mind. I'm also um, coordinating AI across 120,000 people across WPP, uh, and I get to get do angel investments now into, into AI startups. All right. <laughs> so quite the quite the big responsibility there. And I guess you know the questions today are meant to be broad because you are – one of the biggest experts in, uh, in AI in the world. So just want to, uh, you know, scrap your brain as much as possible. So look, I've broken this down into different, um, different topics. The first one is the broader uh, economic and workforce impact of AI. So, 
In terms of uh, you know recent reports, including the from the World Economic Forum uh, Future of Jobs report, indicate that nearly a quarter of all jobs globally will change in the next five years due to technological advancements. Um, how do you foresee these macro trends um, impacting various sectors, and how should companies prepare for this shift? So I, th- I think first of all, it, it probably takes a little bit longer than than what people think. Um, you know, the economic cycles, um, investment cycles. You know, organizations probably, you know, trying to unlock the money to uh, implement these technologies, getting them right, getting them wrong. It takes longer than, than you know, probably five years. So, but I, I do think that AI is a, a new energy resource that, you know, we're, we're, we're tapping into, even though it's been around for many, many years. And um, that energy resource means that, that I think, if, uh, sorry, I've got a parrot that sometimes says hello. Uh, and uh, that energy resource um, uh, um, is going to allow humanity to grow uh, in, in, in new, and it is allowing humanity to grow in new and exciting ways and with, with growth comes disruption so i think jobs will be displaced they will be disrupted but my my guess is is that um is that is that um there's gonna be more and more opportunities for people to to apply themselves to to use these technologies um uh, uh, in ways that allow them to contribute more positively to humanity right yeah i think you know i think you you're absolutely right about you know i think Five years, we're going to start seeing some changes, but the, the broader uh, impact will be further down the line. Just ourselves, you know, we've put off actually hiring some uh, marketing because we can now run it through AI, which is pretty, you know, at our little tiny level, we've put off uh, hiring for one job because, yeah, it can do it now and we just need someone to like supervise it. So that's, for us, that was quite interesting. And this was only like four months after the release of ChatGPT as well. Um, so who knows what's going to happen? But, you know, we talked about, we just talked about how it's going to change jobs and perhaps make some redundant, but it's also going to create new jobs, right? So the survey also suggests that AI could be a net job creator in the coming years. So what types of new jobs you predict will emerge uh, and how can companies gear their talent development to meet this demand? I guess that's what I mean by by growth. By growth, yeah, I think that new opportunities will will, will arise for people to be able to contribute um, in, in new and exciting ways to humanity. I mean, it's, it's actually hard to predict um, what 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 new jobs might might be created. Um, but I think that what what's going to happen over the coming years is is a much more flexible, fluid workforce. So people's ability to to contribute in more granular, fluid ways, as opposed to being a role, and um, and that that's what you do in your in your job. Um, I can be um, several different roles, and I can apply myself in in multiple ways. So I, I think that that's also going to provide unlock um, growth, um, and again align align people um interests aspirations hope streams with with with, with work in a, in a much more effective way um i i, I think that um, because ai is is um all these flavors of ai are do allow you to to innovate i think that people will will come up with new innovations that again will unlock um the the, the creative capacity of, of 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 more and more people so i can't necessarily predict what those um those those new jobs are but you know you can imagine that you know the the, the cost of being able to create innovations um, and get them into production is is dramatically reducing and so you know somebody might realize that you know there are people let's say in old people's homes that are, you know, sitting around potentially not being engaged or, or excited. And there are people on the, the flip side that, that might want to learn skills or um, uh, languages. And, and so now somebody could boot up a platform that essentially brings those two types of communities together. So, so uh, you know, you are able to now create new um, technologies, new platforms, which gives you work, and you're able to now give work um, to, to people that probably found it difficult to access work. So, you know, maybe older people can now actually work and, 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 and you know, impart their, their experience, their, their knowledge to, to um, people that, that might want to, 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 to learn that. Yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. That's very interesting. I think, you know, just on my note, I learned how to code a bit of Python just by asking ChatGPT to put a course together for me. So that was, and yeah, and so I can see the impact being quite broad. I also love that you have a parrot at home. It's brilliant. <laughs> I've got a few of them. They might say hello at some point. All right, fantastic. Um, look, in, in terms of, you know, we've talked about occupations, the new occupations as well, uh, although we can't predict them. So as workers move into different occupations and maybe they have multiple, as you've mentioned, what advice do you have for professionals seeking to reinvent their careers? 
I think you know, certainly what we're seeing in, in WPP, which you know, is, is a, is a what, the, the the creatives that are really we're seeing thrive are the ones that are able to ask better questions of the AI. So those creatives that understand art history, um, photography, understand lighting, aperture, camera angles, they're, they're able to engage with AIs and ask it um, uh, questions, extract knowledge from those AIs in, in much more interesting and impactful ways. They can talk about, you know, an artist that you or I have never heard of, the AI will have heard of, of it and um, and be able to kind of surface that very, very quickly. So I, I think that, that l- learning how to better use and ask questions of these AIs, whether it be creating imagery or text or code, uh, I think is going to be an in- important set of skills. And and um, and that, I guess, may require a broader um, perspective of, of of humanity and and, and different different disciplines and 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 and, and um, um, uh, to- uh, topics. Right, and we've just talked about the, the individual here, what they can do. But what, how can um, employers, companies, help um, best position their workforce to work alongside AI? What, what should they be doing um, when looking at, you know, augmenting the human instead of replacing the human, perhaps? So I guess that there are. Um, the, the AI can be used to improve productivity. So it can be used in our tools like Office and you know, Word and all that kind of stuff to, to help us be faster at writing emails and yeah. creating PowerPoint slides, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think I think capacity is going to be unlocked in that way. And and you know, organizations might want to think about using that capacity not 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 to kind of do more kind of utilization but but to kind of have people go and train and uh, and and do, do innov- innovation and and, and r and d so pr- productivity is going to be Im- improved and with that with that improvement in productivity um the question is what's the best use of that time um the uh, um and, and and then also um the ai is is, is very good at alleviating um frictions or or, or inefficiencies it's also very good at, at making things more effective, um, changing the way that we do things, again, freeing people up to be, be more creative. And and so I think that we need to um, foster um, our work work uh, f- forces, our, our um, uh, processes to, to um, utilize the creative capacity of humanity. Just going back to your example of, you know, you didn't need to hire a, a marketing person because, because, um, these tools can do do some of those marketing tasks. If if you if you kind of ex- expand and uh, and uh, give yourself a kind of a thought experiment that that, that marketing stack is completely commoditized. If if everybody had access to the ability to content predict the activation of that content, push that content out across channels. If everybody had access to that technology, the only differentiator is human creativity. Um, a human creativity will become a premium. So I think the organizations need to be thinking about how do we best unlock um, uh, human creativity? Yeah, and prompt engineering, I guess, it comes into that as well, right? I guess that goes back to the point of, of, of how do we best better ask questions of yeah. the AI. And, um, and, and, and that's not just about, about kind of uh, technical um, um, ability is your your knowledge of again artists of yeah. aperture and lighting that that um, that help you um, create create better content. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of our designers, um, she, I don't even know where she was starting, but she was like, "Use this Nikon X SX one thousand with exactly. uh, with yeah. contrast two four five, and it produced a brilliant image." <laughs> but you need to know, yeah. and I think that's absolutely right. Um, now moving on, maybe to you know obviously a lot of companies have legacy systems and the more we move on the, today's systems are probably going to become legacy given the complexity of integrating ai into those uh what strategy do you recommend for companies looking to modernize without necessarily disrupting my i think my worry is over the past several years i've seen organizations try to build data lakes and then put some sort of analytics layer on top of it and hope, hoping they have AI or hoping that by extracting better insights from data, it will lead to better decisions. Now, I have a relatively controversial view, which is, for the most part, giving human beings better insights doesn't always lead to better decisions. Now, that's not always true, but um, 
humans are, are, are good at making certain decisions, but we're not good at making other types of decisions. And I'm a big advocate of solving the kind of decision-making problem, which is what AI is really good for, good at. And, um, and so I, I think that what, what needs to happen is organizations need to identify what opportunities there are across their, their supply chain, uh, and then solve those problems over time and build out their, 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 um, their um their uh, uh the data and analytic capability so so don't don't start by building a data lake and, and, and putting analytics on top find find opportunities to apply these technologies that drive real value but make sure that over time you're building infrastructure that is is, is, is future proofed um and 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 you know you just have to go on that journey so you have to move and migrate your legacy um chunk by chunk um uh, uh, to uh, to this, this 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 new world i i don't think that migrating it all in one big go and, yeah. and, and creating a data lake is necessarily the right the right approach. I think data lakes ultimately the right things to be building, and analytic and analytical layers are very very powerful. But but I think you you, you need to make sure you're building towards them in a way that, that you know is going to guarantee driving value. Yeah, um, you just talked about. Uh, I, could you actually elaborate on why you believe AI is a great decision making partner tool? Uh, let me give you um. Let me give you a uh, um an example the mathematical uh, some math so if i if i let's imagine you've got some employees and you've got five people that you need to yeah. allocate to five jobs yeah there are 120 possible ways to allocate five people to five jobs so five times four times three times two times yeah. one if i have 15 people in my company to allocate to 15 jobs there are now a trillion ways if i've got 60 people to allocate to 60 jobs there are now more possible ways than there are atoms in the universe <laughs> we have we have many of these decision making problems that exist across our organization right any any decision problem that involves more than seven variables seven people in this case then then it, it becomes intractable for a human being to solve so so um so you shouldn't be using human beings really to solve those problems. You should be using AI. Um, you should be using optimization. And, um, and, and there are many of these types of problems that exist across many industries that human beings are solving or, or they're using algorithms that were invented many, many years ago that if more modern algorithms or more modern AIs were applied, then, they, then you would significantly move the needle. Mm. Interesting. In terms of... Right. In terms of um, moving to the ethical side of it a bit, um, and I spoke to, to one of your friends, uh, Callum, um, who didn't really like the word ethics when it came to AI. When he thought it was something. Anyways, it was just quite an interesting one. But, you know, as companies navigate the ethical deployment of AI, what frameworks or guidelines should they follow to ensure they remain on the right side of this evolving conversation? So Callum can convince me that there's no such thing as AI ethics. So um, um, I don't know what he said to you, but um, I think ethics is ethics is a study of right and wrong. And and the, the big difference between a human being and an AI is that human beings have intent, AIs don't have intent. And it's in it's intent. It's the intended use of these technologies, the intended way of solving a problem that um, that needs to get scrutinized from an ethics perspective. And there are already well-established ethical frameworks to scrutinize intent. Once you once you then implement a solution, whether it be a people solution, an AI solution, or any any solution, then if that solution misbehaves, it's a safety problem. What you've done is you've implemented a solution that is not designed and, and is operating in the way that you want it to. And um, and so there are there are two ways of solving solving for that, or two questions that you need to ask yourself. One is, can I make sure that my systems are explainable? If I can make sure yeah. that my AIs, I, I can explain how my AIs are making their decisions, then I solve a lot of the problems around AI safety and uh, and AI explainability is a hard problem to solve. But it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. So so making sure that you're building AIs that you can explain how they're making decision is critical. And then the other question that you need to ask yourself is if my system goes very well, um, if it overachieves its goal, what harm can it cause? You know, most engineers, when they're developing systems, they think about the failure points. What happens when it goes wrong? 
and we try to then build systems that 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 have constraints for when it goes wrong that it doesn't cause any harm that what we what what we need to think about now is if it overachieves its goal and goes very very right can it also cause any harm and uh, and again that's an engineering problem it's not an ethical problem so there's a lot of who hard there's a lot of people that have rebranded themselves as ai ethicists um, um as far as i'm concerned uh, ethics there's already a well established set of ethical frameworks and the two questions you need to ask yourself when developing ai are is it explainable and um, have i engineered it in a way that makes sure that it's going to operate how i want it to operate now broadly um and 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 over the past um several years i've developed a number of frameworks to think about ai so one framework is 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 how um you can identify um the right applications of AI to solving problems across your supply chain. I won't bore you with the details, but I believe there are six categories or six applications of AI that pretty much cover your whole supply chain. And with each one of those different categories, um, there are different um, safety questions and security questions. And um, so there are what that does deploying these AIs into your organization and operating in ways that are are correct so there's mi micro considerations there are what are called malicious risks so making sure that you're mitigating bad actors using these technologies to create pathogens and cyber security and uh, misinformation and you know that's typically the role of, of government and then there are what are called macro risks which are what are the medium or long-term impact that these technologies might have on society so could we end up creating a super intelligence or <laughs> or what impact will it have on 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 jobs or will it create a post-truth world if if you know we are awash with misinformation um, and again i believe that there are at least six uh, macro risks associated with AI. Uh, again, I think that it's both to do with government and industry to address some of those uh, macro risks. Okay. You, you just mentioned super intelligence there. Could I get your maybe definition of it? And if you think it's going to be a reality and if so, when, or not if so, when, but is it in 10 years is in 50 years, is in 200 years, or is it never? Uh, when I was doing my PhD 20 years ago, I thought that um, uh, building general intelligence was 250 years away. And uh, I guess every year that goes by, I shave a decade off. I think, I think, I think my community felt super intelligence wasn't going to happen for another 40, 50 years. To, we probably think it might, might, might not happen in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, uh, I think that what we might see with a uh, large language models and large language models, I think, you know, are one type of AI. There are other types of AI out there that are actually emerging from academia that, that I actually think are much more likely to spawn a super intelligence. But the, the, the large language models, are like, it's like having an intoxicated graduate. Um, and that, that over the next few years is going to be become like a master's level. And then a few years later, it'll probably become like a PhD level. A few years later, it's going to become a, a professor level. So if, if in the next, let's say, eight to 10 years, we build an AI that is a professor level in every single discipline, then the, the, the next obvious question you would ask it is go, go and build a, a smarter AI than you. And then there is a, there is a co concept called the fast takeoff where, where we, we go from general intelligence, you know, as, as intelligent as human beings to something that is, you know, a million times smarter than us. So I guess the definition of a super intelligence is, is something that is much, much smarter than, 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 than the, the collective um, intelligence of humanity. Um, now, um, some people also think that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have consciousness, sentience to have super intelligence. You, you, you could build a machine and, which has an objective. And the classic example is to build paper, cl paper clips. It could be very, very, very smart at building paper, paper clips and, and you, you know, uses up all of the resources in the world to, to, to build paper clips, um, you know, which might then, then destroy itself or dis destroy humans. Um, but then, you know, some people think that super intelligence, you, you need to have consciousness or, 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 or sentience. Uh, and I, I guess I'm interested in in, in those two flavors of um, of super intelligence and actually whether one is more beneficial than the other. But I think my feeling is is that we, we might end up creating a super intelligence in in the next you know ten to twenty years. 
and it's something that I'm very very passionate about and uh, and, and and actually thinking about how do we um, create um, um, AIs um, that allow us to to mitigate the risks associated with super intelligence mm. um, and you know you you talked about just now um, that university papers research is coming out that you believe will get to a super intelligence before that could you maybe talk a bit about what, what those are i guess i i'm um uh, what i was saying is is that large language models are are, are a very yeah. very powerful um you know exciting direction of of ai um but they are not necessarily whilst they're neural networks they are biologically in, inspired in some respects they're, they're not how brains work um so biological brains don't propagate numbers we we we, we, we propagate spikes and if i if i show you an image I, I don't activate your entire brain, which is what happens with 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 large language models. I activate only small portions of your brain where that's relevant, and, and so our brains are incredibly efficient. Also, we're very good at dealing with co con con continuity, with spatial and temporal reasoning, and we learn very very quickly. So it only takes a few examples to show a child, um, uh, you know, so, some object before it, it is able to kind of generalize what that object is. With large language models, it takes Many, many, um, many examples for it to know what it is. So, um, uh, there, there, there are there are emerging technologies from academia over the past 10, 20 years. Um, they are called it's called neuromorphic computing. That is more aligned with how biological brains work, and 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 that is to do with spikes or spiking neurons or spiking neural networks. Well, that's that's too. I don't understand that, but. I'll take your word for it. Um, like we talked about the the ethics of it, um, and you mentioned the the six different kind of frameworks applications that you've de developed, right? I was wondering where does data privacy come into all this, and what are the best practices for companies to utilize AI without infringing on individual rights generally? I, I guess a bit, I mean. It depends on what we're what AI we're talking about. I think you know if we're talking about large language models, then you know we work with partners to 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 have our own instances of those large language mm -hmm. models on on infrastructure that's safe, um, that's wall gardened. So you know we're not uploading data to the internet. Um, uh, we are we're we're we're, we're, we're managing how, how where that data goes and and and, and how it's being accessed. The, the the infringing of people's rights when it comes to large language models, I guess, is, is 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 if you're creating content, whether it ads or or anything that from, from large language models, but it's been trained on on uh, information um, that's copyrighted, um, you you might inadvertently be infringing those copyrights. And, and in in WPP, we are very 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 careful about. The language models that we use, making sure that we're using models that, that have that we understand the, the provenance that the, the of, of of where the data has come from, um, uh, it, with respect to different parts of our supply chain. You know, for, for when we're ideating and things like that, you know, we can use certain types of large language models where we don't necessarily um, um, uh, can uh, attribute um, uh, or understand the provenance of data. But if we're creating ads that we're putting out there, we need to make sure that we're not violating copyright. So. Um, we're very careful about about using the right technologies, at the, the right part of our supply chain. Right. Okay. And uh, so maybe elaborating a bit more on that, um, I was talking to a friend who's just started a job in generally in, in the AI space, and we were talking about um, simulated data. Um, what what you know? What's your take on simulated data compared to where it could be compared to actual data? Could it be the same level as actual data further down the line? I mean, it, there's a there's a kind of a self fulfilling prophecy around simulated data, right? That, that creates um, creates a a, a a an unfortunate kind of feedback loop, which is your your mm. you know your training your training your training an AI on 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 what it what it wants or what it what it's producing. Um, uh, th there's nothing like real world data um, yeah. to help you identify corner cases and scenarios where things might go wrong. I think one of the classic examples that I I don't know how true this is, but um, you have you know a Tesla that is able to recognize um, 
uh, 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 stop signs, let's say, and it was part. It was sitting behind a van that uh, in the back of the van had a load of stop signs, and so it it it, it wouldn't it wouldn't move because it recognised these stop signs. <laughs> uh, now you wouldn't have thought it creating in your simulated data a scenario where you had a van in front of you with loads of stop stop signs in the back. Um, so, so there's always real world examples that will uh, that you won't necessarily thought of. So there's nothing, nothing like the real world to really to to, to keep you honest. That said, um, you know, the simulated data can get you a long way, um, and um, and and can help you build um, um, AIs that are, are very good and very useful. Okay, great. Now let's move on maybe to more of the some of the business applications or just different industries. So, first one is. Um, decentralization so ai and decentralization so in light of of interest in decentralization how do you envision um ai influencing the move towards decentralized business models compared to traditional corporate structures uh so i so I, i'm a big fan of decentralization i think we need to you know make sure that you have the right application yeah for, but I, i'm also a big fan of how organizations should be decentralized in terms of they operate how they operate i think you know, creating liquid workforces decentralized workforces enable you to be more adaptive to a rapidly changing world um but there is something very important here about the concept of decentralization or um uh, uh or maybe even the open source movement which you know somehow is linked to that which is yeah. which is i i don't believe that necessarily technology is the is the um, differentiator? So we all have access now to you know open source large language models, etc. The differentiator is two, uh, two things. One is the data, and and so okay. going back to this idea of sim simulated data, you know you can simulate actually it's real data that will that will make these AI smarter. That will that, that really is your defensible moat. And the second is is the talent that you use to to use these technologies. To, to create different differentiatable businesses. So it's data and talent. So what we are going to see more and more of, I think, is organizations realizing that they can't compete to, to compete with organizations that have captured a market that, you know, that, that are generating revenues from you know, some tech some technology. The only way to compete with them is to make it open source and um and, and and make it free because what you then do is you take their users uh you 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 then are capturing the data which is valuable to you and and hopefully you're also capturing the talent as well because you can create a, a you know pool of talent that is then innovating that that, that technology because it's open source so I, I actually think that we're going to see more and more open source happening which is a good thing because it makes these technologies more and more abundant as well. If we can, if we can make these technologies accessible and free to everybody, it just, in theory, um, raises humanity to another level. Mm. Yeah, it makes you think, doesn't it? <laughs> and, um, it but with, and this might just be me not, you know, being uh, well versed in this, but don't the a few companies hold the majority of data? They do, and uh, and so how do you compete against them? Is that you 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 stand up an offering that is is free to take their users, so that then you're collecting data. If if you know they they are sitting on data and they are they 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 they're selling their wares. You know, you're licensing their wares, but but if if you want to capture their market, then you need to then you need to offer something that's different. And what we're seeing is an offering that is is something that's free. Because people are realizing that it is the data that is ultimately valuable in the future. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, um, I could be sitting here all day trying to think about it. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of moving back to th that was an outside the box question um, that I know piques your interest a bit. Um, coming back to just strategic advantage for companies, right? So how they can leverage AI. Deloitte's insights uh, suggest that a bold enterprise-wide AI strategy is crucial for general transformation. How should companies approach the development of such a comprehensive strategy? And what role does top leadership play in this process? I think I think really there are three three aspects of a business that need, that can. They, they should be looked at from an AI perspective. One is productivity, um, and and you know, it's bringing AI into the day-to-day -day tools that we're that we're using, um, you know, back office processes, all that kind of stuff. The second is is looking at your supply chain, the flow of goods and services across your unique organization, and where you know where you're going to buy technologies off the shelf to solve some of those 
those um, inefficiencies or you're going to build them yourself or you're going to, you know, you buy from a partner. Um, that 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 is the, the battleground actually for, for most organizations is where they should be applying AI and building their own proprietary solutions that, that will differentiate them from their competitors. Right. So that that and and then the the, the the which is which is essentially your digital transformation, and then your third part is is if you're fortunate enough, like we are in WPP, the CEO said, go away and figure out how does AI completely disrupt. Them. So so you've got you've got productivity, which is you know commod, commodity will be a commodity because everybody will access, have access to these new. AIs that are embedded in our tools. The second layer is your digital transformation and, and making the right bets around how it will differentiate your business and what you should defend and what you should let go of. And then the third is how how is this going to completely disrupt our entire organization and industry? Right, and and I, I think this this is follows on in terms of you know a report by TechCrunch emphasizes the importance of hyper personalization in AI applications with regards to enhancing customer experience from a company. Um, so how can companies align their initiatives, AI initiatives, with broader business strategies to personalize their customer experience? Well, I think I think ultimately. Most organizations have a load of inefficiencies, a loads of opportunities to improve effectiveness. And it's not an intractable problem to sit down and work with different stakeholders to kind of list all of those uh, inefficiencies. Uh, you know, when, sometimes they touch the customer, sometimes they don't. But any inefficiency that you alleviate, even if it's kind of deep inside the supply chain, in, in theory, you know, that, that's a cost saving that might ultimately pass on to the customer. Um, so, so I, I so I think I think going through that process of 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 identifying the opportunities of AI, prioritizing those opportunities according to criteria like is the data available? Do I have the skills to solve it? What's the value to the business? What's the value to the customer? You know, the, the, you know, there's a set amount of criteria that you can use to then prioritize them, and then starting to knock each one off, solve each one, and then building your AI infrastructure over time. In theory, you know, all all of those benefits will be passed on somehow to the customer. And if if you know if if the direct customer experience is important to you, then that's just one of your criteria, right? It's, it's, mm. Do I do this project because my customers will immediately feel the benefit and, and therefore you should prioritize that over, over others. Yeah. So just general business strategy with a, with a, with AI it's, sprinkled on top. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. It's um, ultimately it's, it's the business strategy is to become more effective, more efficient at delivering goods and services to my customer. And uh, an AI is a, is a tool to allow you to do that. Yeah. So I think, you know, speaking about efficiency, uh, your three things are productivity, supply chain, and then the last one was a longer one, but it's more so around um, innovation, perhaps, or the freedom to innovate. It's it's, it's disruption. It's um, disruption. It's, is is that you know you, you might have a, a strategy now and you might be able to optimize your supply chain um, and become very efficient, but is there a scenario where your business model is going to be completely disrupted by somebody that's come along and done done, done it differently? Uh, right. You know, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would call this an innovation or open innovation, where, where they would kind of carve out a an innovation team and you know get them to sit in a different building and try and you know protect them from the the corporate bureaucracy. And, and then their job was to go and disrupt the organisation. I think that that's absolutely relevant now, um, particularly with regards to AI for 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 some industries. And um, and and so I think that 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 ge genuinely AI is a threat to disrupt um, uh, entire business models and. Uh, there are some industries and some organizations that should be investing in that. Yeah. So you said that's the keyword though, for me, it's the should be investing in that. Some, as you mentioned, some don't make, some companies don't maybe have the liberty of doing both. Right. So, yeah. you know, what would you, what framework would you recommend for businesses to balance the two objectives of productivity, efficiency, and then on the other side, disruption slash innovation? Well, I think productivity and efficiency is 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 that that you know that that's a that's a sort of bread and butter at the moment. So people are you know looking at bringing co-pilot and whatnot into their into their organisations. When it when it when it comes to looking across their supply chain, there will be opportunities there to build differentiated solutions, and it might be some of those differentiated solutions could be 
become their own businesses. So if you go and solve a problem, and that's what Satali has been doing for many years for organizations, they're disrupting supply chains and where they've solved a problem that, that is, is differentiated in the market. The question is, well, should you productize that or platformize it? And then it become its own company that will then, you know, generate its own revenues and, and maybe even grow into something that disrupts your industry. So, so for example, you know, one of our clients, one of my favorite clients is DFS. It's a, it's a, it's a sofa um, uh, uh, manufacturing um, uh, uh, company here, a furniture company here in the UK. And over the past 10 years, we've been going on a journey of solving problems across their entire supply chain. Now, DFS have created a separate company called the Sofa Delivery Company um, that, that they have platformized that capability that is now you know, delivering sofas beyond, beyond DFS. Um, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I think that, that, that organizations should probably start with looking across their supply chain, what really matters to them, where they should really genuinely be differentiating themselves, and then that might be an opportunity for disruption. Okay. Um, do you have, a, is there any other stories like that? So not stories, but case studies such as DFS that you, you can share? Because th those are quite interesting to, to Yeah, to tes hear. Tes tes Tesco um, many, many years ago um, approached um, us to solve their, help solve their last mile problem. Tesco had an incumbent solution. They know that that solution wouldn't be able to scale in the way that Tesco wanted to scale. And they, they actually knew that they needed to, to build something themselves that they had control over. Last mile delivery for them is an incredibly important and differentiated part of their business. It touches the customer, um, you know, both on their website and also, you know, the, the, the delivery experience and they wanted to have control over it. So we helped build their last mile delivery solution using the latest and greatest AI technologies that they've internalized inside Tesco and have continued to innovate that, 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 that technology, uh, you know, very, very sensible thing for, for that organization to, to have done. Mm, very, uh, it is indeed, yeah. I'm sure you have many more, but <laughs> we could be here all day. Um, look, I, in terms of the, the business strategy side of the, the conversation, let's put that behind us now. Um, just now it's going to be outside the box question, so it'll be a bit everywhere, um, just on your opinions on it. So, uh, so first of all, some of these are bigger questions. So, for example, the philosophical, uh, philosophical impact of AI. So, as AI continues to grow, do you believe it will prompt a philosophical shift in how we view work and productivity? And if so, how? Um, what, what I would like to see happen is, uh, is incentivizing the, the application of AI to solving problems like food creation and distribution, healthcare, education, these things that we need to survive and thrive as human beings. If, if there was a way of incentivizing more and more startups to, to innovate in that space, it probably means that those innovations um, will, will in, in, use AI to, 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 to make them more, so if we can bring the cost, if we can make it more efficient and effective to create and disseminate food, healthcare, edu edu education, transport, et cetera, we can bring the cost of those goods down to almost zero. So in a, in a world where the government doesn't necessarily have to create a universal base income to support people that might not be able to work, all of their goods are, that they need to survive and thrive are, are, are there, are, are, are almost free because we've managed to innovate, use our smarts to, to make them available. It's a, referred to as a world of abundance, and Callum, who you've spoken to, um, refers to this concept of fully automated luxury capitalism. There is a book called Fully o Automated Luxury Communism, and there is an argument that actually these two um, perspectives converge uh, together in some endpoint where, where the, 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 we have a society, a, a, a world of abundance. And... Um, and so that's what I would like to see happen. And in when when Cal, I spoke to Cal about the fully automated luxury capitalism, I think one of the things he he mentioned is that most people will not be needing to work further down the line. Do you see it like that? As in, like people will be the creators will be free to be more creative. Um, and other people will be free to enjoy different leisures, services, and stuff like that, but they won't necessarily need to work. 
I, I, don't, take I, don't, I don't know what, what the world looks like beyond 10 years. I think that we're going to see a, a Cambrian explosion of innovations, new opportunities for people to find and do work, paid work over the next 10 years. I think beyond 10 years, it's hard to predict. I guess there's one camp, which is, um, uh, which is, we should be, we should be freeing, freeing people up um, from paid work enabling them to live in a world of abundance and people often say to me you know daniel what would i do if i didn't have to work right what work, work defines who i am as a human being and i know lots of people who don't have to work you know they've built companies they've solved them they've made money whatever yeah. they, they're not they're not sitting at home bored and depressed they use their time and their energy to try and contribute to humanity and I, and i ask my audiences when i do lots of keynotes on these topics you know what would you do if you didn't have to do paid work and people will still work. They still write poems and play golf and, and um, you know, spend m more or less time with their friends and family. But people do still do stuff. And, you know, whether that's paid or not, it sort of doesn't matter. You still work. Even though AIs can write poetry maybe better than us or play golf better than us, it doesn't stop us from enjoying writing poetry and enjoying playing golf. And and if you keep pushing people, you know, what would you? What else would you do if you didn't have to do paid work uh, and everything was abundant? People usually say the same thing, which is they want to try and do stuff that contributes to humanity. And, and I, I believe that we all have an innate desire to want to make the world better. And, and, and I think there are too many people born in this planet, um, on this planet, that uh, that are economically constrained. And and if we can remove those economic constraints by giving people access to food and education and healthcare and transport for for free, then then I think that those people will then direct and apply themselves in ways that might want to um, contribute to humanity. So, question for you is: What would you do if you didn't work? I do exactly what I'm doing now. So I'm very, very, very lucky um, uh, that I do, I do, I do what I want to do. Um, and so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate in, in that respect. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy, but you know, again, most people do say the same things and it's some, your know, balance that we're all kind of familiar with. It's exercise and spend time with people and play games and read books and, and, but there is this kind of additional thing, which is, which is, I, I want to do something that makes the lives of other people or animals or the environment better. And, and I don't think we are free enough necessarily um, economically yeah. to, to go and do that part, which I think actually for me brings true happiness. Now I'm not saying that we should all go and, you know, contribute to humanity but there are too many people born into the world without even the opportunity yeah. or maybe even ever having the opportunity to to, to to contribute to humanity absolutely i think at the end of the day people will still need a purpose right yeah i, I say i know lots of people don't have to work but they don't have um they don't have no purpose in fact actually many of them are even more purposeful yeah, than, uh, than, than what they've what they've ever been no, absolutely um in terms of maybe one or two examples of the question I'm about to ask, but can you share your thoughts on how AI could be leveraged to address global challenges such as climate change, pandemics, uh, or pandemics? You've also mentioned uh, food security a, a bit there, but maybe within the next five to 10 years, um, what, how do you see AI leveraging and addressing global challenges? Well, 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 first of all, so, so I, I did a TEDx talk a few years ago on the macro impact of these technologies. So, so I've got you know, at least six macro challenges there that I identified. Out of the um, backpack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, indeed. But I mean, I, so, um, but, um, so I think, I think if we apply these technologies in the right way, we can reduce the amount of carbon significantly from the creation and dissemination of goods. And the reason why I know that is because when we go and solve like the last mile delivery problem for Tesco or, you know, workforce allocation for a you know, big company, we can typically reduce the amount of carbon by 25%. And if, if you, if you can then, co-optimize across supply chain so make entire organizations optimized you can get a, a significantly more amount of carbon reduction so i think that if we were smart about applying these technologies we'd be able to reduce the amount of carbon so much that we would easily get control of our ecosystem we, the, the, okay. there's so much inefficiency that exists in in how we operate that the ais could solve for um, ais are are being you know used to try to figure out how to create nuclear fusion um, they're, they're being used to advance medicine. I, I, I have a, a personal interest in um, 
misinformation and, and how AIs could identify whether a piece of content is going to be problematic, is going to trigger a community and, and how you could then use blockchain or some other mechanisms to then authenticate that content before it even gets out there and starts causing harm. So I think that AIs could play a part in mitigating the risks around misinformation and deep fakes and a post-truth world. So and, and, and like any like any tool, it's it's not good or bad. It's how we use it that is is the most important um, aspect. And uh, and I, you know I'm very hopeful that that human beings will will figure out how to use these technologies in a way that will have a net positive contribution to humanity. Yeah, and I think that again the keyword there for you is the net positive, which I find it very interesting because my next question was going to be about how worried are you about bad actors um in the space and maybe you know your colleagues around you who are experts in, in ai as well how worried are they about bad actors either developing or using ai i, I think it, it is an absolute you know concern um you have to ask yourself why do people do bad things maybe they are broken in some way you know psychologically damaged or maybe they do bad things because they need to feed their family and that's the only way to to survive or maybe they do bad things because people have control over them and they can determine their economic constraints well if you can free people up so they don't have to worry about getting money to feed their family or if you can free people up where you don't have power over where somebody doesn't have every power or economic power over them then my guess is that is that those people will do good things and and it's probably more around the people that are psychologically damaged that that, that we need to, to to be mitigating risks around. Great. Look, one one last question, which I ask everyone: um, What's your single biggest advice you would give for a company navigating the next five years with AI? Have a purpose. Have a really strong purpose. Um, it's your purpose that will attract customers. It's going to attract. It's going to attract um, talent and um, try to, to make sure that, that the decisions that you're making, that you're bringing these technologies in pragmatically and not just kind of getting seduced by the hype, but, but try to align those decisions with, with, with your purpose. And, and I actually believe it's the collective purpose of enterprise that will make the world amazing for all of us. If you think about the purpose of the brands that you consume from, if, yeah. we, if AI can help you accelerate towards and achieve that purpose yeah. it, 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 it's it's the collective purpose that will make a world of abundance yeah and then it will be translated into allowing people to have purpose to do different things it's, a, it's exactly it's a glorious <laughs> it's a glorious virtuous positive it's cycle the best virtuous circle we can get to um look daniel has been an absolute pleasure um thank you very much for joining us today pleasure thank you Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows awaits you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. So welcome everyone to today's session of uh, Capital HQ uh, Masterclass uh, on Asset-Based Financing. Uh, I'm Hugo, I'll be your moderator for today's session. We're here to explore the intricacies of asset-based financing, a key strategy for businesses looking to leverage their assets for growth and stability. Today we've brought uh, together industry leaders to share their wisdom and experiences uh, with this financial instrument. So first, I want to begin by introducing a leader in the field of technology and finance, uh, Jan Zulko. 
Jan is the CEO and founder of Aeroflone, an innovative company that's pioneering the device as a service sector. And with a proven track record of driving growth and operational excellence, Jan's leadership has seen Ever, uh, Everphone scale new heights in the B2B market. So hi, everyone. I'm Jan. I'm the founder of Everphone. Um, I founded Everphone eight years ago um, on the premise that, is that it is very complex to manage mobile phones in corporate settings. So if we think about what does Everphone do, simplified said, we rent out mobile phones. And that now sounds like something very simple. You buy a phone and you rent it out. But the true complexity on the side of companies is that it's not just going into a shop, buying a mobile phone, giving it to the employee and the employee can use it. But it's actually that, first of all, the, the um, mobile phone has, has to, uh, and mobile device management has to be put on the phone. The right apps have to be installed. Um, it has to be sent to the address um, of the employee. If they're in the home office, the logistics have to do at the end, the device has to be wiped again from the data that's uh, still on that has to be refurbished and reused. So the entire life cycle, as it's called, is a very complex process for companies. And all of this, of course, has to be managed. The assets have to be managed. Um, uh, the company needs to know which employee has which device and so on. The second thing that is always a problem for companies uh, um, owning the device is, of course, the financing part. As often when employees leave the company, they give back the company-owned phone, of course, as they should. Um, but then the, the company is stuck with a relatively new mobile phone. So what does the company do? They can't just sell it on, on eBay. So in the end, what they do is they simply... it's usually stays in the drawers uh, um, of uh, the company. So Everphone thought of a solution that solves all these problems in one step. And that's in the end, Everphone buys the asset. Everphone goes deep into the processes of the company to understand which software has to be installed, which mobile device management is needed, which cybersecurity needs to be on the device. But we all manage this. We directly interact with the employee and, and this is crucial for the session, of course, we own the phone. So at every given time, we own the phone and we basically give a usage license to the users to use this device. And there is one great aspect, full flexibility. If an employee leaves the company after six months, they give back the device to Everphone. Everphone doesn't charge the company anymore. That's simplified said what we do. So in the end, we do the entire management of the devices and the financing part. Of course, as you can imagine, by now we have roughly 400,000 devices under, under management. Those are a lot of phones. The average phone is about four to five hundred dollars. So we need a big debt facility to finance all these assets. And especially with part of the revenues at the end of the life cycle, the residual value of the phone in the end, this makes it a relatively complex financing structure. And this is what Dietmar and Veronica is going to tell you about uh, in the session today. Great, thank you very much, Jan. And for uh, anyone who's interested, all, all, any founders or even investors interested in working with you guys, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, um, so mostly we are focused on large enterprises. So it starts at a thousand devices. So we are more for the corporate uh, corporate customers, but of course, grown up uh, uh, grown ups. Let's call it like this or interested uh, larger companies. Um, it's it's they can directly contact me. I love hearing about the the user stories and uh, the demands in the market. So just contact me on LinkedIn. It's usually the easiest way. Um, just. Google my name. Uh, thankfully, I have a very unique name. Uh, so just Google me, send me a request, um, and uh, I will shortly answer. And if you're interested in the product, happily do that. If I can support other founders, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship. Uh, also, always happy uh, to at least give my uh, uh, two cents of advice. Thank you very much, Jan. It has been a pleasure. Um, so we just had the privilege of hearing Jan uh, Everphone, uh, CEO and founder. Um, I now have the privilege of having Dr. Dietmar Helms with us, uh, a partner at Hogan Lovells and a leader in the legal domain of asset-based financing. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Helms brings a wealth of experience in structured finance transactions, having advised on several benchmark deals. Uh, his legal acumen has earned him recognition across leading lawyer rankings, uh, making him the ideal expert to guide us through the legal framework of asset-based financing. Uh, so now we're just going to hear a small keynote, a short keynote from him. Thank you, Dietmar. 
Thank you so much, Hugo. Um, we have been introduced over the last years to a number of companies such as Everphone, new business models with a significant need for funding. As Jan has already explained, uh, those use cases are typically in the sharing economy as a typical use case um, um, where they replace ownership and provide services both in the B2B field as well as in the B2C field. We also see that in the, now in the con uh, consumer finance space, we have advised a number of solar companies and heat pump companies for the energy transition that want to offer consumer finance solutions to their customers. So finding the right balance uh, of funding or the right funding mix is a particular challenge for these asset-heavy startup companies. Apparently, the access to traditional bank lending is particularly difficult if you are a young company. Everphone already is a now established player in the market and can obviously seek bank funding. But when I met Everphone a number of years ago, um, they were still young in the market with short track record and would usually not get a traditional uh, unsecured or secured bank lending. Um, also, the other possible route would be a sale and leaseback structure, which might not particularly fit to the very flexible business model that Everfund wants to offer to his clients. On the other side, the pure equity financing would also be very inefficient and too expensive. So uh, apparently, these companies need to find the right mix of equity finance and debt financing. So startup companies were often led to uh, seek funding through venture debt, um, which might work or may not work in an ideal form because it comes with a lot of restriction on the further growth and might not be the best solution for a high scalable business case such as Everphone. So we have invented uh, the kind of asset-based lending structures that we are talking about in more detail today. So what this structure is mainly about, uh, first of all, we have to distinguish financing models which look on the pure receivables financing versus an asset-based lending type of structure. So in an receivables financing, for instance, if you have an installment purchase contract, which would fully amortize the asset at the end of the lifetime of the contract, then we would set up a kind of a factoring structure which, where we would purely sell uh, and fund the receivables. Where in another case, like in uh, Everphone's case, we have a very, or we might have a short rental period, which would not lead to a full amortization of the asset, where we would also look in particular on the asset value itself. So the difference to a traditional bank lending in an asset based lending structure would be that we try to set up a structure which allows investors full control over the assets and over a potential enforcement scenario where they have to segregate the assets in an insolvency of the respective company. So the main advantage is that the creditors are not just secured creditors in a potential insolvency proceedings, but they can actually segregate the assets that they have financed. They can control the enforcement process itself. They can avoid costs and, um, well, uh, additional time uh, for an insolvency administrator administrator to take decisions on the enforcement and give them uh, a much better position either to control the enforcement itself or to negotiate with the insolvency administrator how to best enforce the collateral. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you very much, Dietmar, for that uh, launch into asset-based financing. Um, today, we, we're joined uh, with Dietmar and myself by Dr. Veronica. Uh, she's the Chief Financial Officer and Managing Director at Everphone. Uh, Veronica's journey in finance has taken her from the structured world of banking to the dynamic and fast-paced startup ecosystem. Uh, for this panel, we will navigate the landscape of asset-based financing, uh, exploring its roots, um, and going into the mechanics and advantages of leveraging company assets to secure funding, a concept that recently, as Dietmar has uh, pointed out, has been pivotal for certain companies in terms of growth. So our discussion will dissect the nuances from the initial evaluation of assets to the intricate legal considerations. So let's kick off uh, maybe with Dietmar first. Going back to its very core basics, could you define asset-based financing and its plain, its core components? Sure, Hugo, thank you. So I think the main idea of this asset-based financing or asset-based lending, as we call it, in the case of, for instance, Everphone consists of really segregating the assets from the operating company, 
In these cases, we set up an insolvency remote entity, which becomes the owner of the relevant assets, meaning here in this case, iPhones or iPads that are rented out by Everphone to its customers. And the only link between this insolvency remote SPV and Everphone would be a service contract by which Everphone would then still provide certain services, uh, the marketing of these uh, products to its customers, the collection of um, payments from the relevant customers, and the maintenance of the relevant devices. We would then, in addition, have a backup service typically in place, which is a standby solution in case uh, the operating company becomes insolvent so that the creditor has someone to turn to to take over the enforcement and uh, the wind down of the collateral. Okay, great. And um, Veronica, uh, from a CFO's perspective, uh, why is asset-based financing, at least in your opinion, uh, becoming a suitable choice for startups and scale-ups? So this is especially relevant for asset-heavy business models such as ours. So procuring an asset, usually a mobile asset, that is leased out or rented out to consumers or B2B, and that is generating steady cash flows. Um, in ancient times, this was typically automotive leasing contracts or rental contracts. Um, nowadays, we can finance pretty much every asset from smartphones to um, other mobile devices to electro scooters, but also handbags. And to scale such a business model, um, the company would need a steady influx of assets they could rent out. And obviously, this cannot be happening with equity in a scaling business model, just because equity is the most expensive form of capital priced at roughly 15 to 20% um, margin, whereas asset-based financing, if done in the right structure, can be obtained at margins of under 5%. And therefore, having such refinancing in place can help significantly scale and also make a asset-heavy business model profitable. Right. And, and just a question on that. So what's maybe for either one of you, what's changed in the financial industry to allow for this larger scope of financing of asset-based financing going from maybe just some cars to now pretty much everything? Well, I guess many startups who have tried to reach such financing and who have had the right support um, amongst others, Dietmar, who has helped banks to understand the concrete risk of the asset and the startup and found a solution how to contain the risk in a way that it's um, amenable to a bank rating. Right. And uh, Dietmar, coming to you now, with, with your experience in secura securitization, what due diligence uh, processes would you say are essential for companies to undertake when securing asset-based financing? I think we look at the number of uh, questions when we uh, well get introduced to a new startup or scale-up company that seeks debt financing. So we really try to educate this company to take a look at their own business uh, as if they were lending debt uh, funding to themselves. So um, we are really looking at everything starting from the credit process, the client customer intake process, fraud prevention process, four eyes principle, um, all these typical questions that a debt investor would later ask in the process. We are looking on the underlying contracts um, that they have with their customers, uh, whether they are all solid um, and are suitable for refinancing. We are looking at uh, all the compliance issues, whether or not they have the required licenses in place. And obviously, the, the, the whole organization of the company itself is up and running and working. Yeah? So these are typical companies that haven't been around just for a few days, but they have already at least a certain short track record and have proven that their business model is solid. Right. And sticking with you with regards to, apart from the fact that it's asset heavy, what criteria makes a business a good candidate for asset-based financing? Does it matter where they are in this stage, uh, whether it's Series A, Series B, or further down the line? Uh, what kind of criteria does it make it? I think it it should be a solid business model that people believe into. Um, they should have reliable founders and uh, people in the um, in the management of the company with a certain track record. Often we have zero founders such as Jan, who has in the past already set up other businesses before that and has proven that he has the right skill set to come up with the right business model and also brings together the right um, well, management team that can run that business. 
And um, obviously, um, although we provide significant amount of the funding for debt funding, the equity component obviously also plays a role, especially in times where it's no longer that easy to uh, raise another capital round. So debt investors are also looking at rundown rates, et cetera, because they don't want to fund a business that is at the edge of becoming insolvent in a very short period of time unless they can raise another equity round. So I think um, debt investors have become a little bit more cautious about this uh, approach. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into asset-based financing versus equity financing. I think a lot of founders probably watching this are interested in that. But coming to you, Veronica, with um, Eberphone's innovative business model, could you discuss how asset-based financing fits within your broader financial ecosystem, especially uh, compared to perhaps traditional lending models? So we have something in place that I call the golden balance sheet rule. Um, this means that all of our growth, which is invests in people, in tech, in marketing, is financed by equity. This is something that is of vital importance to investors, and that's why they finance it. On the other hand, all of our assets rented out to clients are debt financed. We're doing this exclusively by asset-based financing, just because this has been proven to be the cheapest and the most accessible form to us. But obviously, it would be also possible to run such a model and include venture debt capital or include um, traditional corporate lending on, let's say, our inventory or the like. Um, we have it covered in our structures, and that's why it's not necessary. Um, I'd also like to underline the high availability of debt capital, in even in terms of economic crisis, so we had the COVID crisis, we have the funding crisis for startups um, that has basically been happening in 2023 um, since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And during all those times where equity has been very scarce and very expensive and difficult to supply, debt capital was pretty much freely available on the market um, if you had the right business model and if you were able to prove that it's sustainable. Um, I've raised one facility during COVID um, at my former employer. We raised um, our current facility at Everphone during this time of 2023 crisis. And there were never a lack of, let's say, available banks in the market um, that would have been able to do this deal. Um, whereas equity investors are just difficult to find. Right. And can you maybe share an example from Everphone or your past experiences where asset-based financing was effectively utilized um, and perhaps uh, maybe the first time you guys used it at Everphone. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is a funny story. Um, so Everphone was you uh, at the start a B2C club. It's what's okay. called a smartphone club because um, Jan dropped his device and the screen broke and he needed a new one and thought, well, everyone's having that pain at some point in their lives. Um, then they pivoted to B2B because one of their private customers was a salesperson and they wanted to equip all of their colleagues in sales with uh, a phone. And that's when the business model pivoted. They acquired some minor clients and were able to buy all those devices with equity. But then they out of a sudden acquired a big four um, client from a large advisory firm and they wanted uh, to roll out 10k devices within three months and that was the point in time when Everphone realized um, that they wouldn't get the equity to buy all those phones and when they started um, setting up and investing into a debt facility um, this was um, set up with a smaller fund because Everphone indeed didn't have a track record it was a very easy structure via a promissionary note and over time and with more track record, Everphone has um, set up three more facilities, each with larger banks, each more complex, but also each cheaper, um, ending with that private securitization we've set up um, by the end of 2023. Yeah, it's cheaper, more complex. That's that's where you need the both of you to come in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Obviously, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, to Dietmar first, maybe, how does the scalability of a business impact its ability to secure asset-based financing? Yeah, I think it's uh, a cornerstone. Obviously, um, this complex structure isn't suitable for a company that does not seek to really grow in size. 
um, while we start doing these structures with a minimal, minimum debt funding of about 5 million euro, I think the expectations of lenders would be that the business would ramp up in a relatively short period of time to at least 10, 15, 20 million to make it cost efficient. I think a business that would stay at a financing volume of 5 million should uh, seek for a less complex uh, type of financing. Right. And and for you, Veronica, how, how have you found when Everphone started reaching scalability? Did you find it easier to secure asset-based financing or not really? Yes, indeed, because I believe the credibility that the early mm -hmm. banks lent by investing into Everphone um, also made us attractive to larger partners. By then, we had a proven track record of fulfilling our debt, of securing additional funding, of also delivering in terms of remarketing our assets in claims management and all the like, and being able to show a two to three year full history in a very data-based setup um, is very convincing to banks. So it's probably not the fault of those very early stage startups if they can't reach asset-based financing. It's just a lack of data and a lack of history um, that's oftentimes detrimental to getting such type of financing. Right. And and coming to you, Dietmar, before we go into asset-based versus equity financing, I think it's important uh, in terms of the evolving definitions in the financial sector, how would you differentiate asset-based financing from other forms of secured lending, particularly if we focus on a startup slash scale-up audience? Yeah, I think it's a more elaborate way of financing. It is also using concepts of secured lending because this um, special purpose vehicle, which becomes the owner of the assets, would typically also grant security over the assets as an additional belts and braces protection for the investors. But the main idea is really to segregate the assets from the operating company. Um, I'd like to point out another point to what Mer Veronica has mentioned before. I think key for this financing to work is really to also have the right asset class. Um, um, traditionally, banks would probably not have financed against a portfolio of handhelds, mobile phones, because they couldn't evaluate um, the asset at a certain point in time. I think the availability of data was one of the key factors that has helped to really make this product uh, well, more reliable for investors so that companies such as Everphone could really provide sufficient data to their investors and to prove at any point in time they can have a very accurate evaluation of the asset portfolio. This is the one point that is uh, important. The second point is that you also have a liquid secondary market. Today, um, as you can see on eBay and other platforms, these assets that are rented out by Everphone are traded in the thousands each and every day. So not only have you reliable data that it's not a random number that you would get for a used iPhone, um, but you would also well, have enough comfort that you can sell several thousands iPhones in a very short period of time on these platforms. And this is also a key factor for a debt investor to really grant uh, funding on that basis. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so look now, now, now let's move into asset-based versus equity financing. Um, and Veronica, you touched upon it already with your golden balance sheet rule. Um, it'd be great to maybe find out how you came to that, or was it a, a term you got, you, you learned somewhere else? And, you know, when did you decide to apply that the first time? Well, I believe that's a kind of inherent business logic a bank would not be willing to finance a client's growth unless this was um, some debt that was specifically designed to that and would have a venture debt component. And on the other hand, investors would not be willing to invest the very scarce equity at a very high interest margin in financing something very basic that a bank would be also ready to finance. So it's kind of leveraging the two components to the best of our knowledge and Indeed, it's customary to combine equity and debt fundraising. Um, indeed, it's customary to combine equity and debt fundraising, as it happened during our Series C in 2021, and mm. now in our Series D. Because for equity investors, a company being able to obtain bank financing is a sign of strength, and that's why they're super interested in companies achieving such. And on the other hand. For banks, an additional equity provides a certain security cushion 
And if they are able to fund the junior tranche or the equity injection into a facility for the duration of that facility um, and can prove they are able to do so by an equity injection, this is also some stability for in the bank's view. Right. And um, Dietmar, from, from the investor side, perhaps, if you can talk a bit about the scenarios where asset-based financing offers better investor security, perhaps, than equity financing. Yeah, obviously, uh, debt financing always ranks ahead of equity. So if you are an equity investor, obviously, you come at the very end of a potential liquidation of the company. So any debt investor, by definition, is already ranking ahead of equity. And the structures that we put in place are offering even more comfort to investors that they can actually segregate assets from a potential insolvency so that they would not only rely on insolvency proceedings and a potential sort of payout from the insolvency estate, but they can actually segregate assets from uh, companies such as Everphone and liquidate them themselves and have more control over the proceeds that they can get out of these assets. Okay, and and in your experience, how do because we've heard from Veronica how how uh, equity financing and debt financing coexist, but in your experience with the companies you've helped in the past, how do those in your in your experience coexist in in terms of a for example a specific funding round? Are they usually followed by one another? Are they usually done together? Are they separate? How how do you usually see those? Uh, we often see them kind of combined as Veronica described. So often we see uh, a certain condition in the debt funding that equity is raised at a certain point in time. And on the other side, equity investors also sometimes uh, demand uh, well, comfort in respect of the availability of debt funding so that, uh, that the funding actually occurs at the same point in time as we have often seen in the past. It's not a prerequisite. Um, sometimes you also have like a post-closing covenant in the debt funding that the next equity raise is going to happen in a, a certain period of time after the debt funding closes. But sometimes it's really combined to happen at the same point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just moving on to the applicability across different business stages. So Veronica, how... Can you maybe go a bit deeper into asset based how asset based financing has supported Everphone's growth from a startup to scale up, um, and if you saw a big difference uh, when you were just doing equity to now using asset based financing? Well, I believe that asset based financing has enabled us to grow. We would never have been able to secure as much equity, especially during those difficult phases on the equity market, but also generally in Europe to be able to maintain a high growth profile and roll out over 200K devices a year. So um, this is something that cannot be handled by equity. It might be able to be handled with um, US invest, US um, venture capital investors usually are able to supply bigger tranches, but securing equity tranches of let's say 20 or 30 million makes you a larger fundraiser in Europe. And this would basically, if we use that equity to buy phones, this would probably bring us through, let's say a quarter to half a year. And so um, we would never have achieved the growth that we experienced with Everphone. Right. Also yeah. um, in times as those profitability is getting more and more important. At one point, investors would demand to reach profitability, which we can only achieve once we have a significant number of assets under management, because there are functions such as mine that only scale um, when they tackle larger asset numbers. Um, and this means getting more profitable over time. We would have to improve our interest margins as we have done in the past, but we would also be able to um, scale and have e economies of scale throughout all our business, because um, we have a larger base of assets, we can distribute those general costs too. Right. Thank you. Um, and coming to you, Dietmar, kind of a two-part question. How did you get into this world, your, your personal journey into this world of asset-based financing? And what types of assets were most commonly used maybe when you started compared to now? And where do you think that's going? Will it be applicable to absolutely everything in the future? Or will it still remain somewhat uh, closed off to certain things? 
I think my introduction to asset-based lending happened about 10 years ago when I happened to sit next to a young um, a man at a closing dinner and he told me about some startup companies that were going to be founded in Germany in Hamburg, Munich, Berlin, sort of the hubs in Germany for this type of financing. And uh, we started to look at business such as Everphone and similar companies in the market that had tradable assets. And we were thinking about what could be a potential structure to get assets, uh, access to debt funding for these types of companies. So we actually used a structure that was used before in the car rental space, uh, which is kind of a similar use case where you have very short rental periods for vehicles that would not lead to a full amortization of the assets, but also have this um, element of an asset segregation in a special purpose vehicle. So when you seek debt funding, you typically try to replicate a structure that is already bankable, that is used to banks. You don't try to invent something completely new that no one has done in the past, but sort of make this transition from a car rental structure to this kind of asset-based lending structures. That was, I think, the new element and using it for new assets such as mobile phones uh, and to convince that investors that they have sufficient data available to make a, an asset-based lending and asset-based test for the asset value itself that was also new in the market. It was a very common feature for the car space because you have this uh, residual value list uh, provided in the Schwacke list in Germany, for instance. So you have reliable data in the market for used assets, but we only had to create that, set, that same level of comfort for that investors for new assets such as Everphones, mobile devices. We have seen in the past other use cases, so we have recently financed coffee machines, we have financed handbags, uh, we have financed e-scooters. So there's a large variety of assets, but the crucial questions are the same as I discussed before. So it is important that you have sufficient data available for the assets to really come up with a day-to-day -day valuation of the asset portfolio, and you need to have a liquid secondary market so that in case the operating company ever becomes insolvent, you can appoint a backup servicer and you know for sure that you can liquidate these assets at the value that you expect to receive. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and to Veronica, could you maybe, we, we've talked about all the positives here, um, but could you maybe discuss a specific challenge you faced uh, while arranging asset-based financing and how you, you overcame it? I guess I can iterate on Dietmar's point here. Um, at Everphone's beginning, it was very difficult to convince the investors that our assets are indeed fungible and um, that we can sell them off at a value larger than zero. So um, what we had to do, we had to prepare the data ourselves to be able to prove to banks um, that this works out. We set up a data product, which is basically a crawler that crawls the internet for B2C prices. Then we have a mechanism that converts B2C prices into B2B prices because we usually sell off um, large bulks of phones. Um, and this is what in the event of Everphone's insolvency, um, banks would also do. And we have, of course, to be able to predict the future value of the handhelds and devices that we are buying today. And that's where we employ machine learning um, in detail, a deep forest technology. This data product enables us to predict the residual value of a phone, any phone with any minimum duration of the contract, with any make and model. And of course, over time, we have been able to prove to banks that this mechanism works. And we are in a 95 confidency interval of meeting our um, expected returns two or three years later. Being able to prove this made refinancing much easier and also guarantees us that the banks not only finance the cash flows arising with B2B customers out of the asset, but also the residual values. And again, as said before, um, it sounds very easy to set this up, but it needs a lot of structure, a lot of work, and it also needs time to be able to present a data set of, let's say, three to four years to banks um, in order to really convince them. I can I tell you another it doesn't sound easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think another component that was crucial to the success of these structures was also that we now have certain service providers in the market that provide backup servicing for these products. 
um, that wasn't existing before. So when a backup servicer in the past for a securitization transaction, these were debt collecting agencies. So they could only collect outstanding receivables, but they could never uh, collect assets such as mobile phones, refurbish them and sell them in a secondary market. So over the last number of years, we have seen such service providers to really occur on the market, see that as an own business model. And uh, they are now implemented in these structures. And this only makes it viable and comfortable for a bank to invest into such a product. Right. And look, I, I want to kind of move on to something that, that you're specialized in, Dietmar. Um, we've talked about operational hurdles, a bit of financial hurdles and structural, structural hurdles for companies. But what legal hurdles do companies typically face when setting up asset-based financing structures? I think it's more the complexity. It's not a straightforward uh, secured lending where you just have a credit agreement with a bank and a security agreement over your assets. You have to set up a new entity. This can be a subsidiary of the operating company. It can also be an orphan SPV, which is held by a Stichting. So this is completely separate from the operating company. You then have to set up a servicing agreement between the operating company and the asset quo. Uh, whereby the service company would then provide every service that is necessary to really market the product because the asset company doesn't have its own employees. It's just owning the assets, but it shouldn't have any employees by itself. Then also you have to set up these backup servicing agreements, which are tailor-made contracts that are really then meeting the investor's requirements uh, for a reliable backup servicing in case the operating company becomes insolvent and then we also take a close look and due diligence on the underlying customer contract. So the whole process we really set up is a little bit more cumbersome, but I think over the last years we have gained a lot of experience and we can replicate certain use cases. So yeah, so for companies who want to, who want not an easy way, but a more tried way, they should just come to, to the both of you and get your insights. <laughs> um, could maybe staying with you, Deepmar, could you share an example where asset valuation proved challenging um, and how it was resolved, perhaps? Um, I remember one case where we have set up an asset-based lending, for instance, for an e-scooter company. And the public perception of e-scooters at that time was really a disaster. Everyone thought that these scooters have zero value after a short period of use. And so no one was really prepared to lend uh, debt to finance the acquisition of e-scooters. So this company that we have advised set up its own uh, platform where they started selling used scooters after the use of one year time to really prove that these scooters still have a significant residual value. And I think this has uh, provided uh, sufficient comfort for that lenders to invest into that structure. Right, and, and, and for you, Veronica, has there been a time at Everphone where it was asset evaluation was was difficult or had you set up everything from the crawler from the get-go? Um, we had set it up very early on, but um, obviously we didn't have results until the first, first cohorts of our phones came back and had been sold off. So for three years, we had to basically convince banks to trust in us and in our system without having real data to evaluate it. And this made refinancing at this point in time, on the one hand, very expensive. And on the other hand, um, not comprehensive, which means we couldn't refinance a very large proportion of the capital expenditure of the smartphones, but we had to bear a large junior tranche. Okay. And and for you, Dietmar, how do you see the la this landscape and perhaps in a legal term um, evolving uh, in the next few years, uh, perhaps technology influence or something like that? I think it has become now uh, tested and um, yeah, a, a debt funding structure, which is now more familiar to more banks. Um, so in the beginning, there, there was only a very limited number of investors that would actually explore that new way for uh, funding startup companies and scale up companies. I think now we see bigger tickets in the markets. We see more sizable for portfolios such as Everphone, for instance with uh, funding of more than 100 million uh, for a debt funding. And we also see more interest among banks to really launch that as a product. 
we see some structure that are set up as an securitization structure and asset securitization structures. Some of them are set up as a specialized lending structure. So there are different ways to go. We also see debt funds investing into these structures. So there seems to be way more appetite now. And uh, I think we see more data in the market. We see more marketplaces where new products are marketed. We have recently advised a company that is producing industrial robots, for instance, for um, yeah, the, the uh, repackaging industry for logistic companies. And um, even those kind of products that sound very tailor-made and uh, sophisticated seem to have a secondary market where you can well extract data from and where you can find sufficient, reliable uh, marketplaces that you can sell off these products. Right. And and just to keep to this, this might be a bit left field in terms of question, but do you perhaps see in the future where a seed round company could leverage asset based financing or is that do you think that will always be too early? We have seen these cases. Yes, indeed. Right. We have worked with companies that have just uh, passed their seed round and have already had access to asset based lending. It really depends on the company. It depends on the specific assets. Okay, great. And I would assume they would have to have also investor support because setting up such a structure would also require talent in-house that comes from a banking background that is knowledgeable, that is able to, on the one hand, calculate, on the other hand, to legally um, understand such structures. And this would mean a cost invest on the side of investors. Right. And and sticking with you, Veronica, from a strategic standpoint, how do you anticipate asset-based financing will change in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? I'd hope it will be more and more available to companies. I believe that from a technology standpoint, maybe um, tokenization and blockchain would enable us to offer a better security regimen than we have today. Um, securities are complex, especially once a company serves clients, not only in their home country, but also in other European countries or even um, overseas, because security law is different there. And this makes it very costly to check. So I hope that technology and tokenization um, can be one way out of um, applying national security law. Right. I'm working with a company. I won't, I won't name them, but they're creating... Um a way of exactly what you said, tokenization for assets based on if they go insolvent, people can buy it off the market quite quickly and pay back their creditors. I'm not an expert in this, but it did sound very interesting in some of the companies they were Super working cool. with. Yeah, very cool. Um, but yeah, the, based out of Switzerland, very cool company. Um, but yeah, so uh, coming to you, Dietmar, what are the most common pitfalls in asset-based financing agreements and how can they be avoided? I think just to add to the previous question, I think yeah. this basic concept of having an asset call SPV owning this asset already takes out a lot of complexity from a security perspective. So the sec local security, if you look at assets that are located outside, for instance, of Germany and other jurisdictions, is usually just an add on to the structure. But usually this uh, security would never get enforced in case of an insolvency. We would just rely on the asset co to be the owner of the assets and being able to repossess it. So sometimes this helps when getting security seems impossible or it's too cumbersome or not cost efficient. There are certain jurisdictions, for instance, in the Nordic countries where you cannot uh, grant a security interest over movable assets without also transferring possession to the asset, which wouldn't make sense in the case of Everfond, for instance. If they hand out the assets to the debt investor, they cannot rent it any longer to their customers. So in those cases, this basic structure of having an asset co-owning the assets already solves a lot of these uh, issues, which would otherwise be, be impossible to solve with a security interest. Um, coming to your question about the pitfalls, I think uh, one of the main pitfalls is really to finding the right funding strategy in the in the beginning of a company's life. What we have often seen in the past is that startup companies often think that venture capital is the way to go and uh, venture debt funding is the way to get uh, venture debt funding into that business model. And uh, without thinking about whether or not this venture debt would then later on allow them to scale the business. Yeah. So a venture debt provider would usually take 
security interests over all the assets of the company and would also encumber the business with a lot of negative covenants so that they would not be allowed to take out other financing without the venture debts uh, providers um, uh, permission. And um, so if you reach the relevant debt size of this venture debt, you want to grow further, you need to get consent to repay the venture debt. So if a company really has the scalability in mind, they should either start uh, taking up that asset-based lending from the outset, or at least uh, consider when they get a venture debt funding that they have some sort of carve out provisions in these agreements that would allow them to later on switch to asset-based lending, which is usually the better way of funding if you really want to grow big. Right. And um, I, I don't know if this, uh, this question is relevant to you, Veronica, um, but if there is, if there's ever been a time, can you discuss a time when asset-based financing did not go as planned? All the time. <laughs> okay. So um, I believe there's pretty much all the time something happening in a startup environment that has not been foreseen. For example, Everphone's third facility was prepared in a way that our customers would do 12 or 24 month contracts. And the facility was signed and a very large um, German DAX client called and said they wanted to do 36 month minimum duration. Right. So what did we do then? Um, for the first month finance thing, those contracts as if they were 24 months with a huge loss of cash and equity and then renegotiate with a bank to please, please allow us to also finance 36 month contracts. Um, same is happening when a new product is onboarded, when a new amortization profile is onboarded. We are usually having stable rental amounts through the time, but now one of our large big four clients is asking whether they have, um, whether they would be allowed to have degressive rentals. How mm. to fit degressive rentals in a security structure? Well, you basically ask the bank, explain them the rationale behind this ask and then find a solution with them. Um, we're very happy to have banking partners that are flexible, that are quick to respond, and that are willing to consider whatever makes sense business-wise to also appreciate refinancing-wise. But in a business model that's rapidly changing, as is a startups or a scale-ups, um, there's always something not going according to plan. Yeah, and I think one of my questions was, was you, you answered it a bit, but... How flexible have you found banks in general? If you select the right banks and if they are convinced that your business is a great one, they will be flexible. So question and, is, how do you select the right bank? Well, basically, you, you ask them those questions. I remember um, in my first refinancing structure, I was talking to that banking partner on the 23rd of, of December and I told him, hey, I'm having a balance sheet problem. I need you to, to refinance more cars between Christmas and New Year's Eve. And he did it just because they're smallish bank and they're super flexible. And he was willing to um, open up his laptop computer and help me out between Christmas and New Year's Eve. Um, that's the kind of flexibility we need. In this structure, we had um, to do our first drawdown between Christmas and New Year as well. And we had to do it on a Friday, which is a non-banking day for our mezzanine partner, Phoenix. So they just enabled it because they believe in Everphone. They asked their employees to do an extra shift on Friday um, and pay out the funds. Um, I believe in a good collaboration, that's something banks are willing to do. If they stop trusting you or if you um, don't maintain a good relationship, then they won't be as lenient and as accommodating for special requests. Sounds, that sounds like a very healthy relationship. <laughs> um, um, and to you, Dietmar, the same question in general, because I'm guessing you deal with uh, not just Everphone, probably with other companies as well. How have you found the flexibility of banks in general? Well, I can only reiterate what Veronica has said. And obviously we see a lot of players in the market. We also gain certain experience from the past when we have seen banks and funds acting in these kind of scenarios, reacting to those special requests, um, asking for this special flexibility to well amend on short-term notice certain requirements in their facility. And we are happy to share this experience with new clients that we take on board and advise on 
which bank or fund might be the best choice for this particular product. And obviously over time, when banks get more comfortable with the company and the product, obviously the, the amount of flexibility also increases over time. So we usually say the first financing that a startup takes up is probably not yet the time when you get the, the ultimate best terms for it in terms of funding costs and in terms of flexibility. Obviously the banks at the very beginning try to give you certain restrictions just to control the risk better. But the more confidence they get into the business model, the more data they see, the more track record they see, they will open up to discussions and allow you more flexibility. And then you can start renegotiating the terms of your facility. Great. Look, uh, we have time for one more question uh, from both of you. So maybe first, Veronica, what advice would you give to startups considering asset-based financing for the first time? Consider it carefully, but if you are convinced this is the best option, really invest into people, invest into tech, invest into internal processes, and invest into good advisors and lawyers um, to set it up. It will take some time, but it's totally worth it. Great. And uh, for you, Dietmar, from a, from a legal standpoint, what are the first steps a startup should take when exploring asset-based financing? Um, we are always happy to bounce ideas at a very early stage. So we get introduced to a, new, to a lot of startup companies and we are happy to take a look at uh, their pitch deck, for instance, and give them some preliminary advice how to best present the business to a potential bank. We also make introductions to potential lenders and we try to already um, sort of, um, well, improve the business model wherever it is possible to make it more bankable and uh, admissible for bank funding. Okay, great. Well, look, for anyone watching, um, we'll put some details in the description below um, to, to get in touch uh, with either Dietmar or Veronica. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to, to help if they can. But I'd just like to take the time to thank the both of you uh, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Veronica and Hugo. It was a pleasure. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Welcome, welcome back everyone to Capital HQ, uh, where for this session, we're going to be diving into the heart of tech due diligence. Joining us is Chris Phillips, uh, founder and managing partner at Phillips & Byrne, uh, named synonymous with excellence in the tech due diligence industry. Uh, since 2019, Chris has been at the forefront of guiding funding and strategic technology assessments, helping startups and investors alike navigate the complexities of the tech landscape. He has been an interim CTO um, for a long time uh, in various different organizations, so has a lot of experience there. With a career spanning over two decades, uh, including roles as an engineer, CTO, and now as a leading advisor, Chris brings a wealth of knowledge and insights. Today, he will share his expertise on what makes tech startups succeed, the nuances of tech due diligence, and the future trends in technology investments. Uh, get ready for an enlightening conversation full of actionable insights. Welcome, Chris. Happy to be here. Thanks, Google. Great. Look, let's let's get uh, let's get stuck in. And before we dive into the depths of tech due diligence, could you share a bit about um, the ethos and mission that drives Philips and Burn in the tech advisory landscape? Yeah, absolutely. So we always say we help founders and investors build the world of tomorrow, and that probably sounds like a huge ambition. But uh, in the essence, that's exactly what we do. Yeah, I mean, 
Um, the way I see the startup scene is that we really use the opportunity to build another world, to build another future, hopefully a better future. And having been already part of the startup industry for more than 20 years, um, that's always my ambition. And by advising investors on one hand, but also advising founders, entrepreneurs on the other hand, that is definitely our mission that we want to help building that, build that future. Um, apart from that, I mean, uh, we have this mission in place, but also we have a kind of prime directive, uh, principle number one in our company, and that is zero bullshit. You all, uh, also find that uh, present on our website. And we not only write it, but we actually mean it. Uh, it's our moral compass for our work, but also for our own company. Okay. And where did this uh, zero, zero bullshit uh, philosophy come about? Yeah, that comes from my um, history as an interim CTO. Um, I once had a, a colleague from the US uh, who had worked with me for a couple of years uh, talking to me over a beer. And uh, he gave me that feedback. He said, like, you know what I what I value most about you is like you're absolutely zero bullshit. I always know where I stand. I always know this is the truth. Yeah, And then we can operate based on that and i like that feedback a lot and i think i made it to my own personal first principle and then i introduced it also to the company later on yeah and i look i i, I it's a, one of the things i've taken on when i started working um because i work with a lot of founders um i help them with their due diligence materials not to the same extent as you do but i do that as part of my as part of my everyday day-to-day -day role and, you know, after five, six, seven clients, I was like, look, I'm going to be very brutal with you because it's better it comes from me than it comes from a potential investor. And at the start, I was a bit wary of saying that because it kicks off the, the relationship between uh, a business and a client a bit off. Uh, but today I use that every time I get on a call and they seem to enjoy it. So I, I, I relate to your okay. zero bullshit. Um, well, look, with, with over two decades in the tech and startup ecosystem and now leading Philips and Byrne, can you share how your journey has shaped your perspective on tech due diligence? Yeah, uh, I started as a typical techie, techie I would say. Uh, so I used to work as a software engineer for quite a while and had various other roles uh, in engineering before I uh, eventually became a CTO and then an interim CTO of uh, more than 10 years. Um, but still, I had this typical tech perspective. Um, and then when I had my first uh, due diligence, not as an auditor, but on being on the other side of the table, that was really an epiphany for me because suddenly um, I got confronted with what the outside world would consider as standards. Uh, and I think that was a, a very valuable lesson for me. Uh, fortunately, we got the funding. Fortunately, uh, we the, the, the startup grew. Um, nevertheless, it made me think a lot about, like from a higher perspective on what actually uh, a good uh, technology organization uh, needs to bring to the table. Uh, that was one aspect, but the other one, and that is probably even the stronger, strongest driver, um, I had to endure throughout my career a couple of, let's say, bad tech DDs. Um, in that sense that for me as a CTO, it was an absolute waste of time and um, the insights were very, very limited and there was almost no feedback whatsoever for me and my team. And I found that a pity because we invested a hell of a lot of time um, into preparation for that tech DD and um, in the end we left with nothing. So yeah. I swore to myself that if I ever would perform a tech DD, I would try to turn it, uh, turn it around and um, set it up in a way that it's highly valuable, not only for the investors, but also for the startups, for the teams being involved. Uh, I always say it's the most thorough and most honest feedback that you can get as a founder and as a CTO. And we try to stay true uh, to that principle. Yeah. And, and I mean, 
it's, it's interesting having sat on both sides of the table. And I think next question is, how do you mm. believe the diversity of thought, right? Because I'm guessing when you sit on either side of the table, the way you approach something is completely different, right? But the end goal for both sides mm. is is to build something uh, and move together. But how do you believe having done both things, how do you believe that diversity of thought and experiences enriches your tech due diligence processes and perhaps mm. Phillips and Burns? What I always feel is that we have a different perspective from many, many other consultancies performing DD, especially like the bigger ones, uh, because our team has a different DNA. We all come from the startup scene. We have all worked in startups and scale-ups. Uh, and that's a huge difference because we have felt the pain ourselves. And we usually are not business analysts uh, performing a tech DD. We, we are techies. Yeah? We are engineers. We are architects. We are former CTOs or directors, VPs. And uh, that is definitely something that influences massively our view. Um, but there's also a second perspective that I um, gained when I became a founder myself. Um, <laughs> And I was an advisor. I was always like advising CEOs how to build and lead their company. And one day I looked into the mirror and said, like, who am I to advise someone if I haven't built my own organization and my own company? And this was actually the prime primary motivation for me to build Philips and Burn. And that changed my perspective entirely because I suddenly found myself in the exactly same situation and I did the same things or the same mistakes the other founders uh, did and I, what I what I could watch over the years and although I knew I couldn't help myself but making the same mistakes sometimes and I understood this uh, the thinking better why founders tick the way they tick so that was really a, a, an eye-opener for me and I think that has also massively influenced our perspective with that regard that um we understand the pain, also the founder's pain, and we can sometimes translate it to investors, but we very often also know what to do in order to mitigate the risks uh, going along with that. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, putting being put in the driver's seat, I think, um, can, can do that. I haven't been there myself. So sometimes I speak to founders and I find myself in this situation where I'm telling them, like, I've, I've worked with hundreds of companies and then they're like, yeah, but you've never run one. You know, I have people I need to, I have people I have to feed. You don't have people you have to feed other. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but look, for, for the purpose of this conversation, I think, you know, and, and this concept has, has quite a few definitions, but I, I'd love for you to explain what tech due diligence is and its critical importance in the investment decision-making process. Yeah. I always like to boil it down. Um, to one simple question like for me tech dd is the answer uh, on the question does tech and product have everything with regards to people process and technology that it needs to achieve the business goals that is what you need to figure out in the tech dd and if not what needs to be done in order to get there mm -hmm. And and given your your vast experience, how has the approach to tech due, due diligence evolved over the years, uh, perhaps from a founder and an investor's perspective? Um, and that's first part. So maybe we can talk about the last 10, 15 years, your, your experience. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can touch on the rapid technological advancements happening within the last year and a half. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started with like... Um, my background and my thinking uh, as a technologist and uh, as a, a one person show. And I think that has influenced uh, the first couple of years, especially the first five to 10, I would say. And, and this is what I see nowadays a lot. I see many brilliant technologists conducting uh, DD as a kind of a single person show um, and nothing against that. It can be exactly the right context for, or the right thing for some context. However, I realized that um, the more DDs that I performed and later on we performed and we have performed around like 700 DDs by now. Um, so you could, you could see that um, 
the the most important thing is having having a framework yeah having a framework of um conducting dds but also a framework of standards and best practices you mm -hmm. apply and you you benchmark companies against uh, considering certain contexts certain stages certain industries etc cetera, etc cetera, and also having the data to benchmark the companies against similar companies of that stage that industry etc so um, that is definitely something that has evolved, I would say, uh, throughout the last five or six years um, and has become a focus uh, in our work. Um, I mean, the last one and a half years, probably you refer to the big paradigm change through AI. Um, of course, that has been super exciting also for us. I still remember when um, the first release of um, ChatGPT came out, um, I spent probably personally half a day on on just like bombing it with anonymized data, seeing what I would get back as a result. Um, and that is definitely, of course, in uh, part of everyone's uh, discussion right now, also strategic discussion, like uh, will consulting survive? Uh, will assessments survive? How well will they look like five years from now? Yeah. Um, so and I don't think that there's a way around AI or ignoring it would be a smart idea. Um, however, um, I think there's at least for a couple of years, um, there will be a hybrid approach. Um, and I believe in that hybrid approach. I mean, nobody knows how, how it will exactly be with uh, GPT-5 uh, or even 6 uh, down the road. Um, but nevertheless, I think there will be still um, space for heavily tech supported analysis and consulting um, driven by people or at least aspects of people such as um, empathy, expertise and experience in order to get the nuances right. And as long as people are involved into businesses, uh, people are the main thing to consider i mean i always say like it's when i started i thought it's uh, 90 percent uh, people and 10 percent tech nowadays i'm tempted to say the problems are related of 99 percent to people and one percent to tech right so and as long as there are people it's good to have also people on the other side of the table but what needs to be clear the times for expensive so stupid consulting um these are over and that's in my eyes a good thing yeah yeah and and look talking about this from a maybe a different angle technological mm -hmm. advancements has that made your job harder because the, maybe the the concepts are are more data hungry they're maybe a bit more complex has that made your job harder uh in general uh, I would say that has made our job even in more interesting. Um, I mean, we were in the lucky position that we, um, I don't have the numbers for 23, but for example, in 22, 30% um, of 30% uh, of our uh, DDs were AI related or deep tech related. Uh, so, and to be honest, although of course uh, the other DDs are also interesting, but uh, these ones were thrilling, uh, especially like, Looking into uh, uh, looking into companies uh, who are open AI competitors uh, and develop their own la large language models. I mean, that's super exciting for for technology teams, right? So we have built up um, a certain expertise in the field of AI and are capable of going down very very deep the rabbit hole. And so, in with that regard, it has also kind of um shaped our understanding of the landscape and um has excited us so much that uh, some of my colleagues really really went into it and built up um a really good expertise in it so we are not afraid of of assessing complex technology companies sometimes we even go i likely uh, i lively remember uh, a company in the quantum uh, computing uh, context uh, that was totally innovative back then. And that gave us a pretty hard time from a tech DD perspective because yeah, uh, no framework. Yeah? 
So, but nevertheless, these are also highlights uh, in the history um, of each uh, and every assessment company or consulting company. So we love it. Absolutely. Sounds like it. Um, and um, what are some common misconceptions about tech due diligence that you've encountered and how do you address them? Maybe we can, maybe we can do this from uh, answer this in two parts. The first one can be an investor part and the second one can be a founder's misconception. Uh, yeah, ah, nice one. Um, let's start with the founders. So we see uh, two main uh, misconceptions here. Um, one is uh, some founders um, understand the DD as kind of a hide and seek competition. Yeah? And mm -hmm. I understand that uh, in an M&A context, but I, or let's say I understand that in a highly political M&A context, I don't understand it in a in a VC investment context or in a very friendly M&A context, because I think it's a wasted opportunity uh, of getting feedback also on putting the real problems on the table and see how you get along with your future shareholders or even like partners. And uh, so that is something that where I highly encourage founders not to play too much of hide and seek uh, and be open and be upfront uh, with uh, whatever challenges uh, are existing. Um, also, uh, it goes hand in hand with uh, that an, a DD may be a waste of time, but that is also because not every DD is a win uh, for the team yeah, and not every DD is valuable. Um, so that's more like on the consulting side to, to um, change that. On the investor side, my favorite uh, um, misjudgment is um, ah, this is the commodity. This is commodity. We we don't need a tech DD here. Uh, I don't know how many times I heard that sentence, and I think it's wrong. It's in ninety percent of the cases it is wrong because I mean let's uh, let's take a simple e-commerce or SaaS or marketplace model yeah people are always like oh, that that's commodity nowadays yeah that might be true but there is no like plug and play uh, tech framework or tech solution for that that you install within a day maybe uh, apart from shopify for e-commerce but but even that takes uh, some time and needs some tweaks but especially like let's say in, in a SaaS uh, environment there's still a lot of tech under the hood and um the if you if you have a business model in a highly competitive uh, situation or, or landscape um, then it's crucial that your product engineering delivers at very like fast iterations and a lot of value and if that is not the case you just might lose the race and then you might have the most sophisticated business model or the best whatever um, you will not win the race about market share. And uh, this is why I always try to encourage investors, even if it's commodity, to, to look closer at it so that we can like, uh, give some recommendations how to make it more effective or more efficient or um, whatever it is that you need to do in order to, to uh, loosen the break. Yeah. Yeah, those are two very good insights. Um, definitely, you know, definitely. Um, could you maybe walk us through the key components of a comprehensive tech due diligence process? Um, and maybe part of the framework. <laughs> I don't want you to reveal your secret identity at Phillips and Burn, but um, uh, if you can re reveal some of part of it. Um. Yeah. Um. Of course. I mean, of course, uh, you start with uh, the investors. You really want to understand uh, their motivation, why they're uh, investing into something. Um, then on the other hand, on the on the founder side, um, it's important to create transparency very early on. They need to know and they have a right to know what is expecting them um, and also to build that relationship, right? And then, of course, you have a lot of data ingestion and processing, like automatically or manually, like through the data room or similar uh, sources. Um, and then 
I mean, I know that this part is very handled very differently across the industry. Like we still heavily rely on interviews because, as I said, I believe in, in people interaction combined with data. Um, so that's the interview phase. And then uh, last but not least, uh, there's, of course, the aggregation phase uh, with a report as a deliverable. And we are always big fans of discussing the report, not only with uh, the investor side, but also uh, later on with the founder side so that they get the most of it, um, the most out, out of it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, in this process, how do you assess the scalability and future readiness of a startup's technology platform um, in general? Yes. Um, from a technological perspective, point of view or let, let let me start differently um first of it all we want to understand the business not challenge it but really understand it because i'm a i'm a believer in context and uh, yeah. the business case and the the growth strategy are, are the context for tech um and after we have understood that um when we look at technology um, we look at the architecture because the architecture in the end is the reflection of the business that you build translated into technology um, plus like organizational setup being reflected in, in technology, information flow, uh, so to say. Yeah. And so we look uh, in detail uh, into that and um, also like into infrastructure. We very often have conversations about a like uh, kind of in-depth um, architecture workshop on a whiteboard, making it as, as visual as possible. Because, uh, I mean, I also learned very early on that people speak very different languages, assuming they mean the same, but they don't. So visualization always helps. Um, and uh, like in addition to that, we also do detailed analysis of data, of course, but we also do live reviews, for example, of uh, monitoring dashboards or uh, similar things, because that is always uh, fun and uh, also speaks, uh, let's say, speaks also another truth than just looking at architecture. Mm. And, and, you know, if we move on to kind of discussing risks, uh, what, what red flags do you commonly encounter in, in this process? And uh, how mm -hmm. should companies address these prior to even going into a due diligence process? Yeah, I would say there are a couple of things. And again, it always depends on the context. Yeah, if you if you talk to a VC about a Series A funding, it might be an entirely different context rather than wanting to sell your healthcare company to a big corporate, right? Uh, I mean, what might be considered a red flag in the letter will maybe not make a VC raise an eyebrow. Um, that's, I think that's the reality. Um, so, but let's stick somewhere in the middle. Um, I mean, one thing, especially like when you're about to really scale, uh, you should uh, make sure that you don't have any hygienic um, issues uh, that just uh, inhibit uh, your, your growth here such as some legal stuff yeah that for example you had these 10 freelancers in the first two or three years building your software but you never made any contract with them so the ip question um is unclear yeah? that would be for example a very unfortunate um uh, situation then then uh, that doesn't say anything about the quality of your tech or the quality of your business um, but it will give you a headache. Yeah? So, um, and there are a couple of such topics such as like GDPR or like open source software licenses, at least very strict one, uh, ones. So um, this is something that needs to uh, be made sure that, that everything is uh, in place here. Um, and the other thing is uh, like uh, the view on the organization. Do we have the right people and roles in place? And I mean, nobody is perfect. We know that we come from the startup scene. It's always work and progress. Um, however, um, at least if I'm a founder and I know, okay, nine months from now, we, have, we want to raise a series B, then I should make sure that I have the key people on board or at least most of the key people and the other ones I should be at least looking for. 
Uh, so yeah. that one can see its work in progress. Another thing is uh, technology. When we look at technology, it should be always the balance. There's always this this kind of fight, this this power struggle between building it super lean and sometimes even quick and dirty and shipping and uh, speed is everything. And on the other hand, uh, there's, there's also um, this uh, ambition to build towards the vision uh, and to build it rock solid. And um, I think a good CTO always finds that counterbalance and manages to figure out how to build in, a, in, a, in fast iterations and in a lean way towards that vision. Does that answer your question or? Very much so. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, no, that, that's that's great. Um, I think those highlighted some some good red flags in that scenario. And I think the way you approached it is different angles. So it gives uh, not just one answer, but four, which is good. <laughs> um, could you maybe share an example where um, tech due diligence significantly impacted the outcome of an investment or acquisition decision? I understand that you might not be at liberty to disclose who and what so if you want to keep it anonymous no problem um yes um so i mentioned before already the the uh, highly competitive uh, situations and that is for example something in in a dd it's rarely just the one thing that is a big fat red flag and then uh, the investor backs off and most of the time it's either if there are question marks on the business model or on some other DD streams and then tech comes on top, or it is a combination of various um, tech uh, issues plus maybe a challenge in business. For example, highly competitive landscape and we go in, do the tech DD and come back and say like, well, tech has so much technical debt. So, so many things that need to be reworked in order to still have a good velocity in feature development that they might be busy for the next two years, just kind of cleaning up. They will have very, very slow output by until they have cleaned up everything. So if that is the case, and we say there is barely any way around because they have already produced so much mess, that would be probably a deal breaker. Yeah? If, if it's in a highly competitive environment and everybody knows okay, there are 10 competitors outside there. They will basically overturn them. Uh, they don't have a chance. Um, the other way around, if, um, if uh, for example, um, a company does something highly innovative and it's a big bet anyways, and they have the time because there's no competitor on the market anyways, the same um, issues we find might be um, more tolerable. Um, and so it, it it could be totally okay. Right. Uh, but, yeah. So it depends. Yeah. So so again, it, it depends on the context, but there's just some, that's some general frameworks there. Um, yeah. Or another, another good example is if a technology is absolutely not, um, not suitable for a certain problem or for a certain um, for a certain context, uh, or you already know, okay, the the founder built it itself with Visual Basic or some like uh, uh, Code Fusion Pro. I think three years back, I even saw something built in Code Fusion. I was like, wow, I thought that died twenty years ago or something, but. I think that was a case where someone still knew it and thought it was okay and just built it. And as a prototype, it's maybe fine. But, but if it's already a production system, it will be pretty hard to maintain that over time and also to find uh, to find a team for that. Right. Interesting. Um, and I think I have like uh, spoke uh, spoken to someone recently about um, no code, low code software builders. Mm -hmm. Their take on it was that for a prototype, for an, until an MVP, it's it's okay. And but they would rarely see it in terms of a tech business that following a certain stage, uh, they should really think about building that in house, right? From your perspective, what what's your opinion on that? Um, 
For, I totally agree on the prototypical phase or MVP phase. Um, I think have as little effort as possible. And even if it doesn't totally fit, doesn't matter. Um, it's always a trade-off. Um, I'm a big fan of buy, verse, buy over build. Uh, so also for later stages, if you have the possibility and something is not your absolute core, please, if there's any decent solution out there, buy the component, build a component that is that is uh, like highly component based like uh, the components talking to each other via api so a loosely coupled system so that if you decide to kind of pivot your business or like over time things become outdated you can relatively easily unplug one component and plug in a new mm. stuff instead of having to rebuild everything um so, and that, that is the case if you have a lot of third-party components and kind of by decision uh, in there. In terms of low-code, no-code, um, it's sometimes it works, but sometimes it's unfortunately an illusion. Uh, and um, you, you're the the adaptation or the the uh, customization uh, rate is so high, uh, and you did. Uh, didn't anticipate that in the beginning and the complexity is higher than you initially thought and then you might abandon that path and then eventually build something yourself uh, that's true right okay very good food for thought there um and look we, we talked about ai a bit already right but i want to explore mm -hmm. a bit more about the integration of ai within the tech tech due diligence process so in, mm -hmm. in that context uh, of AI and ML uh, into technical mm -hmm. due diligence, there's a spectrum of opinions on their reliability and depth of analysis compared to traditional methods. From your perspective, how can firms and maybe how does how does Phillips and Byrne balance the efficiency gains from automation with the mm -hmm. need for a nuanced expert evaluation, especially when assessing mm -hmm. complex or novel tech environments? Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, that is something where we, I think the entire industry is still in a mode where we are experimenting and we are making assumptions and we are, we are building first products um, that support our work. Um, but we all know that might be wiped off the table with the next release uh, of, a, of, of uh, like, for example, GPP-5 yeah, or uh, some other technology that kind of is another paradigm change. Um, however, so I think it forces all of us to be even more data focused and data driven, which is a which is a great thing. Um, as I said, we ran experiments on anonymized DD data, and uh, what we saw here, even with uh, GPT three five and four. For simple context, the results are already pretty surprising. Uh, so yeah. um, um, reality is rarely simple. <laughs> um, when we fed uh, it with, with more complex, uh, multidimensional context, um, then the limits were reached pretty quickly. Um, and the analysis became quite shallow. But yeah. I mean, that is uh, that is changing on a almost daily basis, I have to say. Yeah? Like three months ago, our, our uh, and, uh, like experiments on architecture diagram analysis was devastating. Um, last week's analysis was quite promising. Um, so I think it's important that you that you place your bets or you, you exactly deeply think about how and where to place your bets here um, to in, that you increase your AI literacy in general as a consulting company. Um, and apart from that, as I said before, like on the human side, like ex expertise, experience and empathy, the, the three E's uh, will be still important for quite a while. Expertise probably not that much anymore because a lot of expertise will be substituted uh, by machine. Um, maybe at some point also experience. The empathy part will 
remain for a bit longer. But I yeah. think especially you mentioned the nuances, yeah, especially in the nuances, um, humans will have uh, a few more years of leeway, I would, I would speculate uh, today. Yeah, and I think it's it's more than a few years, in my opinion. Uh, I've 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 spoken with a lot of investors, not about tech due diligence because I don't know much about it, but I know a lot about well, know a lot. I know due diligence more, regular due diligence more, mm -hmm. and they say, especially in early stage, right? I'm not talking Series B plus. I'm talking seed, pre seed, maybe a bit of Series mm -hmm. A. The team at the end of the day is the most important thing, mm -hmm. and. I don't know if the AI will be able to discern Jack from James in terms of who can lead this team better, right? Mm -hmm. um, I understand maybe from a tech due diligence, when you look at the data, that can maybe be analyzed quite shortly. It, it does it in a way that's maybe not great today, but you can see how it gets there. But analy analyzing Jack from James, from Emma, from Marie, I think that will stay difficult. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, that's interesting because that was, um, I think, uh, my biggest USP when I started doing the, the investors recommended me to each other because I was known as that person who also uh, um, brought gut feeling into the discussion. Yeah? And it was, I, I had a pretty, <laughs> pretty good uh, quote uh, or how to say that target, target hit rate, so to say. Um, when it came to talking to founders and feeling whether something was off between them, whether there was an elephant in the room, whether there was a hidden conflict, or like how they interact with each other, what kind of standing the CTO has on, on among their C-level peers, stuff like that. And that is, even today, that's still... I mean, that's still a topic that is still, as you said, team is uh, uh, focus point number one. And that is something investors want to know. They want to know yeah. who to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's still a human domain. Absolutely. Um, and look, for, for, for founders and investors listening, how does engaging with a firm like Philips & Byrne uh, early in the investment process help them? Um, it helps um, in the DD uh, context or in the DD phase after the term sheet uh, was signed by like A, the, the hygienic stuff like mitigating risks, uh, identifying risks, et cetera. But on the other hand, I think the most, the most uh, important or the mo most valuable stuff is probably like, okay, can we invest into that? And we answer that question very clearly internally we always ask ourselves the question if you had 50k as your own money would you invest into that company and that question helps a lot in order to make that recommendation um and we also get clear rec recommendations what to do after the investment and that is a crucial point that i learned in my time as interim cto and cto uh, when i sat in board meetings and i had the feeling hmm, sometimes that's not the right discussion here yeah. because the, the, they didn't consider what was going on in product and tech and made plans without, without for example, being aware of, um, of some things not being possible because of some, some limitations, some technical debt to deal with or some other potential that was being left aside that could have been utilized, stuff like that. So, but especially in the negative topics, I like to address them within the DD and I see ourselves in our work as a conversation starter between founders and investors to, to really address the difficult topics and turn them into a constructive dialogue. That, and I personally think that is the biggest value that we give, but probably the investors see the biggest value in giving clear recommendations to both the investors, but also to the founders. And of course, including CTO and CPO, what to do next and how to accelerate growth and accelerate progress, et cetera. Yeah, because I'm looking you know, at, at some of your clients and... <laughs> It's pretty remarkable on the investor side, you know, Notion, uh, Lake Star, Axel, HV, Early Bird. It's it's really remarkable. On on, on the company front, is it's it's also very very impressive. Um, so, you know, I think 
you mentioned earlier some things that sets you apart in this space, uh, including bringing that dialogue and having that interview in person, interviewer interview, that face to face thing. But what would you, what other things would you say uh, sets you apart in the market? Um, I mean, we spoke already about the zero bullshit rule. And as I said, that's my prime directive. Uh, so um, when um, we, we don't sugarcoat things, I mean, some, sometimes we sometimes we kind of, as you said, sometimes it stirs uh, things up if you don't sugarcoat and are not super diplomatic. But I think it's it's super important for an honest conversation and also for a tough conversation that is sometimes necessary. And that is mm. definitely something um, both sides get uh, from us. Um, another thing is um, that uh, we have this uh, startup and tech DNA. Yeah? And uh, sometimes even to a certain extent, the in, uh, I mean, the mini investors or wannabe investors uh, perspective, because um, some of us have also several angel investments. So at least we, we got a glimpse of that perspective. Um, and last, not le last but not least, um, we are techies. Yeah? We understand tech. What, what I see often in tech DDs is that it's, it's a business DD with um, very superficial findings. And what we do is we start with the business model and this tech strategy. And then we went down the, or we go down the rabbit hole uh, down to the very code level. Uh, we look at code, we look at data, we look at algorithms, we look at models. And um, uh, not many teams do that in that depth um, without forgetting about uh, the broader context and the, the mm. business uh, perspective. Yeah. You, from what I've seen also, you do this quite quickly, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think that's the nature of the business. If you work with VCs and founders, uh, everything needs to happen yesterday. And I personally enjoy it, uh, even if it's stressful, but that's exactly that speed and that this, um, uh, what's the name, like frequency or yeah. rhythm. Uh, that uh, shapes or or, inf or like kind of uh, characterizes the the industry. So I, I love it. Um, uh, usually it's two weeks or something. Uh, we have time, including prep and report and everything. Uh, sometimes it's four days. Then it's a bit stressful. Um, so I don't want to burn my te my team and do that every week. But um, yeah, uh, I like I like the speed of our industry. That sounds great. Um, and look, look <laughs> uh, looking beyond conventional markets that you might be used to, maybe European, and I, I don't know if you guys deal with American markets, but by the looks of it, you do. Um, how do you assess the potential of tech startups in emerging economies? Is it very much a similar framework, or do you look at it from a different angle? Mm -hmm. No, it's basically the same framework, uh, but you need to be aware um, uh, which which market you look at or which country. I mean, we have worked in, I think, 25-ish countries, um, mm -hmm. uh, most of them being in Europe, but also in North America, for example, or in Southeast Asia. So we, we know the markets very well. And for example, um, to pick an, um, an example from Southeast Asia, if you look at Singapore and Malaysia, yeah? Very, very close by, but totally different markets. Um, yeah. Because um, the, the, salary, um, the salaries in Singapore are so much higher than in Malaysia for, for tech people, for engineers. So everyone who is more or less independent goes to Singapore. That leaves um, Malaysia with quite a talent drain in the engineering space. Uh, so if you... If you um, want to build a startup in um, Malaysia, you need to work very, very hard to recruit uh, great tech talent there. And you also um, need to pay above um, average uh, salaries. So that is one understanding that you need to have if you assess certain local markets. A another one is um, that, and that surprises me quite often, that despite all the globalization and globalized tech community, there are always still, um, let's say, technology hubs in different areas or countries. For example, Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe is 
uh, C, C sharp and .NET are much stronger than in Western Europe. Um, so th that is something that keeps surprising me. I think in generally you can say that the U.S. still has um, has a big advantage in in terms of best practices and tech talent um, density and and um, spirit and attitude. I I still find that when when I work with uh, U.S. companies, it's not like not like in two thousand. 10 or so when I had the feeling uh, Europe is 20, 25 years behind. Now I would say it's maybe five, uh, but still you can you can feel there's in most of the cases still a difference. But I think the European scene has caught up a lot. Um, and also like the scene in uh, non-American or non-North American and non-European um, uh, countries has uh, like has really caught up a lot, of course, also because the the differences due to remote work and a more globalized uh, community have been also equalized. So, um, and that's a huge chance uh, for emerging markets, especially also in the in the times of AI, where um, at least that's that's currently the assumption that organizations will become much leaner and the capital. Um, that you need to build a company will also uh, be much lower. So uh, I'm very much forward looking to for the to the next years uh, what uh, will be emerging in terms of uh, uh, startup scenes. Yeah, definitely. And I think you know, we, I'm conscious of time. We have a couple more minutes. But yeah. uh, with regards to remote work that you mentioned, there is that something mm -hmm. that comes into the framework uh, when you're doing tech due diligence, or not really? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Can you elaborate? Like, on that? for example, the 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 development team, the product team, the tech team, whether they're remote workers or not, does that affect the due diligence at all? Yeah, I mean, of course, we look at it, and um, it also it, the the fact that there are more and more remote teams has has also massively influenced our work because pre Corona, um, in ninety five percent of the transactions, we were on site assessing the team that was also on site. Then Corona came. We all had to uh, work from home. But post Corona, we the majority of the teams we need um, are working either partially or entirely remotely. So there's there, there, there's no need, or also it, it doesn't make any sense for us to be on site because the developers aren't, and we yeah. want to meet them in their natural habitat. So we switch to remote uh, in these cases because we want to see how they work on a day to day basis. Um, so yes, we always look at it. What is the case here? We look whether it suits the company DNA and how the rest yeah. of the company works uh, and whether they have the right tooling in place, the right processes in place and whether the alignment is still there because uh, still um, uh, achieving a great alignment in a remote setup is still a struggle for many companies and many leaders particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um three more questions two are okay. quite rapid fire um for the investors in the audience could you share one piece of advice on how to best prepare for a tech due diligence just one piece of advice yeah investors should exactly know what they want why they want to invest and um what the expectation is for now what they expect us to find and what their expectation is for the next year or two uh, that helps uh, the company uh, to, to negotiate expectations and uh, see whether they can meet them or not. Um, and also it helps us, of course, in our work to make a realistic assessment. Um, is that what you mean or is that, or yeah, do you yeah, mean yeah. Uh, something yeah. else in terms of expectation no, or I mean. advice? No, yeah. no, no, that's okay. what I mean. And now turning it on its head for the founders in the audience, uh, let's just, let's assume maybe that they're about to open a round. Um, what was one piece of advice on how to best prepare for tech due diligence for them? Um, on the founder side, I, I, I like to say that always uh, lead your department in a way that you always could have a tech DD coming within the next three months. 
So have yeah. your have your stuff in shape. But because in the end, I mean, apart from a few bureaucratic requirements, um, eighty percent, maybe even more, of the information that are being uh, requested and also assessed in a DD um, should be there already and should be kind of working artifacts that you use in your day-to-day -day life. For example, architecture um, diagram, that should be a living document that your teams use in order to make sure they speak the same language. So it shouldn't be prepared for the DD, it should be there. Same with a lot of knowledge. Um, that advice I can I can tell uh, to founders and particularly CTOs, I learned that tribal knowledge is something that will cost you a lot of energy and a lot of confusion, or uh, it costs you a lot of clarity as your company grows. So write things down. It might it might be annoying, but it will save your life. Great. And finally, how can uh, interested parties uh, get started with you guys uh, from their tech due diligence needs? Yeah, um, just ping us. I mean, we are there on all channels, LinkedIn, email or phone or whatever. So reach out. You can reach out for regular investment DDs, but also M&A on the buyer side, but also founders who want to sell their company in a few months and they want to have this health check beforehand in order to avoid risk in the DD process. And also if you just want to have an internal feedback and health check, uh, we are there for you. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for joining uh, today, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure and for everyone joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a couple of uh, links in the description uh, with their website, with Chris's profile on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for joining us today, Chris. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me too. It was really fun. Thanks. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. All right, welcome everyone to the uh, to this episode of Capital HQ. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled to welcome Bastian Buch, uh, Executive Product and Tech Advisor at Philips and Baron, uh, to explore the critical world of metrics and tech. Uh, he's first going to give a presentation uh, on that, and then we'll go into a bit of a Q and A. So, with an illustrious career spanning uh, quite a few years, Bastian has left his mark on leading companies like Zalando, Delivery Hero, and Omio. And as a co-founder of the Mentoring Club, he's also deeply invested in nurturing tech talent across the globe. Today, Bastian will share his insights on the power of metrics to transform tech strategies, drive innovation, and steer companies towards success. So get ready for quite an enlightening conversation that will deepen your understanding of tech metrics and their pivotal role in shaping the and the future. Welcome, Bastian. Hey, thanks for having me, Hugo. I'm very, very happy to be here and share a few like of, of our thoughts on how we work at Philips and Burn and also my experience with, with working in tech. Of course, we can go like three, four hours with that, right? So I'm really yeah. touching the here, but I think in our Q&A afterwards, we can really uh, dive into some of these uh, areas. All right, so I think I can skip this. So you already introduced me, um, um, maybe a few words about, about Philips and Burn. We, a consulting company um, um, doing like tech DD, sales checks. Uh, we help investors, founders to really shape the organization with that, uh, the products and with that, uh, the future. Um, and um, yeah, super happy about that and really KPIs, metrics, uh, mm -hmm. and how to set these up in a growth environment is um, kind of very close to our hearts because that's what we do um, 
every day. All right, so metrics, metrics uh, in tech or metrics just in general. Let me start with like setting a bit of light on what are metrics and what uh, they are not. Um, it seems so obvious, but uh, we see that a lot of uh, companies, a lot of teams, a lot of managers um, kind of um, use them not in the, in the best way possible, let's say. And let's say metrics are a good compass for management steering. They are a tool for self-improving the organization, teams, uh, the product, and a good way to align goals, ambition, and priorities to grow a company into being more uh, of a kind of, um, yeah, you know, some of more autonomous entities, uh, which is the foundation for growth. Um, however, metrics are not a micromanagement tools for teams and individuals. So it's not about like going into teams and like trying to manage individual things, aspects of a team just by using metrics. It's also not the cure for evil because in the end, they are not the goal, but just the means to an end. So even if you have, for example, OKRs and set yourself KPIs, the KPIs that you're using is a language with it, like a means to an end, right? So you are, you are trying to bring everyone together by using that metric, but the actual goal is something different. It's a real change within uh, the company. It's a real change within the world. But it's measured by 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 KPI, and the KPI can be wrong, needs to be improved, and so on. So, don't um, yeah use use uh, the KPI as the only uh, yeah uh, thing that you that you see when you talk about goals, right? Um, in a lot of cases, we see that organizations try to implement metrics and KPIs and just stay at a very, very high level, the surface level and think that by having KPIs, they're doing everything right. We believe that in the end, it's a cultural aspect and um, everyone in an organization that wants to use metrics as a, as a, yeah, as a way, as an operating system, let's say, to, um, to, to grow, um, need to understand how, need to understand the system behind, right? And uh, here's just like two areas which are very important um, to understand that um, when we talk about metrics and KPIs and targets and goals and so on, in a lot of cases, these are used as like almost um, synonyms, but they're not, right? So we need to understand the cascade of things. Metrics, just numbers, then KPIs, that are like key performance indicators. So what are the metrics that you want to use that, uh, that make you understand how your business, how your team, how your product performs in the specific market, right? Metrics is like almost everything that you measure. KPIs is, is a subset of those or even just a, a ratio of different metrics um, to, to make you understand how the business goes. The target then is just like the KPI and where you envision it to to get to. So define KPIs as indicators for success and failure in a specific um, time, in a specific case. And then you set specific goals, specific strategies to um, you, you want to leverage to accomplish business objectives, right? Um, and understanding this makes it more easier or more easy to, um, yeah, to communicate and to discuss certain things within your organization. Because in the end, you have business people, you have product people, you have tech people, you have managers, you have individual contributors, and bringing all of this together needs a specific framework. This is one of those. Another one is on the other side, on the right-hand side of, of my slide here, which is understanding, and I know it looks very obvious, but in the end it's not, to understand what are you actually talking about. Is the KPI that you want to put in the center of your, like, let's say, intention in a specific meeting, is this an input? Do you measure process? Do you measure the output? Or is this all about impact? And specifically for setting goals and targets, this is super important because you want to know and you also want to align everyone behind that thinking if um, the, the leverage that you currently see is on the input side. Right? So for example, as a company, you might see that hiring more people um, makes things better because currently you have a lot of uh, bottlenecks within your engineering. Oversimplifying here, but in the end, it's an input, right? How many people can you hire? It's not the outcome, it's not the output, but you um, leverage the input. In some other cases, especially when you already grew, 
this input is actually not what you want to leverage, but you want to leverage your outcomes. You need to know more, think about, okay, how can we actually say more no to specific uh, priorities? And measuring those um, means that you need to have a great understanding about what is the value of each of the initiatives, each of the features, each of the uh, systems that you're running. And then you can, um, <clears throat> you can yeah, um, have an impact on the actual outcome um, uh, overall, right? So that being said, there's another framework and that's something that we use quite a lot when we speak to founders and, and leaders within organizations, which is, um, looks a bit complex here. So let me try to step back a bit and, and simplify. So when you have an entity, whatever it is, might be a team, might be uh, uh, an organization, might be the whole company, might be a product or just a feature. You always have two perspectives on those. One is the perspective from the outside. So how do you know that this is, uh, this is successful? Right? For a company, it might be the market share, for a team, might be, I don't know, the feature adoption rate that, uh, of the features that the, uh, that the team is building. Uh, might be also some quality, uh, quality um, measures like how many bugs does the, that the team produce also, and so on. Um, and then you have an, a, a different perspective, which is from the inside out. And this is only what who is part or what is part of, of that entity looks into in order to improve. So there's an evolutional metric or evolutional perspective um, for teams, for products to improve over time, right? So the outcome of that will be eventually and hopefully uh, be um, more performant um, outside in view. But in order to get there, you need to grow. Um, one example for that is um, discussed in a lot of companies, which is velocity, right? Velocity is a very typical evolutional uh, metric, which is only true for one specific team and cannot be compared across teams. But there are managers out there, there are companies out there that use that um, specific metric as a KPI to measure team success and to measure if teams perform. And then they even start to... Um, compare specific or the different teams with each other. That's not possible, right? So in the end, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, that's a metric that the team owns, uses in order to become better, but it's not something that tells you anything about the actual success and performance of that specific team, right? And you can apply this, this framework um, across like all different layers of company, um, roles, um, products, as said. Um, in the end, the important part here is that you always need to know what are you actually talking about. This is a metric, this is an aspect that speaks about a specific, um, about the impact of a specific entity, or is it something that speaks about the growth of a specific impact? Um, as a manager of a team, for example, like let's say a VP of engineering, and you have multiple teams, um, you should be interested if teams use um, um, uh, metrics like velocity, but it's not a measure that tells you anything about the performance of the team. So leave that to them and really look more into the quality that they produce, the impact that their features have and so on. Um, then when you go into a specific tech team or product engineering team, um, the curation of the optimal set of operational metrics is super important. Um, there are different um, um, starting points here. And I would really say, if you're a startup, you should start, just start by using those and then adapt over time, add more things uh, like, for example, uh, the Dora metrics or the space metrics. They talk a lot about the team, right? It's, um, evolutional metrics that speak about, okay, how does the team um, uh, work? And is there anything that they can improve in order to create better um, better products, uh, but then there's also system metrics that you need to need to find. The most important thing here is that you should not only look into one thing and just measure for the sake of measuring because someone else told you or because there is a specific system like Dora, but really understand what is the system that you're in and then try to capture the overall system. I'll tell you why. Here's a little video of a very simplified um, team system, let's say, right? There's trust in the team, psychological safety, engine happiness, but also something like 
external things like the, the, the uh, customer happiness or the work in progress, speed of iteration. And I try to model here how these different elements um, um, yeah, relate to each other. And in order to understand this, you need to have metrics measuring um, um, the work in progress kind of easy, but customer happiness is not just something that you say, yeah, our customers are happy because we read so in our app uh, uh, app reviews, but something that you need to measure. And then you really can understand how certain things belong to each other. And why that? Because not to have the numbers, but because you want to find how you can actually optimize the system. So if you see that you come, uh, that you uh, that the employees, that the team members in the team become unhappy because you measure so, then you find out, okay, there are other things that might impact those, um, uh, this element. Um, so um, bottom line here, really see that you measure the overall system, um, team health, um, uh, quality, um, infrastructure, application, and also product, and just don't ignore um, 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 a certain level here. Uh, layer here. One thing that a lot of teams do is not really looking into product metrics because if they are, this is for designers and product people or business people, but not for us. We look only into infrastructure. I think that's not 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 good. We need to see uh, both things. One one example that we can also speak later but on is um, cost um, for infrastructure. So you measure measure the cost of infrastructure, but just having a number of like whatever cost five million euros doesn't tell you anything. But if you bring the customer and the product into it as well as a as a ratio will help uh, will tell you much more which is like uh, let's say cost per uh, million euros in revenue or cost per customer cost per um, just traffic right and with that you get a ratio and you get an understanding of here's how we can um, optimize our system all right um yeah product analytics already started to talk about that um especially in the SaaS context where people build, for example, developer tools or just very technical products, um, they tend to, not everyone is doing it, but they tend to not really apply uh, traditional product metrics, product analytics, um, as, as we can call it, right? Um, like, I don't know, engagement metrics, uh, even conversion rates, um, 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 user journey, um metrics um and we believe that especially in a SaaS context where of course it's very difficult to to measure these metrics because you don't have the you know the high amount uh, high amount of, of customers uh, it's super important to focus on these right because in the end there are certain uh, elements certain decision points that you want to still make and not just out of gut feel but because you measure so like user adoption and satisfaction of your customers and in order to understand is there features that you want to sunset how can you actually sun those, sunset those features because you in the end um, have to see the whole pr product development life cycle and just saying a feature is uh, is not, not there anywhere does not mean that uh, there are no dependencies and customers still using it and so on right? so it's very complex and in order to, to understand that and manage this, and manage this right, we need to have um, um, product analytics here. Also pivoting is, is a thing, right? To understand, okay, are user, uh, users using your features in the way you intended them to use us or are they actually ignoring specific features and so on? And with that, you, you get the story behind how the user actually um, uses your tool to solve their problems. And there might be areas where you want to pivot and just like really, um, uh, do things in a completely different way. A huge um, um, topic um, also in, in our world with Philips and Burns developer experience, right? So a lot of companies nowadays, and since already many years, build their product not just with a UI for certain people, but also with an API and with ways for developers of the client companies to use the features in, 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 in an integration scenario. And Measuring developer experience is super important, not, not just internally for your people, but also externally to understand, okay, how are actually developers using your tools or your APIs? Uh, are they happy with what they have? Are they happy with the documentation? How do they actually onboard? How do they test this? And so on and so on, right? We really go in, into that as well. So the next question, or one of the biggest questions that we always get um, 
be it now in the consulting context or as a manager of, of a specific company, is actually how can we introduce metrics, right? You started somehow, you've been a small team, everyone knows what to do. Uh, a lot of things become, uh, a lot of decisions are made based on gut feel on, 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 on just like because you know the path forward, right? And at some point you believe that, um, or you see that introducing metrics is an important point. And uh, here are a few things that we can, can mention here. Um, start with your culture, mentioned this already, right? So um, understand um, the, the systems behind how you make decisions, um, really push to not only base your decision based on opinions, but on facts. This is especially true and uh, hard for the founders, who of course need to have an opinion. They need to have a vision of where, where the company goes, but um, putting facts over everything is super important, especially um, when you have more and more people coming into your organization, right? Um, establish scientific approaches, uh, A-B testing, for example, not just like look at the numbers, but really understand what is significance, how do you use this, uh, use these things is, uh, is important. Yeah, and then of course, when you, um, I don't know, create slides, create documentation or uh, narratives, whatever way you go for documenting um, things, really, really invest into creating insight and proper reasoning. So it's all part of the culture that needs to be behind that because without that uh, metrics always will be just a side, a side thing, right? Um, second point is agree to what, what to measure, right? So come together as management team on all different layers, right? Executive, but also in a team, product, product manager and engine manager, for example, also team and together agree what is important, right? So I um, showed you the, 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 uh, the cascade of things, right? From input to to outcome, we look at the system that you have, uh, the problems that you might have, or the areas that you want to improve uh, and grow in, and then agree what to measure. It's so easy to measure everything with all the tools out there, but it's super difficult to understand what is important at this specific point in time, and then start to measure those. Another element, um, especially in, in, in startups, um, in, in bigger corporations, might be more difficult is democrat democratizing data. Right, so try to collect everything. Try to make it uh, anonymous. Right, of course, uh, not, no, we are not talking about personal data, but then make this available to to everyone so that they can query the data, that they can experiment with it, build their own um, Python scripts uh, to, to visualize specific elements. Right, and with that, make everyone make it easy for everyone to understand how the product works, or how the team works, how um, uh, how the system looks like, because with that, you will get the creative creativity of the people um, um, back uh, in the end, right? Thinking holistically, I already mentioned that, right? Not just look into infrastructure, but really see the whole thing. If you're a sales heavy product, uh, make sales available, uh, sales data available to people. If, if marketing is, is your current thing because you want to grow, make the marketing uh, narratives visible and, yeah, um, manageable by by um, by using uh, metrics and KPIs. Um, so always see the, the overall picture. People development um, as the next element. Um, it's it's just not true, right, to say, uh, okay, we are working in a, in a startup and everyone understands metrics the same way. No, um, make them understand how metrics work. Um, um, make them understand what is the conversion rate in our context. Make them understand how to use the data warehouse that you might use to invest into um, making people able to understand, use, and yeah, um, make sense out of the data out of the data that you have. It's a it's an investment that is um, absolutely worth it because it will just bring everyone behind the same goal, A, and B, as I said before, uh, you will un unlock the creativity uh, of many here. Yeah, and face rollout is also important. Um, it's a, it's a, oops, sorry. It's a, it's a, it's a bigger change, right? So you need to look into okay, what is the right starting point for that? Um, start with I don't know having a metrics meeting every week with the management team in order to understand where you stand, and then roll it out to more people. Um, um, if, for example, you are already quite data driven, but your tech teams are not then maybe as tech managers, engine managers, you can start by just um, releasing one very simple, lightweight 
uh, data story every week so that everyone starts to understand, okay, this is the impact that our products are doing, but not do, uh, do not more, right? So it's all about finding the right things um, or the right iterations to make the change successful. And um, yeah, last but not least, I have a few best practices and anti-patterns that uh, we collected over the years um, that might be helpful for you to know um, um, beforehand. Right? So uh, prefer push over pull um, situation, right? So just having the data somewhere and believing that everyone just goes into it is probably not the right um, idea, right? So um, there might be people who are interested in getting the data, but it's hard, not everyone will do it. So I told you about the data, uh, data stories that you can re release every week. Bring the data to your people, make them understand. I right? see this as, especially as a manager, or if, you, if you're leading a data, data team, for example, make this your responsibility to really bring the data to the people. Uh, don't wait, don't, don't let, just don't wait for the people finding where they can find the data. Uh, another one is uh, absolute numbers. So I've seen a lot of cases where um, KPIs were just absolute numbers. Cost is a, is a good example. I already spoke about that. Put whenever possible things in ratios. Can be different ratios, right? So um, um, in order to understand um, how things yeah, um, correlate with each other. Um, that in the end will then unlock the patterns within your organization, within your product that might be worth investing into. Just absolute numbers don't tell you anything because you don't have a uh, you don't have a connection point um, here. Um, and this is even true for um, um, the team invest that you do, right? So if you have a certain understanding of what is the value of your product. And you know how much you invest in the team, but just like just summing up the salaries of people, you have a ratio that is super helpful because you understand what is the return on invest. Really, uh, quite quite a useful and well known metric, but a lot of companies don't do it, and uh, I think it's absolutely worthwhile to do it um, uh, in order to understand where to invest into what what are the biggest um, say fruits to find right in your organization. Um, prefer visualizations to create insights. Just looking in, like if you have a metrics meeting or like quarterly business interviews or whatever you have in the organization. Uh, just opening a, a, a table, uh, a spreadsheet, in most cases does not make the trick. Uh, look at trends and look at correlations, means you have to have some kind of a visualization in order to talk about insights and not just about the data, right? Uh, an important uh, an, an example here was. Uh, it's like when you look into data and you see it's going down for a week, it doesn't tell you anything. You can just like freak out and say, oh, let's let's look into this more. But if you have a bigger line and you see, okay, actually there's always a drop at the weekend <laughs> or every other week there's a drop, but overall the trend goes up then you can relax right and, and, and actually go to the next um, thing because there is no insight. It's just the data that tells you something um, or, or which, which is not uh, relevant. Um, yeah, for my metrics into dashboards, I think it's clear. Standard tooling, especially in the beginning, right? Don't invest into building your own dashboards or building your own visualizations. Really try to use as much standards as possible because it's 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 your company is about uh, building a specific product and not about building dashboards, right? So I uh, use standard tooling here, um, which makes it also easier to change um, um, later. Um, yeah, I think a lot about the right visualization. I had this already, uh, colors, chart types, consistently, this is important, right? Not having a different language just because you have a different person and they are just different team. So make this part of your company DNA, DNA to like know when there's a line and there's an, I don't know, a red mark somewhere that everyone understands. Oh, yeah, this is the same across the board and people don't use things in different ways. Uh, on the avoid side, um, already, Spoke about some of these, like micromanagement, um, does not just makes it makes it worse, right? It's a, it's a cultural anti pattern here. Why did the team have five story points less than last week? Might be a good question, but it's not a not a question that is that is relevant. Um, uh, metric parallelism, too many metrics here. Um, time frames, 
um, I, I spoke about that, right? The weekly dip, is this relevant when the overall trend is positive, right? So zoom in, zoom out, drill down, drill out. So seeing, seeing the whole pic uh, picture is always impor uh, important. And um, yeah, the isolation uh, of metrics is also one thing, right? So ratios is, is one way uh, to do it. Another is really to have dashboards that put things in in correlation, right? You could see, okay, here's the product max, it goes up, but at the same time, revenue goes down and you put an infrastructure um, metric there as well, or a quality metric, right? In order to really see, ah, yeah, this is the overall pattern. This is what it tells us. And then you can make better decisions. So isolation, um, just because you have teams in isolation does not, doesn't work. Um, question metrics, of course, that's super important, right? So you always need to question it. Is, is actually the conversion rate the right thing for us or is it something different? Does the con conversion rate as we look at it really matter or um, or does it tell us the whole story or do we need to change it in, in its meaning and with that and its mechanics? Um, always do that, evolve them um, whenever possible. Yeah, and then last but not least, um, and I, I started with this is, uh, of course, metrics, that doesn't mean so and it's not the goal. And with that, you cannot ignore your intuition. Right. Sometimes you need to push forward in order to understand uh, what's what's happening. Um, you need to bring your experience in order to, um, yeah, in the end, it's human work that, that you're doing and metrics only help you to um, get to, yeah, to common language, let's say, um, to, to drive decisions. All right. Um, I, I think that we can send out or make this available uh, to everyone who sees um, this, um, this, this talk and the Q&A. Here's some um, yeah, um, uh, useful resources that might just help you to, to deep dive a bit deeper into that. Um, but yeah, as I said, we can, we can definitely make those available to all of you. All right, that was it from my side uh, for now. And I'm now happy to, to answer your questions, Hugo. Thank you very much, Bastian, for that for the insightful presentation. And yeah, the, the the resources you've added there at the end, I'll add it into the, the description so people can have a have access to those. I'll also put your um your contact details as well as Phillips and Burns contact details there. So if anyone wants to get in touch and dive deeper into those, that'd be great. Well, look, I I think you know you you've gone into a deep dive into into metrics. I just want to take it back a bit in in terms of you. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, how did you get into the this this sort of industry? And let's say, how has your perspective of the importance of metrics evolved since your start? Yeah, it's a it's a very very good question because it's an it's an it's indeed an evolution. Right? So when you start somewhere, you you are like very energetic. You, know, you you go into products, you, you you see what's going on there, and you are very opinionated. Right? Uh, and I I see this also with a lot of founders out there who are like young and like to start something. Um, but over time, I understood that being led by intuition and being led by metrics is not like a black and white view on the world. You actually need to combine both. Because um, as I said in my, my, my talk, the metrics give you a language and give you signals to prove your intuition, you prove your gut feel, and then drive better decisions. I think that, that really developed over time when, when you are more complex scenarios, right? And bigger companies where uh, there's not just 12, but maybe 40,000 people, right? And then you have to drive a decision like, okay, do we actually need to platformize it? Do we need to invest into reducing the cost of this and that, uh, let's say, infrastructure? And yes, you can always say, yeah, yeah, I believe that because I see it's very, <laughs> very, uh, very costly, right? So I've seen other things before and why don't you believe me? Whatever. But if you if you then use metrics, you get to a certain language. And in a lot of cases, uh, also investing into understanding more about the actual opinion that I formed by using metrics led me to conclude that actually my opinion was not right or was only partly right and uh, also informed me. Another another element um, that I really yeah, that I learned and really like liked and leveraged today is um the value of kpis for leadership i'm not speaking of management but leadership right especially in tech people oftentimes don't know what they actually produce what's the impact of things right and what i what i did for example at uh, omeo 
quite a lot is really myself going into the data warehouse and getting data out and making understanding, okay, how many tickets, right? It's a ticketing platform for buses and trains. How many tickets did we sold today? And then putting this into context, how many trains did we actually, like if you, if you put the tickets and then how many trains made we, uh, did we make full uh, over the last week? And then sharing this with the engineers. And this in the end helped them to identify with the product, with the company and make them proud about what they actually do there every day. Right? Because what they see is code, they have all these challenges and bug fixes and technical depth and so on. But investing into those and having these data stories made it tangible and uh, is, is a great leadership tool. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we find it a lot. I'm sure you do as well. You know, when, when companies, uh, when founders are asked during the due diligence pro process about different metrics, um, some, some of them who haven't installed it need to spend at least one or two weeks getting it all together. Uh, and it's really important for investors. So I think, you know, it's one of the things that we, we usually tell our founders, have you got this metrics ready, this metrics ready, et cetera. But I think one of the interesting things I want to get to is you've worked at large corporate, large tech organizations. Uh, Zalando is an example. Are the, are the metrics different at different state as in like is the importance of sp specific metrics um different for different stages or is it still very similar depending on the stage in terms of the most important metrics that the executive team need to have a look at so of course right the the mix of kpis is different as i, as I um, outlined before um you might measure the same things, but in the end, what you look into, the actual KPIs, the key performance indicators, is, is different because you have a different, um, yeah, different focus, priority as a company, right? While uh, a growth startup might look into just growth and ignore profitability, at least for now, uh, a bigger company where <laughs> the cost is, is, can be extreme and the growth is not so big anymore, you want to look into profitability, right? With that, of course, the focus changes. Another big difference, of course, is that it's it's way more difficult to give a holistic perspective to everyone in the organization, right? So at Zalando, I led a, led, a, led a platform team very quite far away from the actual product. And obviously, there were metrics like, you know, conversion rates and engagement metrics and so on, but there were... In, in a complete different department, a complete different area of the organization. And it was very hard to say, okay, what we do here and how it be, how it relates to uh, how customers use our product was almost impossible. Right? So you need to find ways to still tell these stories and, and make this available. Um, the, si the silos that form in bigger organizations um, are good for some ways, right? Because you, um, you don't need to discuss everything with everyone. Um, but at the same time, there, there is distance created and it's very tough, right, to, to bring um, uh, metrics to everyone. And I think this is a, this is a fundamental responsibility for, for leaders and managers in these organizations to connect the dots, right? So um, I'm leading this organization to go out to the marketing people and understand, okay, how do we actually make revenue with the data, right? When people click on certain advertisements on, um, we, we were speaking about Zalando, um, how do we make revenue here? What does it yeah. mean if, for example, certain elements in our backend when we when we measure events uh, get lost? How, what, what's the impact on revenue, right? And I need to understand this complex, let's say, scenario in order to bring the people in my teams along. So this is very, very more difficult. And with that, the, 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 let's say, uh, the, the challenge for leaders um, is more into that, right? And in a smaller startup, of course, it's very, very easy because founder, need, when they speak about that, you have dashboards available for everyone. It's, it's more like a very easy, hands-on organic approach. Yeah, absolutely. And um, look, can you share maybe an example from your time at uh, Omeo where a specific metric significantly influenced product development or strategy? Yeah, so... Um, of course, cannot go into like lots of details here, right? So let's talk about how the how the copy strategy looks like. But one thing that that I can say is, um, during my time there, we made a quite big decision on investing into flights, right? So it's a ground transport platform doing a lot of like you know, for bus and trains mostly. Um, but we also saw that 
it's very difficult to become a global platform because um, ground transport and train, like trains and buses, are by definition local businesses, right? Mostly local businesses. You cannot go with a train from from here to uh, New York, right? So you need to have something in between. And what we've seen is that people use it once when they travel. Maybe coming from the US, you use it once to take a train, but they never use it again because they only fly to Europe every whatever seven seven years. Right? So what we understood is actually we need to find something that combines um, those local markets, and this is only flights. And this is what we really made to measure, right? Okay, when we yeah. have people searching for flights, do they use the platform that we have even more in their local markets, right? And um, this was definitely definitely one area where looking at the metrics, looking at how the customers behave, made us then decide to invest into flights and making flights uh, um, yeah, um, a product of, of our uh, of, of our company yeah it sounds like yeah i mean metrics is sounds like it's been a lot of uh, influence on that and uh, look another one of your personal experience right so you've successfully reduced cloud costs by implementing cost metrics at zalando um can you guide us through that process as well i know you probably have a lot of different examples but if we can maybe focus on on that one for a second because it was a, a significant amount of savings as well yeah. so first, first of all it was not me right reduced the cost it was, was it was about the team um yeah, the, the difficulty here was that there was a system that cost like 12 40 million uh, a year in terms of infrastructure and uh, we measured, and I outlined this before in my, my, my talk, uh, we measured um, total cost against budget. And when you do that, right, you, you, your, your, your um, reference point is actually not the right one because when you say I have 15 million in budget and your cost is 12 million, you just change the budget with the growth that you have in the end, you are in a way lying with this. So what we did uh, was actually trying to find a way to measure, um, the, it's, yeah, let's call it kind of the return on invest to find a mechanic uh, that tells us about how efficient is this cost, right? And um, what we did is like trying different uh, different uh, KPIs here, and we ended up with having cost per million events because that machine that we actually speak about is a kind of a stream machine where um, customer clicks, uh, customer engagement, right, goes through. Um, and we, we found out that actually there's a lot of variation in that. So we by that by looking at that number, we understood actually when this is not stable, then there must be ways to reduce that, right? And we looked into the architecture, looked into the infrastructure for ways to, to optimize this. And then we just used this metric as a guiding, as a guide for us uh, to experiment with certain hypotheses that we had on the infrastructure. And uh, in the end, right? So long story short. Um, we iteratively uh, reduced the time by almost 50% overall um, uh, over half a year by not changing how many events go through that, but actually by changing how the RAM was, uh, the memory was used, uh, how, the, how the architecture uh, was designed on the back end um, and so on, right? So there were a lot of different things that, that we were doing. The, the important point here was really that we had a measure that tell, told us the variance of things, how things relate to each other. This, in the end, also helped me to rationalize the invest into that area, so that I could get like, you know, the buy-in from my managers and the managers of their managers to say, okay, the team is busy with in optimizing that part, so we don't have enough capacity for other things. But this is worth while looking into because we save five million, or more than five million year over year, and in the end. This will amortize uh, itself, right? So, uh, this was really, um, yes, I think, a good example for, for how you can actually make things tangible uh, by 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 doing by doing metrics, not just like your gut feel. Yeah, data data rules the world. <laughs> um, um, and look, in, in regards to uh, just generally, right? What do you feel is the most underutilized metric in tech product management? And why should teams pay more attention to that metric? I think um, one of the most underutilized metric is developer experience internally, not the one that I mentioned before in the SaaS context, but really internally. 
um, develop experience might be misunderstood as happiness and people need to have just a good time at work and so on. But I think it's not. It's like, do they have the right tooling? Do um, Is the onboarding that they have right? Um, um, the decisions that are being made, building or buying certain things or whatever, right? All of these need, need, to, be, need to be well understood. And um, especially when you grow larger as an organization, you will have um, kind of a, yeah, it's called a kind of a microservice architecture in your organization, right? So you have a team that builds something that another team uses. So, and then developer experience becomes even more important because that team that built something, in a lot of cases, I've seen that, you know, they think, okay, the other teams need to just like take what we build because we believe it's good. But if you yeah. put developer experience as a cultural measure for you to, you know, um, evolve your organization, then the other team needs to think about, okay, is the documentation that we write about that certain, that, that specific element that we provide to other teams, is it good? Is the API well understood? Do we use the actual, actual the right standards here? And so on. In order to not just provide some piece of technology for others, but also make it useful, make it great, make it, yeah, improve the culture, right? Um, and this is specifically true for teams that, um, yeah, have, have a, which purpose, purpose is this, it, it is kind of to maintain and implement external tooling, external uh, platforms. For example, localization is one thing, right? Where you translate uh, text elements. It's, they look a lot into, okay, how do editors, marketing people use this tool in order to translate their, uh, their copy? Uh, but in the end, this tooling needs to also be integrated in the product in like whatever your landing page uh, machine is like or whatever, right? And this, this element of developer experience cannot be forgotten because there is a lot of frustrations in it. Right. right. If if, if uh, implementing or integrating an external tool, also an internal tool, is 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 hard, right? Is heavy lifting for them, then uh, it will just reduce the yeah the happiness in the team, the engagement of them, and also the adoption to that new technology that you want to integrate. So, looking into developer experience, I think is is fundamental, especially in in organizations that grow and then create these dependencies makes sense and and you know you mentioned you mentioned earlier um you know metrics are not a cure for all evil right and they're not yeah. the goal but a means to an end but a, a lot of the time also metrics often tell a story beyond simple numbers right can, yeah. can you maybe describe a situation where you use metrics to or your organization uh, use metrics to craft a compelling narrative for stakeholders. Perhaps it swayed a strategic decision uh, or highlighted an overlooked success. Yeah, I mentioned the one with, with, the, with, the, with the flight and the train and the meal, right? I think this is where this is a good example. Let me think about uh, another, another element. Yeah, so my time at Delivery Hero. Yeah, this is this is actually a super interesting one. We looked into conversion, just conversion metrics, right? Very simple. People order food, um, put it in their basket, um, at their address, click a button, and then some some rider comes to them and delivers the food. Um, what we've seen is that across different markets, you know, and the platform was built from uh, for for products for South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Pakistan. Uh, Sweden, Germany, right? So in a lot of different cultures, that conversion rates were very different, very, very different. And we did not understand why. And we looked into that and we compared those and we made like drill downs into, okay, why is actually, I think it was Pakistan, but it doesn't matter so much, uh, was way more below that. And the, the user behavior seems to be off. And we first saw that there's a bug and we made a kind of big bug bash and we like, you know, deep dives into what is wrong here. We didn't find it. And in the end, we found out that um, actually the user behavior is different. People have a different understanding. I have a different learned behavior of where do they put, when and where do they put the address? When do they want to decide which payment method they use? And, and so on. And with that, right, it was a great um, way to say, okay, uh, I think we need to invest into feature, feature management. So to actually make one product, not one size fits all, but actually make it 
manageable in a way that we decide per market, per brand, how you know the the the, the conversion flow looks like. And um, yeah, this is this. I think this is a good example, right? So just look conversion rate. Yeah, very simple. We need to just optimize for that. But if you really go deeper, you see ah, actually, it's it's very different from from culture to culture, from yeah. product to product. So it gave you, yeah, it's it's crazy how metrics can can highlight those cultural differences as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and um, look, with regards to because you know at Phillips and Burn, you guys are well known for your tech due diligence, right? So, how do you recommend investors balance hard metrics with um, qualitative insights? Insights maybe such as team dynamics or product innovation and making informed investment decisions. Yeah, as, as as said before, right? It's always it's always a holistic thing, and I can tell you, tech tech due diligence is about tech. Yes, it's about um kind of very mechanical things like say, okay, we need to have this and this in place. But um the major piece of it is almost therapeutic, right? So it's almost looking into okay, what what are the different people in the company all about? What kind of roles do they have, um and so on. So the qualitative aspect is uh, is even more important now for us. The difficulty is how do we make this measurable? Because in the end, no one cares if we say, yeah, they, they are fighting about certain things again and again, right? And this might be a tension. This is not, this is not some, something that an investor can use. So what we do actually is uh, trying to rationalize um, those observations by having a score. So we have a score in place that uh, tells the investors all about like organization, leadership, all the different aspects in the company with 12 different areas and sub areas and how we do it we have a standardized way to to score certain uh, elements of these companies by having like, standardized questions standardized observations blah 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 not going yeah. to many years here but this helps us then to uh, a give a perspective of the company which tells like here is elements that you need to look into here's elements that might be i don't know um, problematic can we can translate those into recommendations to improve? And even more important, we can benchmark those, right? Because we can say, okay, a Series A company in a FinTech environment um, in Europe looks like that. And here we have a different company and how they benchmark against those then will tell us, okay, is, is this A, is this correct? What we, what we look into here, but also the investor, um, uh, how like a certain target company that, yeah. that they, that they want to look into um, performs on a yeah qualitative level, right? And again, as 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 as, as outlined before, it's just a way to find the same language um, um, here. Great, and and look with regards to Philip and Byrne, how do you you mentioned it a bit there? I'd love for a bit of a deeper dive from from you. How how does Philip and Byrne tailor its approach to tech due diligence with a focus on metrics? Um, and for startups and VCs listening, how can they engage with you to leverage your expertise in that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, as I said, we, we look into many different areas. And what we do is we do two, always two, two uh, major, let's say, streams into looking into company. One is looking into um, what we call a virtual data room. Right? So we get a lot of data, uh, we get source code access, we get access to their uh, Jira or um, Asana, and we have ways to get the data out of it and then um, create insight metrics. Um, we, we, we have standard ways for that, and this is what we look into. Uh, we invest a lot into automation in that, that regards, right? To really get, get a, make a sense out of what the, what the co company is currently producing not just from a product perspective, but also in terms of code, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of documentation, in terms of roadmaps and so on. So this is one other thing. And obviously there's a path moving forward, right, which, which comes with AI, which makes it even more, um, more important um, to, 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 do, to do that. And then the other element is to prove these and to question these and to challenge these together with um, key people within the organization. So we, for DD, uh, we usually do like five to 11 um, interviews, uh, certain formats like from a leadership, but also code walks with people to really look into things and then, um, yeah, uh, find the right balance between what is the truth here, what is the actual insight that we want to give to an investor. For a company um, to, yeah, also prepare for tech diligence is um, 
is, is, is actually from the beginning make one thing key in your understanding, which is that as a founder and as a leader, you're not building a product. Mm. What you're doing, you build a company that creates great products. It's a, it's a very important, very different perspective, right? And if yeah. you understand that what you do is actually building a company to build product, is that you need to invest into all of these elements that create leverage and scale along the way. Of course, a product can scale, right? The product scale is, is a completely different perspective here and a completely different way of, of looking at something. But creating a company that scales and leverages is, is even, even more important because a product can only grow to a certain, yeah, um, let's say, goal. But what comes after that is only, uh, only possible uh, by having a great organization. And um, that being said, is that, and that's what we look into. That's also what investors are interested in not so much interest in the current product. Uh, obviously, this is one element, but what they are more interested in is how is the team, is their experience in scaling teams? Uh, what is the team set up? Um, what is the organization set up? What kind of dependencies do they have? Blah, blah, blah. And um, this already gives the answer of how to prepare for, for a DD, which is just like focusing on your company, focusing on documentation. Do you have yeah, developer onboarding in place? Do you have the right metrics in place? How do you leverage metrics? Is there a way to... Um, uh, to scale teams in an organic way or do you always yeah. have to reinvent the wheel because oh wow we have a new product and now uh, our front end teams becomes uh, 20 people is this manageable probably not so from the beginning think in product teams for example right and um, this this is i think the, the major focus and i would also really personally believe uh, that this makes us well, one of the fundamental differences um, um, between uh, just good product uh, and great organizations. Okay, sounds good. Um, and and for people to get in touch with you guys, yeah. uh, for you guys to help them with with any kind of metric related or just uh, in general tech due diligence, what's the best way for them to do that? So I mean, obviously, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, right, that's the best way. Just reach out, uh, send me a message. That's that's definitely possible. Uh, I also will um, uh, added already uh, a link to my Calendly. Um, that you um, that you find um, um, later, right? Um, so yeah. book a session with me, um, definitely possible. Uh, another way is uh, I mentioned, uh, you mentioned before that, that I'm also leading this mentoring club. There's also a way, right, to get in touch with me for like some 30, 60 minute mentoring uh, on these topics. Um, so that's, that's the ways uh, we have. Okay, great. And uh, look, last question. Uh, and I want to, first of all, say thank you. It's been very enlightening, actually. And also, you know, your real life experience actually puts that tangible, sometimes intangible metrics to actual some real life applications, which is which is refreshing. Um, but look, as we ra wrap up this, this conversation, could you share one tip and just one for founders on how to effectively leverage metrics? not just talking about the metrics, but actually making it almost like a product yourself. So visualize it, evangelize it, and make it not, not you know, not, not something that is there because you have to do have it and because others have it, but really make it part of your DNA, right? Okay. So um, if, um, let's say, uh, let's, let's talk again about this conver con con conversion metric which are kind of boring, but it's always because everyone knows about it. If this is what you're looking into, make it part of every single conversation that you have, make it part of your management meetings, make it visible, make it, bring it to the screens, right? Be proud about it. Show like the company in your Orleans meetings that here is the hockey stick and that's how we did it. We are proud of your end of our engineering team because they unlocked this specific change in our, uh, you know, in our, in our, on our metric here. I think that's, that's the number one metric. So if you want to be a data-driven company, take it serious and make it make it a premium member, let's say, of your of your of your startup's elements. All right. Very, very, very good tip. Uh, look, Bastian, thank you very much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And as mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Bastian's calendar will be in the description. Uh, so feel free to reach out to him and his team. But thank you very much, Bastian. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Welcome to Capital HQ. 
where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. So, welcome everyone to this Capital HQ Masterclass session where we have the privilege of sitting down with Simon Brendel, uh, Associate Partner at Phillips & Byrne. Uh, Simon brings a wealth of knowledge and insights into the dynamic world of tech investing, uh, from seed funding to major M&A transactions. Simon's expertise spans the full spectrum of the tech ecosystem. Uh, today, he's here to share his experiences, predictions, and strategies for investing in tech, offering invaluable advice for investors navigating this evolving landscape. Join us as we delve into the intricacies of the tech investments uh, with one of the industry's leading minds. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Fantastic. So look, before we dive into the intricacies of tech investing, could you share with us a bit about your journey that led you to becoming an associate partner at Philips & Byrne and what drew you to focus on venture strategy, technology and innovations within this role? Very happy to. So I was initially studying global arts. I wasn't a lot into the business world. And I was doing the typical internships, so banking and consulting, the stuff you'd normally do, right? And at some point, I realized uh, that maybe that's not for me because you can't really move a lot of things day to day or operationally. And I went into the startup world. Um, I was with a startup in Munich. I'm also from Munich. And um, we've built a marketplace to rent construction machinery. And that was actually where I really felt I can move day-to-day -day, uh, operational tasks, not like in, in banking or in, in consulting, uh, at the big consulting firms. And we built the company out and it was really great. We, we hired a lot of people, we raised a lot of venture money, and that's also how I got into the whole venture private equity ecosystem. And I was also responsible for the whole product side there. Um, so kind of that was also my intro to tech. And then after couple of years and around 25 million venture money raised, I realized that it's I'm more of a builder, uh, more of the early phases in actually building the company. And there, then we had around 100 people. And I realized I'm not a manager so much and handed over to, to other people and actually was looking out for what I want to do next. And I was actually about to go into an investment role, but then realized I'm um, actually more, I want to focus more on the tech side of things, similar to investing, but more tech heavy. And that's why we uh, scaled Philips and Byrne over the last years, which is a tech advisory company yeah. where we go a lot into transactions with investors, with scale-ups on tech side and advise them how to be, how to build the best products, how to be the best tech companies possible. Yeah. So you, you wanted to be a, a big cog in a smaller machine is essentially that you could also say that, yeah, you could also say that, um, and also still be a bit more technical than the average, because it's, I mean, we're not doing finance advisory, not really look into finance, we just look into tech, and that's what I wanted to learn more about, as I feel that tech is moving the whole investment scene over the next 10 to 15 years. Absolutely, but, and we'll, we'll get into that, yeah. I think, there's, there, it's going to move the next 10 or 15 years, and it's moved significantly in the past 10 to 15 years as well. Um, so look, ha having been at the forefront of guiding a significant funding and tech assessments across Europe and beyond, how has your experience shaped your perspective on the tech ecosystem? And that was, I was actually, it was quite interesting because in the last years I now was involved in about a hundred transactions from all sides. So really small, as you said, really small seed transactions and, but also then really big fundraisings and also M&A private equity transactions. And First of all, and obviously, if you if you build your own company, that's not what you see. But the variety is really big. So you in in Europe, you have such great software companies, but you also now start to have all these crazy deep tech companies, all these great innovations yeah. coming out of Europe of all the different centers. 
And tech is not is not like one bucket where you can fit everything in, but it's so diverse and it's so great the tech ecosystem we have, and that's a really cool learning. And then, but then you also see that a lot of the companies also across the fields are very similar in the topics they have across the different stages. So a lot of the seed companies, whether it's software companies, whether it's deep tech companies, have similar cha challenges. And also across the stages, Series A, B growth stages, and then also in M and A questions. Typically, um, do not vary so much across the different segments. And then obviously you have also a time horizon um, in my learning. So I started with the before COVID basically and um, took the whole COVID down in the beginning of 2020. And then we had the last couple of years, we had the craziness before now the last one and a half years, the whole venture ecosystem was down and then saving a lot so yeah there was a lot of shift and also how you scale your tech company and how you how you plan for it yeah 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 absolutely and you know i at at, uh, at wholesale investor we work with uh with uh seed to series b companies and tech predominantly right so what we often see is um you know what we've seen recently so i joined in the summer of 2021 right so that was the peak of it was exactly. investment right but I only saw three, four months of it, and then it started mm -hmm. going down. Um, and what we've what, what we found is that now uh, it took a while. It took maybe a year before the shift started happening in the founders' um, mind space. Uh, in that they are now all about sustainable growth and profit, right? Um, I'm sure we'll touch on that. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about that in terms of that evolution. Uh, especially since COVID, especially since 2020, uh, perhaps after the down that we had at the start because of COVID and then after it started picking back up. Yeah, I mean, as you said, like there was this there was this down where it was all uncertain. We didn't know like what what is even a lockdown? How does it work? I mean, there was still the crazy times like what how does this all work? What will happen? Are we are we all going to die? Um, but after a couple of months, everybody realized that it's probably the biggest push for for digital innovation for for everything digital in general. Yeah. that you might get and so venture was pouring in a lot and also obviously we were still in a in a zero interest environment so fundraising for for investors was a lot easier and then we had two years of absolute craziness um, or one and a half two years around about however you define it where basically everything was about growth even at all costs also in tech um, you you would just try to grow no matter what it takes yeah and also, obviously, we had it in advisory. So it was never about how to be more efficient, how to refactor your code, how to yeah, scale efficiently with the resources you have. But the, problem, the, the solution for every problem was we just put in more resources because we can get more resources, right? Yeah. And a lot of companies were doing that also then into 2022. As you said, then like summer 22 was a bit of the breakpoint where the first fundraisings were going slower. Uh, interest was rising and uh, also GPs had a harder time in fundraising actually and then it was kind of a dragging out effect um, where all the companies now realize slowly but surely hey we might not get as, as much money fundraising further on so we have to be more efficient with what we have and that's also the the main theme then of, of late 22 and the whole 23 is actually like we have to be efficient we won't fundraise we may do a bridge round internally with existing investors, but we will probably not fundraise. And if we fundraise, probably not at the, at the existing valuation or with a lot of structure in the deal. Um, and so basically in 2023, also the advisory projects, all the mandates were actually like, okay, let's imagine they don't get more resources on tech. How can they scale efficiently? Or can they even scale efficiently with the existing setup? Or is there so much tech debt so much challenges um, on tech that they might have trouble scaling uh, into, for yeah. example, enterprise segment or larger clients in general, or even just higher margins. Yeah, absolutely. And and coming back to you know to what you guys do at Phillips and Burn, you, yeah. you you work with both the investor side, right, uh, with with clients uh, that's really remarkable. You know, Axel, Early Bird, um, and then you also work with the startup side. How was the feeling? How did um did you realize it pretty quickly that uh, the investment flow and the investment time was getting longer or was it really when the market started realize the general market started realizing it? No, we, we realized it actually quick, pretty quickly, to be honest. 
because uh, I mean we are at a, at a pretty interesting spot because the the investors typically come to us when they sign a term sheet and sometimes even earlier when we discuss certain industries or verticals and whether an investment there is interesting or what company in a certain vertical is interesting. So we were in a pretty interesting spot because we started noticing um, that the investor interest uh, is basically differing a lot from our from our initial forecast. And there were there were just no investors coming to us and you have these. The venture world is really cyclical. Uh, so you have yeah. this down in, in January and you have this down in, in summer, and that's quite typical. And basically in August, you can't really reach an investor. You 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 will hardly reach any investor in August. And that's quite normal. We know that. And there's also no inbound from investors in, in August or in January, typically, or very low. Um, but then over the whole spring in, for example, 23, there was literally virtually very little inbound, and it was totally different from what we normally experience. And we realized that. Also for the whole year, then um, there's a lot of down. Um, but vertically for us, or happily for us, what happens then is obviously there's a lot of MA coming up and a lot of private equity investors because if companies can fundraise but need cash, um, they are looking for other method methods of, of exits or even of investment. Yeah. And then private equity is getting involved, maybe even an MA consolidation in a certain industry is, is happening. And that's also where we act as an intermediary between these investor types and the, the company. Great. And and look, reflecting on all those challenges within the venture and tech scene in the past year and a half, two years, what key factors do you believe will drive the European tech ecosystem in 2024 and beyond? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that's very certain and that's still quite quite a big push on the industry is the whole deep tech uh, topic, deep tech, industry, vertical, however you want to call it. And um, that's basically not only deep tech. I mean, there's there's this, all these studies that you get a better return in deep tech and it is the way bigger market and everything. But the underlying topic is that the industries that deep tech is normally pushing into or deep tech companies are normally pushing into are just industries on the rise. I mean, it's, it's climate, it's the whole impact climate topic, which obviously we don't need to argue about that. It's one of the pressing topics of the next decade or even 50 years. The same about the whole military sector where deep tech is often moving in. Uh, we've now seen that military investments have been a little underserved in the last years and a lot of funds, a lot of private equity funds, a lot of uh, venture funds are pushing into that segment because they realize that there's a huge return and huge upside there. Um, and then there's also a lot of governmental money flowing into it. So we have a lot of subsidies and investment support. Um, and that's basically pushing the deep tech side. Subsector of deep, deep tech and venture, I'd say, is the whole AI topic. And yeah, also they are driven by the US, driven by the great innovations there on the whole LLM, but also on the semiconductor side. That's a huge topic and will drive the whole venture segment. So sort of all the layers, all the different stages in the AI process are just pushing like crazy um, and yeah. will drive a lot of venture push. And then subsequently, that will also, again, AI will enable a lot of business model innovation in different segments where you will see venture. So all the big old industries will be challenged by um, AI and there will be um, young challengers, challenger startups going into whatever industry, old vertical combined with AI, especially where you can gain proprietary data. So big one big segment that we are seeing one of the biggest industries is generally health tech yeah. and also industry where you can do a lot with proprietary data. So you can get a lot of data in health and from that data, you can then again gain competitive advantage with AI. Same similarly for manufacturing, just a very big industry, predictive maintenance, um, QA uh, for the product you manufacture. And there's also a lot of potential for AI happening. Absolutely. And I think, you know, talking about that, the, couple of pieces there from, from from what we've seen last year in terms of the data of the companies that have successfully raised capital on our platform, et cetera. Yeah. A lot of, first of all, it's lower than it was in the years before. I think that's just general market. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I joined FinTech was, <laughs> FinTech was, you know, as long as you put FinTech on your thing, you were raising capital pretty much. Yeah. Um, um, that's an overstatement, but you get my point. Um, Last year, what we saw was obviously a downturn in everything, but the two that really spearheaded uh, is climate tech, green energy impact, 
And the second one is um, was agriculture comes into that. And the second yeah. one was med tech, health tech, yeah. a huge, a huge amounts of that, whether you're a medical device or whether you're pioneering maybe new uh, research into drugs uh, or even new treatments. It was it was really impressive. Um, and, you know, last year I was looking at trying to get speakers for another event Mm -hmm. And I came upon NATO Innovation Fund, you know, yeah. um, with one one billion euros. So mm -hmm. I think that's also their push into I, I don't know exactly what they do. Right. But I can only assume it's a lot about deep tech for military purposes and probably other things. Um, exactly. Yeah. But um, look, let's talk a bit more about deep tech and AI in general. So. Maybe what would be great is for a bit of a definition of deep tech from from yourself and what you consider deep tech, because online and uh, people have very different varying definitions. So it'd be great to hear about, about what you think is deep tech. Yeah, that's that's I mean, that's one of the big questions. Actually, what is deep tech? And a lot of the investors also are, is this deep tech. So what we typically consider as deep tech is if there's considerably IP built within a company. That's actually, I mean, if you build a software company, especially if you build a SaaS company, you might also build IP, of course, but typically in the standard SaaS company, also in the standard FinTech company, in the standard software company, there's not so much of IP that could be patented that is actually proprietary involved. Of mm -hmm. course, there's exceptions to this rule, right? Um, but um, what we typically consider deep tech is something that could be patented, uh, may not be patented because of the bureaucracy around this process and the lack of speed involved, um, but could be. Quite often, it's also a spin-off from some sort of scientific organization, can be the case. And that is what we typically consider deep tech. And again, this can be, of course, in software. So a lot of the AI topics, a lot of the machine learning topics uh, are spinning out of scientific innovations that can also be in all kinds of software hardware combinations. So IoT, we've done a lot of uh, autonomous driving also, um, autonomous driving cases. And yeah. there it's quite often the case that it is considerably IP involved. Um, and that's what we consider a deep tech company or a deep tech case. So con considering that and w mm -hmm. what we've talked about, there's there seems to be some sort of re resilience in the deep tech field amidst everything else that's maybe contracting. Yeah. So why is that? Like what unique value propositions do deep tech startups offer to investors and to the general market? Yeah, I mean, what I just said, if you have certain proprietary IP or if you have IP uh, that could be patent, normally that also means there's quite a mode in the company you're building. So typically in traditional software cases, the mode is more in your customer login and in the, in the um, go-to-market you've built, for example. Um, and then the, the customer go to market expansion. But if you have such a deep tech case that is evolving around certain IP, uh, the, the, your competitors have to first build this IP or get their IP on their own or better IP. And that's a strong mode you're building in your own. So that's helping a lot of the deep tech companies once they have it. And then also the, uh, the other cases, um, there's a lot more capital needed to build this IP quite often. So deep tech companies are normally more capital heavy, but that also means if you have built a company above that threshold, if you have built that mode, it's way harder to just build another company in the exact same space because investors will just say, okay, they already raised whatever 50 million, build this IP, why would we fund you doing the same if you again have to build the IP? So that's, there's another, or there's a very different risk profile and then, there's a there's a not so much technical factor, but often um, deep tech companies, as we just said, come with less cyclical industries. So the whole climate, the whole agriculture, the whole med tech, this is just industries that will always be working, even if, as right now, the economic climate is a little bit down. A lot of the companies that uh, um, deep tech company, uh, the deep tech startups are serving, a lot of the industries that deep tech companies are serving yeah. are just less cyclical, and better better markets or better um, companies to sell to than the typical software SaaS company. Yeah, so more more long-term and sustainable in terms of what the output they can do. But look, I, you mentioned Moat uh, there, right? Which is very important for deep tech. I, I was wondering what 
the value when, when you when investors look right for SaaS companies, fintech companies, a lot of the time they come back to product market fit. Is there a product market fit? Exactly. I'm sure it's the same for deep tech, but from what I hear and just general feeling, and this might not be the way to go, right? But it feels like the moat of a deep tech is almost as valuable as product market fit for investors. Is that the case? More so maybe than a SaaS or a fintech? Yeah, exactly. So in the early venture stages with a deep tech company, um, it's quite often the question, not like, does it fit into a market? Um, but can you actually build whatever they have in mind also at scale? So can you actually build this fusion reactor or this rocket engine or this semiconductor manufacturing machine or this medtech device? Is it actually from the theory and the IP and the patent they may have, is it actually buildable and scalable as a venture case later? Yep. Um, and that's, in a SaaS company, you, you just don't have this or in a software company because you can build most of the stuff with software that uh, that's envisionable, right? Uh, you can just build it, just needs time and resources. But for a deep tech company, you have this way more often. And then again, the, the this if you cover or if this technical risk is covered, then you get to the market risk. But normally uh, the assumption is that the market for the deep tech companies is secondary. There's way more the question about uh, for technical risks and whether you can build it, which again gives you this mode that we spoke about. So th this leads very well into the next topic that I'd like, I'd love to talk with you about, you know, the role of due diligence in all of this, right? Because yeah. product market fit uh, obviously takes due diligence, but I, you know, I think from a due diligence perspective, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the team, uh, it's, it's probably easier to find whether a company has product market fit, right? Whereas that moat, especially considering that moat usually means novel, new, uh, yeah. something that's disruptive, something that people, general investors, or even technical investors might not necessarily understand, right? Yeah. So from that perspective, how what what kind of framework should investors employ when looking at a, a new deep tech company that has a new moat? Yeah. So, I mean, if you speak to, obviously, a new deep tech company, you always need experts from that field to challenge them. And that's in deep tech, especially that's quite often very hard because you have these, there's these funny cases where it's like a, a really, really innovative deep tech company. And then you realize, okay, they are pioneering this concept and there's maybe 10 people in the, in the whole world who actually understand this concept deeply enough because it's a really new scientific concept. And obviously you need one of these 10 people to actually DD the founders and the, the founders is probably three, four of the 10. Um, so that's a quite interesting challenge in deep tech is really going into what they have built and understanding deeply where the technical innovation they want to pursue or want to build is is uh, is involved. But then also you can you can there are certain standards across companies that you can involve, and quite often it's it's repeatable in whatever you're looking at. So there's a lot of AI cases that are similar. There's a lot of innovative cases that are very similar also in IoT, in the whole software hardware connection cases. And um, quite often it starts with the team. So you really challenge the team. You look in what they've done over the last years and you also look into their plan. And that's quite often also the first thing, how they want to transfer out of the scientific innovation, where you discuss a lot of theory, where you build your IP into how they want to build it as a technical product with and for clients, because also the, the early stages in deep tech is where you start the conversation with your clients, what you normally don't do in the scientific innovation case, and then scaling out how they really want to build it also at scale. Yeah. Um, so you really challenge the team. And then secondary, obviously, you go into the product. So you read the papers. If there's papers, you really look into the architecture on the software side. You look into the supply chains and the plant um, manufacturing, if it's a more hardware product. And uh, you speak to clients, I mean, that's for sure. You speak to the potential clients, to the maybe even to the people co-involved in building the product, because that's also quite often the case that you have industry partners that you build a product with is also kind of de-risking. It's saying like, hey, we built this rocket engine, you and maybe five others are the potential customers for this. Do you want to be involved in building already? Yeah. Because then you might ensure also maybe with an LOI that you actually want to buy it. 
because if there's only like 10 potential buyers in the whole European market, they probably want to go with an LOI first and de-risk building something that they might not need down the road. Yeah. And so build based on their needs. Um, yeah. And speak to them. So that's typically what an investor should do or would do in, in such cases on due diligence. Yeah. And, and you know, you, I'm sure well, for the people that don't know, you know, Phillips and Byrne, you guys are, are, are experts in this, right? And, and tech due diligence. Can you maybe share an example where tech due diligence that you guys uh, led revealed maybe critical insights that significantly influence an investment decision? So what we we don't share um, specific cases and names. Um, that's just one of our golden rules. We never yeah. share we share, never share names. There's some positive case studies on our website, um, but we never share names, especially not with details of the findings that we that we had. But maybe I can give abstract examples. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there's typically two to three common pitfalls that also are the same or similar for deep tech companies and for um, more software standard calls or standard tech companies. One is, and I've already mentioned that, is actually on the leadership side. So if we do a tech DD, we don't only look at the, at the software or at the product side, but we also challenge the organization side of tech because that's quite often a very involved factor if you want to scale your tech. And um, one standard thing is actually that the very early tech leaders or CTOs, they're great builders. They have built the first version of the product. Uh, they are the ones that are really, really deeply involved and smart about this product and know a lot, but they might not be the perfect manager, especially not if the team scales. And it typically gets a topic around Series A, mm -hmm. where you then ask them, or we ask them in a DD is, hey, how do you plan to build your team out? What is the critical roles you want to hire? And what is the factors you see you need in this team to actually be successful? And that is when they realize that they see themselves also way more in the role of a builder, but not the manager of the tech team. Um, and they might need a transition and a potential new CTO, or they might need a lot of... Um, help coaching mentoring whatever there's certain formats different formats that are involved here to actually from being the sole builder of this product becoming a manager of 20 30 40 people maybe even yeah. more in the technical team so that's a very common thing that we've seen many many series a-ish tech DDs, and also where investors need to put an eye on because having not the best cto in place for every given stage has a huge uh, ton of opportunity costs because you hire very expensive talent into your tech. But if they get burned by not having a good manager, this will be very expensive and slow your company down quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and look, move, moving moving on from that, um, you know, you mentioned already manufacturing, construction, and, you know, uh, your recent blog that you wrote, you mentioned that in 2023, we saw more specific deep tech use cases, right? Uh, including in manufacturing and construction through tech. So yeah. what, what should investors look for when evaluating startups in these sectors? Yeah, so what I what I referred to in the blog, and that's that's a mixture between AI and, and general old industries, that's what I mentioned earlier, is there's a huge level right now if you have whatever proprietary data. So if your startup or also your old industry company um, is collecting whatever kind of data that nobody else has access to. And that's quite often the case in manufacturing and manufacturing is also a big enough industry. That's the same thing in med health tech. Um, and an example for this, as I said, is for example, all the productive companies and all the predictive maintaining they are doing. Because with AI, there's a huge potential to automate more of this and to use the data and the unique insight you might have across the different verticals, across your clients to automate the maintenance and to lever your own investment and be a help to more clients. The same in health tech, obviously health data normally is quite proprietary. So if you collect data from your um, patients, if you have a whatever hospital or whatever patient service, you will have proprietary data and you can use this data. Obviously, you have to be compliant with certain regulations, but you can use this data to make certain predictions and maybe recommend certain medicine or even supplements to people and build a new business out of this. 
And so that's what I mean is in this old big industries, there's a huge potential to build new cases, yeah. even as a business model innovation based on the proprietary data many, many companies have and lever um, internal margin profiles by that. Yeah, and I'm guessing, you know, uh, probably one of the biggest ones the biggest industry is supply chain, right? That that's going to be significantly changed. Um, but yeah, look, you, you mentioned health as well, right? In, in your blog. Exactly. Um, so it's has seen remarkable innovations recently, but yet a lot of it faces a lot of digitization challenges. Um, exactly. What opportunities do you see for investors in this space and how can they assess startup viability effectively for digital health? So in digital health, obviously, as you said, there's huge uh, compliance needed with certain regulations. Uh, also, obviously, depending across um, different regions, different markets. Yeah. So also means on the other side that your company normally starts in one region and international expansion is way harder. Um, we've done a lot of uh, transactions and due diligences in, in the UK health tech market, similar in Germany. But moving from one market to another is just way harder. Yeah. So first of all, you have to look obviously a lot for compliance in in health medtech. That's I mean just just for sure. It's very critical data. You have to be compliant. You have to be also very secure with the data. Um, quite often insured in the compliance. But then again, that's just I'd say a hygiene factor that most of the companies have nowadays. Um, but then again, for the second factor, as I said, it's for me if I look at a company there's just no excuse anymore for not having your data structured and usable. So you should, if you look in a, into a company right now, look into what data are they collecting, if so, and or what proprietary data, and is it structured in a way, or could it be structured in a way that's already usable for a certain data product, recommendation product, on top of the existing uh, business model? And that's, as I said, a huge lever on most of the companies also in health tech that you could have and will increase both your, your, your top line revenue side because you can just monetize a new product. You can build a lot of different innovation on it, but could also increase your, your bottom line because you will just automate a lot of processes in your existing product based on the insights you get um, from the data. So that's, I'd say, especially also in health tech, that's my most common recommendation is look into the data the company is gathering whether it's structured and how could how it could be used for add-on business models or business model innovation even okay and i mean very good points there but for example let's let's assume an angel investor who might not have the technical knowledge to understand what every data point means or where, what the data is how can they inform themselves or what actions can they take um, to ensure that they, they're understanding the market and what the, the, the data that a company holds? Totally fair. So it's, it's also not about understanding every data point. You, you rarely do that. You, you quite often don't have the time to do that. But um, I mean, also as an angel investor, the concepts for this should exist. I mean, if you do an angel investment, it's very early. Probably even the product is not existing fully. Yeah. So you, you would normally challenge what's the concept in terms of data the company wants to pursue? Is it kind of sensible? And especially what is the proprietary data they, they can or want to acquire with their product? So what's their data strategy? And that's what I mean. Also in, 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 in the angel, in the, in the pre-seed seed stage, uh, the company should have at least a strategy on this side. They will probably not build it or not build much of it yet, but they should be able to explain what uh, kind of data strategy they want to pursue and what is the proprietary data they want to build it around. And that I can also question as an angel investor and ask myself also, obviously, as a potential client, hey, is this data I would hand over to them? And would the, the advice, the recommendation they might give from this data be helpful to myself and to my broader audience and customer group? Yeah, and yeah. taking this to maybe the next level, right? So we yeah. talked about pre-seed seed with angels you know last year when when the, the ai hype was everywhere um companies left right vcs uh, private equities left right and center were just investing in ai 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 yeah. right 
Um, and then I spoke to someone who had been doing purely AI investments since mm -hmm. 15 years, yeah. right? I interview very similar to this and he very bluntly stated some of these VCs have no clue what they're doing, right? Yeah. So for those strategies, for, for them, what, what strategies would you say that they should employ, right? So is it looking to hire in-house, which may be quite expensive? Is it looking to work with a company such as yourself on a, on a need to basis, depending on the, 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 the company that's coming in? Yeah. What, what, what would you recommend in terms of strategies for them? So, to, I mean, I wouldn't say they have no clue, but obviously the, the, the pace of the industry is just so fast yeah. that you really need to stay up to date. And if you have a, let's say, main job as an investor, it's really hard to stay up to date with all the trends and all the things founders are building. And especially in AI recently, over the last one, two years, it's just changing so extremely fast that even we sometimes are challenged to keep up with all the things happening. And so I'd say as a day-to-day -day investor, you will have a really hard time if you not focus on this specifically. And it's the same thing if you hire specific talent for that. Um, so it's always the question, can this person really only focus on this? And I mean, that depends on fund size and all the different fund allocation topics. But if they can, that's certainly great. And then there's a second topic is normally hiring a third party to do that. And there's different stages. You might also hire just a scientist to do it. Um, there's also scientists quite a lot involved in different, um, uh, let's say, due diligence cases. But then also at later stages, at bigger transactions, you might hire firms like ours. And yeah. just de-risks your individual investment decision because we see so many different companies across also different investors. And if you are the one person doing AI within an investor or uh, the, the very few people doing AI within an investor, you might still be biased by only the companies you see and we see the company. What we see is that the companies across different investors, what different investors are looking at, how they focus on certain segments, certain technologies. And by that also we are able to de-risk also the internal bias they might have on certain topics. Right. I'd say, especially at, let's say series A onwards, you try to, to get a third eye view on um the the due diligence cases and not only do it internally and that's also quite often we work with investors who have specific internal people for tech dd might also have specific internal people for certain dd cases but they still decide to hire us on that case and have us cooperate with their ai person with their iot person because we just have another opinion on the company on the industry yeah Makes sense. And look, moving on to leveraging data and AI in investment decisions, not looking to invest in data and AI, but leveraging that tool, those tools. How, how do you integrate data analytics and AI into the investment evaluation process? And what, let's say, what advantage does this bring to your clients, but also to you? Yeah. So that's actually, I mean, a very huge trend um, across investors. And one of, so one of the reasons why investors should hire internally is automizing and leveraging the, the process of the investors and of the investment themselves. And there's for us internally, there's two stages of this. So on the one hand, there's basically just optimizing and automizing the process we are having in an investment, yeah. um, or in investment due diligence. And that's basically just increasing the, the speed and the efficiency of the process. That's also how clients benefit from it is they get they just get a better and faster process in so operation operational efficiency then operational efficiency exactly um, by running certain automations by running some on analysis for example on the code level on the security level on an automated basis on a company by also being able to run outside in checks on companies on certain topics um, we are able to speed up the process of such a due diligence and for example in a series a case need maybe one one and a half weeks for full due diligence on a company and probably bring that even down to one week within this year so that speeds up the whole process for all people involved and then the second side and that's the way more interesting but also way harder side is 
again, investors are players with a lot of proprietary data. Yes. As everybody. And so all the and the same is true for all the due diligence players for us. The the main challenge here again lies in how can we structure this data that we get from other DDs, from the industry insights we have, how can we structure that? Um, also, again, being compliant with the laws, and it wouldn't be great if we just share data we get in a due diligence with other parties, right? That wouldn't be, then we would be out of business tomorrow. Um, but doing that in a way where we can generate benchmark insights, for example, across all the 150, 200 series ADDs we've done, and leverage that to give you a view on your specific company you might invest in. So we've done whatever 50 companies in a certain industries. A certain industry across the different investment uh, stages and they can tell you hey for a series a company in for example fintech they are or in, in uh, b2c fintech they are outperforming on certain tech metrics compared to the typical series a benchmark of 2022 2023 and that's where we are going slowly but surely building this engine um, to be able to serve this on a broader market and that's also where investors are going comparing their whole portfolio to the outside market on a lot of different metrics. Great. That <laughs> sounds like a lot of work you guys have gone on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And yeah, so look, that's the model, right? That That's what yeah. you guys are building. Now the input, the data that's coming in, in, the, in that context, what challenges do investors face in ensuring data quality, relevance, maybe bias, and how can these be mitigated? So investors, I mean, investors are in a better or in a, in a good place quite often on getting data because you, in a, in a due diligence, you normally get very high quality data from the company themselves because you might, you will do an investment and if it's not a fraudulent case, right, you will get data from the company that's actually proven to be right um, and probably even uh, certified. And the same is true with the mass of data being available on outside in cases on certain platforms. Yeah. You will be pretty sure that you will get data out of that. Specifically on portfolio analysis, for example, there's one thing um, that investors need to consider, and that's the whole survivorship bias. Mm. So quite often you'd compare to the successful companies you had and their metrics. But obviously that's also only the successful companies you had. And you actually need to build a bigger pool of all the companies, not only yeah. the really successful ones that so to say survived the growth and compared to that, their metrics, because um, you, you, you really want to have an average of the market or the subset you're yeah. comparing to, not only the successful companies to in the end have healthy and usable benchmarks in a way. And I'd say that's one of the biggest challenges and you can prevent that by just changing your data set in a way or adequately to to not only have the, the successful, the surviving companies. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you just focus on the on the companies that did really well, it might not just be because of the data, right? It's, it's exactly. It might be because of the team that you mentioned or external yeah. factors and the data of companies that failed might still be extremely valuable. So very important mm -hmm. to have that, that, that holistic oversight. Um, look, now looking into the future of VC with data-driven investing, right? Or the future of investing. How do you envision data-driven investing shaping the future of investing, venture capital? Uh, mm -hmm. And what role does AI play in this transformation? I think it will play a huge role. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that future because we will currently... We see investment is still driven by a lot of bias internally. Uh, I actually wrote my my academic thesis on uh, heuristics and biases within which we see and private equity investing. And it was a couple of years ago, but you can still observe a lot of the things actually being true and actually happening in the market. And um, we see will change. Oh, yeah, sorry, AI and we see will change that um, because you will just be able to find companies and to analyze companies without applying bias first, especially in finding. Because I mean, there's still all the statistics of underserved female founders, underserved minority founders, right? And also then female founders, for example, being way more cash efficient. Um, and 
will take years for sure to build up or to catch up the spaces. But especially in the selection process of companies and in the early stages, data will be able to navigate across biases that investors, individual investors may have way better than just peer pressure um, and help in the selection, help in the early stage investment process and basically navigate a better VC investment based yeah. mostly on data. But so completely see how that could work, right? But the model needs to be, needs to have as little bias as possible as well, right? That's exactly, that's one of the challenges. Obviously the model is being fed by the data that we currently have and the data is being built in the market with these biases. So you actively have to look into, um, into the data set, first of all, what biases might be involved and also obviously into the model themselves and the decisions. And that's where in general, not only with AI and BC, but AI in general, a lot of the questions are right now, how explainable are model decisions, the whole explainable AI topic, how well can we explain why a model decides for something and how well can we detect if there or whether there's still bias within that decision or how much bias based on the data set will there be in that decision. Mm. But I'm pretty confident that over the years you will be or you will have less biased decisions yeah. compared to a human alone, standalone process, investment process. And this is a bit of a left field question that pro probably doesn't have much to do with our discussion. It might, but what's your thoughts on synthetic data? There's been a lot of talk about synthetic data. Yeah. Do you think we'll get to a stage where it can replicate real world data um, or yeah. not? I, I think we will get there for sure. Um, it, it, I mean, on the one hand, it helps to augment data sets and it helps to prevent uh, biases in data sets already. And we will also get there um, to a point where synthetic data might be able to fully replace data sets in the future, but also already augmenting data sets and maybe neglect or yeah, preventing certain degree of biases, I'd say is a great advantage and a huge upside of having synthetic data. So question on like a, a much smaller scale, right? Yeah. With this, do you think a synthetic data set or could reply to a survey for market research and give you an understanding of what the market's looking for? Probably, yeah. I'd say so. Probably That's already cool. is within the realm of what's reasonable. Um, I'd try it out and look into the into the quality, also try multiple um versions of that or, or variants, but I'd say probably yes. That's very cool. <laughs> um, for, so look, for, for I'm conscious of time, we have a couple more minutes, but for investors eager to, to dive deeper into tech investments, um, how can engaging with, with you guys, Philips and Byrne, elevate their, their strategy in general and due diligence process and maybe maybe take um, take us through the typical process of an investor joining you guys, what that entails, uh, and what your outcome is, whether it's good, bad, like how do you, what's the whole process look like? Yeah, happy to. So um, we typically get engaged around the term sheet of an investment. So normally the investment decision with, for a certain company is already being done. What we also do on a more customer engagement basis is actually discussing with investors certain industries, maybe even certain verticals and a comparison of companies. But that's typically then on a higher level because technically you don't have so many insights into a company or on the tech side early on. Um, so that's only basically a high level supporting their investment decision. And we really get involved and into the due diligence once they sign a term sheet with a company, once they are, are in the final bid around and, and actually decided for an investment there. And then we start a due diligence process we discuss the investment thesis, we discuss what they actually see in the company and why they want to invest. And based on our due diligence framework that ranges from the leadership team across the, the tech architecture, the scalability, the security, to the code level, to the maintainability, 
we build out a case for that specific company based on also the investment thesis. And we run some automated analysis. We request a data room. And then we dive into the company deeply. We do interviews with certain team members and also get back with the investor uh, during that process. So basically reflect what we've seen. And that often gets interesting if there's a deviance from what the investor has pitched us or the investor has maybe uh, also defined as the investment thesis, the guiding questions. And then basically in the middle of this process, reflect and say, hey, that's what we've seen. Do you want us to go deep somewhere else? Or is this all fine with you? And then we start writing the report. And that's also where we differ the most from typical tech DDs um, out there, because what we want to achieve in a report, and that's always our benchmark, is not only give you the, hey, this is good, bad, I don't know, performance is okay, um, because that we found that not to be very helpful also when we build our companies and uh, were DD. Um, but what we want to achieve is give you a benchmark um, across different topics, how you're performing. So scalability, for example, for a Series A company, you're above market or compared to market, maybe a little bit low uh, in terms of scalability. And then also give actionable recommendations on all the different topics. So we have a huge list in every report. We have a huge list list of the topics we found and the issues we found, but also how to prevent them. And these lists are quite often then used with for by the investor for board decisions for 100, 200 day plans post investment. Um, and quite often the CTO also appreciates or the technical leadership appreciates that because they actually get a deep sparring on tech, which many investors may not be able to provide on that level. And that's how we typically uh, run a transaction. Fantastic. Well, it sounds really good. I have uh, two or three more questions um, looking towards the future, but I think one that would be very interesting is, you, you know, you've worked with both startups and investment firms. You do that a lot. What key qualities do you believe define a successful investor founder relationship in the tech sector? Maybe from prior investment to yeah. post investment. Yeah. So we often say, and I mean, that's, I'd say also from pre to pre investment to, to post investment, quite an important topic is openness. So, um, Put your every, every we always say also that everybody has the skeletons in the closet. Nobody has none. And especially in the investor founder relationship, put them on the table. Tell the investor what's up. Um, and also be open about the plan you have going forward, navigating them. Because as I said, everybody has them. Um, but investors can be a big supporter in navigating them once you realize that it's way smarter in the long run to be open about them, to tell them, hey, we have this topic, um, but it's also, we already have a plan to mitigate it. We just maybe need resources or we maybe need a bit of time to navigate it and to prevent it. And normally, if you run that very well, um, investors are open to doing that because they, yeah. they acknowledge that everybody has the skeletons. Um, and that for me, and that's also what we've seen helps to build this relationship investor founder and often is a crucial part of a successful company and a successful founder investor uh, relationship yeah it's on your brochure the the zero yeah. bullshit approach exactly <laughs> um great and and um you know as we look towards the future looking ahead what significant uh, maybe give us two um, tech investment trends do you anticipate will take center stage over the next few years? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we've discussed both of them already. I, I'd stick there. Um, so for sure, for me, the biggest topic of the next years is proprietary data um, on the one hand. So whatever certain industry vertical you're in, can you leverage, can you gain and leverage proprietary data within that model? Yeah. And business model innovate on that. Um, and the second topic is also, again, whole deep tech, not only climate deep tech, um, for certainly a very big topic, very close to, to our heart of Philips and Bern and huge stuff happening there. But then also, and that's very close to, to my heart personally, there will be a lot of um, defense, dual use innovation, a lot of deep tech in military use cases 
that's actually growing and will shape the next couple of years with investment, as you said, also governmental, the NATO, but also the German government, the France government, I think also the UK government are unlocking big money pools for that. Yeah. Uh, on the customer, but also on the investment side. And I'm pretty confident that this will be a driving factor in the investment landscape for the next years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, you talked about Germany there. Ger I read in the in the Times this week, the Financial Times, the um, Germany has just pledged its highest ever national uh, budget, right? So yeah. we're going towards that. Um, but look, finally, could you share one one piece of advice? I know it's probably difficult for sophisticated investors aiming to navigate the complexities of investing in the in tech, um, in general. <laughs> I'm probably I'm at the risk of, of being very repetitive. Yeah. But again, look into data. Question founders, especially on data. Um, if you have if you have just one, or if I have just one advice that I can give to people is look into the data and the the, the proprietary advantage a company can build out there. Because that's the only thing that will not be at risk by AI, by um challenger companies and especially also will you help will help you to to evolve your company um over the next years is having certain proprietary data models fantastic well look uh look simon um thank you very much for joining us today it's been uh absolute pleasure and for anyone who's interested in getting in touch with simon uh we'll put uh different links in the description uh, for Phillips and Byrne, maybe to your blog, uh, to different kinds of things that people can have access to. But thank you very much for joining us today. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Google. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Dan Huber. Um, I'm... Uh, based here in Zurich, Switzerland, I uh, run a single family office for the last 20 years. Um, before that, I have been uh, in the financial market, uh, active with a company, uh, some of you might remember, uh, www.oanda.com uh, was, was, was one of the companies I was involved at that time. Uh, early 2000, I started um, as a family office investor. And uh, besides my background, I'd like to give you a, a little bit of uh, an introduction to um, one of our latest investment. It's called ADNA, Authenticated DNA of Companies, which is um, hopefully not only solving a problem uh, we had in, in our form family office, but um, maybe some of your investors or family office um, people that are watching uh, this, um, as well as startups or SME companies, uh, can basically um, uh, identify themselves with it. So um, we, we tried to solve this uh, problem actually uh, quite early in 2010, 11, 12, but uh, it didn't really work. And then with the arrival of uh, blockchain, we really thought it would be a, a time for another try to establish what we basically call a permanent pre-due diligence data room, which serves startups, SMEs, as well as the whole investor community. Um, so we position ourselves as a, as a platform that helps to solve some corporate governance and compliance issues. 
And what we are trying to solve or have solved actually with a, with a rolling platform already exists in other industries for many, many, many years. So for example, in the airline industry, every airplane has a black box. Why? Because the airline manufacturer as well as the airline itself wants to know what happened during a flight with the pilot, with the condition outside the plane, with the plane itself. Uh, similar in the modern electrical cars or any cars today, you have an accident chip, which records anything, everything that happens to the car, to the driver, etc. And quite similar to, to this, we as investors have always had a problem with startups knocking on our door and basically asking us for an investment. And then we said, yeah, could be a match. Let's um, give us uh, some high level documentation. And of course, we waited for three days or three weeks sometimes until we finally got something because data rooms are usually incomplete, both at the startup level, but also some SMEs never have their data ready. And uh, of course, uh, if you've ever been involved in, a, in an operational position, you know it's, it's quite time consuming at the time that somebody knocks on your door and says, oh, cool, what you have done here in the last couple of years, we want to buy your company. And the stress for the management team starts. And last but not least, documents need to be authenticated, meaning C-level people need to prove that they have the real thing uploaded and approved. All the documents are, are signed. And of course, that leads to this traceability and verification that we think in a nutshell leads to one thing that in today, today's investment world is so, so important after all these FTX cases and others that we have uh, had to witness, trust. And trust you receive if you have authenticated data and create what we call a full data integrity, thus achieving a high level of trust. So our life cycle, of course, uh, is very simple. Shareholder agreements, perpetual integrity, physical assets on the startup side usually very rarely exist. So startups have usually a few documents, but then of course, as a startup, you are planning to grow into an SME company. And over the years, more and more of the documents arrive and um, really important contracts and new CVs of management people, loan agreements with banks, et cetera, which eventually after five years, 10 years, sometimes 20 years leads into something that might be an M&A transaction or handing it over, uh, over your company to the, to, to the next generation. And this is basically also demanding that the whole history or the whole DNA, as we call it, is always ready and, 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 and authenticated. How we do this very quickly before I show you the product live is of course, somebody uploads a document, either an internal or an external document, and somebody else in the management team approves it on very, very important documents. Maybe even the board of directors approval is needed. We have a concept of external key partner verification. We could be your fiduciary company, your lawyer, or even a board member could, could take this role. And last but not least, Currently, since uh, last year, we are hashing all of our clients' data room once a month on currently two or three blockchain layers. We are just expanding our blockchain offering because it's not our data room, it's our clients' data room. And some have a preference for this layer one blockchain, some have a preference to um, other blockchain layers. So I stopped my pitching here very quickly. And I'd like to show um, you now the full screen of, um, of our product. So very simply, um, we have here the year, the actual year that we're in. We are collecting something that we call the key folders on these different topics. Here we are quite uh, stubborn. We say every company has to have that. A lot more flexibility is, of course, already done than here on the corporate folders. I would say the first six, seven, eight folders of our technologies is quite common in most of our clients, customer or data room. 
Uh, as you can see here, for example, if something is missing that you really need, the administrator can upload that. Last but not least, if, for example, somebody like me is uh, set up as an owner in this company, wants to have his private stuff as well, he can add that. It's not a must have, but he can do that. As you can see, we are working in the previous pitch. You saw that little color scheme. So, of course, uh, the goal is to have everything in, in, in dark green, which uh, is the sign for completeness. I'll show you here, for example, an example of uh, 2021 on our own ADNA data room. So walk the talk. We're using this for our own purposes. And as you can see, everything is fully completed, approved. For example, if I go in this year into the corporate folder, a oh, small tutorial comes here. And I, for example, want to see our charter uh, documents. I can open this. Uh, and basically, I can see here that these up here on the upper right hand corner, I can see that these are the people that have been approving this particular document at the time it was um, uh, uploaded. And I can see when they have done it, etc. If I still have today a comment to this document, I can do this here. So this is in a nutshell how we do it. And a good example here, for example, why is the tax folder, even for the year 2021, not fully uh, completed or dark green? Well, because even in uh, very efficient Switzerland, I haven't or we haven't received a tax audit for the year from the Swiss government, nor have we uh, had a social security audit uh, uh, of um, uh, our company and all its employees. So this basically, in a nutshell, is what we do. As an um, administrator, of course, I have um, uh, very simple things. I can look at all of my history so that, for example, in this presentation today, I have uh, viewed a document, creates a log. Since I'm uh, an administrator in this uh, company, I can see how many gigabytes of data we already been using. And just to give you an indication here, uh, our data room has been totally completed for more than uh, four and a half years. And we are using 1.6 gigabytes, or sorry, 1.6 gigabytes of a total of five gigabytes that we have um, on the cloud. I can define very simply who in our data room has which rights. So I can set up different people internally. I can also inv uh, invite other people like investors uh, that might be interested in from uh, the wholesale investor community to view certain things. So I can give them access to it. I can set up my own uh, customer roles if, if we haven't matched that. I can see, of course, uh, who are the active users. I can also have inactive users. So if a CEO or a CFO eventually leaves the company, I can set him to inactive or her. And last but not least, I can define what and who can see what in particular folders on, on my system. So they, this basically, in a nutshell, is um, what we do. Uh, of course, the system does give me some indication if I have to do something. So for example, a new document, uh, our, our pitch document was uploaded by uh, one of our coworkers here, Urs. And now I'm being asked to uh, approve this document and, and why I'm in the live demonstration, I quickly do this uh, with you. So this is actually a, a pretty large document. So it will take a second or two uh, to upload. And basically you see here this um, pitching document that I'm uh, going to be switching back in, in a second. And since I know it's the right one that uh, Urs, uh, my colleague, has uploaded, I'm uh, going to approve this um, and say, yes, it is the right version. So basically, I'm doing this approval now. It gives me a confirmation that I have approved it. I have no pendings anymore, so I'm basically done and can return now uh, to whatever else I'm doing. Uh, updating our own data room as it is today, it needs the whole management team at ADNA anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes a month because it's not your, your expense reports or think, think something that you upload into ADNA or into your ADNA. It is really just the very, very important elements. 
So very quickly now, uh, switching back to um, uh, my pitching uh, information, uh, what we do and how we do it, you have seen now on the product uh, demonstration in, in the live mode. Uh, of course, um, the process of how we do it is, is company owners and executive people as well as board meeples have a very important role. External parties that are interested in this authenticated DNA uh, uh, stuff is, of course, uh, either on the banking side, on the auditing side, lawyers as well as investors, eventually corporate buyers, and key partners basically um, you know, monitor from, from an external position a little bit that the company is really updating uh, the right stuff in, in, in the right order, in, in the right format. Our marketing positioning is that, of course, we want to become uh, the company's single source of truth, which then eventually can serve all kinds of different uh, external as well as internal uh, uh, bodies and, and organizations to make sure that what you're handing over to these people is the final, final and actual version and the latest version that you have. Um, some of the founders, uh, quickly, I'm coming more from an investor, um, venture capital background. Uh, Donnie Bernard is our CTO. Urs is a guy who runs a, a large um, M&A boutique here in, in, in Switzerland. And our uh, president of the board, uh, Urs Rechsteiner, is, is, um, is a lawyer. Last but not least, um, everything that you've seen now is um, uh, also since uh, uh, December of uh, last year available on mobile. Uh, the um, ADNA uh, version on iPhone is released and uh, you know actively used by startup companies as well as um, SME companies that we have. And we are working currently on the Android version. So um, uh, this should be released next month. So that basically is, in a nutshell, what we do. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, you found that interesting. If you're a startup, uh, definitely a suggestion from an investor point of view, um, do this, because uh, it could be very helpful in your pitching to investors, showing them a little bit of, let's call it good governance and compliance. And investors usually like that. Uh, that you have, even you're just six months or a year old, you have your uh, company and everything within your company a little bit in, in good order. With this, I'm basically um, concluding my pitching as well as my live presentation. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much for that. Um, Hi, Hugo. Uh, that's, it's, it's really cool. I think, um, you know, I think we're going to dive deeper into um adna maybe the name behind it would be very good to understand them um, you know compliance the evolution of it in digital finance and when a company is compliant its impact on the efficiency and moving in the capital markets um but before we get into that i'd love to talk a bit more about your personal journey i know you've talked about it but you know could you maybe take us through your your journey so far yeah i mean uh, as I said earlier, um, I, I wanted to solve with ADNA a pain point we had in our own family office. And, and, and this was at the time of the investment, uh, you know, we, we were waiting for documents. Finally, we got some documents. And then we wanted to make sure that at the time when we transfer the 500,000 uh, over to the startup company or sometimes even SME companies, we wanted to have a clear hash, a clear freeze on the documents that we were given, okay? And, 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 and already at that early stage, this kind of hashing the data room on public blockchain at the day you're transferring uh, the money is a protection for me as an investor, but as well as a protection for the management team of the startup or SME company, because it's both ways, you know? They can prove to me what documents they have given me for my due diligence work. And I can prove that I had these documents or I didn't, you know? Uh, in classical m and technology elements, nowadays you do this uh, on, on encrypted uh, USB sticks and say, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to have this a little bit more of a dynamic, making sure that both sides understand that this is the material that we had for the due diligence. The second part was, 
you know, I don't want to do micromanagement in, the, in investments that we're involved in. But I want from time to time see how the company is doing. And with ADNA then starting to turn into a platform where I can monitor a little bit, you know, how well updated they have done their things is very nicely. And the very nice thing about what I like, things in the ADNA are always at the same place. So I don't have to look at the Dropbox structure that I don't understand. I don't have to look at the SharePoint structure that I don't understand. It's always at the same place. So the shareholder agreement is always there. The financial information is always there. And I know it because it's in every company the same. Makes sense. Almost. 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 The same. Almost, but yeah, I mean, the structure is, is pretty straightforward, by, especially by the looks of the demo. Um, and look, going from how, what have been your challenges so far moving from an investor to a CEO? My, well, not Maybe learnings, uh, maybe not challenges, learnings. Would be more. Uh, more I I, th I think it's good sometimes as an investor to jump back into the CEO role, because it really shows you know how many loose strings you have to tie together, how you have to make sure that uh, your investors, in my sense, uh, my family of course, <laughs> uh, is happy about the reporting and sees that we're making progress and that we are you know hiring the right people and taking the right steps and you know do the minutes and do the the board minutes and the management minutes and publish them and sit etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think it is a good exercise uh, for for all kinds of investors or particularly in my case to sometimes book, uh, jump back into the driver's seat you know which is not what i'm planning to do for the next 5 years within adna uh, but uh, you know i think uh, helping this company from an operational point of view was a good exercise and a good learning point for me again and hopefully uh, helps my investment uh, uh, questions and style as well. <laughs> For sure. And um, look, moving on to ADNA at a very high level, we'll go a bit more in depth later on. Um, how do you differentiate yourself from other data management solutions in the market? I think the big differentiating is that we are tying documents to people, irrevocable. Thus making sure that, you know, people understand establishing a company or managing a company in a C-level position brings a lot of fun and a lot of work, but also brings some responsibilities mm. towards yourself, to your, towards your, your, your core C-level people, towards your board, and last but not least, towards your investors and the society. Because... You know, I mean, driving a car today needs a license in Switzerland, in Australia, in the UK, everywhere. You know, I'm not saying that establishing a company should require a license, but I think people have to understand, you know, uh, uh, starting a startup is not only fun. It brings some real important responsibilities with it as well. You know, absolutely. And. Look, now let's moving on to the evolution of compliance in digital finance. I know you were recently, you know, reflecting on your panel participation at the World Economic Forum in Davos recently. What is your perspective on the current state of compliance? Um, I think from a legal point of view, there's a lot of compliance rules um, in place in, in various jurisdictions. Some go overboard with their compliance requirements. Uh, some keep it uh, <laughs> uh, very minimum. Uh, but in general, I think, you know, people should view compliance as, 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 as part of, of establishing a company, like benchmarks, you know? So whatever jurisdiction you're in, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand every little detail of compliance, but you have to apply common sense to your compliance measures and to your compliance steps that you're taking in the company. And I think the, the, the best uh, uh, would be to say, okay, what kind of compliance elements would I love to see from a company that I may be not in the C-level management team reporting to me, you know? So in a nutshell, I would say uh, we have enough compliance rules and, and, and we have enough 
uh, possibilities to, to control from a legal point of view what um, uh, governments or, or uh, tax people want to see. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you've got to do it. I mean, and that's the point, you know, you're going to have to once in a while sit down and, you know, go by the rule, what, whatever your jurisdiction you're coming from uh, is requiring uh, your company to basically have as a compliant element, you know. And, and in a nutshell, it's not that much, but as a CFO usually or as a CEO combined with the CFO, you know, once a month, you, you should spend at least one or two hours on those compliance issues. Because if you don't do it and you always postpone these things to, I don't know, end of the year and then end of the year is very busy and blah, 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 you're, not, you're never going to do it. And so that's why we have a technology platform like ADNA. Is, I mean, technology helps you to push. And it's not something that you immediately have to do now on the 31st or tomorrow on the 1st. But the system, the software pushes you every month to do certain things. Because otherwise, the color starts going from dark green to orange to red. And if your board members see certain areas red, they're probably going to call you and say, guys, what happened? For sure. It's <laughs> a good point. Um, and can you talk a bit about the name? Uh, you know, how did you come up with it? Huh. Very simple. We looked at what we did and we said, yeah, we're collecting the DNA of companies and we are authenticating or, yeah, hashing, authenticating and hashing this particular data. Uh, so the name was actually uh, very simple. We're, we're named after what we are doing, you know. And, and, and basically, uh, as you have maybe seen at the, at the last uh, slide in my presentation, it's um, your company authenticated. That's it. Simple. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> I like and, simplicity. I like simplicity. And, of course, sca scalability and simplicity is usually a good match. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For a startup. And look, coming back to uh, a compliant company, what is the impact that a compliant company has on uh, multiple things, right? But the first one is, on, for example, let's assume a company is raising a, a Series A, right? What's the impact of having a compliant deal room, due diligence room, due diligence materials on perhaps fundraising? Very simple. No stress for the operational people. I mean, if you have your, your, your data, uh, everything compliant and ready and... and uh, you know, testified, anyone knocking on your door or, or anyone really starting heavy due diligence, you, I mean, you have it, you have it. And, and it, it really, I mean, I have a very good friend here in Switzerland. He sold quite a, a prominent software company in the financial market a uh, year and a half ago. And he said, Dan, what you're showing me here, we would have you needed two years ago because our whole management team was going at five o'clock in the morning into the head office to do exactly what you're showing me. And then, of course, from eight o'clock in the morning till the rest of the day, we had to, you know, still run the company. So if you do this while you are starting and growing your company into one year, two years, three years, and I mean, look, and, 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 and this is very honest, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why we started ADNA as well. How many startups have we seen in our life that four founders were knocking on our doors and we gave them some money? Then eventually, after six months or 12 months, from the four founders, two have left. Hmm. For various reasons, for various reasons. You know, and, 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 and you want to make sure, uh, even if you're a little bit more mature SME company and you have a a management team and suddenly somebody out of the management team is leaving the company or you want to fire this person from a board perspective, you, you, you want to be in a, in, a, in a capable position to do that. So compliance to me has again a lot of elements that are found in trust because the company has all its DNA ready for whatever purposes there might be. Like you said, next financial uh, financing round, 
Uh, maybe there is some uh, uh, merger discussions eventually happen between two parties who know each other already for quite some time. Uh, there is maybe a bank who wants to grant you a, a, a yeah, substantial loan and is interested in, in, in really looking into your DNA, seeing that you're not hiding anything from them. And that all equals to trust. Yeah. It's core. It's the core, it's, it's the core of a business, external and internal. Um, great. And look, um, could you maybe elaborate a bit about the... The, the technology behind ADNA. I know, uh, you know, it mentions uh, blockchain. Can you maybe talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, as I said in, in my um, uh, entry statement, um, we tried to, to build ADNA uh, a couple of years ago on, on, on Web 2.0. And, 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 you know, we spent a couple hundred thousand in, in, into that project. And then I think like 2011, 2012, we realized it, it it's not working. The stickiness was missing. Hmm. When we were introduced to blockchain technology, uh, summer 2017, we realized that this blockchain DLT technology is what we were missing. Cryptocurrencies, and of course, uh, that's, uh, that's not, not, not something I want to talk about, but the, 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 the basic DLT blockchain layer was very, very convincing to us because it has this decentralization uh, aspect and it has this irrevocability, which we think is very key to not only what we're doing, but a lot of other things um, that are pe that people are doing on on on, ba on 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 the foundation of blockchain technology. No? So yeah. I think for us it was a real game change changer because uh, we we really believe in 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 I think somebody very high up in in IBM once said uh, what the internet did to communication, blockchain is going to do to transactions. Yeah, you know, and and. You know, I think um, I think it was the CEO of IBM who said that. I forgot her name or his name. No, I think it was uh, a woman. Her name, um, and and I really believe in that. You know, I, I think in in a couple of years we will see a lot more transactional elements that have its foundation on blockchain. So for our purpose, it's not only a marketing thing that we, uh, as I said, uh, uh, just last year started to add, but it has a very high impact on what we're doing, because the next thing we are just in progress of doing based on blockchain is starting to NFT, non-fungible tokenize, yeah. our client's most valuable assets. So it might be a patent, it might be a source code, it might be machinery that you have. And, and we want that our clients have them again ready for whatever purposes they need it eventually, in a digital form. And NFT, in that sense, is a perfect solution for that. Yeah. Which hasn't been NFT hasn't been around when we started in 2018, you know? So so I think the, the whole evolution that, that uh, everything around blockchain is taking is very good for, for the purposes that we're planning to do in in the long run of ADNA. Uh, and um, this NFT uh, technology that is now been around for uh, two, three years, as I think really matured that we can start now integrating that, as well as the hashing. Can you maybe talk a bit about some examples that you see the NFT side of ADNA taking in the future? Yeah, I mean, a very simple uh, example could, for example, be if an investor uh, comes to us and, and uh, on our next financing round says, OK, guys, um, um, I don't know, I, I, I give you two million on, a, on X valuation or XX valuation, but I need security. I, I want additional security. So by that time, we probably have our whole source code in an NFT. Now, of course, lots of people who will listen to this or watch this, they will say, yeah, but the source code without the team is, 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 is not much, you know. But still, just as an example, you could NFT a source code, you know, and, and basically... Uh, uh, pledge that for whatever grant or, or loan or, or investment you think. Or, or so, uh, for example, a, a machinery company that uh, you know gets a loan from a bank, uh, and the bank says, "Look, uh, you're not you're not a quoted company. We need additional security. So maybe 
you own the the the, the manufacturing uh, building that you are currently manufacturing. And then you can NFT that real estate and basically pledge that NFT uh, against the loan. And the nice thing out of that, of course, is again entrepreneurial driven. You are starting to create your own track record on loans, you know, because uh, those 15 NFTs that you have given out maybe for your building uh, after three years or after five years, they come back into your credit fold hmm. that we will then have at that time in our ADNA setup. We, we currently don't have it. So I think it is really something that, um, you know, uh, I had a presentation the other day where ESG was a big topic. Uh, and, and of course, we have an ESG folder in our data room. And, and I met a, a CEO who said, Dan, I, I really like what you do here because I sometimes have people who, you know, are questioning, are we really doing what we're saying we're doing on the ESG side, you know? And here I have an irrevocable, authenticated, fully approved C-level management, board management people uh, a data a document, which basically shows that we have done what we have talked about. So I think the NFT side will become, especially during the active life uh, of a company, um, quite interesting uh, in the sense that, uh, yeah, it helps you to, to be more dynamic when somebody on the investor side, on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the public side, maybe uh, uh, questioning your ESG activity, you need to prove that you have done what you said, you know, or you have what you have, you know. I think you know we we kind of spoke about this uh, not on this uh, on this call, but if a company goes goes bust, using your NFT using the NFT side, um, creditors can actually come in and, and just take that. So I, I, yeah. I'd love for you to talk about that a bit. Yeah. Here, here you're talk, uh, uh, touching on my second pain point: why I founded ADNA, or we founded ADNA. It's not only me. Uh, and my second pain point is clearly, as an investor, I'm, I'm not better and hopefully not worse than anyone else. I invest into 10 companies and five of them, they go bankrupt, total loss. Three of them basically left pocket, right pocket. They don't return much. They don't even pay for our time. And one or two make, make, make it all up. Okay. That's fine. So, so probably most investors that listen to this, uh, uh, they, they will agree that that's the life of, a, of a, an investor or a VC. And my problem with those five that go out of business is, is not that they go out. Of course, we lose money, total loss. But the problem I had or still have is I'm confronted what here in, in, in the European market is called an, an insolvency manager. Usually a person coming, or always coming, mostly coming from the government side. And of course, these people don't understand what kind of assets are still available in this company. And, and you know, insolvency laws, at least here in Europe, they're quite clear and regulated, and you have to do what you have to do. But if certain assets and those really important assets are already in an NFT, you could basically much, much quicker put those NFTs onto a marketplace and say, guys, here's a company 20 kilometers south of Stuttgart with these kind of assets, maybe two or three, that has gone out of business. Who in this world is interested in buying that? Mm. You know? And an NFT then, of course, is testified as really still existing. So this machine is sitting down here on the uh, on 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 my my uh, my ground and it is physically still here. So making sure that NFTs aren't being sold three or four times, you know, because with digitalization of NFTs, that could be something that some people would try to to do. And last but not least, you know, I mean, it it, it is helping uh, uh, the government to to efficient or hopefully more efficient and hopefully also more profitable run down. Uh, companies that, yeah, go out of business. And that's Which, it. by the way, by the way, just to give you an example, is a huge market. You know, in Germany alone, thirty-five billion euro every year, repeating, go down 
Of course, there's a lot of coffee shops and hairdressers and so but there are companies with real interesting assets. Maybe not for somebody in Germany or Switzerland, but maybe somebody in Mexico has a need for this 10 or 15 year old machine. And if he knows that this machine is available, he might buy it because he sits up on a lot of cash, which he hasn't invested in, 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 in Mexico directly. You know? So this, this is my, my, but here we're clear. I mean, even though we are talking to some recovery departments of, of larger banks, which, uh, yeah, uh, usually have quite <laughs> a lot of companies that are not in so great shape in their recovery department, but we know this, this, this second pain point will not be solved immediately. It probably will take another two or three years until we can really then start creating this marketplace for de-stressed sometimes or insolvent assets. You know? And I've talked to, uh, to some of my friends in the, in the hedge fund business or distressed business in, 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 the, in the States. And, and, and they say, yeah, this is, this is cool. This is cool. And one of my best friends said, Dan, this is so typical that it comes out of Switzerland because, and I think he, he said that, otherwise I will say, Switzerland used to be the world champion in, in re recycling, you know? <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we're recycling papers and pets and, and pet uh, material and, and, and lots of other things. And, and, and he basically said, yeah, well, why don't we try to recycle companies. And, 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 and we're fully down to earth with our feet on, on this topic. I mean, lots of companies that go to insolvent, there's, there's no asset whatsoever that should be recycled. Makes sense. And look, the platform obviously has holds a lot of sensitive documents, right, from these companies. What measures do you take to ensure data security and privacy? Um, of course, <laughs> very much. Uh, I could show you a graph on that if you like. Um, yeah. uh, just to illustrate that uh, quickly, let me quickly switch back. So of course, um, very good point and, and very important point. Um, we basically go out of business in, in, in no time if we don't make sure that documents are safe. And so we basically double encrypt every single document that is uploaded. First, we virus check it, then we encrypt it. Uh, uh, we're just adding uh, a technology that you can um, erase names, uh, blackout uh, names or, or things that you don't want to be shown on, on the document. And what is important, the, the security code or the key generating uh, technology sits on your side, not on our side, it sits on your side. And the double encryption eventually leads to the point that if somebody really ever, ever is able to break into your data room, he sees not the structure, he sees a whole bunch of encrypted documents. And as soon as he or she tries to pick one, he probably might be able to pick one, but then the alarm goes off and he is not sure if he picked the rent contract uh, from your company, or he picked the shareholder agreement. He doesn't know because he can't see it. Mm. So from a technology point of view, of course, we have applied whatever today is possibly available to make sure that your data is very, very safe. Because as you said correctly, we are not collecting guinea pigs of your company we are really collecting the really, really important stuff. And by the way, I had a client from uh, Germany the other day who said then, you know, our general accounting and, and, and documents and, and co-working uh, documents that we're using on various other platforms, it's here in this um, ERP system from SAP and my DNA data sits somewhere else. I find this as a diversification of risk if we can talk about uh, portfolio management strategies as a diversification of risk, already that is a good point. Because yeah. he tells me he's being hacked on his SAP system twice a month, three times a month. You know? That's a lot. <laughs> it's a big company, by the way. Yeah. Um, and look, you know, you've earlier this year, uh, well, we're only one month in, but you've released uh, an app, mobile app. Um, 
what was the thinking behind that? Um, mo- you know, most of these B two B softwares are usually web based. So, w- yeah. what was the thinking behind it? Um, two things. I think uh, since we are uh, rolling out our technology or our platform, uh, especially into the startup scene through incubators um, in in various countries that find our let's call it good governments and compliance elements quite um, uh, useful and, and, and supported by a technology for their incubation uh, yeah. programs. So because of the, you know, startup scene that we are usually seeing as clients, a uh, mobile app is a must have for that generation, you know? Yeah. Uh, and the second point is uh, uh, also for, uh, you know, investors or board members that are traveling, that are moving around and sometimes uh, sit for uh, an hour or an hour and a half uh, in traffic jams or at the airport and they have a little bit of time to, look at their companies, you know, either as a board member or as an investor, you know, so it's, it's both. It, it is the young generation want to have these things in, in a mobile app and um, uh, the more uh, gray hair oriented guys, um, it's convenience. It's convenience. Yeah. I think it has also a practical application that, uh, you know, when you're moving around, even as a CEO and you're sitting with your investor and he says, uh, I need to see the last, uh, I don't know, the last document, you have it on your mobile. You can basically open it on your mobile, on the fly. You know? So it's it's both generation, technology-oriented uh, younger people on the startup scene, but then convenience for uh, anyone else uh, uh, involved with a company or a startup. Makes sense. And um, look, come here. a couple more questions. I'm aware of time, but how do you envision the future of digital compliance? and its impact on global finance? Good question. Uh, since I'm not a lawyer, I think uh, I'm, not, I'm not really, really qualified to answer this uh, in, 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 in detail. I, I can, I, again, I can just say from, from an operational point of view, as well as from an investor point of view, uh, I think we need to make sure that all of us play by the rules, much, much more. We need to avoid these FTX or whatever cases or or Credit Suisse. (laughs) I'm sitting in Switzerland, (laughs) Credit Suisse as an example. Uh, Yeah, and and, and particularly board members and, and particularly investors have to understand that these compliance as well as corporate governance elements are on the to-do list in their job description, at least here in Switzerland. Mm. And so I think we we, we will have, uh, I think, an increase in awareness, both on the financial world, including banks, as well as board members, as well as uh, private equity or venture capital investors, that due diligence doesn't stop on the day that you transfer the money. You need to continue watching. And, and watching closely. All right. Well, look, that's all we have time for today, Daniel, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us today. And for anyone interested in finding out more about ADNA or Daniel, uh, there's uh, several links uh, below um, or in the description that you can find, uh, including how to get in touch with them. But thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to uh, work uh, much, much closer with the wholesale investor team, as well as uh, your whole platform, which, um, you know, I find uh, a very good contribution. Hopefully we can uh, also add a little bit of contribution to your uh, uh, business success. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome to Capital HQ where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? 
joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment. Hello and welcome. My name is Lou Jury. Uh, I'm the founder and executive chairman of Sprint Ventures, uh, and I'm delighted to be here today uh, to present at the Capital HQ Masterclass, Masterclass Conference uh, about crafting a robust family office or fund investment thesis. I'll just get straight into my presentation. Uh, and before I do, I just want to uh, go through our disclaimer under our AFSL. Uh, this is general advice only today, uh, and I encourage you to read uh, this, uh, this disclaimer uh, at your leisure. Today, uh, I want to talk about how we've crafted uh, our own VC uh, fund uh, investment thesis. Uh, it's very similar to setting up a family office investment thesis, especially for those family offices that are setting up uh, a VC arm or a private equity alternatives stream to their, uh, their office. Um, and uh, I just wanted to take you through how we've done it over the last four and a half years. The Sprint Partners have been a key part of that, and uh, they're led by the managing partner, Georgia Barkell, myself as uh, one of the founders alongside Heath and Ben, uh, and uh, together we have nearly 100 years of experience uh, across financial services, startups, entrepreneurship, accelerators, uh, the, the corporate world, uh, and uh, we think that that's a really good place to, to build uh, a fund with all that uh, all those different levels of experience. Enough about us though. Uh, today, really what I want to do is dive into the seven steps that um, when we put this together, uh, we thought were the most important seven steps when setting up a family office or a fund investment thesis. Um, when, you, when you set up the family office and fund investment thesis, they normally go hand in hand. Um, not, you know, normally when you set up a fund, a, a venture fund, a private equity fund, uh, it's very similar. You need to go back to the building blocks and the structural elements of setting up um, that fund to get it right. Uh, often with family offices, it's about the generational piece. And uh, we see that all the time. We've got 75 investors in our two funds and uh, we, we'll be raising a third fund next year and we'll be adopting a lot of what we uh, are talking about today uh, in terms of the, the setting up of the actual funds uh, and also uh, the establishment of the investment thesis and how we go then about deploying capital to ultimately provide that alpha. So it requires careful planning and collaboration. Collaboration is probably the most important word here out of this whole slide uh, because the collaboration leads to great integration uh, of different perspectives within um, you know, the family office or uh, the fund that you're setting up. Uh, basically, you need to use all the different views. Uh, I, I think often the younger generation, if you want to call it that, of, of, of a family office or the, the young guns within a fund, especially a VC fund, uh, might often overlook uh, some of that experience uh, that um, can come from uh, the different generations that have actually often been the ones that have really driven the core growth elements to being where a family office is uh, and setting that up. It does take time, so there's a note there to really, you know, really plan things out, take time, uh, and really treat this as patient capital, um, because to get the the you know and generate those long term alpha uh, and successful investments, you do need a lot of patience, you do need a lot of resilience, um, and uh, you need a bit of time uh, to support your investment thesis. Uh, with everything, it's important to remember that past performance is not an indicator of future performance. So go in with your eyes wide open. Uh, like anything we do when we look at funds, uh, we treat them as a brand new fund uh, when we're setting them up. And uh, although we might have had success in our former businesses, in our commercial life, in our previous funds, in the portfolio companies, uh, you still need to go in with your eyes wide open. The first step that we recommend when you set up a fund or a family office 
um, investment thesis is to find the objective, go back to the core elements of why you're doing this. Uh, and most importantly, we believe, and what we've done at Sprint, is set up the governance structures. There's a few questions to ask when you set up uh, a family office investment thesis. The, the most important thing is who will run the money, uh, who will be on the investment committee and who, who will be the chair uh, of that investment committee. Uh, what sort of board structures do you need and, and who will chair, ultimately chair the board? Do you bring in an independent uh, external chairperson to actually help uh, provide uh, you know, a level of independence within your governance frameworks? And what governance risk and compliance needs do you have that are really going to allow you to appropriately uh, set up, monitor, report and evaluate um, your asset allocation? Uh, is that a third party governance risk and compliance committee like we have at Sprint? Uh, and, uh, you know, that is chaired by an independent, uh, extremely qualified independent uh, chairperson uh, that really allows that separation of governance um, and powers um, within the organisation. It's important to note when you are defining the objectives and the governance structure of a family office, make sure that the founding generation uh, is involved in all the discussions. Your family values uh, you know, are integrated because they're essential within how you actually are going to construct uh, your go-to-market, your investment thesis, your mandate, the reporting, et cetera, uh, and make sure those insights um, are, are adopted and, and they guide uh, the vision for the future generations coming through your family office. There's no difference of actually how you build a fund, especially a venture capital fund, uh, like with Sprint, uh, what we see is making sure that there's open collaboration and a robust um, level of you know insight sharing uh, that that keeps going. It, it starts at the beginning at step one here, but it actually goes and permeates through uh, the whole organisation for um, the time frame that you're working together, which is often decades. And some artefacts that get produced at this step are a family constitution, a family council with an underpinning charter uh, and really, really good in terms of, um, you know, having those assets and those artifacts that are generated that uh, may be assigned off with each of the different parties within your organisation. I just want to stop and pause and, and thank uh, Rawlings Bolton who are actually providing uh, the, some of this content and there's a take a leave behind at the end of this presentation that you'll be able to access um, and um, and take home. Uh, on to step two. So what you need to do once you've set up that governance framework and define the objectives, you need to assess the financial resources and the requirements. At this stage, it's important to engage some experienced financial and legal advisors who can op help optimise uh, your family resources. They can help optimise your fund as well. We did the same. We got in at this stage some really experienced legal fund experts to set up and craft the right uh, components of that. And in a venture fund and even family offices, you can look at things like ESV CLP, uh, early stage venture capital, limit, limited partnerships, which need to be registered. They need to be considered. They take months, if not you know, up to a year to actually get approved, uh, but they do provide benefit to um, either the family office or the fund um, if, if you can be successful in securing things like ESV CLP. So make sure you uh, you basically start partnering with these these key people, <clears throat> and they they're going to basically try and break down this very complex world of funds management, mandate, uh, investment committees, uh, and they're going to basically look at uh, the holistic helicopter view of where you've been, where you've come from, uh, and really uh, simplify uh, early on what your investment mandate will be based on the accumulated family wealth. And that's not, not just financial capital, that's the experiential capital, the network capital, the social capital that a family office uh, brings uh, from all the different generations and different components uh, of a family office. And the outcomes, as I said, were engage the advisors at this crucial second stage. Uh, and often they are the lawyers uh, and the, the accountants that understand the tax implication. So, there's another stage that I recommend is defining the cornerstone investment objectives. So what this statement uh, and this thesis 
uh, defines is that what what do you want to do and what do you want to achieve from this particular family office or fund that you're setting up? When you build the investment thesis and the mandate around uh, the family office uh, and the fund, basically, are you looking for long-term wealth preservation? Um, are you looking for capital growth? Are you looking for income generation? Or are you looking for a combination of those objectives? And the family offices that we see that are successful with this actually employ at this stage someone that can come in as a chief investment officer. Uh, they're a trusted advisor often, and then they get appointed into that CIO role. And they basically can help construct and craft uh, where the family wants to go. Uh, and it's a bit like setting up a fund. When you set up a venture capital fund, you've got an investment thesis, you want to deploy capital into certain uh, areas of early stage often, uh, and that's pre-seed, seed, series A, series B, et cetera. But you might not want to do series B. So you might actually want to focus more on pre-seed and seed. And so you need to actually define your core obje uh, objectives at this stage. But back onto the family office, what you're looking at here is uh, wealth preservation um, and, uh, you know, different areas uh, that uh, can provide this. Now, again, this is general advice only. Uh, and uh, I do recommend talking to uh, pr professionals that can actually do the construction of this uh, at a more detailed level. If not, appoint your own person that has those financial qualifications and advisory qualifications uh, to allow you to, uh, I suppose, get a great understanding of where you're going to do your, your asset allocation. As I said before, establish those legal and tax structures on the back of that work. Uh, uh, you know, make sure you set up the best uh, tax structures, of course. Um, one size does not fit all, um, and uh, the advisors will be able to help you out. Um, an important consideration at this stage is do you actually set up an AFSL, an Australian Financial Services Licence? Do you become a corporate authorised representative uh, of an AFSL? Uh, as an example, Sprint, we're an authorised representative uh, of Boutique Capital and Boutique are the AFSL. Uh, we're under the auspices and reporting requirements of that AFSL. So whatever they have to do to ASIC, uh, we have to do as well. Uh, and that's prudent, uh, good behaviour, good, uh, you know, good uh, muscle memory from the start is to actually set up uh, and clearly identify what your objectives are going to be and whether you actually are going to require that authorised representative. And who do you go to? Who do you trust? How much is it importantly going to cost? And do you have the, uh, the people within your organisation that can actually handle all of the compliance uh, and reporting requirements that you need, as well as, importantly, the risk requirements uh, that, you, that you're going to have? Step four is build a team and define roles. This is a really important part uh, of setting up a fund, a VC fund, uh, setting up a family office. It doesn't really, there's no distinction here. The, as we all know, people are the most important thing within any organisation. And finding the best professionals who align with your family goals or your fund goals uh, will take time to put together. Um, this is the part where um, helping the founding generation of a family office understand that you might need uh, some differences uh, of style, let's say. So as you see today, I'm wearing a T-shirt. Uh, so we've got T-shirts versus suits. Uh, often some people within family offices wear more suits. You might need some younger people with uh, younger investment uh, ideas and ideologies and visions coming through to create um, you know, a real robust uh, breadth of, um, you know, discussion uh, and, um, you know, adding a different dimension to your investment thesis. Uh, it's important to involve everybody within the family office or the fund about who's the next hire, why you've got the next hire. What we do at Sprint is actually on the whiteboard, put up our organisational charts. Um, we, we spend a lot of time about um, are getting an understanding of who we need. And that's not just who we need from an investment decision point of view. It's actually more behavioural science around the right person, the right fit uh, in terms of uh, the next role that we're hiring. So really important that um, you, you, you look at the behaviours 
of people uh, and also their skills, of course, and involve the family, involve everybody within that decision. Uh, at this stage, as that third point states, it's important to have members of your team that have investment committee experience, they have investing experience, uh, they might have portfolio management experience, um, and they're not, you know, you can have people that come from maybe a generic background, uh, but you really need some people with some muscle memory uh, within the space that you're going after. For example, some of the family officers that I've seen over the years that have been very successful here have recruited uh, people that have very different perspectives, different uh, worldly perspectives, uh, different investment thesis perspectives um, that might be social capital in terms of impact investing. Uh, and what they bring is very unique and very different, but it complements uh, all of the other asset allocation that's going on with that family office. So that person might be the social impact venture style PE alternatives investor uh, and others within the family office are off with the bonds and the property and, and all those other, uh, and the cash, all those other different types of investments. Um, so a little pitfall that we've seen is when a family office tries to add a venture capital investor too early <clears throat> uh, and doesn't consider portfolio construction. And by that, what we mean is um, the construction within the, the alternative sleeve of your asset um, and whether there's alignment there to have early stage, often younger founders out of accelerators coming into the family office and being on the portfolio of a family office, uh, either fund or within their, their remit. And sometimes there's a bit of a misalignment, both from the person trying to achieve venture uh, and high risk investments at that early stage with the generational uh, piece back in the family office. Uh, I think in venture capital and having in venture capital funds, the investment thesis is, is driven to that. Um, and uh, if you're building a family office and you're building venture capital within your family office, it's important to note that that just by employing a person, uh, you know, potentially straight out of uni or a couple of years under their belt and just plonking them into your family office and hoping that they're going to deliver the alpha returns on early stage venture type investments, uh, might not work out in the timeframes that you're expecting. Step five, develop investment and wealth management strategies. So yeah, this is what I was saying before about asset allocation. And what I've got here is an internal asset allocation self-assessment map that we use at Sprint. And this is, again, general advice only because there is different pieces of uh, different assets that can be added and moved around in here. This is our take our interpretation for our investors that come on board as LPs uh, when we actually talk about uh, the, the, the venture capital space. So again, general advice only. But down in the bottom, uh, sorry, on the axis, you've got uh, the return, uh, it, it, you know, the higher the return, the higher the risk, potential risk level. Uh, and down in the bottom left there, you've got the fixed interest, you've got the cash, the bonds, the corporate bonds, et cetera. Uh, and the next sort of side of, of, the next scale of risk is is property, resi property, a bit of commercial property. Things go up and down. Things move out uh, here, of course, and it's always in the news. Um, and then up into sort of the more high risk, having your own business, being in private equity, uh, having small cap equities. Blue chips sometimes can you know come down, but sometimes depending on the the, mac the macro forces and the markets, um, you know, equities can be slightly exposed. Right up to venture capital or hedge funds, which are up in the alternatives, higher risk, but potentially higher return uh, asset classes. And it's important for a family office, um, you know, to uh, make sure they understand their attachment to their existing business investments or their property investments or their bonds or whatever they've been doing, um, you know, may hinder their appreciation for the diversification of the different asset classes that are needed. And especially when we see it from the, the flip side, um, we're explaining that venture is high risk. So if you're constructing an investment thesis within a family office and you are considering private equity or venture capital as, a, as, a, as an option, it's important to carve out a sleeve of that uh, like you would do uh, with uh, each of those different areas or those different assets uh, and make sure that, again, you talk to your chief investment officer that you've recently appointed or the asset allocators, the financial advisors that you might uh, bring through uh, to actually get 
uh, a robust, um, you know, risk tolerance uh, built to your specific investment philosophies. And all of this is best uh, formalised through an investment policy, a document that everybody can sign off on within the organisation. Here's a bit of a um, capital deals pipeline and an investment policy that's taken into an actual uh, image format for you. So this is venture capital. We're up in the high risk, uh, potentially high return. Uh, we're looking at seven to 10, 12 years to potentially get that alpha from a portfolio of companies. And how do you actually find those portfolio of companies? And so the investment document, investment policies that come out of this stage need to be reflective of where you'll be. So if you're crafting up a, a family office um, and uh, you're, 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 you're looking to build that investment mandate and part of that is alternatives and part of that alternatives is private equity with venture capital, uh, you, you do need to have people that are present within all those different areas at the top of the funnel. Uh, you need people attending incubators and accelerators. You need them partnering with universities. You need to understand uh, who the advisors are, who will give you that deal flow, because it's about bringing that 100 or so opportunities per month through the funnel. Because as we know, uh, and, and as we invest at Sprint, it's one in 100 that uh, actually get through. So really important to understand the landscape of your deal flow network, the opportunities network, uh, and whether you've got the right people within your investment policy plugged into these extensive national networks of accelerators and other venture funds. The other piece to this is how you actually then build up your investment philosophy uh, and how you then go and market that philosophy. And this is taken directly from our IM and DEX. When we go out to talk to um, potential LPs, often family offices, high net worth individuals, uh, institutional investors, they do want to know how you're different and, and how you're achieving uh, the long-term opportunity for alpha. So what we do is we look at core values and then we pull out one of those core values, the core value, which is actually founders first, which goes into everything we do. It's pretty much in the DNA. We back in the truly great founders uh, to provide the ultimate alpha through their hard work, but we support them with social infrastructure, experiential network and human capital to help supplement them and help them uh, globally scale and, and, and build that. So you can see there, there's four core areas on the left. Place founders first, right at the top. Uh, we become their trusted advisors. We always have value, uh, value realization in mind, so the exit in mind. So you need not just the buy side, you need the, the grow or the hold side, and then the sell side, which is the exit. And then we need, uh, you know, you need to understand how we, then we fit in from an ESG point of view and the community, uh, the ecosystem within what we do. On the right-hand side there, we've pulled out then one of those things, which is the most important to us, is if you can find a great founder, often that great founder will provide that success, uh, even if they have to pivot within the business at the early stages of, of venture. So if a family office, for example, is getting into this area, um, you know they, they need to go and meet those truly great founders. They need to be uh, amongst those great founders. And the family offices that we know from our venture community um, that we catch up with, with a lot, uh, are, are very active within those areas uh, alongside us. A really important part of the modern family office investment thesis and crafting and building uh, a family office or a fund is to actually have efficient administration and, op and operational back office systems. Uh, these things are crucial, uh, not only for product uh, productivity and efficiency gains, but actually for day-to-day -day operations and, and saving costs uh, within the, the actual family office and the business. These systems require ongoing uh, attention. Uh, they need support. They often are uh, software that you, can, you can't just set and forget. Um, and uh, often uh, you need to explain this to the founding generation, that the value of technology, technology solutions or compliance frameworks is vital to the back office success within the family office and therefore the successful running of an investment thesis uh, and investment mandate. What I suggest is look at APIs. Um, so these are things that can help plug into different uh, different bits of kit. Uh, and at Sprint, we've actually built our whole system, our whole Sprint back office. In that includes artificial intelligence now, 
uh, using APIs, using things like Airtable, Slack, Google Forms, Zapier for the APIs, uh, and then some open API, uh, open AI to actually help uh, run some, some artificial intelligence across all of the deal flow that comes in. Uh, and these are cost-effective platforms. You can always move to uh, things like Salesforce, Affinity, and others later on. But there is great uh, software out there uh, that you can actually use, uh, which really will speed up a lot of your transaction time and a lot of the due diligence time that you're going to need, rather than running it on Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel. So an important stage and the, probably the final step uh, to talk about today is um, the family education and communication programs, where we see funds break down in their investment thesis or a family office struggling with uh, an investment thesis, uh, especially within our sleeve of alternatives in private equity and venture capital, is uh, always having uh, communication programs. This is you know, based on uh, the annual events that a family office might put on. Uh, we say that every quarter uh, there should be uh, initiatives that are delivered, such as uh, family forums, uh, monthly uh, lunch and learn that might be quarterly, but you can we do the monthly at Sprint. Um, and it's an ongoing evolution of education and training. Uh, it, it's not just set it up. It's it's all going to happen, and, and the investment thesis is, is going to run itself. Things change within an investment thesis, uh, and things need to be um, malleable and, and, and being able to pivot. Uh, of course, under the auspices uh, of an ESVCLP in a partnership, a limited partnership agreement, you cannot change a lot of that, and especially like a, a trust. Um, it's very difficult to change some of those those structural things, so get them right back in stage two and stage three. But it's important if you need to bend and flex. And I'll give you an example as your minimum investment amount might change in terms of how things are going from, you know, six months, you know, in, in six months' time, things might be different. And so you might need to reduce or, you know, uh, raise your minimum thresholds for your investment checks because of macro forces, because of market forces. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, you need to have that, that flexibility. You need to communicate that. And it's often important that founding generations uh, are bought in because they've probably gone through a number of these cycles. Uh, and uh, those founding generations can provide some pearls of wisdom uh, at this stage when you're, um, you know, you're really sort of working through investments, portfolio management, and trying to realize returns. So that's the end of the presentation today. I just wanted to uh, thanks, thank Rawlings Bolton uh, for uh, providing a great takeaway uh, from this session. It's about um, setting up a, a, an investment policy statement, which covers a lot of what I talked today. Uh, and you can go to rbco.au slash IPS uh, and register your details there. They'll automatically send you a PDF document, uh, which gives you a number of, of the different themes that I talked about. And that's a really great document that they've prepared um, in terms of when you set up and craft a family office, especially the investment thesis and some of the things, the peripheral things that you need to, to need to know uh, when you do that. My contact details are there on the left. Uh, my name's Lou Jury. Uh, I'm the founder executive chairman of Sprint. Uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure talking, talking to you today, the Wholesale Investors Capital HQ Masterclass. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows await you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment.
Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's, uh, this session's um, of Capital HQ. Today, I'm uh, very excited to welcome Miles. Um, Miles is a seasoned operator with a deep understanding of the investment landscape, specializing in tech-enabled ecosystem and scale-up strategies. Uh, with a, his extensive experience working in a single-family office since 2011, Miles has honed his uh, expertise in navigating the complexities of emerging markets. He's known for his strategic approach to positioning brands, developing market-relevant products, and building efficient tech platforms and teams. Currently, as the director of Tapio Foundry, Miles is at the forefront of scaling, scaling B2B African fintechs, driving financial inclusion, and addressing significant credit gaps in the African market. His insights into emerging markets and not just theoretical, but are backed by a solid track record of real-world applications and successes. In today's conversation, we'll explore the nuances of investing in emerging markets, understand the unique technology requirements in emerging economies, and get a glimpse into the next wave of emerging economies. Miles' expertise will provide valuable insights for investors looking to navigate these vibrant but often misunderstood markets. So, yeah. Welcome, Miles. Yes, I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great to be on here. Great to contribute to what you guys are doing. It's, it's great to see that you guys are building up a really interesting ecosystem of not only partners and investors, but also knowledge. I think it's very important to share knowledge. So always here to help. Absolutely. And um, look, let's go straight into it, right? Uh, could you maybe define emerging markets for our listeners and highlight their key traits, such as high growth potential and perhaps economic volatility as well? Okay, brilliant. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think um, you know, emerging markets is a, really, is, is a really interesting concept. You know, there are lots of different uh, synonyms used, you know, emerging markets, global south, um, Developing markets. I think. I think in terms of in terms of our context specifically in the Africa space, one would be looking at um, the the high growth potential. Obviously, GDP is a factor, uh, but then also looking at high growth in terms of population, uh, where the population is growing. So, is that is that a younger population, which is predominantly in these uh, in these new emerging markets, and traditionally a lot of these uh, a lot of the uh, environments that we specifically play in are, you know, they do have economic volatility, whether that's depegging from stable currencies, as we've seen in, uh, in countries like Nigeria, or, uh, or high, high inflation because of economic policies. Uh, we've seen that in Zim before, Zimbabwe. So, you know, I think, I think it's not really a clear cut silver bullet answer. Well, this is what a yeah. uh, an emerging market is like but really it's just a combination of factors but uh you know where there's uh where there's where there's volatility or risk there's always huge opportunity and that's really what we focus on is more the opportun uh, opportunistic side of it great fantastic um and look just going straight into the next question with regards to its growth potential right so there's a report by the federated hermes limited that came out recently that says that emerging markets are expected to um, have faster economic growth compared to developed markets. So what specific opportunities do you see for investors in these markets then? Uh, yeah, so so I think it's your, you know, there's there's obviously a risk versus reward here. Um, and, and, and maybe we need to differentiate between emerging markets such as China, which is, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of debate going around now whether that is a emerging market being the second biggest uh, um, economy in the world going uh, probably going to become the biggest compared to compared to uh, emerging markets in our case as in as in the Africa setting. Um, so so yet again coming back to coming back to what we know, um, I think I think from certainly from our side, the risk is you know uh, the way that we look at it is that they one has to associate the investor returns with the risk premium. So that's obviously loaded onto the expected IRR of an investor going into some of these markets. So you traditionally see that the the return in these in these markets are generally higher, but like we but like we expressed before, there is risk associated to it. So this is where investors are starting to say, okay, well, what is that 
how do I quantify that risk? How do I how do I say that if I can get a return in a developed market of ten percent, what is that? Uh, what is the risk rate that I'm going to put on top of that return to say, well, now I'm interested in the in the emerging markets? Is it three percent? Is it five percent? Is it ten percent? Well, you know, these are these are all specific depending yeah. on what type of investor it is and what stage they're investing at. Uh, but yet again, it comes back to risk reward. Well, what is the risk rate of going into these markets, and is that risk rate um, going to meet the uh, going to meet their IRR expectations of what their their true IRR expectations? Okay, great. And could could you maybe share some success stories or of countries or sectors within emerging markets that have yielded significant returns? Um, just well, this uh. There, there's so many. Uh, there's so many. I think, I think we need to um, differentiate between returns in terms of uh, valuations and in terms of exits because they're two very, very different things. Uh, so, in terms of, in terms of valuations, I think there's some amazing, amazing examples. Uh, uh, Flutterwave is a good example. That's, uh, you know, they, they are a. Um, they like remittance payments uh, platform, uh, really, really cool fintech. And they've just uh, valued themselves last year, I think July, June, um, and maybe a little bit before that at about 3 billion US dollars. And they're heading towards, uh, and they're planning to go towards an IPO in the, in the US. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a great success story on, in terms of valuation. In terms of exits, that's a that's a very different kettle of fish altogether. Um, you know, this um, a lot of the a lot of the emerging markets is is no Silicon Valley. If you could if you could turn a um, uh, put a um, put a phrase to it, and I think the the secondary market in some of these countries is is relatively immature, uh, and specifically on the venture side. So I think I think valuation and exits need to be looked differently in some of these markets. And I think there's some good case studies of big uh, private capital firms that have struggled to exit in these in these in these regions and had to go through a down round. So I think I think in terms of the valuation and um, and exit, there are some good examples where there's a lot of a lot of acquisition strategic acquisitions that are taking place based either on the strategic importance of that of that business. So um, uh, specifically on the on the payment side and on the banking side, and then but but most of these are based around value, you know. Mm. So when I say value, I mean well, how much value are they creating for the end consumer? And traditionally, these exits are done more on a um, on a on a uh, on an M and A basis. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the transactions taking place. Um, I think uh, I think in in 2019, there was, you know, less than 10% of all of all exits were done on the venture side. Most of them were done on the on the private equity side. So it just kind of paints a picture of where the exits are happening and uh, and what those and what those um, and what those uh, rails are. That's that can help entities trigger a liquidity event within the markets. Okay, that, that's. Very interesting. I think, I think you know, it's it's good to understand uh, maybe uh, with regards to that and just generally the market, what kind of challenges and risks are associated with emerging markets? Perhaps you know, including political instability, um, currency fluctuations, and maybe some strategies for risk management, um, in those in, in emerging economies. Uh, so so I had a um in a. In my past business, we we had a saying that one needs to listen to the subtle signals within the markets, and it's a uh, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, however, it's always, I guess, I guess the the things that are always important to look at are the are the foreign exchange risks. You know, that's always a that's always a, a big problem. Um, uh, trying to kind of externalize currency, you know, is is uh, is a nightmare for lots of businesses. Um, I think. I think also from a regulatory point of view, depending on what industry you're in, you know, those are those are evolving very, very rapidly, and because these markets are um, 
are also in their own right evolving. So because because there's the technology is is moving so quickly, the regulators are having to keep up with this new technology coming into the market. So having a finger on the pulse from a from regulation legislative point of view, um, you know, coming back to the uh, flutter flutter waves uh, example, uh, the Kenyan regulator was very was very hard on them regarding their uh, their regulatory position in one of the markets, and I think that that kind of gives us a bit of an overview of how regulators, even though they are um, they are progressive in a way, they are uncompromising in some aspects. So I think it's a bit of a you know really just keeping your a uh, Keeping your ear to the ground and seeing what's happening on a on a daily basis within those markets. Um, yeah, yeah, and I guess that that's understanding the also the the local cultures, consumer behaviors, mm-hmm. and regulatory environments, right? Um, so, with regards to that, with your experience, you know, let's let's say there's a new investor, uh, there's an investor who wants to invest in emerging economies, uh, perhaps in Africa. What tips would you say to to these investors to gain local insight and the importance of having, you know, local partners or uh, et cetera? Yeah, it's it's uh, the due diligence on the local team. They need to be really, really on to what's going on. Um, you know, just from a just from a if I can use a personal anecdote, uh, uh, you know, we we spent uh, I personally spent about four to five years in Central Africa building our businesses and. One of the one of the many things that we tried to work on was that was that handover of responsibility, and uh, you know the teams that we worked with were incredible in that space, and they took it on and ran with it, and they now have a brilliant relationship with those with those regulate uh, with those regulators and and um, and and really took ownership of that. So may uh, so I think really the 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 responsibility on the due diligence on the team need to be need to be good and i think i think what i've seen what we've seen has been a really good success um in some of these markets has been the has been the ability to be dynamic mm. and having having a having a a co-founder team so not just a solo team but a co-founder team is a lot more powerful in these markets because they bring different uh, different skill sets to the to that business. Obviously, they need to be from different different backgrounds. So, you know, uh, one needs to be uh, skilled in one area, and then and one out of the co-founders need to be skilled in another area. But really, that that is where the magic is: is how um, is how powerful that team is, and how how good they are to execute across uh, a different range of. Uh, of business um of business outputs or requirements so i think that's if if maybe i can just summarize it into a sentence it's a team on the ground that's executing on on the day to days that's that's really important mm. and and i guess you know adding to that maybe from a personal point of view you can speak about this um let's just say uh, investor x wants to invest in is interested in the nigerian economy nigerian ecosystem mm-hmm. nigerian startup uh, but doesn't know much about the culture and, and uh, regulatory uh, landscape. How would you, what's your single biggest tip to these investors in regards to learning more about them and getting acquainted with all uh, that is necessary to, in order to make a reasonable investment? Yeah. So uh, we have seen that there have been some mistakes by some investors uh, looking at the so-called pan-African solution or uh, assuming that one product would work well in one country and uh, and therefore would work well in all the others. I think that, um, you know, much saying that a product that would work in Germany would also work in France because it's part of the EU, you know, it doesn't really work like that. So I think if, I think if someone were to come to me and say, okay, well, what really was your success um i think it was that we we took a position we do what uh, we do what we do we do a lot of it and we do it well so we don't try and be a specialist in everything uh and and if you're focusing on a niche or in an area i would i would recommend that's that's really what you do because it is it is a complex environment there are 
Uh, the business cultures are very, very different in different parts of Africa. The climate is uh, the climate's different. The the fiscal policies are different. It's very fragmented. Uh, the regulators sometimes talk to each other, but there's 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 no real ecosystem, so to speak, as you were to have in a more developed uh, environment such as Europe. So. I would say if you if you're targeting several markets, stick to those markets. If you're targeting several or oh, one or two um, sectors, focus on those sectors in terms of if it's fintech, ag tech, ed tech. You know, really stick to your stick to stick to the uh, that space and specialize in it because it is it is a very very complex environment and a lot of people do make money, but there are a lot of there are a lot of war stories out there that haven't been so pretty. So so that's what I would recommend. Um, do what you know, do a lot of it and do it well. Fantastic. Great, great advice. Um, I think, you know, um, for example, I, I grew up in, in China, um, and, and Hong Kong. So I had to, when I moved to the UK five years ago, um, Hong Kong and the, and the UK are quite similar culturally. There's a lot of similarities obviously there, but getting acquainted with the UK culture, um, I thought it was going to be easier than it actually was. Um, and so that, that was quite shocking for me because obviously growing up um, in, in that part of the world. So I think, you know, from a business perspective, from an investment perspective, it's definitely the case where I think to make the best, most informed decisions, you need to be part of it uh, to some extent, right? I'm not saying move there, but definitely interact with people on the ground as much as you can and not make decisions just based on, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, yes. Yeah. I guess let's now talk about the leapfrogging in technology that is happening in emerging markets, emerging economies. So how do you perceive the leapfrogging of technology in, in these markets and its impact on investment opportunities in areas such as fintech, e-commerce, and renewable energy? So I think the technology needs in these markets are very different to what we what we expect or what we use here in in more developed markets. So maybe if I can use a specific case study, uh, mobile money, for example, is a technology that's been really came out and was widely adopted in East Africa between 2008 and 2014. Uh, and then has spread rapidly across Africa. Uh, and when I say across Africa, it's gone into West Africa, come further south into Southern Africa, and is really is really one of the one of the uh, primary ways that people transact in these markets. So, so what does mobile money mean to to these to these um, to these people living in these markets? Well their phone immediately comes with an infrastructure they don't need to download anything they don't need to uh they don't need to have a certain type of phone to be able to access mobile money it's just there available on the phone so so to come in with an alternative such as a digital wallet there are immediate challenges there that are presented by just having a really good current uh current offering that requires very little infrastructure so when you look at mobile money someone can get a phone today they can put money on that phone and start uh, transacting today they don't need to download an app they don't need to transfer money onto the app and your cell phone is always with you so it's more it's it's an easier way to to transact compared to having a wallet or a, a physical wallet not a not a digital wallet but a physical wallet so I think I think the the technology needs for Africa are vastly different. Um, so I'm not saying that their technology is is better or worse. It's just different depending on what the what their requirements are. So specifically on our side, the technology needs are more around how do we how do we plug into mobile uh, mobile money infrastructure, and instead of saying, well, how do I create a um, a, a, a web 3.0 solution or a decentralized um, a decentralized technology or some crypto some crypto uh, functionality it's 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 more it's it's a different it's a different set of challenges 
that they face, but it is unique and one that we probably won't face in the UK. So because a UK, uh, the UK, let's use the UK as an example, everyone has, uh, uh, people have access to a neobank such as Starling or Monzo or Revolut and wouldn't use their cell phone as a main way to transact. So, you know, I think, I think it's, it's more the case of saying, well, how can we adapt the technology to those local environments um, or create technology for those local environments that necessarily won't be based on a developed market thinking. They'll probably be very different. And uh, so, so I think the challenge is trying to, trying to go into these markets with a, with a developed thinking hat on and say, well, this worked in Europe or this worked in the UK and now it's going to work here. So I think that's really the biggest challenge that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the company, a lot of the businesses have found with technology is that it works in one territory, but doesn't work in the other. Yeah. And you can even look at it from a, from a, from a regional perspective that even mobile money, even though it was highly successful in Eastern Africa, didn't get the same traction and it, as it did in some of the Southern African countries. Uh, such as South Africa, so you know it's it's even even on a regional basis the technology uh, the the technology needs are different. So uh, I think I think that's probably one of the challenges that are going to come around for the for um, for new entrants into markets is saying, well, how do we build technology that's relevant to the markets, not what technology is out there and can we bring in because uh, what what technology can we bring from developed markets into into these developing markets yeah. because sometimes it's square peg round hole. Of course. I think, I think this comes back to what we've been speaking about. I think throughout the, the, the conversation till now, it's educating yourself about the market you're going into. And it's not just about, yeah. it's not just about developing markets in general or the African developing markets in general. It's mm. about each respective country is different. And I'm guessing, I don't know much, right? But I'm guessing in, even in specific countries, there are different values and cultures within it. It's, uh, Africa is so diverse that even there, you have to you have to navigate those things and understand the, 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 the cultures and the people and how they operate. So yeah, and I think coming back to your point about the company you mentioned, there's one company I worked with uh, is very similar and they originally... Uh, they originally went into Africa looking to sell phones, re um, old phones, um, mm -hmm. reuse them, right? Recycling them for a cheaper, uh, cheaper price, obviously. And yes. what they realized is that, that that even that wouldn't work. So what they did was they made it so that's paid in installments for a phone um, over a couple of years um, with different degrees of applications on it um and depending on you know how it worked the the company could buy it back if uh, that specific person couldn't complete their installment and then use that as kind of a circular model and that worked really really well for them um i forgot in which countries they were in but it worked really well for them in one country in two or three countries then they tried it in another as you said and then, and it didn't work so they had to rejig their strategy all over again mm -hmm. which is exactly what you said i think i think it yeah. comes back to knowing the local markets is extremely important in making these decisions yeah i think that i think that um that product market fit for for that product in that country is very is is probably the most important thing to to try and find um just a, 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 we find that the entrepreneurs in some of these markets are highly resilient. They are incredible individuals with a lot of tenacity. So, you know, that's that's one of the big strengths out there is um, is when you come across some of these entrepreneurs. They are they have very 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 thick skin, very tough uh, mentally. Um, the challenge is that the product market fits is one of the one of the harder things to try and get right because your costs of your costs of running a business in some of these territories are relatively low, so it's it it's easy to get a business up and running. Um, the trick is making sure that the market is big enough for for this product to work. Number one, and then number two is do you have a product market fit? Yeah, and uh, and I think that comes back to your point about you know it needs to be fit for purpose for that territory. 
And uh, I've actually, actually uh, I don't know what the business is called, but I heard of that where where it's retail uh, retail financing of of uh, reusable uh, reusable or reselling cell phones and selling it next to a, a retail finance offering. And it and it does work really well in some countries, but in others, uh, people want to own their own phone or want to have the newer phone. And you know, but like you said, it's 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 fit for purpose for certain countries. And you know, it's just trying to find out is your product is your product right for that market. But yeah. yet again, that comes back to that team. That team is uh, should be very should be strong enough to be able to uh, to find those markets. So I think I think coming back to that point, you know, um, it's 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 easy to pivot, uh, and and one should always be looking. For to innovate their product ranges within their portfolio companies. Um, and I think the way to do that is just purely by having a good good team on the ground that's able to be dynamic enough to to find those opportunities. If, if they go into a new country and the product doesn't get the same traction as they did in the previous country, are they able to pivot um, their, their existing product range in that new territory to, to gain market share? Right. I think that, the, yeah, I think that that's really important what you've just mentioned. I think that, again, comes back to the same point. Um, look, in terms of in terms of what the future holds for emerging markets in the in the context of the global economy, um, could you maybe talk a bit about that and how it will play in the future, touching on perhaps demographic trends, potential for what we've talked about, technological leapfrogging and just general integration into the global economy? Yeah, so uh, I think I think where the where traditionally emerging markets have started were as a resource point for the emerged markets uh, or developed markets to be able to extract value. So whether that's um, a human capital or or resources uh, such as um, uh, metals, coal um, in metals or coal within the Africa region, or it's uh, employing cheap uh, cheap staff internationally. I think that's that's essentially where where it all starts. And these markets evolve, and when they evolve, you start seeing more uh, a stronger stronger uh, professional services coming out of these out of these markets, and that are then deployed into the international space. So. Uh, if you were to look at um, Vitality here in the UK, that's off the back of a financial services company called Discovery in South Africa. It's a South African company, and they've done they've done extremely well branching out internationally. Same with Investec, and these, and you know, so so it's and maybe South Africa is not the best best example to use, but it it, it started as it wasn't in Europe, it it was a bit remote, and now they've evolved building off what they originally had. And they started off just as a, um, you know, that's where, that's where a lot of resources were, were mined um, in the, in, in the, in the late 1800s sent back into, to the UK. Now, look at, now they're playing in a financial services space in the UK as one of the biggest, uh, as, as one of the biggest uh, health insurers here, life vitality. Uh, so I think, I think where it all starts, it's 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 it, it's an evolution, and what we're starting to see in countries such as Kenya is that evolution of uh, of where really good technology is starting to come out, and people are starting to deploy that technology internationally. Um, people are looking to, for skills that are coming out of Kenya uh, that are that are uh, deployable internationally um, google uh, google and um, google has gone in there and has uh, has invested a lot of money in that in that region as a and that and that maybe is a bit of an indicator of you know uh, even google seeing that there's a big opportunity in the long run to invest in that economy and and reap the rewards somewhere down the line uh, and i'm sure they're ready it's already paying dividends. Um, Kenya is an incredible country, and they've done extremely well in attracting, in attracting inv investments and building ecosystems that support that support startups. Uh, and you'll see that there's a lot of capital flowing into these 
into into some of these markets um you know maybe maybe on the um on the same uh, on the other side of the same coin we do we do see though that there is a high concentration of investment going into certain markets in 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 Africa specifically and it's very concentrated into four or five markets and we do differentiate between primary and secondary developing markets which is another layer but uh so so it's 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 interesting to see how how uh countries who have spent significant amount of time and resources developing their ecosystems have created a space where large amounts of capital is flowing in uh to to invest in startups and and businesses in these territories so i guess um i guess that's where that's where it starts is at cruise at a grassroots level where there's where there's uh a ecosystem being built by the government uh and then from there you know that evolves into investment and then from the investment going in there innovation comes out and and that's really where the evolution comes from so um you know it's like i said Africa is a big place. There are many, many different markets in there, and they each have their own unique way how they've evolved, and they're evolving at different speeds as well. So, uh, so yeah, it's an exciting space, and I think the, the the investment in building ecosystems is really where it all starts. And I think that's the that's the base on how um, in how these economies grow from from a startup point of view. And I think Kenya looking at what they've done in the past um past couple of years have done really well uh on that as a case study some great insights there miles um yeah i think that the yeah a lot of uh, a lot of tips in there a lot of guidance in there which uh, I, i'm sure the investors will appreciate i think you know i think what's important for for today's discussion as well is is to dive a bit more into the technology uh, technology differential um so I'd love to maybe speak a bit about <clears throat> what is your opinion? What have you seen in terms of how does technology utilization in emerging economies differ from that of developed uh, countries um, and maybe also address some of the unique needs of emerging economies that mm. technology must address uh, in that regard? Yeah. So, so we spoke a little bit earlier about mobile money um and why mobile money is is a is a is a need for these markets where they do have infrastructure challenges so let's just talk about uh a a a retail client in in a remote area in in zambia for example so um someone is in monzi in in zambia and they and they only have a uh nokia 3310 let's let's say that that person today is is out there in in a remote region and only has a nokia 3310 so there's no ways that individual is going to be able to have a a mobile wallet so that person is going to have to transact using using mobile money so when i say uh, a mobile wallet i mean a digital wallet uh such as you'd see at a neo bank here in the uk so that person would be transacting using mobile money that means that the person that is receiving uh that 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 money from that first individual who has a 3310 also needs to have a mobile money account and and on the same uh, and these the this infrastructure and this technology uses very low amounts of of data so you know you can be in a remote environment where you can use this technology and it works so i think i think the challenges that are that present itself to implementing new technology in some of these markets is the fact that you're going to have these barriers going into these uh into these countries into these markets where where technology being built isn't can't physically be used either because the consumer doesn't have the right technology or because the infrastructure doesn't support the technology so what does that mean that means that when going into some of these countries the technology that one is building is specific for that country specific for that user because they will 
they have a unique set of needs. And what, what we need to do as, as capital providers or um, players within this ecosystem is recognize that they, that these are challenges on the ground and these challenges need to be addressed somehow. And um, and being aware that that just because there's a technology that's solving a specific challenge in a developed market doesn't necessarily solve the same challenge uh, uh, solve a similar challenge in a developing market. So I think coming back to your coming back to your question, I think it's yet again being very sensitive to those signals that the that the market's giving to you. Look at what's currently there why that infrastructure is there and why is it working and then if it is working and it's and to to try and replace or substitute that technology why would someone replace the technology if it's working if it's not broken why fix it so we we take a we we take a view on it saying well there's infrastructure there already how do we build on top of the existing infrastructure so you know, we're not we're not necessarily first to market with a new idea, but we adding we adding value onto an existing infrastructure that is already there and serves the market extremely well. So, um, so I guess it's just yet again looking at looking at the technology that's available and why people are using that technology, and and trying to build on top of that rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> I think that yeah. Um... Yeah, in regard, like talking about that, you know, and talking about t touching upon what you said there, touching upon what we talked about beforehand. So the mobile, the mobile first phenomenon, right? So building on top of that, building on top of the fact that it is a mobile first. Uh, a lot of these countries are mobile first. Um, with with these com uh, countries often being uh, mobile first, um, how does this? usually design the influence of digital services um, in regards to innovation um, and mm. et cetera? So the most, uh, there, there is a very, very high percentage of populations within the, within these developing markets that use their cell phone as their primary and only source of access to the internet, which is incredible. So, Consistently, when we're looking at the markets that we're working in, we're saying, well, how do we get our product into the hands, the physical hands, as in on the cell phone of the consumer? And that is, that's really the big question. So coming back to our first, uh, the, the point before saying, okay, well, what infrastructure is needed for our technology? We trying to make our technology as lightweight as possible so it can be used on very very low um, on uh, with very low amounts of data, uh, and build the back end infrastructure that most of the that most of the uh, that most of the processing is done off the unit, so off the actual phone itself. It's done it's done in a cloud environment. So your uh, so your pack, uh, so your data transfer is extremely low, and uh, and there is an attractiveness to have an app specifically from many of the investors saying, oh, well, how's your app and whatnot. But we're looking at it in a lot more practically and saying, well, does an app actually solve the problem or is it a nice to have? So, so I guess, I guess coming back to your question, mobile first, looking at just basic, uh, basic things that we've just touched on now, large proportion, a very high percentage of these populations use their cell phone as the only uh, contact point to uh, to the internet. Um, the the low the low uh, data environments um, and and the accessibility and how how do you access this without without putting up barriers of 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 infrastructure, meaning downloading an app and whatnot. So. You know, it's it's all about it's all about making the user journey as seamless as possible, piggybacking off the existing infrastructure, and and not creating barriers for 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 um, for users to actually make use of the um, of of the product which you're offering. 
Great. So, so I think it's like you said, mobile, uh, mobile first. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That's that's really where the rubber hits the road. If you could penetrate the market and create a product which can be completely utilized by a consumer or a user on their cell phone, that's that's the majority of the work done. Um, there is a very very high penetration of smartphones in in some of these regions, but still some people are not, they don't have smartphones and one needs to cater for, for, uh, for those consumers as well. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very interesting and different, different market. You know, uh, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be something, uh, you know, it wouldn't be common to hear that, uh, that in the developed markets, people only use their cell phone as a form of access to the internet. Like that is, not something that's that's familiar in, in developed markets, but this is a reality in developing markets. So it's just something that needs to be kept in the back of the mind when when looking at uh, new projects. Yeah, and I think you know <laughs> the the nature of this subject is that it's probably endless in terms of what we could speak about. And I am <laughs> conscious of time. Um, I'm, I am conscious of time. So I I, yes. I really wanted to talk with you about the next wave of secondary emerging economies um with that in mind so i think what would be great uh, first of all is for you to define what constitutes a secondary emerging economy and how these uh, countries differ from perhaps your BRICS or your current emerging economies mm. um, yeah yes okay so uh the secondary markets is are markets that are traditionally not not invested uh, primary investment locations for for investors so you mentioned BRICS, um so brazil russia india china and south africa uh and then we and then also in the africa context if you were to focus in africa um yet again that's that's my expertise but in in the africa context the the main primary markets that are invested in there are south africa kenya nigeria morocco and egypt so maybe just to give an example of 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 primary versus secondary markets in terms of investment. So in terms of renewable energy projects and investments in, in Africa, 75% of all renewable energy investments went into four countries. And that was between 2010 and 2023. Now this is, K, uh, this is KPMG's stats, not mine. And that was into South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and Kenya. So they are traditionally known as some of the primary markets. Nigeria generally fits into that into that uh, bucket as well, and uh, and we see that a high portion of investment flows into these markets, which um, which for us is uh, you know we look at that as as great for that environment, but it leaves but it leaves these other markets a bit underserved. So when when we say secondary markets. We look at markets such as, just to give a few amongst others, uh, Zambia, Tanzania, Uganda, um, Zimbabwe, that are that are not getting the same level of investment uh, being injected into these markets, but have huge problems. So we look at this and say, well, the problem's there. It's not going away. There's not a lot of investment going in there. It's all going into those primary markets. And... Uh, let's let's look at that as an opportunity, and there are incredible founders solving really really fundamental challenges for for people in these markets, and you know they need they need uh, they need capital, and most and because they are secondary markets, most of the time you'd you'd find these deals, um, if you were to compare them like to like for for. Um, primary market so if you had the same you had the same project in kenya as you were to look at in tanzania your tanzanian uh investment terms would be would be discounted compared to the kenyan because it is a secondary market so i think there's a lot of fomo that goes on in these in these primary markets whereas we we find some really really good opportunities and partners in these in these secondary markets that are uh, that are extremely extremely strong strong teams but um you know the capital isn't just uh, isn't flowing there so 
the, uh, they really, really exciting deals that we're working on. Yeah, and I think I think you know I'd love for you to touch a bit more on the on the macro side of of perhaps you know the secondary emerging markets in, uh, in the Africa contract uh, context, so Zambia, Tanzania, and Uganda. So, you know, what are the different factors that are driving growth in these countries, right? Um, and secondly, how are they overcoming historical barriers? So, you know, whether that is political instability, infrastructure deficits, and regulatory hurdles. Um, so on the macro, and then we'll go back into the micro again. Okay, brilliant. So I think the um, there's a there's a huge move, a uh, huge um, huge uh, movement uh, or huge population movement to to big uh, big urban settings. So you'd see um, you'd see this large influx of a very young population going into these urban environments to try and uh, to try and find jobs or to try and start a business and also uh, getting access to edu- uh, getting educated uh, and and what this creates is a is a bit of a is, is a bit of a hotbed of innovation and growth and which is which is really really exciting there's Obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of capital. There are, lot, there are very high capital requirements needed in some of these areas where, um, you know, just on the debt side, you know, we we focus primarily on debt, and we could see that so many micro businesses need debt. There's just no there's no capital provider out there that is that can that is big enough to service all of these markets. So we're looking at this and saying, well. If you're having a lot of micro businesses that are able to generate revenue and take debt out, pay down the debt and take out more debt, that means that they must be growing. You know, these businesses need uh, need bigger and bigger credit lines. So we're looking at this and saying, look, this this is a certain indicator that these markets are that these markets are growing, and I and I purely believe that it's because of this whole urbanization effect that that people are becoming more. Um, that more people going into these markets is high demand for goods and services, and that just and that just really churns the um, makes the economy work. Uh, I think I think the I think the way that these economies are going to grow long term is it needs to start at grassroots level. I think financing the the bottom of the pyramid is where these economies grow because that's where that 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 capital. Uh, really multiplies the quickest. Um, you know, we all know the multiplier effect, but in terms of how quickly that 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 money that is spent at a grocery store on the corner then circulates is a lot faster than a bigger SME. So that's where that's where I believe the the the, the economic growth is going to come from. Um, in terms of the in terms of the historical barriers, I think a lot of the a lot of the challenges arose from from issues such as um, changing fiscal policies or uh, nationalizing or political instability. You know, and you can you can pick and choose different different scenarios that have happened in in different in different countries. Let's look at uh, Angola, for example. They had uh, challenges with uh, foreign exchange, and there was no dollars when the when the uh, when the oil crisis hits and the and the oil price dropped, uh, and you know, and that's a specific challenge that they had there. Um, there's been there's there, uh, some of the countries have been through um, uh, a nationalizing process before. Some went through turbulent uh, transition processes where there were where there was um, local in, uh, local instability. So so a lot of these a lot of these uh, events do either put the brakes on or take a country backwards in a way that that have to be remedied first and then built upon so i think that's where a lot of uh, you know and some and some are purely uh purely more uh, uh geographical based as a, a landlocked country will always find it more difficult to trade um to trade their uh, their goods and services than one that does have a that is by the ocean or seaport uh, so I think, I think the 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 challenges that have led to these are sometimes go back 
20, 30, 40 years. And they've had to build up, uh, build upon that and start afresh. And, and that's really where some countries are a little bit further ahead than others. Um, but then again, I think where the coming back to the to the urbanization and the economic stimulation on the ground root level is 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 that's where the the true economy grows and um, at those at those informal markets is just it's just a hotbed of growth for, uh, for economies and uh, you know we're very passionate to be in, involved in those spaces and I think that's that's where that's where the growth happens within within local markets. Great. <laughs> Um, it's, very, it's a bit of a tangent, but but we're quite passionate about that space. You know, we yeah, you know, it's a, living, it looks like it. Um, yeah, yeah, it definitely sounds like those... yeah, it definitely sounds like very interesting markets. And I think you're right. I think the and I'm I'm not nowhere near an expert, but the grassroots level is is super important. Um, makes everyone rise, right? Um, from yes. the grassroots. Absolutely. Look. Um, I, I'm aware of our time that we have left, um, and I'm I realize we haven't talked about Tapia Foundry. <laughs> um, I, I'd love I'd love for you to maybe you know tell us exactly what you guys do. Um, maybe share a success story. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, go for it. Okay, brilliant. Um, so this is where I need to put on my put on my best pitch. Uh, so. So I guess the what what Tapio does is we are a venture builder that focuses on uh, building a portfolio of financial inclusion uh, firms. Uh, so they would be credit providers in Eastern and Southern Africa. So what we do is we are building a ecosystem around our portfolio companies so they can access capital, they can access advisors. And then we go in and we also help them with uh, something that we've termed is the Tapio Toolkit. And basically, we are an institutionalized co-founder. So we go in and we make sure that we, uh, we, we try our hardest to make these financial institutions be the best version of themselves. So we've got over 11 years of uh, building and running financial services businesses in that region. And we just bringing all that knowledge and all those resources for to these uh, to these startups to uh, to these businesses to become the best version of themselves. So that's that's really what drives us. Um, our purpose is very clear. You know, we want to we want to provide one million micro, small, and medium enterprises with uh, with access to capital through our portfolio. That's that's really the reason why I'd be doing this. Why I'd be so passionate. Uh, so. So, so yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big number, but uh, we've got we've got a lot of passion. We've got a great team, and you know we've got a we've got a game plan. Like I said, uh, do what you know, do a lot of it, and do it well. That's our even that's our motto. <laughs> Fantastic. No, that that's yeah. that's great to hear, Miles. Um, I guess my last question for you is, uh, if you were to give one tip to investors listening in right now. Hmm. Um, who are wanting to engage um, or throw themselves into uh, emerging market opportunity and investments, what would be your biggest tip? I know you probably have 50, but what would be your single biggest tip? I think uh, the single biggest tip is these markets, you have to be patient. The, the, the exit is not as close as it seems. However, if you do the basics right, building value, um, building a bottom line, building a strong business, you will be able to find an exit in these markets, and and you just got to hang in there. You know, uh, it's it's um, it's an exciting space. <laughs> there are going to be many sleepless nights uh, as an investor, but it's it is really really rewarding and then and as an investor you're going to have to be patient so uh i think the two to three to four year exit strategy is will be challenging to do in that market but so so yes be understanding and be patient <laughs> fantastic <laughs> if, I could, 
if I could summarize it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Miles. It's been an absolute pleasure. And for our listeners who are intrigued by the potential of emerging market investments and wish to explore further, um, Miles represents a wealth of knowledge, as you could uh, tell by this call. Uh, so whether you're considering diversifying your portfolio, seeking growth opportunities, or simply want to understand more about the dynamics of these vibrant markets, Miles is your person. Um, you'll be able to find his uh, information in the description. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Miles. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hugo, thank you for hosting me. It's great to catch up. And uh, yeah, it, it, looking forward to um, hearing feedback from, from whoever watches this. You know, we're always looking for feedback. So we yeah. never stop learning. Fantastic. Thank you, Miles. Brilliant. Thank you, Hugo. Welcome to Capital HQ, where exclusive access to the private market and curated deal flows awaits you. Dive into a world of possibilities, from innovative startups and scale-ups to lucrative IPOs and high-yield credit opportunities, all at your fingertips. Gain unparalleled investment insights from some of the leading minds in the industry. Stay ahead with our expert perspectives from around the globe. Connect and network with fellow investors of similar caliber. Join our exclusive in-person and online functions to share, learn, and grow together. And the best part? Joining Capital HQ is completely free for investors. Become part of our proprietary network of over 33,000 investors today. Discover, invest, and network with Capital HQ, your gateway to the future of investment.